kindly watch this introduction video of mine before you directly proceed to the respective timestamp. Most important instructions I'm giving you so that you can get maximum output, maximum, you know, benefit by watching this marathon. Very simple. The first and foremost instruction. In the marathon, we have used materials, right? Like some material we have used. That material is available at free of cost in PDF format in our website. Rest of CSEMA.com. Just open our website. Inside there, something called free resources is there. Inside that, you just have to select the CMA inter option. Then you will find all the subjects. That is first important thing. Second, now these marathons are being handled by our Suresh team. I think uh, many of you, whoever is watching this revision class are well aware of our faculty team. The law is being handled by Subramaniam sir. And uh, financial accounting, basics and P10E is being handled by Sai Babu sir. Remember, for all the eight subjects, we are uploading marathon. Not just for one or two subjects, for all the eight subjects of CMA Inter, under one roof, that is under stress of a CACMA, you are going to get revision classes, you know, access. Then uh, P6 and P10 year, accounting, both the accounting in group 1 and group 2 are being handled by Sai Babu sir. P7 year, income tax, my classes will be there, whatever my CA Inter revision class is there, part 1 and part 2, the same revision class you can use for CMA Inter for December as well. Then GST is handled by Pawan sir. P8, cost accounting, P12, management accounting, both are costing related, is handled by Ganesh Bharadwas sir. Then P9 year, O and M, operations management is again handled by Subramaniam sir. P9 B, strategic management, P10 B, auditing. P11B analytics, all the three papers revision classes are being handled by Harish Krishnan sir. P10, P11A, financial management again by Funny sir. So these are the subjects and the faculties who are handling it. So I just want to give you an information about what subjects we are uploading for marathon. With And uh, coming to income tax, like I don't know whether you're going to, whether you're a group one student or group two student, I just want to give one clarification. For December 24 attempt, there are no separate amendments for any subject including tax. Even for income tax, whatever amendments that are there for June attempt, the same amendments will be applicable for December. You need not even think about amendments. Just to watch the marathon we uploaded. Whatever marathon I have uploaded for recently September attempt of CA Inter, the same marathon you can use it for, you know, December attempt of CM Inter. Because the same is applicable for even CA Inter January 25 attempt. So you can use absolutely the C. And the respect to material you can find in the, as I already told, in our free resources in the website, you can find under CM Inter option, the respective materials. And third more thing, third important thing, we have given for all the subjects, three-fourth preparation strategy. What is three-fourth preparation strategy? Uh, in every subject, we identify one-fourth of the chapters, nothing but, suppose if financial accounting is there, in that, let us assume 12 chapters are there, we will identify three to four chapters that occupy 30 to 30, 25 to 30 marks of the weightage in the exam. 25 to 30 or some worst guess 35 marks. From these chapters, worst guess 25 to 30 or 35 marks is what going to come in the exam. You have to leave it. These chapters you should ignore it completely. Sir, what does it mean? Remaining chapters you have to be 100% pakka. This is called three-fourth preparation strategy. Like many students are asking, Sir, we are unable to complete syllabus in time in the exam. So what are, can you suggest us some important questions in each and every chapter? I tell them that is a very risky strategy. Choosing important questions in every chapter is a risky strategy. Don't do it. If you don't have time, take some three or four chapters in every subject, which occupy 30 to 35 marks weightage. Keep them aside. Remaining chapters, 100% you should prepare. By doing so, no matter how tough the paper, let it come, no matter how tough the paper, it might be in the same end of. It may be like in every chapter, they might be asking uh, C category questions. Let us assume, you need not worry. Because 75 to 80, 85 marks worth of syllabus, you studied 100%. So you can handle any level of paper, even with limited preparation. Like you ignored one fourth of syllabus straight away. So that is what three-fourth preparation strategy is all about. Regarding that, in each subject, in paper file, law and ethics, what are the one-fourth chapters that you can keep them as a last priority? In financial accounting, what chapters are last priority? In income tax and GST, what are last priority? For every subject in group one and group two, we have identified what are the chapters that you can absolutely ignore without any second thought. Or you don't want to ignore, keep them as a last priority. First finish, suppose you might be group 1 or you might be group 2. First finish, each and every subject, 3 fourth chapters, 3 fourth chapters, 3 fourth. Like take P5, all first priority chapters as per our PDF, finish it off. 
P6, all first priority, finish it off. P7, all first priority, finish it off. P8, P9, P10, P11, P12, finish all the first priority. Whatever you are targeting for the coming December exam. After finishing that, you still have time. Then, do focus on the remaining chapters which you originally ignored. This is called 3 fourth preparation strategy. Now, one more important advice. You please focus single group only for the coming December. Especially if at all you are a repeater. Means, you gave an attempt in June or that before attempt, but you failed. I request you to focus only single group for the December. And by the way, what should be your preparation strategy for December attempt? I have already, I have already uploaded a video on preparation strategy in the same YouTube channel. Go to that YouTube channel. So, I mean, uh, you go to that particular video, you will understand how to plan your preparation for the coming December. And not just that, we even gave timetable for CMA inter students who are planning to write single group for the December exam. If at all, you do not have any control on your, you know, preparation process, all that. Daily, 7 to 8 hours of study timetable we have already given. Actually, there is a timetable which we give for our subscription course students who are watching classes. The same timetable you can use for preparing the subject also. It is like a study timetable as well as it is a timetable for watching our classes. Actually, the timetable is made for watching our classes. Every day, what subject, which class you need to watch for how many hours. Instead of watching class, if at all you want to prepare on your own, instead of watching class, you study that particular chapter, that particular subject. So, the timetable is also provided. The timetable also you can find in the same website, rest of us Under, uh, you know, free resources, you can find the timetable as well. So that's it. I just want to give some, you know, these instructions. Make use of this marathon carefully. And by the way, do not watch at star. I mean, do not watch at higher playback speed. Kindly watch at standard speed. Do not rush up. You have enough time. Getting it. Plan your preparation carefully. That's it. Con you know, continue watching the marathon class and do very well. All the very best. And please do comment below. How is this marathon session? Getting it. Your suggestions, your you know, appreciation definitely motivates us a lot. So kindly do comment how do you felt after listening to our marathon sessions. So that's it. Thank you. All the very best. Hi dear students. Yeah, in today's session, let us start with the first concept, time value of money as part of our fast track session. Okay. Yes. So straight away, I'm going to the concept. Time value of money. Simple, my dear students. The value of money changes with time. So what is the meaning of the term time value of money? The value of money changes with time. Here time means generally we have past, present and future. So at different points of time I have to calculate the value of money. A time value of money, money means what? The value of money which changes with time actually. At different points of time the value of money will change. So we don't care about this past value. We care about present value and future value. So in this particular chapter time value of money we are always trying to calculate present and future values only. That's what the important point we need to remember. Yes. So the simple definition of time value of money is the worth of a rupee received today is different from the worth of a rupee to be received in future. So that is a simple definition. That means if I offer you 1 lakh rupees today or 1 lakh rupees after one year, generally you will prefer today's 1 lakh rupees rather than future 1 lakh rupees. That's what the time value of money. The worth of a rupee received today is completely different from the worth of a rupee to be received in future. So why sir? Why everybody will prefer today's money rather than future money? There are some reasons. Let me tell you. The reasons are the important reasons are the first and important reason is inflation. See if I offer you 1 lakh rupees today you can buy some articles. With the same 1 lakh rupees, the same articles you may not buy after one year. That means the prices may rise. That means the purchasing power of money may fall down. Because of this reason, everybody will prefer today's money rather than future money. This is the first reason why everybody is preferring today's money. Inflation. And the second one is the risk. 
or uncertainty. The future money is always uncertain. So that because of that reason, everybody will prefer today's money rather than future uncertain money. This is the second reason why today's money is having more value than the future money. And then third one, preference for present consumption. Preference for present consumption. That means everybody will prefer to consume today only, not in the future. That means if I give you 1 lakh rupees today, you can consume such money immediately. You can satisfy. Now itself you can satisfy by using that money. You don't prefer future consumption. This is also one more reason why everybody is preferring today's money rather than future money. And the fourth important point is the investment opportunities. See dear students, if I give you the money today, if I give you the money today, you can invest anywhere. Say for example, if you have your own business, you can invest this money and you can earn some amount of profit. If you don't have any business, you can invest that money in a bank and you can earn some rate of interest. If you can deposit that money in a company, that means if you buy the company shares or if you buy the company's debentures or preference shares, accordingly you will get some amount of income like equity dividend, preference dividend, interest like that, you can earn some amount of income. That means based on the investment opportunities available to the investors, they can earn any rate of return. And this is also uh, the one of the reason why everybody will prefer today's money rather than future money. That means if I if we can give money today, they can invest on their own. They can invest some amount. They can invest and they can earn some rate of income in the future. And because of this, because of these reasons, today's money will have more value when compared to future money. Okay, so what are the four reasons? Inflation, risk, preference for present consumption and the investment opportunities availability. So because of these four reasons, every investor or everybody will prefer today's money rather than future money. Yes. Okay. Now let us go for the text here. And they have given some uh, reasons, risk, preference for present consumption and uh, investment opportunities. They have not covered inflation. Even inflation is also one of the reasons. Now, dear students, because of these factors, because of these factors, since the investors are facing inflation and risk in the future, investors are facing inflation, risk and risk in the future, they will expect some compensation for these two factors. And such compensation is simply known as the return. In technical terms, the return. In layman language, I'll call it as interest. So simply, interest is a compensation for inflation and risk. So because of this reason, I have to calculate the value of money at different points of time, especially present and future. That means the present value and future value. That's what I need to calculate. Okay. So right in this particular chapter, time value of money, I need to cover these concepts called future value, present value, future value of annuity, present value of annuity, present value of perpetuity, present value of growing perpetuity and compounded annual growth rate. These are the concepts I need to cover in this particular chapter, time value of money. Yes. Let us understand one by one. And before going for this, just have a look on this particular trade diagram time value of money look at this chart time value of money these are the concepts i need to cover compounding future value discounting present value yeah i'll tell you what is compounding and what is discounting look at this under compounding future value i need to cover these concepts single flow multiple flows annuity Yes, we need to understand these three concepts. And then discounting, single flow, uneven multiple flows, annuity and perpetuity. Yes. These are the concepts we need to cover in the under the chapter time value of money. Yes. Now, let us understand what is compounding and what is discounting. Today's value is present value. In the future, we have future value. Say, for example, I'm taking one year period. 
if you convert your present value into future value then that is known as compounding conversion of present value to future value means compounding for that i am going to use one factor called 1 plus r whole to the power of n which is known as fvf future value factor and in a similar way if i convert future value into present value the reverse computation i am converting future value into present value this is known as discounting for this i am going to use one factor called 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n this is known as pvf present value factor also known as discounting factor so this is a simple way of understanding conversion of present value to future value means compounding conversion of future value to present value means discounting let me tell you one important point my dear students compounding means addition discounting means subtraction compounding means you are adding some return to the present value to get future value discounting means you are deducting some return from future value to get present value this is what the simple way of understanding okay so conversion of present value to future value means compounding it's an addition of return conversion of future value to present value means discounting it is nothing but subtraction of some return from the future value yes now let us understand these two formulas in simple way the first one is future value and i am talking about conversion of single future value into present value sorry single uh, I am I'm, I'm talking about the conversion of pre single present value into future value. Single present value into future value. Say for example, I am converting 100 rupees today into future. After one year, I want to know about the value after one year. And this is what the future value. This is what the future value. And this is the present value. Yes. what is the formula for future value the formula for future value is present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n this is a formula for future value yes now just substitute the numbers here let us take the interest rate is equal to 10 percent for the sake of understanding 100 into 1 plus 10 percent means 0 0.10 whole to the power of 1 because we are talking about one year period 100 into 1.1 i'll get 110 this is my future value so 100 rupees becomes 110 rupees after one year so simply i've added some written 10 percent rate of interest to the present value of 100 rupees to get a future value which is 110 yes so now what is the formula for future value present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n this is what the present value factor pvf so what is the formula future value is equal to present value into the second formula future value factor this is not present value factor future value factor r comma n okay so future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n 1 plus r whole to the power of n is nothing but future value factor so this simple formula is future value is equal to present value into future value factor r comma n yes this is what compounding conversion of present value to future value now let us understand the discounting concept present value i told you already conversion of future value to present value means discounting present value means you are doing discounting discounting means you are deducting some return from future value to get the present value see from the future value itself i can calculate the formula for present value future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n and from this mathematically i can write the formula present value is equal to future value into 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n simple formula see here is a formula for present value future value into 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n and i can rewrite this formula as present value is equal to future value into this 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n is known as present value factor r comma n yes it's a simplified formula 
now dear students this is a discounting factor and the previous one is a compounding factor this is a compounding factor which will add return and this is a discounting factor yes now let us say let us take one example let me take two years time period after two years i am going to receive thousand rupees the discount rate is 10 percent and i want to convert this thousand rupees future value into present value so what is the value simple present value is equal to future value thousand rupees into one by one plus zero point one zero hold to the power of two yes how to get it sir 1 by 1.1 is equal to I got 0 0.9090 again is equal to 0 0.826 this is a factor you must use my, my dear students 1000 into 0 0.826 I am taking the approximate uh, factor here 0 0.8264 into 1000 I got 826.4 this is my present value so my dear students the present value of 1000 rupees that I am going to receive after 2 years is simply 826.4 that means I have deducted 2 years return of 10% from the future value of 1000 rupees which I am going to receive after 2 years ok yes now let me revise the formulas future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n and the present value is equal to future value into 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n. But in the study material, they have given you different scenarios. Single flow, multiple flows, annuity. Single flow means converting single value. Multiple flows means converting multiple values. Annuity means converting multiple but equal values. Okay. And we have another one single flow under discounting we have single flow uneven multiple flows annuity perpetuity like that we have some several uh, concepts here let me talk about one by one let me talk about the one, uh, every concept separately yes now the first one is future value see under future value i have to cover i have to cover single flow multiple flows and annuity and these are the concepts i need to cover Okay, the first one, future value, we have a table in our study material and even in our material, Shasta material, look at the context here, future value single and multiple cash flows, the first one is annually single cash flow, multiple times says number of times compounding done. Cash flows of different amounts over the years. That is a series of payments. Yes. Okay. The first one. Annually single flow. Single cash flow. Sir, what is this annually? Here the context is annually means annual compounding. So, actually, you know, what is the formula for future value? Present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n. This is a formula. Where r is equal to interest rate per annum in this context n is equal to number of years that means i am doing compounding on annual basis when the compounding is done on annual basis then i'll apply this formula future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n instead of this if you are compounding if you are doing compounding not on annual basis but on semi annual basis quarterly basis, monthly basis, daily basis, like that if your compounding frequency is more than once in a year, then I cannot use this formula. This formula is applicable only when we are doing compounding on annual basis. That means the R is interest rate per annum, N is number of years. In case if your compounding frequency is like this, 
compounding on half yearly basis or compounding on quarterly basis then in such a case i need to modify this formula so how i can modify this formula simple nothing new here just i'm going to change r and n here see the first formula is about annual compounding frequency now look at the second situation multiple times says n m number of times compounding done in a year the formula will be future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n that's remain same but i am going to change 1 plus r by m whole to the power of m into n so what is this m m means number of times compounding done in a year so let me write the formula clearly on the screen if the compounding is done more than once in a year so what will happen simple the formula will be future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r by m whole to the power of m into n this is a formula see where m is equal to number of times compounding in a year the compounding frequency and n is equal to number of years now let's say say for example if the compounding frequency is compounding frequency is half yearly then in such a case m will be 2 if the compounding frequency is quarterly then in such a case how many quarters in a year 4 if the compounding frequency is for every month then it will be 12 12 times compounding if the compounding frequency is for more than i mean like 12 uh, for every day then in such a case it will be 365 times if the compounding is done on half yearly basis m will be 2 quarterly basis four quarters four times monthly basis 12 months 12 times daily basis 365 times 365 days n remains same number of years say for example if the compounding is done on half yearly basis and number of years are 2 years then m and n m means number of times compounding 2 and 2 years 2 into 2 4 i have to write and m remains two times like that okay so this second formula is applicable when we are applying the compounding on a uh, compounding for more than once in a year okay the multiple times compounding i can say multiple times compounding this is the second formula the general formula first formula is applicable for annual compounding and the second formula is applicable for multiple times compounding in a year okay and the third one cash flows of different amounts over years that is series of payments yes this is also important formula one of the important formula see my dear students the first formula and second formula both are converting single value into future value but the compounding frequency may change the first formula is applicable when you are doing compounding once in a year annual compounding and the second formula is applicable when you are doing compounding frequency compounding for more than once in a year then you should apply second formula see instead of this if you are converting multiple values into future you are not converting single present value into future value you are converting multiple values into future value say for example 1 2 3 but the values are not even but the values are not even these are uneven actually uneven numbers means unequal numbers let us take one example to understand this say for example you are converting 100 rupees of first year 150 rupees of second year 200 rupees of third year then what will happen i have to convert all these values into third year ending value here also i'm calculating future value but i'm not converting single value i'm converting more than more than one value and that to unequal values say for example interest rate 10% per annum 
so why you are taking every time 10 percent because that's an even number and comfortable for for understanding okay now first year ending 100 rupees should be converted into third year ending two years return should be added two years interest should be added second year ending value should be converted for one year one year interest should be added and third year ending value for third year ending value i don't get any kind of return 200 remains 200 so how i can get this value sir simple future value is equal to 100 into 1 plus the interest rate is 10 percent 0 0.10 whole to the power of 2 plus 100 into 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of sorry the second year value is 150 150 into 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of 1 and the third value 200 into 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of 0 no interest will be added so what will happen 1.1 1 .1 into 1.1 100 i got 121 and 150 into 1.1 1 .1, i got 165 plus 200 into 1 200 so if you add these two numbers 121 plus 165 121 plus 165 plus 200 and you got you will get 486 rupees okay see i have converted multiple values into future value and all the values are unequal okay and for that they have given you one formula for this actually we don't need to apply any kind of formula this is a regular computation and they have taken values like this future value is equal to present value 1 into 1 plus r whole to the power of 1 present value 2 into 1 plus r whole square don't apply this formula my suggestion is if you are converting multiple values into future value do it manually don't apply any kind of formula okay you don't need to remember this formula that's my suggestion okay just simply convert the values into future value if you have completed the chapter capital basic this is very easy for you to convert the values into future okay so in the later session capital basic chapter i'll tell you how to convert the values into future value and two concepts actually okay now dear students my suggestion is just remember these two formulas and the third formula is a simple mathematical formula but you don't need to remember this simply whenever you're converting different amounts different cash flows into future simply do the computation manually instead of applying this uh, I mean difficult formula this is my suggestion okay with this the future value of single and multiple cash flows are covered now let us go for the next concept next concept present value of a single flow yes already we understood the formula called present value of a single flow present value is equal to future value into 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n this is a regular formula applicable only when we are doing the discounting on annual basis but if the situation is discounting for more than once in a year nothing but multiple times discounting multiple times discounting as generally we don't apply this particular formula in our regular scenario even in the entire subject financial management or even in fi final level cma final also we don't we are not going to use this formula but they have given you one formula just need to try to remember this that's it nowhere i'm going to apply this formula even in the problems also we don't need to apply this particular formula because multiple times discounting is a very rarely uh, applied concept actually it is most in most of the cases the annual discounting only is applicable see just like for compounding we have multiple times discounting here the regular formula only see this particular first formula is applicable when you are doing discounting on annual basis this is for annual discounting annual discounting if the discounting is done more than once in a year then i am going to apply one formula called present value is equal to the same formula i am going to apply but with some modification 1 by 1 plus r r means r by m whole to the power of n into m that's it the same formula if you remember m means number of times discounting in a year 
M bar M means number of times discounting in a year. Look at the second one. Multiple times say M number of times discounting done. The formula. Future value into 1 by 1 plus R. 1 by 1 plus R by M. Hold to the power of N into M or M into N. Okay. The P V means present value. F P means present a future value. R discount rate N number of years M. This is a term you need to remember. M means number of times discounting in a year. Say for example, if you are discounting for... On quarterly basis, then M will be four times. If you are discounting on half yearly basis, M will be two times. If you are discounting on monthly basis, M will be 12 times. If you are discounting on daily basis, M will be 365 times. The same logic which I have applied in the compounding, the same logic you have to apply here also. Okay. Right. This is regarding present value, conversion of present uh, conversion of future value into present value. For annual discounting, this the first one is annual discounting. The second one is multiple times discounting in a year. Now, the third one, cash flows of different amounts over the years. This is a simple formula. Actually, you don't need to remember this formula. Throughout the chapter capital busting, we'll do this one only. Present value of multiple cash flows. So, what is this, sir? Say, for example, if I if I'm going to convert the future value into present value, you know how to apply the formula. Present value is equal to future value into 1 by 1 plus R whole to the power of N. That's a regular formula. But instead of this, if I am converting, if I am converting multiple unequal values into present value. Say for example, example I am converting 1000 rupees first year ending, 1500 second year ending, 2000 rupees third year ending. Cash flows into present value. Sir, what is the formula? My suggestion, you don't need to remember the formula. Just do discounting. Sir, how I can do this? Let us take the discount rate is equal to 10%. A round figure I am taking here. The formula will be present value is equal to present value is equal to 1000 rupees into 1 by 1 plus R because I am converting future values into present value. I must use the discounting factor or present value factor. The formula is 1 by 1 plus R whole to the power of N. So R means 10%. 0 0.10 whole to the power of 1 plus 1500 into 1 by sir, why you have taken 1 year because uh, I am converting first year ending value and for second year ending value 1500 into 1 by 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of 2 plus third year ending value 2000 into 1 by 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of 3. Now calculate these values. I am converting 3 values into present value, 3 future values into present value and all are unequal values and you don't need to remember the formula for this. I simply uh, apply discounting concept instead of remembering that particular formula. That's my suggestion my dear students. 1000 into 1 by 1.1 it will be 909.909 that's it. Round uh, if I take the number 909 plus 1500 into 1 by 1.1 1. 1. yes that is 1239 1500 see 1 by 1.1 1. 1. 0.826 into 1500 I got 1239 plus 2000 into 1 by 1.1 1. 1. yes 2000 I got 1502 or 1503 round if I take the round figure 1503 yes 909 plus 1239 plus 1503 it is 3651 that's it see I have converted multiple unequal ca future cash flows into present value okay my dear students we understood the concept of present value also now present value also The third formula, my suggestion, you don't need to remember this formula. Simply apply the concept of discounting. Okay. Yes. Now let us go for the next concept called annuity. So what is this annuity? First of all, let me say annuity means series of equal payments. It's a series of payments. That to equal payments, equal payments or cash inflows. So whenever you, you are seeing the term annuity, 
simply recollect or remember one term series of equal payments and it talks about series of equal payments the payments are cash flows must be equal that's what the point important point you need to remember okay keep that point in mind now this annuity is of two types one is the future value of annuity second one is the present value of annuity future value of annuity and present value of annuity so what is this future value of annuity and what is this present value of annuity simple 1 2 3 if you are converting 3 years equal values into future say for example 100 100 100 so these are series of equal payments i am i am not trying to convert all these values into present value i am converting all these values into future so let me convert these values into future nothing but third year ending for converting i need a compounding rate say for example 10% so what is a value see converting this multiple equal values for number of times i mean by doing this uh, compounding for number of times that's a difficult task that's a cumbersome work instead of this i can use a formula for future value of annuity i can use a formula for this and that is future value of annuity sir what is a formula for future value of annuity we have a formula see periodic payment into one i mean one plus r whole to the power of n minus 1 divided by r this is a formula and sometimes people say instead of periodic payment they'll use the term a amount periodic payment every time i can make some payments that's what equal payments are simply known as periodic payment or amount a this factor one plus r whole to the power of n minus 1 by r is known as FVAF future value of annuity factor r comma n okay see now you can apply this formula here hundred is your periodic payment one plus zero point one zero whole to the power of three minus one divided by zero point one zero I'm just trying to calculate the future value here for three years period for three years series of equal payments one point one hundred into 1.331 minus 1 divided by 0.10. 1.331 minus 1 divided by 0.10, and this is 3.31. This is my annuity factor. 100 into 3.31, so I'll get 331. This is my future value of annuity. Even if you can calculate the individual amounts, if you can convert individual amounts into future value, if you sum up all those numbers. definitely you are going to get this number 331 instead of doing that particular cumbersome work my uh, suggestion is apply concept apply the concept of future value of annuity so what is the formula for future value of annuity periodic payment or amount of payment every year into 1 plus r whole to the power of n minus 1 divided by r so this is a formula for future value of annuity so i have converted series of equal payments into future here okay now we have another concept called present value of annuity so what is the formula for present value of annuity the present value of annuity means the same logic applicable here 1 2 3 100 100 100 and the discount rate this time is 10 percent again and this time my objective is not to convert these series of equal payments of 100 rupees into future value this time i am going to convert these values into present value and i am going to use the discount rate of 10% so what could be the value and this time this present value is not a single value this is the present value of annuity i can do discounting concept i can apply discounting concepts for individual amounts separately but since the numbers are equal i don't use i don't need to use that cumbersome work i can use the simple formula simple mathematical formula because the the beauty of mathematics is it simplifies so many computations and one of such computation is present value of annuity the formula for present value of annuity is periodic payment into 1 minus 1 plus r whole to the power of minus n divided by r so what is the formula this periodic payment is also known as a amount of payment or amount of cash flow 
So what is the formula for present value of annuity? Periodic payment into 1 minus 1 plus R whole to the power of minus N whole divided by R. I can simplify this formula and I can write another formula. So uh, people will use different formulas for this and uh, the same formula, uh, it reflects the same formula actually. Okay. So present value of annuity is equal to periodic payment into 1 minus 1 plus R whole to the power of minus N whole divided by R. Let me apply this formula here. For my example, the periodic payment is 100. 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of minus 3 divided by 0 0.10. Now, 100 into 1 minus 1. I mean, the, I can write this number as 1 by 1.1 1 .1 whole to the power of 3 divided by 0 0.10. So, sim try to simplify this factor like this 1 minus 1 by 1.1 1 .1 whole to the power of 3 you, you know how to calculate that yes 0 0.7513 divided by 0 0.10 yes 1 minus 0 0.7513 divided by 0 0.10 and the factor is 2.487 and this 2.487 is simply known as PVAF present value of finity factor so 100 into 2.487, I got 248.7. So successfully, I've converted multiple future equal values into present value, which is known as present value of annuity, and I got 248.7. So annuity is a concept of series of equal payments. If you convert such series of equal payments into future, that is future value of annuity, the formula is periodic payment into 1 plus R whole to the power of N minus 1 whole divided by R and if you convert such series of equal payments into present value then that is known as present value of annuity. The formula is periodic payment into 1 minus 1 plus R whole to the power of minus N whole divided by R. Okay. See these two formulas are applicable only when the future values are equal. In case if the future values are unequal you should do these computations independently instead of applying this simplified mathematical formula. That's what I need to say. Okay. Remember that See, for several situations, we'll apply several formulas. Okay. So, look at the formulas here. Annuity A. Yes, we have used periodic payment. And also, I can use annuity. 1 plus R whole to the power of N minus 1 divided by R. And they have simplified the formula again. And for present value of annuity, they've used the formula like this. Periodic payment into 1 minus 1 by 1 plus R whole to the power of N whole divided by R. They have just simplified the formula. Instead of writing 1 plus R whole to the power of minus N, they have written the formula like this 1 by 1 plus R whole to the power of N. Okay. So instead of that, I, you can use my formula. Yes. With this, we understood the concept of present value of annuity and present value of future value of annuity and present value of annuity. Okay. And they use one word called ordinary annuity. See, my dear students, ordinary annuity means such periodic payments must be made at the end of the period, at the end of each year. Only when the payments are made at the end of each year, I can apply this formula. Otherwise, I cannot apply this formula. I have to apply another formula. And that is not covered in your material. Okay, then at the end of the session, I'll, I'll give you such formulas also. Now, let us go for the next concept called present value of perpetuity present value of perpetuity sir what is this present value of perpetuity perpetuity is also about series of equal payments but that is for perpetual period indefinite period it is also kind of annuity but not for definite period but for indefinite period if i use the word indefinite period immediately the term that comes into picture is perpetuity so what is this present value of perpetuity now dear students if you see say for example i am going to get i am going to get if i am going to get first second third fourth up to indefinite period every year i am getting 1000 rupees every year i am getting 1000 rupees cash inflow for how many years sir indefinite period and I want to convert these indefinite period future equal numbers future equal cash flows into present value I'm not trying to convert definite period say 10 years or 15 years future equal values into present value then that is known as annuity concept but here I'm trying to convert equal future indefinite period numbers okay equal future numbers for indefinite period that's why we are using the word perpetuity 
and if you are converting these perpetual numbers into present value then that is known as present value of perpetuity you know my dear students again the beauty of mathematics comes into picture actually see for this perpetual perpetual period cash flow discounting i am going to use one simple formula called the beauty of mathematics it simplifies every formula the formula is c by r see for complicated expressions they'll define simplified formulas okay this is a complicated expression actually but for that they have simply given one simple formula called present value of perpetuity the formula is c by r what is this c sir c means cash inflow r means discount rate the c is equal to cash inflows per period generally here for every year r is equal to discount rate r is equal to discount rate now let us take the discount rate as usual 10% because that's a round figure for the sake of understanding i'm taking this present value of perpetuity i'm trying to convert perpetual cash inflows of 1000 rupees into present value so c is 1000 divided by r is 10% so if i discount indefinite period 1000 rupees cash flows that occurs at the end of each year at 10% so simply it is 1000 by 10% i got 10000 rupees this is my present value of perpetuity so the present value of perpetuity here is 1000 rupees sorry 10000 rupees okay now we understood the concept of present value of perpetuity what is the formula c by r where c is equal to cash inflows per period r is equal to discount rate that's it now look at the formula here perpetuity present value of perpetuity cash inflows divided by interest rate interest rate instead of interest rate you better use the term r rate of return okay that's what the concept of perpetuity perpetuity is an annuity that occurs for indefinite period if it occurs for indefinite period then that is not annuity that becomes perpetuity okay yes we have another formula which is not given in the study material that i'll give you present value of growing perpetuity sir what is this present value of growing perpetuity see my dear students if the future cash flows occurs for indefinite period but such cash flows are not equal cash flows growing cash flows that follows constant growth rate say for example i got 100 rupees at the end of first year and at the end of second year a growth rate of 10% is added to your cash flow of 100 rupees and i am going to get 110 rupees at the end of second year and again 121 apply 10% again growth rate growth rate it will be 121 and then for fourth year i am going to get 133.1 like that for indefinite period i am getting these cash flows and have you observed one thing these cash flows are following one constant growth rate of 10% so when the cash flows are occurring for indefinite period by following a constant growth rate and if you want to convert such growing cash flows future growing cash flows into present value by using one of the discount rate which is available to you say for example in this context i'm going to take another discount rate r is equal to 15% if you want to convert this growing cash flows future growing cash flows that occurs for indefinite period into present value then that is known as present value of growing perpetuity so what is the formula for present value of growing perpetuity present value of growing perpetuity is equal to the formula is c1 by r minus z c1 by r minus z where c1 is equal to cash inflows at the end of year 1 or period 1 okay and then r is equal to discount rate discount rate g is equal to growth rate g is equal to growth rate let us apply the formula for the above example present value of growing perpetuity is equal to present value of growing perpetuity is equal to c1 your cash inflow at the end of first year is 100 rupees divided by r is 15% g is 
and let me apply the formula 100 by 5 percent and I got 2000 rupees. This is your present value of growing perpetuity. So what is the difference between perpetuity and growing perpetuity? Under perpetuity, the future cash flows, the indefinite period cash flows are always equal. Whereas under growing perpetuity, the future growing, the future cash flows are not constant. Those are growing cash flows following constant growth rate. That's what you need to remember. If the growth rate is fluctuating from one year to another year, you cannot apply this formula. This formula is applicable only when the growth rate is constant from first year ending to indefinite period. That's what you need to remember forever. Okay. Now, present value of growing perpetuity is equal to C1 by R minus C. Yes, we have one formula which is pending under this chapter. Time value of money. See, the formula is compounded annual growth rate. Okay. Compounded annual growth rate. So, what is this? What is the formula for compounded annual growth rate? Compounded annual growth rate CAGR. Compounded annual growth rate means C. Generally, I've invested some money in one of the land and which were ten lakh rupees today. And I left it and after five years by seeing the market value of this land I found that the value of this land after five years is 25 lakh rupees. So my investment value has been appreciated to 25 lakh rupees after five years. That means there is an appreciation here. There is a growth to my investment here. Such growth should be calculated on compounded basis. So every year, how much values has been appreciated? That's what I need to calculate. Compounded annual growth rate means for every year on compounding basis, how my value of the land has been appreciated. That's what I need to calculate. Like this, for land for land and for my investment, like say for example, have I invested my money in the one of the company's shares? And the share price has been increased and the, there is a growth applicable to my share price also and on compounding basis i have to calculate such growth rate compounded annual growth rate for several investments for equity shares investments on for land investments or for business investments for several category of investments since the value of investments are appreciating over a period of time say for example say for five years or for over a period of 10 years the investment values will be increased and on annual basis how the value has been appreciated and on a compounding basis i have to calculate such rate and that that rate is simply known as compounded annual growth rate so that means i have to calculate the growth rate of your investment the growth rate of your investment on annual basis by using the concept of compounding okay compounded annual growth rate for calculating compounded annual growth rate, we have one formula. We have one formula. Let me apply that formula. CAGR is equal to EV divided by BV whole to the power of 1 by N minus 1. This is a formula. What is the formula? EV divided by BV whole to the power of 1 by N minus 1. You can see here they have used one word called U actually. So what is this U? U means 1 by N actually. 1 by N, Nth root. Nth root is applicable here. Okay. So what is this EV? EV means ending value of the investment. BV means beginning value of the investment. So at the beginning of the period, I should know the investment value and I, at the end of the period, I should know the end, value of the investment at the end of the period. N means number of years for which your investment is made. Number of years of investment. Okay. This is a formula for compounded annual growth rate. So what is the formula for compounded annual growth rate? 
e ending value of the investment divided by beginning value of the investment whole to the power of 1 by n minus 1 okay see my dear students actually i can say like this nth root of ev by bv minus 1 the question is how to calculate this nth root sir see say for example let us take ending value of my investment is in our discussion it is 25 lakhs fifth root 25 lakhs divided by I have invested 10 lakh money. That's what the example we have taken. 5 years period. Minus 1. 25 by 10 means 2.5. Fifth root of 2.5 minus 1. Sir, how to calculate this 2.5? Fifth root of 2.5. We have one method for calculating this. Nth root formula. Step number 1. For the number which is in the nth root, you should apply square root for 15 times. Step 2. Step 1 minus 1. Step 3. Step 2. Divide by n plus 1. Step 4. Into is equal to, into is equal to for 15 times. If you can apply this process you can get nth root of any number square root of 15 times see for 2.5 apply square root 15 times 2.5 type 2.5 on the on your calculator apply square root for 15 times 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 minus 1 is equal to divided by n n means number of years here it is 5 years divided by 5 plus 1 is equal to into is equal to 1 into is equal to 2 like that for 15 times 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 I got 1.2011 1.2011 minus 1 into 100 I got 20.11 percentage this is my compounded annual growth rate for my investment value of 10 lakh rupees like that you have to calculate nth root of any number by using this process okay with this the concept compounded annual growth rate is completed dear students okay see and with this we understood all the concepts of time value of money the first concept present value i mean future value the second concept present value and under those concepts we have covered multiple cash flows compounding of frequency for one year once in a year more than once in a year discounting once in a year more than once in a year and also we have covered the concepts called Converting multiple unequal, uneven values into future. Converting multiple une, unequal values into present. And the, those are the concepts we have covered. Along with that, we have also covered the future value. As the future value of annuity and present value of annuity. And finally, we have covered present value of perpetuity, present value of growing perpetuity. So the, and the last concept is compounded annual growth rate. With this, we have covered all the concepts in the chapter time value of money. So... We need to cover few problems related to this concept so that we can complete this chapter. Okay, I'll take one or two sums, one or two sums just for the sake of practice. Uh, you, you need to solve all the problems, but for as uh, this is a fast track session, I'll try to cover two, one, uh, two to three problems at least. Okay, right, fine. Good evening, dear students. The previous session we understood all the formulas related to time value of money now let us apply such formulas to few problems i'll take few problems only out of many problems just to understand the concept okay now look at illustration number one here 
if a person invests 150000 rupees in an investment which pays 12% rate of interest what will be the future value of the invested amount at the end of 10th year so after 10 years what is the value of 150000 rupees that you are investing today interest rate is 12% rate of interest here okay now let us apply the formula the formula called future value future value is equal to present value into 1 plus r whole to the power of n so you are investing 150000 into 1 plus r interest rate is 12% whole to the power of how many years now look at the question number of years or 10 years okay power 10 yes now just calculate this then you will get future value 1.12 into is equal to I got second year factor third year fourth year fifth year sixth year seventh year eighth year ninth year tenth year so dear students I got one point sorry three point one zero five eight this is a factor I got now you just try to get it 1 plus 0 0.12 is equal to you'll get 1.12 again multi again apply like this into is equal to then you'll get second year factor again type is equal to then you'll get 1.404928 like that this is your third year factor so you have to do like this 1.12 is equal to is equal to i got third year factor fourth year again fifth year sixth year seventh year eighth year ninth year tenth year so successfully i got 3.1058 this is my factor 3.1058 into 1,50,000 so the answer is 4,65,877 465,877 this is my future value so this is regarding problem number one dear students now look at the next problem illustration number five Find the present value of 1000 rupees receivable 6 years hence, that means after 6 years, if the rate of discount is 10%. Discount rate is 10%, the life is 6 years, that means after 6 years, I am receiving 1000 rupees and I want to know the present value of such 1000 rupees today. Okay, so the formula, here I should apply the formula called present value. Present value is equal to, what is the formula? future value into 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n so my future value is 1000 rupees and at the end of 6 year i am getting and the discount rate is 10% 1000 rupees into 1 by 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of 6 yes after 6 years i am getting it so now how to calculate this factor that's the question 1000 rupees into See, this is your present value factor actually at the end of 6th year at 10% discount rate. Now, let us apply this formula here. Let me calculate this factor 1 by 1.1 is equal to. You must get 0 0.9090. This is your first year ending present value factor. If you press is equal to again, you will get second year ending factor 0 0.8264. Third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year. I got 0 0.56 double four this is my factor okay so now multiply this number with thousand rupees and the value is 564 rupees okay so just like that you have to apply present value formula i can convert any future value into present value okay right with this the application of present value is over now let me go for the next concept future value of identity look at illustration number 10 Ascertain the future value and compound interest of an amount of 75,000 rupees at 8% compounded semi-annually for 5 years. See, this is not related to future value of NAD. So, just go for the next question. The future value of NAD is illustration number 9 actually. So, illustration number 9. A person is required to pay annual payments of 8,000 rupees in his deposit account that pays 10% interest per year. So a person is making annual equal annual payments of 8000 rupees in his deposit account and that is paying 10% interest per year and we need to calculate what find out the future value of annuity at the end of 5 years. I have given you one formula related to future value of annuity you just need to apply such formula simply you will get the answer okay. Problem number yes here is a question illustration number 9 hit us.
what is the formula for future value of n t future value of n t is equal to i have given you the formula periodic payment into 1 plus r whole to the power of n minus 1 divided by r here is a formula now how much payment i am making annually 8000 rupees this is my periodic payment and interest rate is 10% per year and the term term is 5 years okay 8000 10% 5 years Eight thousand as my periodic payment. Interest rate is ten percent, one plus zero point one zero. Hold to the power of it is five years term, right? Yes, it is five years. Power five minus one divided by zero point one zero. Just apply this. Eight thousand into. You need to calculate this factor, which is known as future value of annuity factor. Okay, this is future value of annuity factor. Let me calculate it. One point one. Second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, one point six one zero five one minus one divided by zero point one zero minus one divided by zero point one zero, and I got six point one zero five one. This is my present value of annuity factor. Let me confirm it again. One point one, one two three four five minus one divided by zero point one zero. I got seven. Sorry. 1.1. This is first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. Minus one divided by 0.10. I got 6.1051 into 8,000 rupees. Just apply it. You'll get 448,840. This is my future value of annuity. So what is the formula for future value of annuity? Periodic payment into one plus r whole to the power of n minus one whole divided by r. So With this, we understood the application of future value of annuity. Now, look at eleventh problem. This is related to present value of perpetuity. An investor expects a perpetual sum of five thousand rupees annually from his investment. So, I am getting a cash inflow of five thousand rupees annually for how many years? For perpetual years. What is the present value of the perpetuity if the interest rate is ten percent? Now, dear students, this ten percent is your discount rate. This is your discount rate, and you know that. What is the formula for present value of perpetuity? C by R. Present value of perpetuity is equal to C by R. That's a simple formula. Present value of perpetuity is equal to cash inflows divided by R. R means discount rate. In this context, my cash inflow is five thousand rupees annually. I'm getting for perpetual years. And the discount rate is ten percent. Simply substitute the numbers five thousand by ten percent. The value is five thousand divided by ten percent. I got fifty thousand rupees. This is my present value of perpetuity. That's it. Now we have one more application in this chapter: time value of money. That is simply present value of annuity. I'll show you one problem related to present value of annuity. Here is the Problem illustration number four. Look at the question. The ABC Limited company expects to receive one lakh rupees for a period of ten years from a new project it has just undertaken. Okay, fine. The company is getting one lakh rupees cash inflow for ten years period. It, uh, I mean, from the new project which has it has just undertaken. Assuming the rate of discount is rate of interest is ten percent, and I can consider this ten percent as my as a discount rate. How much would be the present value of this annuity? See what is The question is about present value of annuity. My dear students, present value of annuity means I must get series of equal payments here. You know, here I am getting series of equal payments of one lakh rupees from the one of the project for how many years? Ten years. So this is a clear case of present value of annuity because I am getting series of equal cash flows here. Okay. Now, what is the formula for present value of annuity? That's the question here. Present value of annuity is equal to. Periodic payment into one minus one plus r whole to the power of minus n whole divided by r, and this is known as present value of annuity factor. Now apply this present value of annuity factor. You know I am getting one lakh rupees cash inflows every year from the project, which is known as periodic payment or amount, or I can say amount. And now I should identify the discount rate and all. Ten percent is the discount rate. Term is ten years. Okay. 
10 percent is a discount right 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.10 whole to the power of minus 10 term is 10 years if I am not wrong let me confirm it again here is the term 10 years okay both are 10 percent 10 percent 10 years now calculate this factor present value of identity factor 1 minus I can rewrite this number as 1 by 1.1 1 .1 whole to the power of 10 plus 10 whole divided by 0 0.10 just try to simplify the formula 1 lakh into 1 minus I'll get 1 by 1.1 1 .1 is equal to this is first year factor 0 0.9090 second year third year fourth year fifth year sixth year seventh year eighth year ninth year tenth year the tenth year factor is 0.3855 i am just taking four decimals only divided by 0 0.10 that's okay you can take four decimals to get the answer that's not an issue don't bother about it you don't need to take all decimals every time because that's a time consuming factor okay 0 0.3855 1 minus 0 0.3855 divided by 0 0.10 I got 6.145 multiply this factor with 10 1 lakh rupees and I got 6 lakh 14,500 this is my present value of finity simple so try to calculate this present value of finity factor every time and multiply that number with your series of equal cash flows nothing but single cash flow so that you get present value of annuity okay with this we understood all the concepts of time value of money and with this we, we have completed the chapter time value of money now we can enter into the new area called risk and return okay right okay dear students now our new chapter risk and return okay See in simple terms what is the meaning of the term return and what is the meaning of the term risk. See you know the chapter name is risk and return. In simple terms return means for every investment for every investment one has to get return and he should face risk also so what is the return it is a principal reward simply since you are investing some amount of money and for such investment you will expect some reward such reward can be in the form of income or it can be in the form of gain or both so for every investment the investor should get a reward and that reward can be in the form of income and in the form of gain or in the form of both income and gain this is what the principal reward from every investment which is simply known as return so return is nothing but it's a principal reward for the investor for his investment which is in the form of income and gain since he is getting some income there is a scope for variability from the expected return such variability is simply known as risk so risk means variability the deviation from our expectation this is what the simple way of understanding what it exactly means so return is a principal reward for our investment risk is the variability of the expected return okay then fine now just go for the theory here you know return and risk are the two critical factors in investment decisions they are closely linked if high risk is involved the risk required return on the project should also be high if the risk is high the return will be high if the risk is low the return will be low that's a regular sentence and in fact it is one of the core objective of the subject financial management risk return trade-off so the level of risk is measured first and then the level of return generally okay fine so let let us understand the term return first of all what is a return it's a principal reward principal reward means the investor that is getting from the investment so what he is getting 
a periodic cash receipts and or income on the investment either in the form of interest or dividend so the first form of uh, income is interest or dividend and the second component in the principal reward is change in the price of the asset so the price of the asset will be changed and that results in either capital gain or capital loss so these two components decides the return for the investment so which is com this particular change in the price of the asset is commonly known as capital gain or loss so my dear students just now we understood for every investment there will be a principal reward which is known as return and that return is in the form of two components one is income one is income it can be expressed as interest or it can be expressed as dividend for most of the investments and then the second one is the price change over the period the price change over the time horizon or period and this price change results in either capital gain or capital loss capital gain or capital loss yes now dear students this return can be a realized return that means the past return the return that we have earned in the past or expected return that means the return that i am expecting in the future it is purely probability based uh, calculation expected return so the, your return is classified into two parts the past return and future return past return means realized return future return means expected return okay now dear students technically we can consider this past and future returns as ex ante return and ex post return ex ante return is an expected return export ex post return is a realized return or a re, or a means realized return in the uh, uh, which is earned in the past so ex ante return is an expected return that i can earn in the future ex post return is a realized return that i have already earned in the past okay okay then now we understood the basic meaning of the term return now let us calculate the rate of return how i can calculate this return yes you can see here we have a formula here total return this it's a general formula applicable to every investment so what is the formula cash payments received plus price change over the period divided by purchase price of the asset this is a formula for total return from any investment so what is the formula the cash payments that i am receiving annually or periodically the periodic cash payment that i am receiving in the form of interest or in the form of dividend or in the form of any other income plus the price change over the period for that particular investment or asset divided by the purchase price of the asset purchase price of the asset is nothing but investment our investment value this is a basic formula for calculating total return of any investment yes okay yes thank you now dear students in most of the cases i'll try to calculate rate of return for a company share because that is very important for us now let us understand how to calculate rate of return for a company share because that is also one of the investment if i put some amount of money in one of the company shares that is my investment and from such investment periodically i want to calculate return generally annually we are going to calculate rate of return from our investment so what is the formula for rate of return the formula for rate of return from equity shares is d1 plus p1 minus p0 divided by d1 plus p1 minus p0 divided by p0 into 100 this is a formula so what is d1 and what is this p1 minus p0 first of all d1 means expected dividend per share at the end of year 1 p1 means first let me write p0 p0 means current market price per share let us say market price per share at the beginning of the year and p1 means market price per share at the end of first year
at the end of year one. So this is a formula for calculating rate of return from one of the company share. Okay. Let us take one example to understand this. I'm taking one year holding period of one of the company share. And at the beginning of the year, I purchased a particular company share at 100 rupees. This is considered as P0. And after one year, the price has been increased to 110. This is P1. And at the end of the first year, I got a dividend of 5 rupees. Now, have you observed one thing? This is my investment, 100 rupees. And for this investment, I'm getting some rewards here. So what are the rewards? I'm receiving dividend, cash dividend. And at the end of the first year, my share price has been increased to 110. This is the price change over the period of one year. 100 rupees to 110 rupees means I got an increase of, I mean, I got some extra amount of 10 rupees in the form of price appreciation. And this is also one of the gain or income to me and which is known as what? Capital gain, capital gain actually. This is my extra income or I can say extra gain. Okay. So if you can apply the above formula for this so that you can calculate rate of return. So what is the rate of return here? D1, the cash payment that I'm receiving, the cash income that I'm receiving, 5 rupees. And the price change over the period of one year, 100 rupees to 110 rupees. P1, 110 minus P0, 100. This is the capital gain divided by 100 rupees is my investment. So 5 rupees is cash dividend and 110 minus 100 is 10 rupees is capital gain. This is my investment. These are the two rewards here for my investment of 100 rupees. So 5 plus 10 divided by 100 rupees that gives me the rate of return 15 by 100 and I'll get 15 percent. Yes, you don't need to calculate it. You can write it directly. Rate of return is 15 percent. Now, so what is the formula for rate of return from one of the company shares? D1 plus P1 minus P0 whole divided by P0 into 100. What is D1? Expected dividend per share at the end of year 1. Sometimes if the dividend is given for the last year, the last paid dividend or uh, just paid dividend, then you should add growth to your dividend. Okay, generally if the growth rate is given, you should add growth to your dividend to get dividend at the end of first year. Most of the cases they'll give you first year ending dividend only for calculating rate of return in this particular chapter. And P0 means today's market price per share, which is known as current market price per share. P1 means market price per share at the end of first year. So if you can substitute all these numbers in the above formula, you will get rate of return from one of the company share. This is one year holding period return. This is one year holding period return. Remember that. Okay. So now we understood how to calculate rate of return. That's what they've given here. Dividend plus capital gain divided by initial investment. You can apply simply D1 plus P1 minus P0 whole divided by P0 into 100. Yes. Now, dear students, this is one year return, but I need past few years return. If I can take past few years returns, then that is known as average annual return. Let us say I'm taking past 10 years returns for estimating the return for the next year. So just to know the return, just to, ex just to calculate the expected return for the next year, I need to take the past few years data because the trend will be continued in the future. So for that, I am going to calculate average rate of return by taking past few years returns. See this past few years returns, by taking these past few years returns, I can calculate average rate of return either by using arithmetic mean, that means simple average, or by using geometric mean, that means compounded average rate of return. See. In most of the cases, the first one is uh, as a regular application, arithmetic mean. Uh, in very in very rare cases, I'm going to apply this geometric mean. In every problem, we are we always try to apply the first formula, arithmetic mean. Okay, arithmetic mean means what? Say for example, if I'm taking past 10 years returns, I'll simply sum up all those 10 years returns divided by 10 years. That gives me what? Simple average return, which is known as arithmetic mean. So you know that the total of all returns divided by number of years that gives me simple average so average annual return means what the average of past few years returns that can be calculated by using arithmetic mean simple average or by using geometric mean compounded average rate okay this is what average rate of return average annual rate of return now the second one is expected rate of return so you can calculate average annual rate of return from the past few years and that return can be expected in the future or else you can calculate expected rate of return by applying the probabilities. 
see i can estimate the market conditions and based on market conditions i can get different rates of returns which market condition prevails in the future i, I cannot decide so that i i am going to assign probabilities to the respect to market conditions or economic conditions accordingly i am going to calculate expected return from the one of the company share or one of your investment so what is the formula for expected rate of return it's a simple one simply multiply the probabilities with the respective returns say for example say for example i am going to get 20% return with a probability of 50% chance 0.50 or i may get 30% return with a probability of 30% or i may get 50% return with a probability of 0.20 20% chance so which return you are going to get i am not sure there is a 50% chance of occurrence to get a return of 20% there is a 30% chance of occurrence to get 30% rate of return and there is a 20% chance of occurrence to get 50% rate of return which one i am going to get i am not sure so here i am going to take the expected return simply multiply the returns with the probabilities to get what the expected return so 20 into 0.5 return into probability 20 into 0 0.5 so that you'll get 10 13 into 0 0.3 12 15 to 0 0.2 10 13 to 0 0.3 this is 9 yes so how much it is 29 percent this is my expected return so they have given you one formula just look at that r1 into expected return here is equal to r1 into p1 r1 means return first probable return into the first probability r2 into p2 that means the second return into second probability r3 into p3 third return into prob uh, third probability r4 into P4, fourth written into fourth probability, like that Rn into Pn, nth written into nth probability. So simply if you sum up all these numbers, you'll get expected return. So what is the formula for expected return by applying the probabilities R1 into P1 plus R2 into P2 plus R3 into P3 plus R4 into P4 plus and so on Rn into Pn. It's a simple mathematical formula. Instead of that, if you can define the table, write the returns, write the probabilities, multiply the returns with the probabilities, and that is the last column, the sum will be your expected return. It's a simple way to calculate expected return instead of uh, remembering this particular formula. Okay. Here is the example for calculating expected return. You see, they have taken four economic conditions, growth, expansion, stagnation, and then decline. For all these four economic conditions, the probable returns are given here. I may get 18% under growth situation, under expansion 11%, stagnation 1%, decline condition, uh, economic condition, I am going to get a negative return of minus 5%. And with their respective probabilities, see, for, there is an equal chance of occurrence for every economic condition. That's okay. Multiply the returns with the probabilities so that I'll get expected return. 2 into 3, they have taken like here. Okay, 2 into 3 means return in rate of return into probability. If you multiply these two numbers, you must get these numbers. The total will be what the expected rate of return. So we understood how to calculate the average rate of return and expected rate of return. Average rate of return means it is the average of past few years returns. Sum up all the past few years returns and then divide by number of years. That gives a simple average, which is nothing but arithmetic mean. And in that way, I can calculate average rate of return. And coming to expected rate of return, apply the probabilities, multiply probabilities with the rate of return to get expected rate of return. So we understood, with this we understood, average rate of return and expected rate of return. Now let us go for the next area called expected return on portfolio. Sir, what is the meaning of the term portfolio? That's what you need to understand first of all. This is a new term for you because we don't have any chapters related to portfolio. We have a chapter called portfolio management at CMA final level that I am going to cover at final level. But here they have given you one formula related to this portfolio that means for calculating expected return from the portfolio. First of all, let us understand what is the meaning of this term portfolio. Portfolio means in simple terms, group of securities, a group of assets. If a person is holding one company shares, then he is holding an investment. 
If a person is holding more than one company shares, more than one type of investment, then he is said to be having a portfolio. So in simple terms, portfolio means it's a group of securities or group of assets. Don't think that every asset will give you same rate of return. Different assets will give you different rates of return. Say for example, in my portfolio, I'm holding three securities or three investments. Investment number one, investment number two, investment number three. From every investment, I'm getting different returns. Say for example, from investment number one, I'm getting 20% return. From investment number two, I'm getting 30% return. And from investment number three, I'm getting 25% rate of return. Now my question is, for my whole portfolio, that means for my whole amount of investment, in all these investments, what is my average rate of return? That's what I want to calculate. In such a case, I, can, I cannot simply take the av simple average of all these three returns. I should assign weights here, not probabilities, it is weights. That means, what are the proportions of investments in each of these uh, given investments? How much proportion of money have been invested in investment 1 and investment 2 and investment 3? You need to take the data, multiply such proportions with these returns. Say for example, I have invested 1 lakh rupees totally. Out of this 1 lakh, I have invested 30,000 in investment 1 and 20,000 in investment 2 and 50,000 in investment 3. So have you observed one thing here? Out of 1 lakh, 30,000 investment 1, 20,000 investment 2, 50,000 investment 3. So if you take the uh, weights here, out of 1 lakh, 30,000 means it is 30%. That means 0 0.3 actually. The weight is 0 0.3. I can take 0 0.3 weight. This is my weight. And from 1 lakh rupees, I have invested 20,000 in investment 2. So the weight is 0 0.2, 20,000 by 1 lakh. And here it is, in investment 3, I have invested 50,000 rupees, that means 0 0.5. So instead of taking simple average, multiply these weights with the respective returns and sum up these numbers, the total will be the expected return from the portfolio, ERP. The expected return from the portfolio or return from the portfolio. Okay, so how to calculate return from the portfolio? Identify the proportion of investment in each of the securities or each of the investment. Such proportions are also known as weights. Multiply such proportions or weights with the respective investment return and sum up all the numbers. That means the proportion into return the column should be added. That means that you should get the total of all these numbers. The total will be your return from the portfolio or expected return from the portfolio. So they have given you one formula here by taking two securities into the portfolio. Say for example, if you have two securities in the portfolio, they've given you one formula. I'm not taking this formula. Let me take my own formula for calculating expected return from the portfolio. You know, the expected return from the portfolio, if your portfolio consists of two securities, WA into ERA plus WB into ERB. WA means the proportion of investment in security A. ERA means expected return from security A. WB means proportion of investment in security B. ERB means expected return from <coughs> security B. This is a simple way of understanding. Expected return from the portfolio when your sec portfolio comprises of two securities. If your portfolio consists of more than two securities, then they have given you one formula. Simple, the weights will be increased and the returns will be increased. Simple. That's what the next formula actually. Yes, here is a formula. Expected return from the portfolio when the portfolio consists of more than one security. Summation of WN ERN. That means I can simply write WA into expected return on A 
plus wb into expected return on b plus wc into expected return on c like that it goes on okay if your portfolio consists of 100 securities then you'll get 100 terms sum up all those returns by multiplying the respective weights then you'll get expected return from the portfolio it's a simple way of understanding multiply the weights with the returns plus weights into returns weight into return weight into return like that if you apply for all the securities the sum will be expected return from the portfolio it can be calculated in the tabular form also tabular form also you can calculate so, so let us apply the formula from the above for the above example calculation of expected return from the portfolio the columns will be return i mean security proportion of investment nothing but weight proportion or weight return nothing but expected return proportion into return or expected return okay what are the securities we have taken three investments if i am not wrong investment one two three security one two three so what are the proportions we have calculated 0 0.3 0 0.2 0 0.5 multiply the proportions with the returns okay 20 30 25 so 0.3 into 20 6 0.2 into 30 6 0.5 into 25 12.5 24.5 this is my expected return from the portfolio above portfolio the portfolio which comprises of three securities okay like this li like that in tabular form also i can calculate expected return from the portfolio if you don't like this you can apply the formula simply weights into returns plus weights into returns like that if you can apply you can get ex expected return from the portfolio okay yes hi dear students good evening all of you in the last session, we understood the term return under the chapter risk and return. Now we are entering into the next area called risk. What is the exact meaning of the term risk? Risk means deviation from expectation. In our context, deviation from our expected return from one of the company shares. Say for example, I am expecting a return of 20% from X limited share. Are you 100% sure that you are going to earn this 20% return? No. My actual return may deviate from this expected return. So whatever the deviation that you are expecting from your expected return is nothing but risk. Say for example, either I will get some extra 10% return. That means my actual return can be 30% or the actual return can be reduced by 10% return. That means my actual return can be 10% after deducting 10% reduction that means my actual return can be 10% more or 10% less from my expected return this could be the possibility of deviation from my expected return of 20% see what are the deviation you are talking about such deviation of 10% either in upward trend or in downward trend is nothing but risk so this is a simple way of understanding so when you are expecting some return from one of the company share or from one of the investment if there is a scope for deviation from your expected return, such deviation is simply known as risk. Now, this is a simple way of understanding. Now, this risk is analyzed into different terms actually. Look at this chart. The risk is, or, or class, the risk is simply classified into two parts, systematic risk and unsystematic risk. Sir, what is the meaning of the term systematic risk and unsystematic risk? See, if you can manage a portion of risk then that is known as unsystematic which is firm specific if you cannot manage a portion of risk then that is known as systematic risk that means you cannot eliminate this portion of risk systematic risk is being influenced by ex external factors that one cannot manage but everybody every investor can manage unsystematic risk because this is firm specific so now under systematic risk 
the external factors that could affect your investment return uh, or market risk this is first risk market risk so when there is a deviation from x market risk i mean when there is a deviation from the return of market then automatically your security return will deviate second one is interest rate risk see interest rate risk means when there are fluctuations in the interest rate in the market then there is a scope for deviation from your expected return purchasing power risk nothing but inflation risk if the inflation is changing then automatically that affects your expect actual return so these are the three risks systematic risks are nothing but the risk which causes because of external factors like market risk which is generally it, it is going to influence every company in the world or every company in india and then interest rate risk nothing but the fluctuations in the interest rate and the third one is purchasing power risk nothing but inflation risk so these are the external factors that nobody can eliminate this portion of risk that's why systematic risk is also known as non diversifiable risk that means which is unavoidable okay then the second part is unsystematic risk so what is this unsystematic risk what is this unsystematic risk the unsystematic risk is nothing but firm specific risk business risk see the nature uh, this risk is purely dependent on the nature of the project that you are handling financial risk financial risk means the risk which arises because of debt financing this is purely based on your capital structure decisions default risk this risk is purely related to bankruptcy and insolvency risks that means when you are not able to meet your obligations like repayment of debt and uh, repayment of prin uh, principal related to preference share capital or uh, any payments uh, any payments related to current liabilities if you are not able to meet your long term and short term obligations then that so whatever the cost that you are incurring related to bankruptcy and insolvency then such risk is simply known as default risk see this is all descriptive part so if you ask me regarding the problematic part so we should understand important terms nothing but application of statistics okay so now i am going to measure the risk see just now we understood the term risk risk means deviation from expectation such deviation can be measured with a statistical measure called standard deviation so i can say standard deviation is a measure of risk which is denoted with sigma standard deviation is a measure of risk we have a formula for the standard deviation standard deviation sigma is equal to square root of summation probability into x minus x bar whole square this is what the formula for standard deviation so what is the exact formula for standard deviation standard deviation is equal to square root of summation probability into x minus x bar whole square so where p is equal to probability where p is equal to probability x is equal to the return for different probability distributions x bar is nothing but mean return nothing but this is the average return so by using this formula i can calculate standard deviation so what is the formula for standard deviation just remember the formula when we are applying this formula to the problem you can understand how you can use this formula so standard deviation sigma is equal to square root of summation probability into x minus x bar whole square p is probability x is return x bar is mean return yes okay now we have another formula called variance see sir what is the meaning of the term variance variance is nothing but standard deviation square variance is equal to sd square or i can say sigma square okay this is nothing but sigma square standard deviation square this is what variance so you just remember the formula that's it nothing new okay so standard deviation is equal to square root of summation probability into x minus x bar whole square variance is equal to standard deviation square okay 
yes we have one more formula called coefficient of variation coefficient of variation this is a relative measure this is nothing but standard deviation divided by expected return this is a formula for coefficient of variation so what is the formula for coefficient of variation standard deviation sigma divided by expected return see the standard deviation represents risk say for example if we get an answer of 10% standard deviation so just now we understood expected return is 20% now just now i got standard deviation of the security is written is 10% so what is this 10% simple there is a deviation of 10% from my expected return either in upward direction or in downward trend so either it could be upward potential or downward risk so what exactly it means actual return is equal to expected return plus 10% or actual return is equal to expected return minus 10% under adverse conditions your return will be reduced by 10% under favorable conditions your return can be increased by 10% so the point is very clear the standard deviation can be in upward trend or in downward trend from your expected return this need not be in downward trend only risk doesn't mean that you are always getting negative factor risk means either you can get abnormal positive return or you are you are going to face abnormal loss okay from your expected return that's what the standard deviation so what is the meaning of the term standard deviation deviation from my expectation so if i got 10% standard deviation then there is a scope for 10% deviation from my expected return either in upward direction or in downward trend okay now what is the next term coefficient of variation standard deviation is an absolute measure whereas coefficient of variation is a relative measure so what it means this is also one of the measure of risk but in a different uh, situation you are going to apply this formula St standard deviation if the standard deviation is 20% and my expect sorry just now we understood if the standard deviation is 10% with an expected return of 20% so it results in 10 by 20 10 by 20 means 0.5 so what is the meaning of the term uh, what is the meaning of this number 0 0.5 0 0.5 by 1 that means for every 1% of expected return there is a scope for deviation of 0.5% so in simple words coefficient of variation standard deviation both are same but coefficient of variation measures risk per unit of return so for every 1 unit of return what is the scope for deviation from our one unit of return from one unit of return how much uh, how much return can be deviated that's what coefficient of variation here for every one percent of expected return for every one percent of expected return my uh, return can be deviated by 0.5 percent so in simple terms coefficient of variation means risk per unit of return this is a simple way of understanding so what is the formula for standard deviation square root of summation probability into x minus x bar whole square and I need to explain this up application of the standard deviation to the problem and P is probability X is written X bar is mean written whereas coefficient of variation is standard deviation divided by expected return yes now what is the next formula I need to understand one important formula called beta the term beta see this beta is dependent on two important factors the standard deviation of security and market and the correlation between security and market Standard deviation of security and market means sigma s and sigma m. 
Correlation between security and market means R of SM. Don't bother about these new terms. And if you can apply the formula, you can easily get the answer. Okay. So that's not an issue actually. Just remember these terms. That's it. Okay. Beta is dependent on two important factors called sigma s and sigma m. That means standard deviation of security and market portfolio. And the second term is the correlation between security and market. So we have some formulas related to beta. First of all. So what is the exact meaning of the term beta? You know, beta measures the sensitivity relationship between security return and market return. If the market deviates by 1%, how much percentage of return of the security can be deviated? So that relationship can be established with the term beta. And for such beta, I'm trying to give you one formula. And such formula is dependent on these factors, standard deviation of the security and market and correlation between security and market. Yes. So before writing the formula, before writing the formula, if your beta is equal to 2, which means for every 1% deviation in the market portfolio is written. Say for example, see in India, Sensex and Nifty are the best representatives of market portfolios because top class securities will be considered under Sensex and Nifty. So such portfolio, Sensex and Nifty uh, as a market portfolio, which is a representative of BSC and NSC. So if you consider the return of those portfolios, market portfolios, there is a scope for deviation. So if such market portfolio return deviates by 1%, then your security return will be deviate, deviated by 2%. That's what beta is all about. So if beta is equal to 2, see beta will be generally calculated for a security. If your security, security means your share. So if your one of the company share beta is 2, which means if market portfolio return deviates by 1%, then your security return will be deviated by 2%. That means your security risk is twice of market portfolio's risk. So that's what the uh, understanding. So we are just trying to establish the relationship between market portfolio and security. Now, this beta can be calculated by using these formulas. Beta is equal to covariance of security and market divided by variance of market portfolio. This is what beta. And then beta is equal to sigma s by sigma m into sigma s by sigma m into R of SM. This is one more formula for beta. So what is the formula for what are the formulas for beta? Covariance of security and market divided by variance of market. And the second formula is sigma s by sigma m into R of SM. This, these are the two formulas for beta. Yes, we understood. Now we have one more formula in the study material that you need to remember. Look at the formula. Covariance of security and market is equal to, and this one, covariance of security and market is equal to correlation between security and market into sigma s into sigma m. This is the formula for covariance between security and market. This formula also you need to remember. Okay. Yes. So with this, we understood the formulas of beta. Now, they have given you one table if the values of beta are in different ranges. Generally, your beta can be more than 1, less than 1 or equal to 1. Sometimes it can be negative also. Sometimes it can be 0 also. So 0 and negative are the two abnormal numbers. But for most of the securities, the beta ranges uh, between like less than 1, more than 1 and equal to 1. Okay. Less than 1 means your beta can be 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.7 like that. More than 1 means 1.52, 2.5 like that maximum. You don't get a beta of 30, 40 times. Okay. So let us consider the numbers. If your beta is less than 1, that means your security is less riskier than market portfolio. If your beta is equal to 1, that means the market portfolio risk and your security risk both are same. Same. It is known as normal beta security. Okay. So just now we understood. When security beta is equal to 1, then if market moves up by 10%, then security will move up by 10%. That means the same deviation. Okay. If market fell, fell by 10%, then security also tends to fell by 10%. 
the same deviation if your beta is equal to 1 if your beta is more than 1 what it exactly means more than 1 means your security is much riskier than market portfolio and which is uh, generally known as if your beta if your security's beta is more than 1 then then that then such security is generally known as aggressive security or high beta security aggressive security it is deviating more okay so a security beta 2 will tend to move twice as much as the market if your market went up by 10 percent then your security tends to rise by 20 percent that means the risk of the security is twice of market portfolio risk if market fall by 10 percent then your security fall by 20 percent two times so these three numbers less than one equal to one more than one these are the regular numbers whereas this zero and less than zero are the two abnormal numbers less than zero means negative beta negative beta means when market is moving up moving in the upward direction but we have security return will go uh, move in the downward direction that means say for example if beta is equal to some minus one if, you, if the market deviates by one percent that means if market is moving uh, up by 10 percent return then your security return will be deviated in the downward direction that means if market is uh, market return is increased by one percent then your security return will be in, in decreased by one percent if your if your market return is decreased by one percent then your security return will be increased by one percent just like that okay negative beta means this market movement and your security movements are in the opposite direction generally it won't happen for most of the securities where in very rare cases the security and market will move in the opposite direction that is a case of negative beta okay now equal to zero equal to zero means there is no systematic risk at all because beta is a measure of systematic risk if your beta is equal to zero which means there is no systematic risk generally if your beta is equal to zero that means that's a clear case of risk free security only for risk free securities the beta will be equal to zero yes the next one is capital asset pricing model which is covered in the chapter cost of capital that is this is going to be covered in cost of capital chapter but still i'm going to give you the formula for capm under capm what is the formula for cost of equity or expected return see for calculating the return from the equity share i can use capm formula expected return means the expected return from the equity share formula is rf plus beta into rm minus rf where rf is risk free return generally the return that you can earn from a uh, risk free asset risk free asset the best examples of risk free asset in india indian treasuries beta is systematic risk factor which is a sensitivity relationship between security and market portfolio rm means average market return or return on market portfolio just now we have considered the example sensex and nifty so whatever the average return that you can earn from the top 30 securities in the sensex or top 50 securities in the nifty then that is known as average market return or return on market portfolio rm minus rf is market risk premium rm minus rf is market risk premium so this is the formula of a expected return under capm just remember the formula that's more than enough yes so these are the formulas covered so all, all the formulas were covered under this chapter risk and return now we can handle one or two sums to understand this risk and return by that this chapter will be over okay yes okay dear students now if you look at illustration number 13 you can understand the expected rate of return variance and standard deviation at a stretch x limited has forecasted returns on its share with the following probability distribution we have they have given you the returns with their respective probability distribution say there is a five percent chance of probability to get a return of minus 20 percent to get a return of minus 10 percent there is a chance of five percent probability like that they have given you one probability distribution find out the following the expected rate of return variance and standard deviation yes so the same formula that I'm going to apply, but with the help of a table. So this is a calculation that I need to do for illustration number 13. Calculation of expected rate of return, variance and standard deviation. The standard columns are written, probability, written into probability, deviation, x minus x bar, deviation square, x minus x bar whole square. Okay. So write the returns order wise, which is given in the problem, just like this. 
and then write the probabilities so multiply the return with the probability so if i consider minus 20 into 0 0.05 i got minus 1% like that multiply returns with the probabilities and sum up those return sum up those numbers return into probability column total will be your mean return x bar expected return this is a first requirement expected return how to get expected return multiply return with probability the total will be expected return x bar the next one is deviation x minus x bar see this return is nothing but x minus x bar means expected return so minus 20 minus 11 i'll get minus 31 minus 10 minus 11 minus 21 like that you have to calculate deviation which is nothing but x minus x bar okay after getting deviations deviation numbers square it apply square then the term will be x minus x bar whole square nothing but deviation square that say for example minus 31 whole square 961 any minus or plus one symbols will be eliminated by applying square so i'll get only positive numbers so these are the deviation square numbers the sum so after getting deviation square numbers then please multiply d square with probability multiply d square with probability i'll get pd square so say for example 961 into 0 0.05 i'll get 48.05 like that multiply the probability with the deviation square so the sum will be summation pd square the summation pd square can be written as summation p into x minus x bar whole square this is nothing but variance dear students this is nothing but variance that's what i have written here variance so my variance is 150 so if you can apply square root to variance then you'll get standard deviation because i told you already standard deviation i mean the variance is equal to standard deviation square variance is equal to standard deviation square nothing but stand so if you can apply square root to variance then i'll get standard deviation in simple terms this is nothing but variance apply square root to this then you'll get standard deviation or else you can apply formula also so i got variance of 150 square root of variance 150 square root of 150 i got 12.24 percent this is my standard deviation so you are expecting a return of 11 percent from 11 percent either you'll get extra 12.24 percent or your return can be reduced by minus 12.24 percent upward potential and downward risk so with this we understood expected return standard deviation and variance terms okay now the next requirement is to calculate beta look at 15th problem from the following data compute beta of security x so we have they have given you a few terms here sigma x sigma m r of xm sigma x by sigma m into r of sm that's what the formula for beta 12 by 9 into 0 0.72 that's a simple application actually dear students so let me show you the solution for that problem illustration number 15 sigma s by sigma m into r of sm 12 by 9 into 0 0.72 so i got a beta of 0 0.9599 or 0.96 say so, i told you already it's a simple application so just substitute the numbers calculate it you'll get beta okay logic and all the conceptual understanding the deep explanation all these parts will be covered in the chapter called portfolio management at cma final sfm subject okay i'll discuss there actually okay this is regarding illustration number 15 now look at this term For problem of 14 look at this term 14th problem consider two securities a and b whose normal probability distribution over one year returns have the following characteristics security a expected return eight percent standard deviation six percent coefficient of variation 0 0.75 just check it so what is the formula for coefficient of variation x standard deviation by expected return so six by eight so i got 0.75 Similarly, for security B, it is 0 0.33. So, which security is having highest amount of risk? Security A, because the risk per unit of return, coefficient of variation is more. Comment on the above information. So, which one you are going, you're going to prefer? I will prefer security B, because for 1% of return that I am earning, 
that is a deviation of 0.33 percent only that's what coefficient of variation so generally we are going to select the security with least coefficient of variation just like standard deviation so i'll select the security with least standard deviation in the similar way i'm going to select the security with least coefficient of variation okay so that's regarding coefficient of variation now i need to give you another formula for standard deviation sir what is the formula for standard deviation for probability distribution the formula is square root of summation probability into x minus x bar whole square we have another formula for standard deviation in case of simple average the formula is square root of 1 by n minus 1 into summation x minus x bar whole square this is another formula for calculating standard deviation just write it and apply if required okay square root of 1 by n minus 1 into summation x minus x bar whole square this is a formula you need to remember see generally in regular scenario we have to use 1 by n into summation x minus x bar whole square but in cma materials everywhere even in final also they are using n minus 1 actually instead of n okay just remember this formula with this we understood the topic risk and return thank you hi dear students yes we have completed the chapter risk and return in the previous session now we are entering into the next area called capital busting this is the fifth chapter in your study material yes the name of this chapter is also known as investment decisions so the other name is investment decisions okay we have three types of decisions if you remember financing decision investment decision and dividend decisions Financing decision means how we are raising the capital. Dividend decision means how much dividend should be distributed to the equity shareholder. Now we are talking about investment decisions. Investment decisions means how you are utilizing the fund which you have raised through equity and debt. Actually after, after raising the fund you should invest the fund in the projects or business. So the ultimate objective of this chapter is effective utilization of fund, nothing but selection of the best projects in the market in such a way that the shareholders wealth should be maximized, their profit should be maximized, their wealth should be maximized and the risk should be minimized. This is the objective of this chapter capital busting. So this is the essence of this chapter. So in this chapter, what we need to do, see look at this these uh, things actually the, these are the capital busting decisions we need to take expansion decisions nothing but business expansion selecting the new projects expanding the existing business or selecting the new projects selection of new projects means diversification expansion means ex ex existing business expansion diversification means selection of the new projects and sometimes i'll go for replacement of the existing assets and the next one is buy or lease and research and development see in most of the cases uh, in a problematic session, I always deal with these three areas only because we don't have any problems related to buyer lease and research and development. Okay. Yes. Now, so what to do? Actually, in this chapter, we have to take investment decisions, nothing but selection of the project, whether a project should be selected or rejected can be decided by using several capital busting techniques. So, before understanding such capital busting techniques first i should define the costs and benefits associated with the projects that you are going to select so in this particular chapter capital busting or investment decisions we are going to evaluate several projects or business or uh, business alternatives nothing but we have to define the benefits and costs associated with that particular business alternative or project so uh, technically speaking we always uh, we uh, will always use the word project for uh, for evaluation purpose so we have to define benefits and costs of every project benefits are simply known as cash inflows and i mean the, uh, just now you can see here cash flows cash flows means you know the cash flows are classified into two types one is 
cash inflows other one is cash outflows in simple terms now dear students we have to do cost benefit analysis what we need to do cost benefit analysis so what is the meaning of the term cost and benefit you know cost means cash inflows sorry cost means cash outflow benefit means cash inflow so benefits are denoted with cash inflows and costs are denoted with cash outflows and we should do cost benefit analysis nothing but for every project that you are going to select we should define the costs and benefits then apply capital busting techniques so by using capital busting techniques we can select the projects properly and so that we can maximize the return of the equity shareholders so if your investment decisions are much more productive and effective if you want to make the make your investment decisions much more productive and effective you must apply several capital busting techniques before applying such capital busting techniques first i must understand what are the cash inflows and what are the cash outflows that is the first part of this chapter okay let me show you what are the cost and benefits associated with every business or every project which is nothing but cost to benefit and def defining the cost and benefits associated with the project nothing but defining the cash inflows and outflows of every project yes i am going to give you four steps to understand the costs and benefits nothing but cash outflows and inflows step number 1 my first job is how much money i am investing in the project nothing but cash outflows calculation of cash outflows see in every project i'll invest in two areas one is investment in fixed assets second one is investment in working capital this is my first part of investment because without having fixed assets and working capital i cannot run any business so i should invest in fixed assets along with working capital this is my first investment and in step number 2 i should calculate depreciation calculation of depreciation this is my second step depreciation can be calculated either under slm method or under wdb method it depends based on the information which is available in the problem and in step number 3 i must define annual cash inflows related to the project because when i am investing huge money in the fixed assets and working capital what i can do annually i can produce some products so when such product products can be sold out and from that i can get sales so i should recover the revenue expenditure then i'll get some profits and such from such profits i should recover my investment then along with that i should also calculate cash inflows so in step number 3 i have to calculate operating cash inflows calculation of operating cash inflows this is step number 3 sir how to calculate operating cash inflows i'll show you particulars here 1 to n because for the whole life of the project i am going to get these cash flows first you should write the benefit which is sales every year i am going to get sales from that i should deduct the total cost see this total cost can be given in different forms like i can write variable cost and fixed cost this is the first way of giving the expenses variable cost and fixed cost in our context fixed cost means cash fixed cost so your total cost can be given in the form of variable cost and cash fixed cost so if you deduct these two expenses variable and cash fixed cost then immediately i'll get pbdt profit before depreciation and tax and from this please deduct the investment portion which is known as depreciation then you'll get profit before tax then deduct income tax from it then you'll get profit after tax add depreciation to it to get cfat so cfat is also known as cash flows after tax this is cash flows after tax cash flows after tax this is also known as operating cash inflows already i have written that name in the heading itself 
So this is a way to calculate CFAT or operating cash inflows. Sales minus total cost, variable cost and cash fixed cost. PBDT, profit before depreciation and tax. See, by deducting variable cost and cash fixed cost, I have recovered my revenue expenditure. And after that, I am deducting depreciation. Depreciation means part of fixed assets. So that means you are recovering your capital expenditure from PBDT. After recovering revenue expenditure and capital expenditure, then I'll get profit. That, but that is before paying income tax. This is PBT. Then from that, please pay your income tax. Then I'll get profit after tax. Then add back depreciation. So why you are adding depreciation? Because depreciation is a non-cash expenditure. So we have deducted such depreciation just to know the taxable profit. So since, have, since we have already calculated income tax, so you should add back depreciation. A simple reason why you are adding depreciation because depreciation is a non-cash expenditure. I have deducted it and then I'll add back after tax. So simply speaking, depreciation is a before tax deduction and after tax addition. And that's what you need to remember. So that, so that I got cash flows after tax. You know, my dear students, this cash flow is loaded with two components. You should remember that. Why? Because cash flow means this is not a profit. There is a lot of difference between profit after tax and cash flows after tax. Profit after tax is the term which is representing profit. Cash flows after tax is not a profit. This is profit plus my investment actually. Profit plus investment sir how it is an investment because have you observed one thing i have added depreciation adding adding depreciation means i'm nothing but i'm recovering my investment nothing but i'm recovering my part of the investment so this portion of depreciation is nothing but your investment recovery so this cash flows after tax is loaded with two important components called one is my profit the other one is my investment so there is a lot of difference between these two terms profit after tax and cfat profit after tax is pure profit that you can from that you cannot recover your investment cash flow after tax is a larger number that is covering profit along with your investment so the only term which is able to cover your investment along with profit is cfat whereas profit after tax is a pure profit that's what you need to remember so this is regarding step number 3 and in step number 4 I should define terminal cash inflow after completing the project I'm going to get my terminal cash flow so that means whatever I have invested in year zero in step number one that will be recovered that will be recovered fully or partially at the end of the project life so how I can recover my investment let me show you calculation of terminal cash inflow calculation of terminal cash inflow there are two components in terminal cash inflow. One is the asset recovery, fixed asset recovery. Nothing but since we have used fixed assets for the whole life of the project, what will happen? I'll get salvage value. So the first part of the terminal cash inflow is salvage value of the fixed assets. Salvage value. But the problem is at the time of selling fixed asset, I must pay capital gain tax if there is a difference between sale value and book value. If it results in capital gain, I should pay capital gain tax. If it results in capital loss, I'll get tax shield. Nothing but tax saving on capital loss. So there is a lot of difference. Let me show you the format to calculate the net sale proceeds. Gross sale proceeds. By selling fixed assets, I'll get gross sale proceeds. From that, please deduct your book value of the fixed asset. Deduct book value of the fixed asset. Identify whether this number results in capital gain or capital loss. If it is a capital gain, pay income tax, which is nothing but capital gain tax. If it is a capital loss, please enjoy tax shield. You'll get some tax saving. Okay. So this results in capital gain or capital loss. If it is a capital gain, please pay capital gain tax. Capital gain tax. Capital gain tax. If it is a capital loss, you can enjoy tax shield on it tax shield on it so what is the case here capital gain tax is an outflow whereas tax shield is an inflow okay this is capital gain tax whereas tax shield is a inflow anything can happen so what i should do let me write a gross sale process b capital gain tax c tax shield see anything can happen only you cannot get uh, you don't need to pay capital gain tax and, and also you can enjoy tax shield anything only one thing can happen so if it is a capital gain tax, please deduct it from gross sale process to get net sale process. Nothing but A minus B. A minus B.
if it is a capital loss i can enjoy tax shield there is a difference between capital gain tax and tax shield capital gain tax is a tax outflow whereas tax shield is a cash inflow if it is a capital gain tax please deduct it from gross sale process a minus b if it is a tax shield nothing but capital loss results in tax shield that should be added back to gross sale process to arrive net sale process a plus c okay tax shield should be added to gross sale process to arrive net sale process capital gain tax should be deducted from gross sale process to arrive net sale process only one thing can happen because either i may get a capital gain or i may suffer capital loss so if it is a capital gain you should pay capital gain tax should be deducted from gross sale process if it is a capital loss you can enjoy tax shield that should be added to gross sale process along with that whatever the money you have invested in working capital that will be fully realized at the end of the project life that's what realization of working capital realization of working capital working capital will be fully realized at the end of the project life depreciation is not applicable to working capital investment this is my terminal cash inflow tci so these are the steps my dear students for calculating terminal cash inflow so now let me show you one thing here in your study material they have given you one format for calculating operating cash inflows please look at this net sales revenue nothing but sales less sales returns less cost of goods sold less general expenses other than interest so cost of goods sold plus general expenses total gives you total cost that means the, the total cost can be given in any form like cogs plus general expenses cogs plus fixed cost plus uh, selling and distribution expenses cogs plus fixed cost plus uh, administration expenses like that they can give you in different forms the revenue expenditure that, that is supposed to be deducted from revenue can be deducted in can be given in any form so they have given you this form cost of goods sold and general expenses whereas i have written what variable cost and cash fixed cost in any way that can be in any form that should be deducted from revenue to get pbdt see in this format they have deducted depreciation also so straight away what i'll get ebit actually we have never considered interest do you know one thing for calculating cfat for investment decisions generally i don't deduct interest generally i don't deduct interest uh, and, and i don't need to mention it so have you observed one thing in our statement i have never mentioned interest component here because i don't need to deduct it whereas in your study material they have clearly mentioned ebit but they have not deducted it have you observed that ebit less tax instead of deducting interest they have deducted tax directly so what will happen nothing will happen they are not considering interest because interest should not be deducted because the projects are analyzed from long term investors point of view long term investors includes equity and debt holders so i am not analyzing this project only from shareholders point of view i am analyzing this project from complete long term investors including long term debt that means bank loans and debentures so that's why we will never deduct interest component for calculating cfad in capital busting decisions that's what you need to remember so less income tax i got profit after tax then add depreciation net cash flows after tax the same format but the names were changed here okay and then i can also calculate cash flows after tax from profit of uh, from this formula cfat is equal to eb18 to 1 minus tax rate plus depreciation you, you please remember this formula cfat is equal to eb18 to 1 minus tax rate plus depreciation nothing but eb18 means ebd because i don't deduct interest into 1 minus tax rate tax rate means i'll get profit after tax add depreciation i'll get cfat in case if profit after tax is taken from uh, pro, i mean your in accounting records your accounting records so in accounting records generally will deduct the interest component that means i can enjoy some tax saving also so if the profit after tax is taken from accounting records and by the by, after calculating profit after tax generally in, in accounting records they'll deduct interest and they'll also enjoy tax saving on interest so because of this reason your cfat computation will be completely changed have a look at this pat plus depreciation they have added depreciation and they have added interest also so why they have added interest because already they have deducted interest in profit and loss account okay so while adding interest they have adjusted one tax saving on interest so the formula is interest amount into 1 minus tax rate this is a formula okay remember that interest amount into 1 minus tax rate so if it is taken from accounting records only so why you have deducted tax saving here because by deducting interest in pnl account 
obviously we are enjoying tax saving on interest so what are the tax saving which we have already enjoyed that should be adjusted here so logic aside so logic apart simply you just focus on the formula only so if the profit after tax is taken from accounting records what is the formula you please write profit after tax plus depreciation plus interest amount into 1 minus tax rate then i'll get net cash flows after tax see this formula will never use in any problem in most of the problems 99.99 percent in most of the problems 100 out of 100 problems will be solved by using this previous format only i will never use the second format you better remember the first format only that's my suggestion okay now already they have given you terminal cash flow no uh, uh, nothing i mean uh, no new points are covered there actually so all the points are completely covered now we understood how to define cash flows now let us go for the capital busting techniques right away these are the important techniques so the capital busting techniques are classified into two parts traditional and non discounting techniques and discounting or modern techniques or time adjusted techniques traditional techniques are non discounted cash flow techniques discounted cash flow techniques are time adjusted techniques these are also known as modern techniques actually modern techniques okay <clears throat> modern techniques now what are the traditional or non discounted cash flow techniques look at the names payback period payback period reciprocal payback profitability payback profitability is not a capital busting technique actually you just need to calculate profitability after payback period average or accounting rate of return predominantly speaking there are only three techniques payback period payback period reciprocal average rate of return if you ask me there are only two techniques in fact payback period and arr even payback period reciprocal which is derived from payback period only you don't need to learn new things actually so if you ask me what are the two important capital busting techniques that i need to cover under traditional methods or non discounted cash flows methods the our techniques simple there are only two techniques payback period arr average rate of return or accounting rate of return coming to discounted cash flows or time adjusted techniques we have several techniques here net present value profitability index internal rate of return discounted payback period modified npv modified arr adjusted present value all the techniques are clearly given here every technique is important and among these techniques the very famous techniques are first four actually okay first four net present value profitability index internal rate of return discounted payback period the remaining techniques are the derived techniques from the previous techniques okay yes now let us understand one by one and we will start with the first category of techniques called non non discounted cash flow techniques okay yes the first one is payback period payback period so what is the meaning of the term payback period payback period is a capital busting technique that will calculate the time period within which we can recover our investment payback the term itself is saying what pay back who will pay back the project the project will pay back to you because you have invested the money in year zero that will be paid back by the project to you in in uh, in how many years nothing but the period within which i can recover my investment from the project so pay back means from project's perspective it is paying back to you so in how many years nothing but the period within which i can recover my investment is nothing but payback period so what is a payback period it is a time period by which i can recover my investment from the project's cash inflows so if you see i'll give you one example to understand it understand this a simple example a project with a life of 5 years i'm taking here and i have invested a money of 1 lakh rupees here so <clears throat> from the future 5 years i'm going to get 50000 cash inflow for the whole life of the project every year i am getting 50000 cash inflow now within how many years i can recover my investment of 1 lakh the timeline is clearly saying within 2 years you can recover your investment why because 50000 plus 50000 is equal to 1 lakh 100000 nothing but i am recovering my investment from this project within 2 years so my payback period is simply 2 years so this is a clear problem to understand payback period so payback period means 
it is a time period by which i can recover my investment from the future cash inflows so why you are not taking profits here for recovering investment and why you are taking only cash inflows you know one thing dear students profits cannot recover your investment only cash flows can recover your investment because cash flows are loaded with two important components called investment and profit so both of such terms can recover your investment but not profit only okay that's why for calculating payback period for recovering my investment for recovering my investment nothing but investment recovery period i will always take cash flow soft tax nothing but operating cash inflows but i'll never take what a uh, profit after tax so profit after tax should not be considered here a red mark profit after tax should not be considered for calculating payback period you must consider cfat only so what is the appropriate term here cfat this is the right term for calculating payback period yes now for calculating payback period we have two techniques we have two situations under two situations the payback period calculation will be completely changed it is based on the nature of cash flows if the cash flows are equal if the cash flows are equal the first case if the cash flows are unequal if the cash flows are unequal see if the cash flows are equal calculating payback period is an easiest task actually payback period is equal to initial investment divided by annual cash inflows this is the formula for payback period if the cash flows are equal annual cash inflows if the cash flows are unequal i must calculate payback period proportionately proportionate how to calculate payback period see this is given wrongly in your study material look at the formula for payback period when the cash flows are uniform nothing but equal they have given you payback period is equal to annual cash inflows by initial investment that's the wrong formula the formula is initial investment by annual cash inflows you please correct it <coughs> sorry okay if the cash flows are not uniform proportionately how to calculate payback period i'll give you one and one example to understand this unequal cash flow situation see my investment is 1 lakh the project life is 5 years with a cash flows pattern like this the first year investment recovery is 40000 second year 40000 third year 30000 fourth year 25000 fifth year 45000 this is the cash flows pattern here now i want to recover my investment i want to calculate payback period i need to recover 1 lakh rupees investment from the future cash flows if you see here by the end of third years by the end of third year i can recover my investment but i don't need to wait till the end of third year why because i just need only 1 lakh rupees so in this case payback period should be calculated like this first of all you should accumulate the cash flows so you have to write like this cumulative cash flows cumulative cash flows write the cumulative cash flows 40000 40 plus 40 80000 80 30 lakh 10000 One lakh ten thousand plus twenty-five thousand. I'll get one lakh thirty-five thousand, and one lakh thirty-five thousand plus forty-five thousand, one lakh eighty thousand. Now, now look at the numbers. My requirement is one lakh. By the end of first year, I'm not re recovering my investment. By the end of second year, no. By the end of third year, I can recover my investment, but the excess there is an excess recovery. I just need only one lakh. Whereas by the end of third year, I am getting one lakh ten thousand. So my payback period is in between second and third year. So here you should write like this. Investment covered by the end of second year. Investment covered by the end of year two is equal to eighty thousand. 
So how much balance is required actually? Balance of investment to be recovered. Balance of investment to be recovered. You know, actually I need one lakh. Already by the end of second year, eighty thousand has been recovered. So the balance of investment to be recovered is twenty thousand. But for third year, I am getting thirty thousand cash inflow. But my requ my requirement is just twenty thousand. So for one year period, nothing but for third year, I am getting thirty thousand cash inflow. Then to get twenty thousand cash inflow, for how many years I should wait? Less than one year only. So therefore, payback period is equal to already I know that two years is a recovery period. By that I am getting eighty thousand. For balance twenty thousand, I don't need to wait for complete third year. Proportionate year is required. Twenty thousand into one divided by thirty thousand. Proportionate calculation. So you'll get what? Two by three it is. 0.667, nothing but 2.67 years approximately. You can convert this 0.67 years into months, into 12 months, 8 months, 2 years, 8 months. Okay, in simple terms. Okay, even the extra decimal can be converted into days by multiplying with 30 days. So this is a way to calculate payback period in case of unequal cash flows. Just accumulate the cash flows and identify your recovery period. So calculate the payback period proportionately like this. Okay. With this, we understood the concept called payback period. Now I am entering into the next area called average rate of return or accounting rate of return. Average rate of return or accounting rate of return. In short form. it is known as arr sir what is this arr return means profit return means profit here i have to calculate the profit percentage rate means percentage the rate of profit the rate of profit is nothing but rate of profit percentage but the profit is always variable number because the profit is always variable number I have to take average number so nothing but average rate of return means i am calculating average percentage of profit over the prospect life so annually how much percentage of profit i am earning that's what i need to calculate okay which is also known as accounting rate of return why because we are always going to take accounting profit here that's why this is also known as accounting rate of return see we have two formulas to calculate this average rate of return the first formula is the first method is total investment method total investment method the second method is average investment method the second method is average investment method the second method is a famous method the second method is a famous method but still you need to understand both the methods so what is a formula simple the first method total investment method total investment method under total investment method arr is equal to you know whenever you want to calculate the rate of return from any investment the simple formula is the income plus gain divided by investment here also you have to apply the same formula my invest my, my rate of for calculating the rate of return the average rate of return from the project i must take the profit in the numerator which is known as average profit after tax so why you are taking average profit after tax because the profit after tax is a variable number so i have to take average profit after tax divided by my total investment in year 0 So this is a formula for total investment method. So ARR is equal to average profit after tax by total investment. So what is the formula for average profit after tax? Get the total profit after tax for the entire project life divided by write the life of the project or number of years. Okay, that gives you average profit after tax. Then write the total investment in the denominator so that you can get ARR under total investment method. This is simply a profit percentage, a profit percentage on your total investment. Okay, I'm not taking any number because it will take a lot of time. Then I'm taking the next method, average investment method. Average investment method. So under average investment method, the formula will be changed. There is no change in the numerator, average profit after tax only. but in the denominator you must consider the average investment instead of total investment sir what is average investment in simple terms average investment means project beginning investment plus project ending investment divided by 2 instead of that they have given you one formula you should remember that formula average investment is equal to half of initial investment 
nothing but investment in fixed assets minus salvage value minus salvage value bracket close plus salvage value the half is not applicable to this salvage value plus salvage value plus your working capital investment plus your working capital investment so this is a formula for average investment so what is the formula for average investment half of initial investment minus salvage value please close the bracket such half is not applicable to the second salvage value plus salvage value plus working capital investment if you can apply this formula you can get average rate of return under average investment method okay now let us go for the next method called payback period reciprocal a payback reciprocal you know payback reciprocal is nothing but the reciprocal of payback period payback reciprocal is equal to payback reciprocal is equal to one by payback period this is a simple formula for payback reciprocal just remember that okay say for example if my payback period is 4 years 1 by 4 years 1 by 4 I'll get 0.25. It is a percent is actually in 200. It says 25 percent. Payback reciprocal is nothing but the rate of return from the project. This is generally we don't apply this particular formula in most of the cases unless otherwise specifically asked in the examination. So if they are asking you to calculate payback reciprocal, you just simply apply one by payback period. Okay. With this, we understood the payback reciprocal. Now I'm moving to. the next set of techniques called net present value actually we have one more term called payback profitability so i'll tell you payback profitability is not a technique actually payback profitability means see just now we have taken one example i'll show you that example you know by the end of uh, uh, okay then let me take the previous example by the end of second year i'll be able to recover my investment 100000 or 1 lakh rupees after second year actually this second year is known as what the second year is known as it's it is my payback period so by the end of second year i'd be able to recover my investment after second year whatever the cash flows that you're getting 50 plus 50 plus 50 nothing but 150000 or 1 lakh 50000 this is my profit this is my profit post payback profitability means how much profit i can earn after payback period nothing but the sum of cash flows which are generated after payback period is purely representing your post payback profitability so whatever the cash flows that i am generating after payback period is purely representing your profit why it is a profit why because by the end of payback period i'll recover my investment completely so the cash flows that are generated after payback period are purely representing your profit okay with this the non discounting techniques were over now i'm moving to the next area called net present value which is a famous technique and this is practically applicable for project selection this is superior over so many techniques that's why this is very important net present value so what is this net present value let me tell you <clears throat> you know for every project i am going to get some cash flows let me take the same uh, let me take one example to understand this there is a project with 3 years life and i am investing 1 lakh rupees today in year 0 i am investing 1 lakh rupees and for the future 3 years i'll get 50000 cash inflow for every year now the question is how to calculate this net present value for calculating net present value the prerequisite is cost of capital cost of capital say for example the cost of capital is 10% so what is the exact meaning of net present value the objective of calculating net present value is whether you are able to recover your investment along with your expected return of 10% cost of capital is investors expected rate of return so you should check it so net present value is a testing measure or checking measure whether you are able to recover your investment along with cost of capital if you can recover your investment along with cost of capital then such project may result in a positive npv 
net present value positive net present value if you are not able to recover your return 10% along with your investment then your net present value may be negative so the net present value decides whether you can recover your investment along with cost of capital so there is a process to calculate this net present value first of all discount all the cash flows at cost of capital 10% you know at 10% rate of return at the end of first year you have to take the present value factor discount it 50,000 into 0 0.909 if you can refer the table present value factor table you'll get present value of uh, present uh, present value of cash flows nothing but 50,000 into 0 0.909 I got 45,450 have you observed one thing my cash flows were reduced here after discounting what what was happened here what was happened here Instead of taking 50,000, why you are taking 45,450? What about the balance money? 50,000 minus 45,450. The gap 4,550. 4,550 is nothing but cost of capital on your investment. That means I am recovering my cost of capital 10% through discounting. So by discounting, what will happen? I am discounting what 10%. Discounting means deducting return, my expected return from the future cash inflow. So I have deducted 4,550 rupees cost of capital from the future cash inflow. So the balance must represent my investment actually. This will help you to recover your investment. Present value of year one cash inflow. This is known as present value of year one cash inflow. Now, in the similar way, discount your second year ending cash inflow also to recover your cost of capital for two years on your investment. 50,000 into, you know that present value factor at the end of second year is 0 0.826. If you can refer the present value factor table. So 50,000 into 0 0.826, I got 41,300. This is my present value of year two cash inflow. And now in the similar way, discount your third year cash inflow also. 50,000 into 0 0.7. 9098265151 50000 into 0.751 i am multiplying it here 0 0.751 50000 into 0 0.751 i got 37550 after discounting your cost of capital has been successfully recovered on your investment and this total present value of cash inflows as a responsibility to recover your investment so I can say 45,450 plus 41,300 plus 37,550, 124,300. If you add all the three years cash inflows, you must get 150,000. Why you got 124,300? Because already on my investment, I have recovered my return called cost of capital 10%. My expected return on my investment has been recovered through discounting. Now, this is your present value of cash inflow. This is your present value of cash inflow. Now from this present value of cash inflow, please deduct your investment because you need to recover your investment also along with cost of capital. So if I deduct 1 lakh rupees from here, then I'll get a positive number called 24,000, 24,000. 300 this is a positive number why because already i have recovered my cost of capital through discounting and also now i have deducted my investment which is also known as present value of cash outflows so after recovering cost of capital and investment whatever the additional value that you're generating is purely representing net present value this is an additional value which will add some extra value to the shareholders this is an excess value to the shareholders this will improvise maximize the wealth of the shareholders that's why always I'll select the project with positive NPV rather than negative NPV. This is the true and exact understanding of the term net present value. Now let me show you the formula for calculating net present value. I'll show you the process. Yes. Present value of operating cash inflows. Present value of operating cash inflows. Plus present value of terminal cash inflow. Terminal cash inflow total will be present value of cash inflows present value of total cash inflows present value of total cash inflows from this please deduct your present value of cash outflows then the difference will be net present value NPV net present value. This is the formula for calculating NPV. Now, dear students, what is the appropriate discount rate for calculating NPV? The appropriate discount rate is cost of capital that you should remember. The appropriate discount rate is cost of capital.
sorry the appropriate discount rate is cost of capital for calculating npv which discount rate i must use cost of capital you must remember that forever okay you know the point is for calculating npv what i should do first i should define my initial cash outflows zero year outflows and then i should define my future operating cash inflows along with terminal cash inflows discount such cash flows and arrive npv okay so for calculating for uh, discounting purpose you must use cost of capital as a appropriate discount rate remember that yes successfully we understood net present value so this particular capital busting technique must be useful for taking decisions so every capital busting technique must be useful for taking decisions even this npv technique should be useful for taking decisions if npv is positive nothing but greater than 0 then i can accept the project if npv is negative less than 0 i'll reject the project if npv is equal to 0 i may or may not accept the project may or may not accept the project that's it this is for npv this is npv decision making in the similar way even for ARR also we have decision making that means you have to take decisions by using ARR also generally the written ARR should be compared with the cost on your capital cost of capital then if the return is more than cost of capital then that project can be accepted if return is nothing but ARR is less than cost of capital what you will do you will reject the project because the return should always be more than the cost of capital because I am raising capital at higher cost whereas the return generated from the project is lower. So such project should be rejected immediately. If it is equal to cost of capital, ARR is equal to cost of capital, may or may not. May or may not. Okay, may or may not. Now in the similar way, even the payback period technique should be useful for taking decisions. Payback period. If payback period, see payback period should always be least. I'll always select the project with least payback period because my objective of payback period is my objective of using payback period is early recovery of investment. I'll select the projects with least payback period. So the application of payback period's objective is to recover your investment at the earliest. Okay. So if payback period is less than standard payback period SPBB. So what is the standard payback period? The management will fix the standard payback period within which you should recover your investment. That means your payback period should always be less than standard payback period. That means the recovery period which is being fixed by management that should be uh, uh, considered as a standard. So your payback period should always be less than such standard payback period in order to accept the project. If it is more than standard payback period, literally you will reject the project. You should reject the project. Okay. So you should reject the project. If it is more than standard payback period, equal to, you know that if it is equal to standard payback period, may or may not accept. Okay. This is regarding decision making under payback period capital investing technique. Now with this, we understood net present value, I mean, Pay, uh, the first one ARR average rate of return payback period and then just now we understood net present value now I am entering into the next technique called profitability index the next technique is profitability index the other names of profitability index are benefit cost ratio present value index desirability factor desirability factor wait desirability factor the famous name is profitability index okay Profitability index and NPV both are similar techniques. The only difference is NPV is a total absolute number whereas profitability index is a relative measure. I will show you the formula. Profitability index is equal to Profitability index is equal to Present value of cash inflows divided by Present value of cash outflows.
Sir, how to calculate present value of cash inflows? What about cash inflows? Is it operating a terminal? See, this cash inflow is nothing but operating cash inflow as well as terminal cash inflow. Remember that. And for calculating present value of cash inflows, I must use cost of capital as an appropriate discount rate. The appropriate discount rate for calculating present value of cash inflows under profitability index technique is cost of capital. Appropriate discount rate. Okay. This is my appropriate discount rate. Okay. So what about this profitability index? Sir? Say for example, my present value of cash inflows after discounting future cash flows operating and terminal cash inflows at cost of capital, I got 1,20,000 as my present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflows is or nothing but your investment, initial investment in year zero. So I have made an investment of 1 lakh rupees. So your profitability index is 1.2. 1.2 means 1.2 by 1. Which means for every 1 rupee of investment that you are investing in the project, you are generating 1.2 rupees of present value of cash inflows. 1.2 rupees of present value of cash inflows. That means after recording 1 rupee from it, the 0.2 rupees is representing your NPV for your investment of 1 rupee. Okay. So generally, if profitability index is more than 1, then I can accept the project. If it is less than 1, I'll reject the project. If it is less than 1, that means what? I'm not able to record my investment actually. So this capital busting technique must be useful must be it must be useful for taking what decisions if profitability index is greater than one then i can accept the project if it is less than one i'll reject the project if it is equal to one you know that may or may not accept the project may or may not See dear students, NPV and profitability index, you have to understand these two techniques simultaneously. Why? Because for both of these techniques, I'm using the same discounted cash flows, no change in it. Present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows is NPV. Present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflows is profitability index. The same discounted cash flows that I'm going to use because the appropriate discounted for both the techniques is or cost of capital. So for both the techniques, I'm going to use cost of capital as an appropriate discount rate. So my dear students, both NPV and profitability index, you should understand simultaneously. So if I can calculate NPV, I can easily calculate profitability index. Okay. So because the same present value of cash flows have to use. Okay. With this, we understood profitability index also. Okay. Right. Hi dear students, yes, now I am moving to the next concept in capital busting chapter. So in the previous session we understood NPV and uh, profitability index, now we are moving to the next area called discounted payback period. See, we don't have any specific formula for this particular concept called discounted payback period. Just like payback period, even in discounted payback period also, I have to calculate the time period within which I can recover my investment. But in payback period, we'll consider the future cash flows, CFAT. Whereas in discounted payback period, we must consider the present value of cash inflows for recovery of investment. The present value of cash inflows must be considered. So present value of cash flows means the cash flows discounted at cost of capital. So just like in NPV, whatever the discounted we've used, cost of capital, even in profitability index also the same discount rate is used. So the same discount rate must be used for calculating discounted payback period. So what is a discounted payback period? It is the time period by which I can recover my investment from the future present value of cash inflows. Nothing but you have to convert the future cash flows into present value terms by using cost of capital as the appropriate discount rate. From such present value of cash inflows, you have to recover your investment. That's what discounted payback period. Let us say how I can do this. First of all, for calculating payback period, what we will do? Generally, for calculating payback period, we'll accumulate the cash flows. 
for calculating payback period generally we will, will consider the accumulated cash flows in the similar way here in discounted payback period also i have to accumulate the cash flows instead of accumulating the regular cash flow i have to accumulate the present value of cash inflows discounted at cost of capital so these are the standard columns here present value of cash inflows discounted at cost of capital and cumulative present value of cash inflows that's what you need to do cumulative present value of cash inflows for example there are 5 years 1 2 3 4 the project life is 5 years and i got present value of cash inflows of 1 lakh 13320 75,440. I'm ju just taking random numbers. 44,720 and 55,555. 1,12,222. These are the present value of cash inflows after discounting the cash flows at cost of capital. See, I have arrived this number. I arrived these numbers by using cost of capital as a appropriate discount rate. so what are the discounted cash flows we are arriving for calculating npv the same discounted cash flows can be used here for calculating discounted payback period remember one thing for calculating npv this uh, profitability index and discounted payback period the appropriate discounted is always cost of capital so the same present value of cash flows can be used for calculating npv for calculating profitability index and for calculating discounted payback period also okay whereas for calculating discounted payback period we always need present value of cash flows for each year separately otherwise i cannot calculate discounted payback period say for example my investment is 2 lakhs my investment is 2 lakhs this is my investment and i have to recover this investment not from regular cash flows but from present value of cash inflows so accumulate this cash flows 113 320 plus 75,440. 113, 320. Of uh, adding this number, 75,440, I got 188,760. And plus 44,720, I got 2,33,480. See, like that, you have to add up to five years, just like in payback period. Now, my target investment recovery is 2 lakh rupees. whereas by the end of second year i got 188760 so i just need balance money of how much how much balance money i need 188760 if you did at 188760 from 2 lakhs i need 11240 whereas for third year i'm getting a present value of cash inflows of 44720 so my dear students simply for uh, see i can write sentences like this investment covered by the end of by the end of Year two is equal to one eighty eight seven sixty. Balance of investment to be covered is equal to balance of investment to be covered is equal to the same calculation which is applicable to payback period. The same calculation you can use it here. Okay, balance of investment to be covered two lakh minus one eighty eight seven sixty. so balance money is 11240 see for one year third year period i am getting present value of cash inflows of 44720 for getting 44720 i need to wait for third year fully whereas for getting 11240 i don't need to wait for full year i don't need to wait for complete third year therefore discounted payback period is equal to it's a proportionate computation two years is already decided And for balance eleven thousand two forty, you don't need to wait for complete third year. Eleven thousand two forty into one divided by forty four thousand seven twenty. Okay, so eleven thousand two forty divided by forty four thousand seven twenty. I got point two five. It will be two point two five years. This is my discounted payback period. Discounted payback period. Okay, so what is the difference between payback period and discounted payback period in normal payback period i'll accumulate the cfat rather instead of using present value of cash inflows so 
there you will accumulate the CFAD. So the cumulative cash inflows must be considered for calculating payback period. Whereas in discounted payback period, I must discount the cash flows at cost of capital. And such present value of cash inflows must be accumulated in order to recover your investment. So in this way, I have to calculate my discounted payback period proportionately. So it is always in between two years. So you should always take, you, should, you, should, you have to take proportionate computation here for calculating discounted payback period. Yes, we understood. Now I can go for the next important concept called internal rate of return IRR. Internal rate of return IRR. IRR. Sir, what is IRR? Before understanding IRR, I need to tell you one important point. See, say for example, I am taking three years project life. I'll invest some amount of money in year zero. That is my investment. For such investment, what I'll get? I'll get future cash inflows. These are your future cash inflows. All these are what? CEF ATs. I told you already, your future CEF ATs are loaded with two components. Always one is your investment component, another one is profit, another one is profit, profit after tax. Such profit is technically known as internal rate of return. So, in every running cash inflow, I'll get two components one is investment, another one is IRR. IRR means is nothing but the profit percentage, the accurate profit percentage on compounded basis. Okay, investment plus IRR. So in simple words, I can say one thing, the future cash flows are always loaded with two important components. One is my investment, other one is IRR, which is nothing but my profit percentage. Okay, now you should calculate this IRR. So how I can calculate this IRR? By discounting. If I discount the future cash flows at IRR rate, if I discount the future cash flows at IRR rate, automatically this IRR will be removed. So through discounting, the IRR gets removed and then I'll get what the present value of cash inflows such present value of cash inflows see if I discount these cash flows at IRR what will happen this IRR will be discounted this IRR will be deducted through discounting then what I'll get the present value of cash inflows the present value of cash inflows the balance portion of present value of cash inflows which is purely representing which is purely representing my investment actually because if I remove IRR from the future cash flows the balance portion must represent my investment only okay so whatever the present value of cash inflows you are arriving after discounting the future cash flows must be equal to my investment if I deduct the investment from these present value of cash inflows then my NPV must be equal to zero this is the way of understanding so in simple words, your future cash flows are loaded with two important components. One is investment, other one is IRR. If you discount the future cash flows at IRR, IR, you are discounting the cash flows at IRR means you are removing IRR from CFAT. If I remove IRR from CFAT, then the balance must represent my investment. So the present value of cash inflows that you are getting by discounting all the three years cash inflows must be equal to my total investment. There your NPV should be equal to zero. This is the correct way of understanding. Let me show you one example to understand this. A one year project life I am taking here for, for the sake of understanding. I have invested 1 lakh rupees money. I have invested 1 lakh rupees money and for such investment I got a cash inflow of 1 lakh 15,000. I am going to get a cash inflow of 1 lakh 15,000. This is my estimated cash inflow at the end of first year. Now the question is how much is the IRR here? Simple. See you can straight away say that you can simply say that this particular 1 lakh 15,000 cash inflow is loaded with two components. One is my investment of 1 lakh rupees. Another one is profit that is 15,000 and such 15,000 surely should represent IRR. A 15,000 amount here for my investment of 1 lakh rupees must represent 15%. See prime of AC by seeing these numbers, I can surely say that the IRR is 15%. What do you say? So here is your IRR. Now, I want to remove this IRR 15% from 1 lakh 15,000. What will happen? Let me show you. The present value of cash inflow. I have to calculate present value of cash inflow. At what rate I am discounting? Not at cost of capital. Remember that I am discounting this cash flow at IRR rate. Internal rate of return. So 1,15,000. This is first year ending cash inflow. So I must use 
1 by 1 plus R, IRR. Here R means IRR. IRR is 15 percent, 0.15. Sir, who said it is IRR? Uh, who said 15 percent is IRR? Because prima facie by seeing these numbers, I can surely say that 1 lakh into 15 percent, 15,000 profit has been added here, right or wrong? So in that case, I can take 15 percent straight away. So 1 plus 0 0.15, this is my IRR. I'm discounting the first year ending cash inflow at IRR, power 1, because this is first year ending cash inflow. Now take the number 1 lakh 15,000 into 1 by 1.15, I got 1 lakh rupees exactly. So successfully after discounting the first year ending cash inflow of 1,15,000 at 15% IRR rate, the IRR of 15% has been removed. So after discounting 1 lakh from 1,15,000, 1 15,000 profit has been successfully removed because I have discounted first year ending 1,15,000 at 15% IRR rate. So such 15% profit element is successfully removed from cash inflow. So I got a present value of cash inflow. Have you observed that this is exactly equal to my investment? Yes, because once after recovering your, once after recovering your profit element from the future cash flows, the present value of cash inflows must represent your investment. So I am deducting my investment from here. So I get an MPV of zero. This is what IRR is all about. So. If you discount the future cash flows at IRR, the present value of cash flows must be equal to your investment. There your NPV should be equal to zero. That's what the true meaning of IRR. So let me write the sentences here. IRR is the discount rate. It is the discount rate at which the discount rate at which the present value of cash inflows the present value of cash inflows should be equal to my present value of cash outflows or my initial investment. This is also known as initial investment or initial investment. So I can say present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows should be equal to zero. So there your NPV is equal to zero. So what is IRR? IRR is the discount rate at which NPV is equal to zero or else present value of cash inflows should be equal to my initial investment or present value of cash outflows. This is the true meaning of IRR. So the discount rate at which NPV is equal to zero is simply known as what IRR. Just now we have proved actually. Now the task is how to calculate this IRR. In the examination they will ask you how to calculate IRR. So this IRR calculation is dependent on the nature of the cash flows. The nature of the cash flows means the cash flows can be uniform, equal or non-uniform, nothing but unequal. So if the cash flows are equal, what will happen? If the cash flows are equal, what will happen? And if the cash flows are unequal, what will you do? If the cash flows are unequal. Yes. If the cash flows are equal, I am going to use a method called annuity, annuity method. I am going to use annuity method. Whereas in case of unequal cash flows, I am going to use trial and error method. These are the two famous methods we must use for calculating IRR. Okay. So look at this IRR. So if the cash flows are equal, annuity method I must use. If the cash flows are unequal, trial and error method you have to use. So under annuity method, how I can calculate IRR? See, in case of if the cash flows are equal, if the cash flows are equal, then simply use the annuity method. So please use the annuity method. IRR is the discount rate at which present value of cash inflows. should be equal to my initial investment. This method I must use. So you have to write CFAT, the cash flows, the equal cash flows that are given in the problem, you have to write such CFAT into, since it is an annuity method, I must multiply this cash flows with annuity factor or I don't know, N you should write. The life should be written here. That is equal to initial investment. Okay. So the unknown factor here is rate of return only. The remaining factors will be given in the problem. So you have to substitute cash flows after tax, you have to substitute number of years and you have to substitute initial investment. Then you will get present value of annuity factor from this. 
present value of identity factor from this r is a no r is an unknown number n is a life that will be given in the problem so initial investment divided by annual cash inflows nothing but cf80 per annum cf80 so if you substitute these numbers you'll get some annuity factor say for example let us say present value of annuity factor r comma 5 years project life i am taking my initial investment is my initial investment is 1 lakh divided by my annual cash flows for all the 5 years is 50000 so my annuity factor will be 2 so you have to trace this factor in annuity factor table you have to trace this factor in annuity factor table trace the factor trace the present value of annuity factor and the present value of annuity factor table and calculate IRR accordingly and calculate IRR accordingly so this is the way to calculate IRR so you have to trace this factor in annuity factor if it lies in between two discount rates we have to use one method called interpolation I'll show you okay then so this is what annuity method so what we have to do we have to apply annuity method like this multiply the cash flows with annuity factor and that should be equal to your investment from that you have to arrive annuity factor and trace that factor in the annuity factor table against five years or against 10 years it depends okay yes now if the cash flows are unequal trial and error method must be used if the cash flows are unequal in case of unequal cash flows i must use trial and error method sir how to do this method under trial and error method you should guess the irr irr rate nothing but internal rate of return should be estimated so a trial should be applied if it results in an error then again you should apply another guess rate so it is purely a guess guesswork actually so how i can do this under trial and error method you have to calculate npv at different guess rates the guess rate at which NPV is equal to 0 is simply known as IRR because when the cash flows are unequal I cannot simply multiply CFID with the annuity factor I must use guess rates calculation of IRR this is a way to calculate IRR under trial and error method write the years and write the cash flows use the present value factor at the present value factor at first guess rate and write present value of cash flows 0 year 1 2 3 4 5 5 years cash flows in 0 year you please write initial investment and all the for all the 5 years write the cash inflows and discount these cash flows at first guess rate say for example if it is 10 percent if my first guess rate is 10 percent i must use 10 percent guess rate that means the first 0 year factor is 1 then for first year I have to write 0 0.909, 0 0.826, 0 0.751, 0 0.683, 0 0.621. These are the factors I must use. So then discount the cash flows. Inflow should be adjusted with outflows in present value terms. Then you will get an NPV. The target NPV is 0. If it results in positive NPV, then you should go for the next guest state. Sir, what should be the first guess rate? Generally, for the problems, the first guess rate should be the 10% discount rate. If the discount rate is not given, I'll use 10%. Then the second guess rate will be 20% if your first guess rate results in positive NPV. So, present value factor at the rate present uh, 20%. And then present value of cash flows, I have to calculate. So, dear students, if it results in, if it results in, I am not taking present value factors here, I am just writing here. You can write present value factors by referring these factors in the table or else you can calculate it by using present value factor formula 1 by 1 plus r whole to the power of n. If it results in negative NPV, if it results in negative NPV, so the IRR lies in between 10 and 20 percent. So when the IRR lies in between two guess rates, then we can use one method called interpolation 
so using interpolation using interpolation irr can be calculated by using the following formula irr is equal to l1 plus npv at l1 l1 plus npv at l1 divided by npv at l1 minus npv at l2 into l2 minus l1 this is a way to calculate irr so l1 will be first guess state l2 will be second guess state in our context l1 is 10 percent l2 is 20 percent so if you, you may ask me one question sir if 20 percent results in positive NPV, then what i should do then you should apply 30 percent so there also if you get positive npv then again you should apply 40 percent like that you should you should apply guess rates by taking 10 percent deviation okay so dear students now the question is sir in the examination whether they'll give give us the discount rates or we should take the guess rates see in the main examination they'll always give you they'll always give you the guess rates you don't need to guess it actually okay guesswork is not required from our side they'll give you the guess rates they'll give you the possible guess rates say two to four guess rates will be given in the problem you have to apply such guess rates for calculating irr so okay in case if the guess rates are not given my better suggestion is you have to take 10 percent first guess rate 20 percent second guess rate. then you should go for 30 percent most mostly between 20 to 30 you'll get the answer okay so this is regarding trial and error method so under anity method you must use anity factor so trace the factor in the present value fact of anity factor table there you can get irr in case if the factor lies in between two discount rates say 10 and 11 or 11 and 12 then for 11 and 12 you have to apply you have to calculate npv npv at 11 percent and npv at 12 percent should be calculated then you can apply the same formula called interpolation irr is equal to l1 plus npv at l1 divided by npv at l1 minus npv at l2 into l2 minus l1 so again i'm repeating under anity method if the factor lies in between two discount rates say for example 11 and 12 then you should calculate npv at 11 percent and npv at 12 percent and between those two numbers 11 and 12 percent use the interpolation because at 11 percent you'll get positive npv and at 12 percent you'll get negative npv so by using this interpolation method l1 is equal to 11 percent l2 is equal to 12 percent so that you can calculate irr very easily and also you can calculate irr proportionately that i've discussed in the classes actually regular classes so that's not required even you can use this formula also okay so with this we understood the concept of IRR. So simply IRR is a profit percentage which is included in the future cash flows. If you discount the future cash flows at IRR by removing such IRR component from the future CFAT, whatever the present value of cash inflows must represent my investment. So present value of cash flows should be equal to investment. There my NPV is equal to zero. That's it for IRR concept. Okay, now. So one more point we should cover under IRR. So if uh, nothing but for taking decisions, nothing new here. If IRR is greater than cost of capital, then I can accept the project. Reject if IRR is less than cost of capital, K means cost of capital. If IRR is equal to cost of capital, we may or may not accept the project. So that's, uh, that is a decision making area actually. Okay. With this concept, IRR is over. Now, you know, in your textbook, I mean nothing but the material, and the study material also, they have given you one formula for discounted payback period. My suggestion is you please don't follow this formula. That creates a lot of confusion. Instead of that, you please calculate discounted payback period proportionately. That is very easy. Okay. Even the discounted payback period for calculating, I mean, after calculating discounted payback period, it should be useful for taking decisions. So discounted payback period must be compared with standard discounted payback period your discounted payback period of any project should always be less than standard discounted payback period then only we can accept the project otherwise i'll reject the project okay so i can say one thing for decision making if discounted payback period is less than standard discounted payback period accept the project greater than standard discounted payback period reject the project equal to standard discounted payback period may or may not accept, may not accept the project yes now let me start with the next concept modified NPV modified NPV how I can calculate modified NPV that's our concept simple one two three 
say for example the first year ending cash inflow is 50000 the second year ending cash inflow is 50000 the third year ending cash inflow is 50000 my investment is 1 lakh how i can calculate modified npv for calculating modified npv you need two rates one is the reinvestment rate say for example my reinvestment rate is 10 percent another one is discount rate cost of capital which is 15 percent here so what i should do my first job is to convert all the years cash inflows into terminal year the first year ending cash inflow must be converted to third year ending cash inflow so by using which rate i should convert these cash flows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate here the reinvestment rate is 10 percent so the first year ending cash inflow of 50,000 can be reinvested for two years, second and third year. So the compounded rate should be used here. The compounding factor 1 plus R. Here R is reinvestment rate 0 0.10 whole to the power of 2. Because the first year ending cash inflow of 50,000 can be reinvested for second and third year. Two years return should be added here. So as part of conversion, I must always use reinvestment rate as an appropriate compounded rate so 50,000 into 1.1 into 1.1 I got 1.21 1.21 into 50,000 this is 60,500 now convert the second year ending cash inflow into third year ending so one year return should be added here again at reinvestment rate 50,000 into 1 plus 0 0.10 hold to the power of 1 so this gives me 55,000 okay Now coming to third year ending cash inflow, you don't need to reinvest it because the, the third year ending cash inflow remains third year ending cash inflow only power 0 nothing but 1 into 1 50,000 only. So successfully we have converted all the years interim cash inflows into terminal year. So sum up all these numbers 60,500 plus 55,000 plus 50,000. So this is your terminal value 165,500 this is known as terminal value. Now what I should do? This terminal value should be discounted at cost of capital. So I should convert this terminal value into present value terms by using cost of capital as the appropriate discount rate. So 165,500. Present value of terminal value, TV terminal value 165,500. Since all the cash flows were converted to terminal year, I must use present value factor here. 165,500 into at cost of capital please discount it 1 plus 0 0.15 my since my cost of capital is 15 percent 0.15 power 3 30 rending value it is so 1 by 1.15 first year second year third year it is 0 0.6575 so 0 0.6575 into 165500 i will get i got 1 lakh 8818 so this is my number minus my initial investment nothing but present value of cash outflows that is 1 lakh so i got an npv 8818 this is not a regular npv this is known as modified npv so how to calculate modified npv convert all the years cash flows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate as appropriate uh, compounded rate so after converting all the years cash inflows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate i'll get a terminal value discount such terminal value by using cost of capital as a discount rate then we get present value of terminal value and deduct investment from it then whatever the value you are getting which is known as modified npv whereas in regular npv the calculation is direct discounting straight away i'll discount the future cash flows at cost of capital and then i'll deduct my investment then i'll get npv whereas in modified npv you'll convert the cash flows and then discount it so for conversion i must use reinvestment rate for discounting, I must use cost of capital. That's what you need to remember. With this, the concept modified NPV is completed. Then the next concept is modified IRR. The true concept is completely different actually. But in study material, they have given you one formula for calculating modified IRR. I'll show you. See here is MIRR, modified IRR. What is the formula? nth root of future value of positive cash flows divided by present value of negative cash flows minus 1. That's what the formula for modified IRR. What is the formula? MIRR, nothing but modified IRR is equal to
nth root of future value of positive cash flows divided by present value of negative cash flows minus 1. So this minus 1 is out of nth root. Okay. This is the formula for modified IR. What is the formula? nth root of future value of positive cash flows divided by present value of negative cash flows minus 1. See we have one form, one problem in the study material for solving this sum. You can refer the study material. Simply convert all the cash flows into terminal year, all the positive cash flows into terminal year by using one of the reinvestment rate and then calculate present value of negative cash flows. Then apply nth root and from that if you deduct 1 then you will get modified IRR. Okay. Actually, the true meaning of modified IRR is completely different. Instead of applying this formula, we have one concept. How I can do modified IRR? Even in the study material, they have given you a big description. And such description is representing this process that I am going to discuss. Okay. Yes. For calculating modified IRR, I have to apply different steps. Step number one. Okay, okay, wait. 1, 2, 3. I am not taking any numbers. I am just taking into marks for understanding. Okay. So what is my first job? Convert all the year's cash flows into terminal year. Just like in modified NPV. Convert all the year's cash inflows into terminal year by using by using reinvestment rate. If reinvestment rate is not available, then try to use cost of capital as a reinvestment rate. Convert all the years cash inflows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate or cost of capital. Then get the values. The total will be TV, terminal value. So what I should do? Convert all the years cash inflows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate or cost of capital as the compounded rate. Once we get terminal value, then you are going to have two values. One is zero year investment, other one is terminal value. Now, modified IRR, modified IRR is the discount rate, is the discount rate at which, at which the present value of terminal value, the present value of terminal value should be equal to my initial investment. So here in this case, terminal value is a single value. So I must use 1 by 1 plus R whole to the power of N, present value factor should be equal to my initial investment, initial investment. So I have to calculate this rate of return. Okay, nothing but modified error. Generally, we don't use mathematical formula. Instead of that, we'll use present value factor and I'll trace this factor in the table. Present value factor R comma N, initial investment. Terminal value is a known term. N is known number of years or given in the problem. Initial investment is a known term. The only unknown term in this problem is IR rate of return. This is what modified IRR. So by tracing this present value factor in the table, I can get modified IRR. So from this, please calculate present value factor R comma N is equal to investment divided by terminal value that I have arrived in the problem. So you'll get a factor and this factor should be referred in the table. Trace the present value factor of say for example, if I get 0 0.751, then trace the present value factor of 0 0.751 in present value factor table against n years project life against n years against n years and calculate modified IRR accordingly and calculate modified IRR accordingly and calculate modified IRR accordingly
okay so trace the factor in the present value factor table again as n number of years the project life and uh, identify the modified error accordingly if it lies in between two discount rates then you must use interpolation method that means you have to calculate npv at those two discount rates and use uh, apply uh, interpolation method then you'll get modified error so this is a way to calculate modified error so what is the job convert all the years cash flows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate or cost of capital get a terminal value then modified IRR is a discount rate at which the present value of terminal value is equal to initial investment so I must use discount rate that discount rate itself is modified IRR so terminal value into present value factor r comma n should be equal to initial investment in this equation TV terminal value is a known term because we can calculate that and then number of years will be given in the problem initial investment is a known term so substitute all the numbers Numbers, then the only unknown term variable term is r and i did calculate the modif uh, present value factor r comma n so this present value factor should be traced out in the factor table present value factor table if it uh, corresponds to one exact rate that itself is modified IRR. if it lies in between two discount rates then i must use interpolation or i can calculate modified error proportionately uh, there is a process for that okay with this the concept modified error is over but in the problem problematic part i mean uh, in a study material they have given you only one problem related to modified error and there they have used this formula and the method they have applied is first they have calculated future value of positive cash flows and then they have calculated present value of negative cash flows then they applied this formula nth root of this number minus one so nth root calculation you know that square root 15 times minus one divided by n plus one into is equal to 15 times that formula that process i have discussed in the chapter time value of money uh, that process can be applied here also for calculating modi modified IRR okay with this the concept modified IRR is over yes next concept is adjusted net present value adjusted net present value How to calculate adjusted net present value? Simple. There is a formula for calculating adjusted net present value. Adjusted NPV is equal to base case NPV minus issue expenses plus present value of tax saving on present value of tax saving on interest present value of tax saving on interest first step number one i have to calculate base case npv that's my first job sir how to calculate base case npv i'll show you base case npv is equal to present value of cash inflows minus initial investment initial investment in this case for calculating present value of cash inflows the appropriate discount rate is ke at cost of equity ke you have to discount the future cash flows so for calculating base case npv i should discount the cash flows at cost of equity ke from that you have to deduct your initial investment this gives you base case npv now the question is sir if initial i mean how to consider this initial investment generally initial investment means the amount that i am investing in year zero Sometimes they'll give you the investment combination, the financing options. If they give you equity plus debt combination for your initial investment, that means the entire investment is financed out of equity and debt. Say for example, equity 60 crores and debt 40 crores. So which amount you have to consider? See, even though it is financed out of debt and equity, it doesn't matter. I have to take four, four I mean, the total of 40 plus 60, it is 100 crores. 100 crores should be considered as your initial investment. So I don't separate equity and debts. So for calculating base case NPV, even though the cash flows are discounted at KE, but initial investment should be considered fully instead of separating that initial investment into debt and equity financing. Okay. Sir, what I should do? Whatever the money which is taken in the problem, nothing but initial investment should be deducted here from present value of cash inflows after discounting the cash inflows at cost of equity ke that's your first job then the second job is 
calculate the issue expenses calculation of issue expenses this is your second job see sometimes for is calculating issue expenses you must go for backward computation why because to finance a new project i need some money whereas the issue expenses results in lower amount of money after issuing the money so because of that reason i should calculate issue expenses through backward computation say for example if the project cost is if the project cost is 1 lakh rupees so i need 1 lakh rupees whereas issue expenses are 5% whereas issue expenses are 5% on issue money so for example if it is 5% say for example if i go for issue of 1 lakh rupees money 5% will be reduced from as part of issue expenses so 5000 after deducting 5000 i'll get net process of 95000 only whereas my project cost is 1 lakh so by using 95000 net process i cannot finance this project in such a case the calculation part will be completely different say for example if the issue amount is equal to 100 minus issue expenses are 5 rupees at the rate 5% 5 rupees so the net process will be equal to 95 rupees so my net process 95 should be equal to 1 lakh rupees so i have to calculate issue expenses of 5 rupees so proportionately i have to calculate issue expenses therefore issue expenses is equal to issue expenses is equal to 1 lakh rupees into 5 divided by 95 this is a way to calculate proportionate issue expenses through backward computation into 5 divided by 95 it will be 5263 so you cannot simply take 5% on 1 lakh rupees project cost because the issue expenditure is complete issue amount is completely different here so this is the amount of issue expenses so this is a way to calculate issue expenses when the issue expenses are uh, given as a percentage on the issued amount okay so this is regarding step number 2 now step number 3 In step number three, I have to calculate present value of tax saving on interest, which is also known as tax shield on interest. Tax saving on interest, present value of tax saving on interest. The first question is, sir, how to calculate tax saving on interest? First of all, you should know the interest amount computation. See, if the debt repayment is given over a period of time or a period of uh, time then you have to prepare debt repayment schedule and accordingly you have to calculate interest for every year separately once we get interest apply tax rate on it then so that you can get tax shield or tax saving on interest so the formula for tax shield or tax saving on interest is for every year you have to calculate tax saving on interest separately if the interest component is changing from one year to another year so the formula is interest into tax rate this is a formula for tax saving on interest interest into tax rate once we get tax saving on interest converts this tax saving on interest into present value terms so present value of tax saving on interest because tax saving on interest is a benefit tax saving on interest is a cash inflow convert this tax saving on interest into present value terms by using one discount rate called interest rate kd okay so simply you have to write like this tax saving on interest into since we are discounting the tax savings here if it is generated for 5 to 10 years or 15 years multiply such tax saving on interest with nad factor r comma n so i'll show you Here is a factor R comma n. Here R means the discount rate. The discount rate is interest rate. Remember that the interest rate on debt is your discount rate here for calculating present value of tax saving on interest. Present value of tax saving on interest. Sometimes if the debt is given in the form of irredeemable debentures or irredeemable debt, then in that case the interest payment is perpetual, so that you can enjoy this tax saving for perpetual years. In that case, you should not multiply tax saving on interest with NAD factor. Instead of that, I must use present value of perpetuity formula C by R. So for calculating present value of tax saving on interest, I have to use a formula like this: tax saving on interest divided by tax saving on interest divided by interest rate interest rate this is the discount rate in this way you have to calculate present value of tax saving on interest okay so these are the steps i must follow for calculating adjusted npv so what is the formula for adjusted npv base case npv so base case npv means 
present value of cash inflows discounted at KE minus total initial investment including equity and debt. Okay. Minus issue expenses. Deduct issue expenses. Sometimes issue expenses can be expressed as a percentage. So you, you have to calculate issue expenses through backward computation in such a way that my net process must be equal to my project cost. Okay. Then after calculating issue expenses, calculate present value of tax saving on interest. Just now we have discussed tax saving on interest is equal to interest into tax rate. Discount such tax saving on interest with the interest rate as the appropriate discount rate. If the tax saving is generated for certain number of years, if it is an annuity, multiply with annuity factor. If it is a perpetuity for perpetual debt like irredeemable debt, then apply C by R, nothing but tax saving on interest divided by R means interest rate discount rate. Okay. So once we get these numbers, substitute the numbers in this formula adjusted NPV base case NPV minus issue expenses plus present value of tax saving on interest that gives me adjusted NPV value with this the concept adjusted NPV is over okay hi dear students so I'm going for the next concept in the chapter capital busting the next concept is ranking conflicts the next concept is ranking conflicts Sir, so what is the exact meaning of the term ranking conflict? Let us take one example to understand this. I am evaluating two mutually exclusive projects called project A and B. And I have calculated NPV for project A and project B. I got 1,50,000 NPV for project A and 1,20,000 NPV for project B. Whereas IRR for project A is 15% and for project B is 20%. Have you observed one thing here? NPV is preferring project A and it is rejecting project B whereas IRR is preferring project B and it is rejecting project A. Now one technique NPV is preferring project A the other technique IRR is preferring project B. Now which project I should select whether I should follow NPV or IRR. This is what the ranking conflict between two capital busting techniques NPV and IRR. So this ranking conflict should be resolved. How I can resolve the ranking conflict? First of all, before resolving the ranking conflict, first identify the reasons behind this ranking conflict. See, the reasons behind such ranking conflict are explained in our material. Now, look at the first reason. The first reason is time disparity or cash flow disparity. And the second reason is size disparity. And the third reason is life disparity or unequal lives of the projects. Sir, what is the meaning of the term time disparity or cash flow disparity? Time disparity or cash flow disparity means the pattern of cash flows are different for both the projects. Say for example, if you look at project A and I'm taking 5 years life period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The cash flows are in increasing trend just like this. 30,000 for first year, 50,000 for second year, 80,000 for third year, 1,20,000 for fourth year and 1,80,000 for fifth year. Like that I'm getting cash inflows. So the cash flows are in increasing trend for project A. When it comes to project B, when it comes to project B, the cash flows are in declining trend. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So my cash flows for first year of oh, 200,000, 2 lakh, 2 lakh rupees. And for second year, it is 1 lakh 50,000. Third year, it is 70,000, then 40,000 and 20,000. Like this, I'm getting cash flows. Now have you have you observed one thing project A cash flows are in increasing trend whereas project B cash flows are in decreasing trend that means for project A I'm getting lesser amount of cash flows in the initial years and larger amount of cash flows in the later years whereas for project B I'm getting larger amount of cash flows in the initial years and smaller amount of cash flows in the later years. So this is what the cash flow disparity between the projects also known as time disparity the timing of cash flows. So this is one of the reason behind ranking conflict between NPV and IRR. So if this is the reason, the first reason, time disparity or cash flow disparity. Time disparity or cash flow disparity. Then how I can resolve this ranking conflict? See, look at the sentences here. In case if there is a time disparity, then I have to calculate either modified NPV. In fact, modified NPV and modified IRR should be calculated by using
by using the reinvestment rate the reinvestment rate so simply you have to calculate modified nbv and modified rr for both the projects then compare such numbers modified nbv and modified rr so based on that i'll select the projects so you know how to calculate modified nbv and modified rr you know so simply uh, when there is a ranking conflict between the projects between the projects arises then because of time disparity or cash flow disparity then such ranking conflict can be resolved by calculating modified npv and modified rr we have few problems in the study material you can see that so please calculate modified npv and modified rr by that you can resolve the ranking conflict okay you know how to calculate modified npv and modified rr simply i have to calculate terminal value by using reinvestment rate then i should discount such terminal value at cost of capital and deduct investment to get modified npv then i should calculate the modified rr rate by using such terminal value the discount rate at which present value of terminal value is equal to my initial investment is nothing but modified rr so in that way i have to calculate modified rr so that's what they have given here so this is the first reason behind ranking conflict the second reason is size disparity sir what is size disparity size disparity means difference in investments size disparity difference in size of investments difference in size of investments nothing but if you see project a and project b for project a my investment is 10 crores whereas for project b my investment is 25 crores now the investments are different for project a and project b this is also one of the reason behind ranking conflict size disparity the difference in size of investments between the projects so for one project i am getting i am investing lower amount whereas for other project i am investing higher amount so the investment requirement when the investment requirement for different projects are different then automatically the ranking conflict arises okay so here for project a and b the investment there is a difference in investment so this is what size disparity size of investment difference so this is also one of the reason behind the ranking conflict between npv and irr so how i can resolve this ranking conflict by calculating incremental irr for incremental investment look at this in case of ranking conflict because of due to size disparity the disparity the size disparity i mean the ranking conflict can be resolved by using the following steps find out the differential cash flows between the two proposals calculate the irr of incremental cash flows if the irr of incremental cash flows exceeds the cost of capital required rate of return then the project having greater non discounted cash flows should be selected nothing but you have to do like this say for example if i am evaluating two projects project a and project b and the cash flows are like this from year 1 to 5 the cash flows are like this for project a the year 1 to 5 cash flows are every year 5 crores whereas for project b the every year ending cash flows are 12 crores per annum so now calculate the incremental investment nothing but identify the incremental cash flows So here is my incremental investment in project B. So if I am moving from project A to B, how much additional investment I have to invest? Fifteen crores. For such additional cash flows, additional cash outflows, I'll get an additional cash inflow of how much money? Twelve crores minus five crores, seven crores. So for these incremental cash flows, please calculate IRR. And such IRR is known as incremental IRR. Incremental IRR. So, if this incremental IRR is greater than cost of capital, then additional investment, then additional investment is viable, nothing but acceptable. Additional investment means investment in project B. So, dear students, in case if the ranking conflict arises because of size disparity, immediately identify the differential cash flows. That means the additional cash flows. additional cash outflows and additional cash inflows by moving from smaller uh, i mean the smaller size project to larger size project so simply add for additional investment how much additional cash inflows i am generating for such additional cash flows nothing but incremental cash flows i have to calculate incremental irr if it is more than cost of capital then accept it otherwise reject such additional investment and go ahead with a smaller size project okay this is regarding the second reason behind ranking conflict size disparity and the third one is life disparity or unequal lives of the projects in case of life disparity 
Life disparity means the difference in life of the projects. Difference in life of the projects. Say for example, there are two projects, project X and project Y. Then the life of project X is 10 years, whereas the life of project Y is 15 years. Now, there is a scope for ranking conflict between NPV and IRR. The conflict arises because of life disparity, the difference in life of the projects. This ranking conflict can be resolved simply by calculating one technique called EAB, Equated Annual Benefit or Annualized NPV. This is also known as what? Annualized NPV. Nothing but you have to calculate NPV per annum, Annualized NPV. So what is the formula for an Annualized NPV? Simple, NPV divided by present value of annuity factor R, N. Present value of annuity factor R, N, where R is cost of capital, N is number of years. And this should be calculated for project A, so project X as well as for project Y. Present value of annuity factor R, Y, R, N. So dear students, have you observed one thing here? For project X, the life is the life is 10 years. And for project Y, the life is 15 years. The discount rate remains same. Sir, what is R here? The R is nothing but cost of capital. So simply you have to calculate annualized NPV by dividing such NPV of the respective projects with present value of annuity factor R, N. We have a substitute formula for this. Sometimes that can be asked in the examination with a different word called capital recovery factor. So the other formula for this equivalent annualized benefit or annualized NPV is NPV into capital recovery factor. Capital recovery factor. So what is the formula for capital recovery factor? Nothing new. The above formula only. Capital recovery factor CRF is equal to capital recovery factor CRF is equal to 1 by present value of annuity factor. That's it. 1 by present value of annuity factor R is cost of capital N is number of years. Nothing but if you multiply NPV with capital recovery factor, what I'll get? NPV into 1 by present value of annuity factor R, N where R is cost of capital N is number of years. Nothing but this is the previous formula NPV by present value of annuity factor. So but in the examination, if they have given capital recovery factor then immediately multiply such capital recovery factor with NPV without any hesitation okay so this is regarding equivalent annualized benefit or annualized NPV this particular technique should be applied for resolving the ranking conflict between NPV and IRR if it arises because of life disparity so I'll select the project with higher annualized NPV that's it okay this is regarding the third reason so the ranking conflict between NPV and IRR arises because of time disparity or cash flow disparity and that can be resolved by calculating modified NPV and modified IRR and size disparity nothing but difference in size of investments that can be resolved by calculating modif uh, sorry incremental IRR for the incremental cash flows moving from large smaller size project to larger size project. So and then the third reason is life disparity or unequal lives of the projects. So in this case I have to calculate annualized uh, NPV or equivalent annualized benefit the formula is simple NPV into capital recovery factor or NPV divided by present value of annuity factor that's it with this the ranking conflict concept is completed now I'm moving to the next concept called capital rationing capital rationing this is our next concept So what is capital rationing? Capital rationing means, first of all, rationing means short supply of capital. Rationing means short supply. Capital rationing means capital is short in supply. So capital rationing is a situation which is being faced by the so many companies while selecting the projects, nothing but fund constraint. Even though there are most profitable projects available in the market, the firm cannot accept all the projects in the market because of the capital rationing situation. Nothing but the short supply of capital. The capital is not sufficient enough to accept all the projects in the market because even though such projects are viable projects. In such a case, how to select the projects is our discussion. So when there is a fund constraint, first of all, when there is a fund constraint, first of all, how to select the projects? First of all, this capital rationing, this short supply of capital is of two types. 
सिंगल पीरियड कैपिटल रेशनिंग सिंगल पीरियड कैपिटल रेशनिंग एंड मल्टी पीरियड कैपिटल रेशनिंग what is single period capital rationing and what is multi period capital rationing single period capital rationing means when the capital is short in supply for only one period that is known as single period capital rationing if the capital is short in supply for more than one year then that is known as multi period capital rationing this is not there in your syllabus we have only the first case called single period capital rationing when the fund constraint is applicable only for initial year nothing but zero year for only one year then that is known as single period capital rationing under the single period capital rationing the projects are classified into two types one is divisible projects another one is indivisible projects divisible projects and indivisible projects divisible projects means proportionate investment is possible indivisible projects means proportionate investment is not possible say for example i'm taking one project project a the investment required is 100 crores whereas the fund available in my hand is 60 crores so can i invest 60 crores in this project a whereas the requirement is 100 crores no it is not possible either you should invest 100 crores or you should reject it this is a clear case of indivisible projects that means a project cannot be divided a part investment or a proportionate investment is not possible in this case such projects are simply known as indivisible projects the projects cannot be divisible okay in case if i can invest a, a part of this project a 60 crores and i can earn proportionate npv accordingly then in such a case such projects are known as divisible projects divisible projects means under divisible projects part investment is possible that means a proportionate investment is possible and i can earn proportionate npv so dear students the decision making changes based on the nature of the projects if the projects are divisible part investment is possible indivisible part investment is not possible yes so in this case how to select the projects in case of divisible projects the selection of the projects is based on profitability index i'm going to apply i'm going to calculate profitability index for every project and i'll select the projects accordingly in case of indivisible projects the selection is based on combination of projects I'll define combinations, combination of projects that gives higher NPV should be selected. So simply speaking, in case of divisible projects, you have to calculate profitability index of every project, assign ranking assign ranking in the order of ranking you should invest your money so in case if you have uh, some uh, money at the end of the after investing in few projects if you have insufficient money to accept the next project then proportionate investment is possible for divisible projects so the selection of the projects in case of divisible projects are purely based on profitability index based ranking so the in the order of profitability index ranking i have to invest my uh, i have to invest in the projects that's what divisible projects Whereas in case of indivisible projects, I don't follow profitability index ranking. I'll simply define as many combinations as possible within the capital spending limit. Nothing but I have some money in my hand, but with that money, I cannot accept all the projects. So with that money, I have to define as many combinations as possible. And for every combination, I have to calculate NPV. So the combination that gives higher NPV should be selected. That's what the combination of projects that gives higher NPV should be selected. This is a case of what indivisible projects. So the combinations are required for individual projects, whereas profitability index based ranking is required for divisible projects. That's what regarding capital rationing. Okay. So with this, the concept capital rationing is completed. Now let us handle one problem relating to cap uh, relating to all the capital busting technique we have one problem which is covering all the capital busting techniques problem number 17 now look at this question i'm reading the question a limited company is considering investing a project requiring a capital outlay of 2 lakh rupees forecast for annual income after depreciation but before tax is as follows 
so the annual income after depreciation that means after deducting depreciation but before deducting tax nothing but pbt uh, after deducting depreciation what, what i'll get pbt uh, and they are saying but before tax nothing but before deducting tax so the given term is pbt profit before tax depreciation may be taken as 20% on original cost nothing but it is slm okay and taxation is 50% of net income you are required to evaluate the projects according to the each of the following methods payback period rate of return on original investment rate of return on average investment nothing but arr it is original investment means total investment and then average investment means you know that average investment means half of initial investment minus salvage value plus salvage value plus additional working capital this is arr b and c are representing arr d means discounted cash flow method taking cost of capital as 10 percent indirectly they are asking you to calculate npv net present value index net present value index is nothing but profitability index internal rate of return irr modified irr these are the requirements most of the capital busting techniques are considered here so i am taking this problem to understand all the capital busting techniques now let us go for the solution and your study material i am taking study material solution here so since we got pbt what i should do working note i'm preparing working note here i have written what the first column is year 1 2 5 look at the numbers here year 1 2 5 so they have given profit before tax for all the five years deduct tax from it nothing but 50 percent is the tax rate if i deduct 50 percent tax from it i'll get pat which is also 50 percent of pbt so profit after tax 50 percent is directly calculated here by applying 50 percent on pbt and to that they have added depreciation to get what cash flows after tax pat plus depreciation for all the five years cfats are considered here cumulative cash flows are considered here why because for calculating payback period i need cumulative cash flows discounting factor at 10 percent nothing but present value factor at the rate 10 percent cost of capital are considered here 0 0.9091 0 0.8264 these are all present value factors for the all the five years period so finally they got present value of cash flows and they have multiplied cash flows 90,000 with the present value factor 0 0.9091. I got this present value of cash inflow 81,819. Like that we got present value of cash inflows discounted at cost of capital. So this is present value of total cash inflow discounted at cost of capital. So by that I can calculate few things here. What I can calculate? I can calculate NPV. I can calculate profitability index. And also I can calculate payback period because the cumulative cash flows are available here. And also, in the same table, they are calculating IRR also. Since the cash flows are unequal, since the cash flows are unequal, nothing but changing from one year to another year, I cannot use annuity method. I must use trial and error method. Nothing but you should go ahead with the guesswork. So I should take the first guess rate. Then if the NPV is positive, then I should go for the second guess rate. Then I should go for the third guess rate until I get negative NPV or zero NPV. The discount rate at which NPV is equal to zero is known as what? IRR. So they have discounted the cash flow at 20% also and, I, and they got 2,46,68487 present value of cash inflows. Whereas our investment is how much? Look at the question. Our investment is 2 lakh rupees. Whereas the present value of cash inflows discounted at 20% cost of capital rate is 2,46,487. So again I got positive NPV. Then I should go ahead with the next guess rate 30%. They, they have applied 30% discount rate and they got present value of cash inflows of 2,3063. Again they got what? Positive. NPV. That's why they have taken the next guess rate 32%. So why they have taken 32%? Can I take 40%? Yes, you can take 40% also. That is also right. So they have taken 32% guess rate. At 32% guess rate, they got present value of cash inflows of 1,95,941. 195,941 minus my investment 2 lakhs. That gives me minus 40. 4059 negative NPV. So the IRR lies in between 30% and 32%. So I should use interpolation me method for calculating IRR between 30% and 32%. So in this table, they have covered all the points here. They have calculated CFAD cash inflows. They have accumulated the cash flows, cumulative cash flows. This is cash inflow this is cumulative cash inflow i need cumulative cash inflows for calculating payback period and they've calculated present value of cash inflows at cost of capital for calculating npv and profitability index they've discounted the cash flows at 20 percent discounted the cash flows at 30 percent discounted the cash flows at 32 percent ultimately they got negative npv at 32 percent discount rate so i can calculate all the techniques comfortably with the help of this table first one is payback period method you know my investment is 2 lakhs. 
by the end of second year i got 180000 recovery cumulative cash flows so the balance recovery is 20000 2 lakhs minus 180000 so the balance for 20000 i don't need to wait for complete third year i got 80000 cash flows for third year so for 20000 how much how many years i should wait 20000 into 1 divided by 80000 that's what they have calculated payback period is equal to 2 plus 20000 into 1 divided by 80000 See, I've explained the, uh, this particular payback period technique with the help of an example. The same uh, process you can apply here, you'll get payback period. I got 2.25 years or 2 years, 3 months. Then the next one is average rate of return. What is the formula for average rate of return? Under two methods, they have calculated here because the requirement is two methods. Original investment method, average investment method. Original investment method is nothing but total investment method. What is the formula? Average profit after tax divided by total investment into 100. Remember one thing dear students, you should not consider CFAT here, you must consider PAT here. That means my second column, the second column is my requirement, profit after tax. Don't take cash flows for calculating ARR because ARR is a profit percentage. Okay, profit after tax for all the five years, my profit after tax is different. So add all these numbers, five years numbers and get the total divided by number of years that gives me average profit after tax. That's what they've done. So if you take the average 50 plus 50 plus 40 plus 40 plus 20 divided by five years, you must get 40,000 average profit after tax divided by my total investment 2 lakhs, 40,000 by 2 lakhs into 100. I got 20% ARR. Okay. Now the next one is rate of return on average investment. Average profit after tax by average investment into 100. How much is your average investment? Half of initial investment, 2 lakhs, minus salvage value, 0, plus salvage value, 0, plus additional working capital, 0. So half of 2 lakhs, nothing but 1 lakh. So 40,000 by average profit after tax, 40,000 divided by 1 lakh. So I got 40% ARR under average investment method. Now the next one is discounted cash flows method at cost of capital, nothing but NPV calculation. Just now we got present value of cash inflows at cost of capital that is 3,8193 because they are clearly mentioned, they have clearly mentioned the cost of capital rate is 10%. So at 10% discount rate, we got present value of cash inflows of 3,8193 and deduct your investment of 2 lakh rupees, then I'll get NPV, net present value. Net present value is nothing but the value that is calculated by discounting the cash flows at cost of capital. We got it. Now, the next one is profitability index. So what is the formula for profitability index? Present value of cash inflows discounted at cost of capital divided by present value of cash outflows. I already told you for calculating NPV and profitability index and discounted payback period, the appropriate discount rate is cost of capital. So just now we have calculated present value of cash inflows at cost of capital. The same present value of cash inflows can be used here for calculating profitability index. So 3,8193 is the present value of cash inflows at discounted at cost of capital divided by my my initial investment nothing but present value of cash outflows is 2 lakhs so 3,8193 divided by 2 lakhs that gives you 1.54 profitability index that's what profitability index which is more than one so I can accept the project since the NPV is positive I can accept the project okay now the next requirement is IRR I already told you we got positive NPV at lowest guest rate of 30 percent so lowest guest rate is 10 percent why you are taking 30 percent my dear students lowest guest rate means that guest rate that you have used just before negative NPV nothing but I got negative NPV at 32 percent so the lowest guest rate is just before 32 percent guest rate nothing but 30 percent is your lowest guest rate don't take 10 percent lowest guest rate which will give you IRR but that is inaccurate and that is not much more uh, that is not accurate answer so if you want accurate answer you must use 30 percent as the lowest guest rate and 32 percent as the highest guest rate so Please use here. What is the formula for IRR when it is when it lies in between two guest rates? I must use interpolation method. What is the formula for interpolation method? L1 plus NPV at L1 divided by NPV at L1 minus NPV at L2 into L2 minus L1. They have used one formula here. Don't take it. Just fo follow our formula. So what is the formula? Let me take it. Yeah, they have calculated NPV. That's it. Nothing new here. 2,3063 minus 2 lakhs. This is NPV at L1 divided by 2,3063 minus 1,95,941. This is NPV at... Okay, let me do it. Sometimes on the study material, they'll give you few wrong answers. Let me do it. IRR is equal to... You know the formula. L1 plus NPV at L1 divided by... NPV at L1 minus NPV at L2 into L2 minus L1. L1 is lowest guest rate that is 30% 0.30 plus NPV at L1 
let me calculate NPV at L1. You know that 2,3063 minus 2 lakhs that is 3,063 divided by NPV at L1 is 3,063 minus of minus you know the ne next guest state 32% results in 2 lakh yes that is 195,941 minus 2 lakhs and I got minus 4059 minus 4059 4059 okay into L2 minus L1 0.3032 minus 0.32 minus 0 0.30 so solve it you'll get the answer so let me do it 3063 plus 4059 7122 0.30 plus 3063 divided by 7122 into 0 0.02 yes now 3063 divided by 7122 0.30 plus 0 0.00860 plus 0 0.3 I got 3 0.30860 or 30.86 percent is this is your IRR 30.86 percent is oh how much we got it here thirty point eight six. so same answer we got it now modified IRR see dear students modified IRR means I must convert all the year's cash flows into terminal year by using reinvestment rate as a compounded rate. The reinvestment rate given in the problem is 10%. Am I right? Look at the question. The reinvestment rate is... Yeah, if the reinvestment rate is not given, I must consider cost of capital as a reinvestment rate. That's what I've explained. If you remember, either reinvestment rate or cost of capital, whichever is available, I can use that rate as a reinvestment rate. So what they have done, look at the solution. First year cash flow can be reinvested for four years. Why? Because there is there are other remaining four years. So for all the four years, I can reinvest the first year ending cash inflow of 90,000 at reinvestment rate of 10%, nothing but cost of capital. So this is a compound rate. 1.1 whole to the power of four should be multiplied with 90,000. Then I got future value of 131,769. So 90,000 into one plus 0 0.10 cost of capital rate, whole to the power of four, four years reinvestment period. I got future value of 1,31,769. The second year ending cash inflow of 90,000 can be invested for three years at a cost of capital rate of 1.1, nothing at a cost of capital rate of 10%. So 90,000 into one plus 0.1 0 whole to the power of 3 1 plus 1 point 1 whole to the power of 3 90,000 into 1.1 1 .1 whole to the power of 3 I got 1 lakh 19,790 like that I should reinvest the cash flow of third year for two years and fourth year cash flow can be reinvested for one year and fifth year cash flow can cannot be reinvested 60,000 remains 60,000 like that please calculate the terminal value by converting all the years cash flows into terminal year by using cost of capital as a reinvestment rate okay so by that I got terminal value of 4 lakh 96,000 359. So now the question is what is modified IRR? See that's what they have done here. See the terminal value is how much? 496,359. Modified IRR is the discount rate at which present value of terminal value should be equal to my initial investment. So my terminal value is 496,359. 496,359 should be multiplied with present value factor as I told you or is modified error that I don't know comma 5 years should be equal to my initial investment of initial investment of 2 lakh rupees present value factor or comma 5 years is equal to 2 lakh rupees divided by 4,96,359 and 
and I got 0 0.4029. Trace this factor in NAD factor table, sorry, present value factor table, so that you can get the answer. So they got 2.48, that's not the right way to calculate actually. So let us see the table. The factor should be referred 0.4029. Now look at the present value factor table actually here. You see, I need a present value factor of 0 0.4029 against 5 years. So against 5 years, I must refer this factor 0 0.4029. 0 0.4029. Yes, 0 0.4029. Yes, 10% not possible. 5 years, 4029. Yes. 4029 so here is a factor 402 4029 or 402 I can consider that approximately so this present value factor corresponds to 20% discount rate in present value factor table so I can say the IRR modified IRR in this context is 20% so your modified IRR is 20% by referring this present value factor in the present value factor table so here is your modified error. So look at this, even in the study material, they got 20% modified error. Yes. Please see annuity table. That's what they told you. So we got modified error of 20%. With this problem number 17 this over. So with the help of this problem, we have covered almost every technique in capital busting. Hi dear students, good evening all of you. Our next chapter is cost of capital. Yes. Actually, say for example, if you are investing 1 lakh rupees in a bank and a fixed deposit, if the banker is paying annually 10% rate of interest for your investment, this 10% rate of interest is a return to the investor it is a return to the investor and it is a cost to the banker so why it is a cost to the banker because interest is an expenditure to the banker that is known as cost so why the banker is incurring cost because it is retaining the capital which belongs to so many types of investors so for such retention the banker is paying a compensation called interest which is known as cost in the similar way, the company is retaining the capital, is retaining the capital which belongs to so many types of investors like, so many types of investors like equity shareholders, preference shareholders, in fact even reserves and surplus also, reserves and surplus, preference shareholders, debenture holders, bonds, and bank loans nothing but loans from banks or loans from banks or financial institutions debentures bonds loans from <coughs> banks or financial institutions or from private lenders also so for all these sources the company has to pay some return to the investors for example for equity shareholders it has to pay dividend equity dividend preference shareholders preference dividend debenture holders and bonds interest even for loans also it has to pay interest all these are returns to the investors and cost to the company so such cost must be calculated for every source for every source in the company so since the company is raising several sources like equity preference debentures bonds loans for all these sources the company has to calculate the cost at the beginning of each year the cost at the beginning of each year and this cost should be calculated in percent test terms and this cost should be calculated in annualized terms nothing but it is calculated for one year period okay annualized terms it should be calculated in annualized terms now just like that we have to calculate cost of equity ke 
we have to calculate cost of reserves KR, cost of preference share capital KP, cost of debentures, cost of bonds and cost of loans. All these are simply known as KD, cost of debt. So I have to calculate cost of equity, cost of reserves, cost of preference share capital and cost of debt. And all these sources cost should be considered, should be considered as the cost of the respective sources. But the point is I have to calculate the cost of the total capital, nothing but I have to calculate the average cost of the total capital. Since my capital comprises of so many sources and I, I will never pay same cost to every source. For equity shareholders the cost is higher whereas for debt holders the cost is cheaper and for preference shareholders the cost is moderate. But I want to calculate cost of the whole capital that I am raising. Nothing but I have to calculate the average cost of all the sources. So which average I have to calculate? The cost should be calculated by using weights of the respective sources. Nothing but I am going to calculate weighted average cost of capital. What was that? Weighted average cost of capital. So at the beginning of each year, every company must calculate its capital's cost. Nothing but the cost of capital, which is simply known as weighted average cost of capital. So before calculating weighted average cost of capital, my first job is to calcul calculate the cost of individual sources. So I should learn how to calculate cost of debt and then I should learn how to calculate cost of preference share capital. Then I'll move to cost of equity. Finally, cost of reserves. This is what our job. So if you want to calculate cost at the beginning of every year, see for every year at the beginning, I have to calculate weighted average cost of capital. Nothing but I want to know the cost of my total capital. So for calculating this weighted average cost of capital at the beginning of every year, the company first it should calculate the cost of the individual sources. So that's our first job. Now let me go for the first source called debentures. If I can understand the cost of debentures, I can easily apply the same formula set to the cost of loans and cost of bonds. The same formula set is applicable to bonds and loans also. So debentures are classified into two types. One is irredeemable debentures, irredeemable debentures and redeemable debentures. So what is the difference? If you pay perpetual interest then such debentures are irredeemable debentures that's why irredeemable debentures are also known as perpetual debentures forever you are going to re you are going to pay interest only but you'll never pay principal so principal redemption is not applicable to irredeemable debentures in case of redeemable debentures the debentures must be repayable or redeemable after a specified life period that you are mentioning so such redemption, nothing but repayment of debentures, the principal component of debentures can be redeemed in two forms, either in lump sum, redemption in lump sum, or in installments, redemption in installments, <clears throat> redemption in installments. So this is what the classification. So for all these situations, how to calculate cost of debentures? How to calculate that? Let me start with the irredeemable debentures. Irredeemable debentures. One point I need to tell you for every source, it can be debenture, preference share, equity share. I have to calculate cost under two circumstances. One at the time of fresh issue. The second one is for the existing instrument, financial instrument like debenture, preference shares and equity shares. Existing instrument means after issuing such source from second year onwards that becomes an existing instrument. So I have to calculate cost at the time of issue and then I have to calculate cost at the beginning of each year after the first issue. Okay, nothing but I have to calculate cost at the beginning of first year, at the beginning of second year, at the beginning of third year like that I have to calculate cost at the beginning of each year only for first year it's a case of fresh issue from second year onwards it will be the cost of existing instrument so why you are saying this because for fresh issue I, i'll always use net profits as a denominator base whereas for existing instrument i'll consider market price because after issue every financial instrument like debentures bonds shares 
preference shares, equity shares, all these financial instruments will be listed in Indian stock exchanges like BSC and NSC and those are going to be traded. So we can see some price for such instruments and such price as a basis for calculating the cost of every source, cost of debentures, cost of preference shares and cost of equity shares from second year onwards. Okay, after the issue. So for this reason, I have to calculate cost under two circumstances in case of fresh issue for, for the first time. <clears throat> in case of fresh issue what is the formula for cost of debentures simple cost of debentures kd is equal to you know i have to write the money that i am receiving in the denominator because for this loan only for this money only i am paying cost the cost should be written in the numerator nothing but see in shortcut form i am going to write it np so what I, what I am going to pay? Interest. But for this interest, I will enjoy some tax saving. Why? Because interest is a tax deductible expenditure. So Income Tax Act allows the interest expenditure on debt as an allowable expenditure. So since you are deducting such interest, since you are deducting this particular interest portion while calculating taxable profit, you can save some tax liability. Because if you raise equity, such dividend, if you raise preference share capital, such preference dividend payment are not tax deductible expenditure. So I cannot enjoy tax saving by paying preference dividend and by paying equity dividend. But by paying interest, I can reduce my tax liability. Such saving is a benefit. Interest is a cost. Tax saving is a benefit. So tax saving on interest can be calculated by multiplying interest with tax rate. So take the common term I out of it, then I'll get I into 1 minus T by NP. This is the formula for cost of debentures, irredeemable debentures in case of fresh issue. So what is the formula? <coughs> interest after deducting tax saving. That's why this is known as after tax interest. After tax interest means interest after deducting tax saving. So I into 1 minus T is your cost. Cost divided by my net proceeds that gives me cost of debentures at the beginning of the first year. So that's my cost, uh, the annual percentage cost. Okay, this is an annual percentage cost. In the similar way, after one year, I have to calculate cost of debentures even for existing instrument also in case of existing instrument. In case of existing instrument, what is the formula? Cost of debentures KD is equal to same numerator I into 1 minus T only but in the denominator instead of taking net process I must consider market price of the debenture. So just like this first year for first year I should consider net process because at the time of fresh issue I will receive net proceeds and then at the end of first year my cost will be I into 1 minus T interest after deducting tax saving but from second year onwards for calculating cost of debentures at the beginning of second year I must use market price here rather than net proceeds. So at the end of second year the cost is I into 1 minus C there is no change in it but I have to consider market price. So from for existing instruments always the denominator is market price but not net process only for fresh issue I must consider net process. The question is how to calculate net process I'll explain. So my dear students in these two formulas I means interest interest amount on the single debenture face value okay T is income tax rate. NP means net profits. Sir, how you can calculate net profits? Let me show you how to calculate net profits. Simple. Every debenture can be issued either at face value or at premium or at discount. If you are issuing debentures at premium, add premium to that particular face value to get issue price. If you are issuing such debentures at discount, deduct such, deduct such discount from face value in order to get issue price. So face value add or less premium or discount. If it is a premium add it. If it is a discount deduct it. Then you are, you are going to get issue price. From this issue price please deduct issue expenses like <coughs> issue expenses like flotation cost flotation cost underwriters commission flotation cost underwriters commission and brokers <coughs> sorry my dear students the issue expenditures can be given in any form like flotation cost underwriters expenses 
and sorry underwriters commission and brokerage generally these three expenses are expressed as a percentage on issue price or face value it depends so these issue expenses must be applied on face value or issue price whichever is higher so based on the information if issue price is more apply issue expenses percentage on issue price if face value is more then apply issue expenses percentage on face value just be, why because sometimes my issue price may be discounted price in that case the issue price is low whereas face value is higher 100 is face value issue price is 90 after deducting 10 percent discount just like i'm taking example so in that case on which price i must apply issue expenses say for example if the issue expenditure flotation cost is given as a percentage that is five percent so without mentioning anything about it so such five percent must be applied on face value or issue price whichever is higher so after deducting issue expenses i'll get net profits this is the way to calculate net profits so i'm not explaining these terms called flotation cost underwriters commission brokers because it kills time so since it's a fast track class just follow the format so net profits face value add premium or less discount then i'll get issue price minus issue expenses rotation cost underwriters commission brokerage and net process so successfully we understood every term with this irredeemable debentures cost computation is completed now i'm moving to the next area called redeemable debentures Yes, <coughs> even for redeemable debentures also, there are two cases in case of fresh issue and in case of existing instrument. What are the formulas? Sir? Simple in case of fresh issue, cost of debentures KD is equal to i into 1 minus t is a common term in addition to that i must add one term called rv minus np by n whole divided by rv plus np divided by 2 it's a shortcut formula for calculating cost of debentures in case of fresh issue redeemable debentures so i into 1 minus t plus rv minus np by n so you know my dear students this i into 1 minus 2 is a known term so why you are taking the second term rv minus np say for example i am issuing debentures at 100 rupees whereas redeeming the debentures at 110 that means i am taking 100 rupees from the debenture holder whereas i am repaying 110 rupees at the time of redemption that means additionally i am paying premium at the time of redemption so how much additional money i am paying 10 rupees 110 minus 100 110 rupees i am repaying whereas 100 rupees i am i am getting from the debenture holder i am receiving from the debenture holder additionally i am paying 10 rupees premium cost divided by say for example if the life of such debentures because these debentures are redeemable debentures so these debentures will carry some life so the life of such debentures are 10 years so if i write 10 years here 110 minus 100 10 rupees divided by 10 years so per annum premium cost to the company is 1 rupee this is a premium cost perception in the similar way sometimes the redemption value can be less and net process can be more and that can be a benefit to the company so this can be happened also so my dear students <clears throat> my suggestion is instead of interpreting this particular formula you better follow the formula strictly okay if, so why you are taking the denominated term nothing but i am receiving net process i am redeeming some value i am taking average of these two numbers so net process in at the beginning of the uh, at, at the time of issue and redemption value on redemption date so these two num the average of these two numbers must be considered for calculating cost of debentures see this is not a mathematically derived formula it is just an approximate i mean it is just a formula for approximate answer you don't get accurate answer but still it is an acceptable answer for getting full marks okay now this is for fresh issue so you now the question sir what is i i means interest t means income tax rate as usual so what is rb redemption value at the time of redemption np means net process as usual you know n is life of debentures life of debentures means number of years this is for fresh issue in case of existing instrument in case of existing instrument same formula instead of writing net process please write market price so formula will be i into 1 minus t plus rv minus mp by n whole divided by rv plus mp divided by 2 nothing but instead of taking what 
net process i'm taking market price of debentures this is for existing instrument so we understood fresh issue and we understood existing instrument so with this redeemable debentures cost computation is over so successfully we have completed debentures cost computation so what about redemption installment irr concept must be applied irr concept must be applied also known as ytm method this is not there in your syllabus actually so not an issue so my dear students let us go for this next source called preferences cost of preferences so before going for cost of preference share one more point i want to tell you regarding redemption value unless otherwise specifically stated in the problem i should always assume that rb means redemption value which is always equal to face value if there is no information in the problem what i should do rb is equal to par value or face value if there is an information like premium that means uh, there is a specific point in the problem the debentures are redeemable at a premium of 10% or at a premium of 20% or at a premium of 15% then consider such redemption value by adding such premium so if there is no information in the problem i should always assume that redemption value is equal to par value now let me go for the next source called cost of preferences before going for cost of before going for calculating cost of preferences let me tell you one important point whatever the preference dividend you are paying on preference shares for every year that is not a tax deductible expenditure in fact this is an appropriation so you cannot enjoy tax saving on preference dividend so we have applied i into 1 minus t for cost of debentures computation but here i am not going to apply preference dividend into 1 minus tax rate so why you are not taking preference dividend into 1 minus tax rate because preference dividend is not an allowable expenditure under the provisions of income tax act so i don't get tax saving because of preference dividend so don't multiply pd with 1 minus tax rate that's what the important point you should keep in mind while calculating cost of preferences so here also i am going to classify these preferences into two types irredeemable preferences <clears throat> and redeemable preferences and redemption lump sum is a case that i am going to handle nothing new here now let me start with the first area called irredeemable preferences just like in debentures here also i am going to classify the two situations two circumstances one in case of fresh issue other one is in case of existing instrument in case of fresh issue nothing new the same formula set that i am going to use but instead of using i into 1 minus t i am going to use preference dividend so what is the formula for cost of preference share capital if you ask me the formula is same nothing new in the denominator i'll take net process only but in the numerator instead of taking i into 1 minus t i must consider preference dividend that's it nothing new here okay in case of existing instrument what i what you need to consider in case of existing instrument you know dear students for existing instrument what you'll write substitute the term net proceeds with market price that's it so kp is equal to preference dividend divided by mp mp means market price of preferences market price of preferences pd means preference dividend in the previous formula mp means market price of debentures here mark, uh, i should apply market price of preferences okay this is for irredeemable preference share capital let me go for the next area called <coughs> redeemable preference share capital the same formula set that i'm going to use nothing new here again in case of fresh issue and in case of existing instrument recollect the previous formula the same formula is applicable here also just instead of taking i into 1 minus i'll take pd so kp cost of preference share capital kp is equal to instead of i into 1 minus i'm taking preference dividend into plus i mean preference dividend plus rv minus np by n the same formula divided by rv plus np divided by 2 nothing new here so what about these terms pd means preference dividend rb means rv means redemption value of preferences np means net proceeds on issue of preferences n means life of preferences that's it okay so what about existing instrument substitute the term market price in the place of what net process nothing new in case of existing instrument in case of existing instrument what i'll do kp is equal to preference dividend plus rv minus mp by n 
whole divided by RV plus MP divided by 2. That's it. So what about MP? Market price of preference share. That's it. So this is regarding cost of redeemable preference share capital. That's it. Now, dear students, let us understand few more formulas which are given in your study material by applying dividend tax actually. So every formula is covered except one 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 additional formula that i need to that i need to explain what was that this one actually have you observed this formula i plus rv minus np by n whole i mean for such whole term i'm multiplying one minus x so why you are multiplying for whole term actually i should write i into one minus t plus rv minus np by n that's what the original formula why you are taking uh, one and uh, why you are multiplying this one minus x set with a whole numerator term see this is one of the assumption generally interest is tax deductible expenditure sometimes if the rv minus np difference premium is also a tax deductible expenditure nothing but premium is a cost to the company so for example i'm raising 100 from the debenture holder whereas i'm repaying 110 that means additionally i'm paying 10 rupees cost and if such cost i mean the cost is known as what premium cost at the time of redemption if the income tax department allows such premium cost as one of the expenditure annually then i can take such premium cost as an expenditure but also i can take such premium cost for considering tax saving that uh, that means even for premium payment also i'll get tax saving premium into tax rate nothing but tax saving so for the second term also I must multiply RV minus NP by N into 1 minus tax set. That's what you need to apply actually. But in majority cases I am not going to use this formula. That means no, uh, I will always try to apply the first two formula only. I into 1 minus C plus RV, RV minus NP by N whole divided by RV plus NP by 2. For whole that for, for the entire numerator term I am not going to multiply 1 minus tax rate. But they have given one formula in case if at all if you can if you, if you can find any problem in the examination like even the premium which is payable by the company is tax deductible. If you can find such point, then you should change the formula. Instead of multiplying such 1 minus tax rate with I only, you should also multiply such 1 minus tax rate with the second term called RV minus NP by N. So the formula will be changed completely. I into 1 minus tax rate plus RV minus NP by N into 1 minus tax rate whole divided by RV plus NP by 2. Hopefully, you cannot find such kind of problems. Hopefully. Now, this is one more point <clears throat> now i'll also i need to explain this uh, term called amortization of bond nothing but valuation of bonds and then i need to explain cost of convertible debentures i'll explain no issue let me handle the next areas called cost of preference share capital i have explained every formula here but before going for that i need to give you one important term called dividend tax in case in case if you can see the dividend tax in the problem then the formula will be slightly changed what will happen look at the formula this is your regular formula pd plus rv minus np by n whole divided by rv plus np by 2 for redeemable preferences i know that when dividend tax is not considered in case when dividend tax is considered what will happen the formula will be slightly changed instead of writing preference dividend please write preference dividend into 1 plus dividend tax that means i am adding dividend tax to my preference dividend i am increasing the first term nothing but i am adding what preference dividend tax to preference dividend component now that is my cost why because the company itself has to pay what preference dividend tax along with preference dividend payment the company has to pay additionally preference dividend tax so you should add preference dividend tax to your preference dividend nothing but pd plus pd into dt actually so if you take the common term out of it, PD into 1 plus DT, where DT is dividend tax, preference dividend tax. The second term remains same, RV minus NP by N. A numerator, there is no change, RV plus NP by 2. So this formula is applicable only when the dividend tax is considered. Okay, nothing new here. So the same terms they have given here. And also, you should understand one important term called computation of dividend tax. So how I can calculate dividend tax? Let me tell you a few important points here. First of all, the tax rate can be given on dividend. The regular tax rate can be given on the, uh, I mean the regular the regular tax rate which is applicable on dividend can be given normal tax rate. Along with that, they'll give you surcharge. So surcharge, if the surcharge percentage is given in the problem, that should be calculated on tax on dividend. 
and if the education has sent secondary and higher education has are given in the problem then those two percentages should be applied on regular tax rate plus surcharge sir i'm not understanding this point how you can explain this let me show you one solution for understanding this point now look at one of the illustration which is given in the study material i'll straight away explain this point tax if tax on dividend is 12.5% surcharge is 2.5% education cess is 3% calculate the cost of preference share capital you cannot you should not add 12.5 plus 2.5 plus 3 you have to calculate this dividend tax in a different way now let us see the dividend tax 12.5% is a regular tax rate which is given in the problem surcharge should be applied on 12.5% 12.5 into 2.5% i got 0.3125 have you observed it 3% i mean actually 2.5% of 12.5 that is 0.3125 this is the second part okay surcharge part and the third part is education cess is 3% education cess 3% should be applied on the first tax rate dividend tax rate plus surcharge rate so nothing but 12.5 plus i got 0.3125 surcharge so 12.5 plus 0.3125 into 3% so i got 0.384375 nothing but approximately 0.3844 so like that you have to apply so again i'm repeating surcharge should be applied on the first tax rate 12.5% and then education cess should be applied on tax rate plus surcharge so like that you have to calculate dividend tax actually and such dividend tax should be substituted in the formula so so that you can get answer okay this is regarding dividend tax application now the same application is applicable to irredeemable preferences also so the regular formula is preference dividend by net process or preference dividend by market price for existing instrument when dividend tax is not considered if the dividend tax is considered the formula will be slightly changed so pd into 1 plus dividend tax divided by net proceeds for fresh issue or market price for existing instrument should be considered so this is a formula i must apply if dividend tax is considered okay okay then fine now i need to explain two concepts two more concepts for debentures see how to calculate the value of the bond for calculating value of the bond i need two things actually one is the future cash flows the future cash flows and expected interest rate which is also known as expected yield on the bond expected interest rate this is not the actual interest rate on bond this is expected interest rate of investors also known as expected yield expected yield so the future cash flows from every bond depends upon the nature of the bond if the bond is a redeemable bond i'll get the cash flows in two forms one is interest cash flows for every year interest per annum interest cash flows for every year and redemption value on redemption sometimes this redemption value can be made in lump sum redemption at the time of redemption you may get the complete value or this redemption value can be done in installments form also so if it is given in installments form such installments and interest should be added every year and such i mean you have to define future cash flows accordingly so i'll show you one problem so how to calculate value of the bond define the future cash flows and identify the expected interest rate or expected yield discount this future cash flows at this expected interest rate or expected yield on the debentures or bonds so that i'll get value of the bond so what is the meaning of the value of the bond present value of future interest and principal cash flows derived from the bond discounted at investors expected interest rate or invested expected yield that's it investors expected yield okay so that's what the value of the bond so simply discount the future cash flows like interest and principal redemption at investors expected interest rate or expected yield we have one problem related to this particular concept also let me show you here is the problem see 
X Limited is proposing to sell a 5 years bond of 10,000 at 10% rate of interest per annum. The bond amount will be amortized, nothing but will be repaid. Amortized means repaid equally over its life. That means 10,000 by 5 years. Every year, if, if you buy this bond every year, you'll get 2,000 rupees principal redemption along with interest. What is the bond's present value for an investor if he expects a minimum rate of return of 6%? So this 6% is a discount rate. Now look at the points here. First year, what is your cash flow? I will get interest on my principal amount of 10,000. 10,000 into 10%. 1000 rupees is the first cash flow at the end of first year. Along with that, I will also get what? The principal redemption annually because I am getting equal amortization every year. So 10,000 principal that I have invested for 5 years period every year this particular company nothing but who is this? X Limited is giving me 2000 rupees principal along with interest of what? 1000. 2000 plus 1000 my total cash flow is 3000 rupees. Have you observed one thing here? Interest and payment of principal are given here. Now what about second year? See for second year I don't get interest on complete 10,000 rupees because I am getting principal redemption at the end of first year of of 2000 rupees for balance amount only 8000 rupees only i'll get interest so 8000 into 10 percent interest 800 rupees is my amount of interest plus the principal redemption 2000 2800 is my cash inflow for second year like that i must define cash flows for all the five years and these cash flows interest and principal redemption should be discounted at investors expected rate of return called 6% rate which is given in the problem. 6%. So at this rate only I have to discount the cash flows. So how to discount the cash flows? Simple. 1 by 1 plus R whole to the power of N. 1 by 1 plus R means 0 0.06. For first year cash flow, 1 by 1 plus 0 0.06 whole to the power of 1 should be used. For second year, 1 by 1 plus 0 0.06 whole to the power of 2 should be used. And those factors must be multiplied with the respect to cash flows. See, here they have given you one equation instead of this you can use the table like this just simply calculation of value of the bond i'll give you the format only i'm not going to calculate the value of the bond you have to take the columns like this here cash flows already we have defined interest and principal redemption as cash flows Write the present value factors at 6%. 1 by 1 plus 0 0.06 is equal to first year factor. Is equal to second year factor. Like that, calculate the present value factors. Multiply these two numbers so that you will get what? Present value of cash flows. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Just now we have defined all the years cash flows. Write the cash flows here. Okay. Write the present value factors here. Multiply these two numbers. Multiply these two numbers so that you will get what the present value of cash flows. This will be your value of the bond. In the simple table, I can calculate value of the bond instead of using that particular equation. Okay. This is regarding value of the bond. We understood. Now, let me go for the next concept called cost of convertible debentures. Cost of convertible debentures. Sir, what is a convertible debenture? Convertible debenture means the debentures will be converted into certain number of equity shares at the discretion of the investor on redemption date. Generally, for redeemable debenture, debentures, what we will do? For debenture holders, I am going to repay the principal at the time of redemption, either at par value or at premium value. This is what going to happen for redeemable debentures. But for cost of, I mean, but for convertible debentures, what will happen? Instead of giving cash to the debenture holders on redemption, we are going to give shares to the debenture holders, which is decided at the time of the issue itself. So how I can decide that? Simple. Every debenture will be converted into certain number of equity shares. Say for example, each debenture will be converted into 10 shares. So 10 shares will be issued for every debenture on conversion date. So what will happen? The formula will be changed here. For convertible debentures, how to calculate cost of debt cost of debentures nothing but debentures means convertible debentures the same formula that i have used for calculating cost of redeemable debentures the same formula i'm going to apply here i into 1 minus t plus rv minus np by n whole divided by rv plus np by 2 no change in any term all the terms are same except the red mark term called rv rv i must define because at the time of redemption, I am not giving the principal in the form of cash. 
I'm giving their investment in the form of shares. So the value of shares are completely different because shares va share values will change from one year to another year. Always the share price will grow. So the redemption value is a pure computation. So I must use one formula here. The formula for redemption value is number of shares, number of shares for each debenture, number of shares for each debenture on conversion date, on conversion date into the market price of the respective share at the end of the nth year, nothing but at the time of redemption. Okay. For example, every debenture is converted into 10 number of shares and on nth year, the price of the share at the time of redemption is 15 rupees. So I'm going to give them 150 rupees worth of shares to the debenture holders. This is that discretion. They can either they can choose the principal in the form of cash or they can get the shares and they can sell these shares in the market and then they can get their money. That that's their option. From my point of view, how to calculate this redemption value? How to calculate this redemption value in case of convertible debentures? So the redemption value can be calculated like this number of shares for each debenture on conversion into MPN. Now MPN means nth year ending market price. N means life of convertible debentures. Now there is a formula for MPN. What is the formula for MPN? MPN depends on the sh how the share price is go growing. So generally the share price will grow on compounded basis. The formula is MP0 into 1 plus Z whole to the power of N. This is a formula for MPN. Say for example, I want to calculate 50 year ending price and today's share price, today's share price is say for example, it is 10 rupees share price. 1 plus G, the growth rate applicable to the share price is 15%, 1.15, 1.15. For how many years, sir? 5 years. 50 year ending share price I want to calculate. Simple, 1.15, 50 year ending factor I need it. It's a compounding factor. 1 year, 2 years, 3 years, 4 years, 5 years. It is 10 into 2.011357. Multiply this number with 10 rupees. I got 20.11. This is my redemption value of the shares. Nothing but redemption value of the debentures. So, sorry. This is my share price at the end of fifth year. If you multiply this 20.11 with 10 shares, the answer will be changed. Say I have taken another example. Don't uh, confuse. So, don't get confused actually. So, 20.11. 10 into 20.11 means 2 not... 1.11 this is the redemption value of debentures convertible debentures okay see this is a random example this is a random example and this one is a separate number which i have calculated separately okay so don't get confused actually here now dear students with this we understood cost of convertible debentures the only point is redemption value computation that's what you need to understand. Now, let us go for the next area called cost of equity shares. Dear students, expecting fixed future like preference dividend and interest payment is so easy. Whereas for equity shares, the payment of dividend is variable. So based on variable future expectation, calculating cost of equity shares is a cumbersome work and difficult task. Because of this reason, we have several approaches for calculating cost of equity shares. The first approach is dividend by price approach. Second approach is earnings by price approach. Third one, dividend by price plus growth approach. This is a very important approach. Very important approach. Next approach, earnings by price plus growth approach. And then the next approach is realized yield approach.
and finally capital asset pricing model this is very important approach capital asset pricing model shortcut CAPM okay so these are the approaches we need to discuss let us start with its dividend by price approach so CAPM is also a very important approach actually this is also a very important approach let me start with the first approach called dividend by price approach for every source I, I must consider two circumstances in case of fresh issue and in case of existing instrument so in case of fresh issue the formula for cost of equity k is there is no change for debentures computation I have taken I into 1 minus T by net process for preference shares PD by net process here also I am going to take in the denominator net process only but in the numerator I don't take I into 1 minus A I don't take preference dividend I will take DPS dividend per share of equity shareholders ok this is for fresh issue nothing new net process means net process on issue of equity shares in case of existing instrument in case of existing instrument KE is equal to DPS by MP not you must mention MP zero that is very important okay cost of equity KE is equal to DPS by MP not this is for dividend by price approach so what is DPS dividend per share what about MP not current market price per share that means the market price of the share today in year zero not at the end of first year in year zero itself today itself okay this is regarding cost of dividend sorry cost of equity in case of fresh issue and in case of <coughs> existing instrument so for fresh issue I must use net process for existing instrument I must consider MP not okay now let me go for the earnings by price approach simple instead of taking dividend per share I must consider earnings per share that's it nothing new here also the two circumstances in case of fresh issue and in case of existing instrument in case of fresh issue what will happen simple KE is equal to cost of equity KE is equal to instead of taking dividend per share I must consider earnings per share EPS by net process in case of existing instrument what will happen in case of existing instrument KE is equal to cost of equity KE is equal to earnings per share divided by market price MP not so instead of taking net process I am taking current market price per share MP not this is what for existing instrument so the same formula I have applied but instead of taking net process or current uh, sorry instead of taking dividend per share I have taken what EPS earnings per share see these two theories are more or less same there I am taking dividend per share 100% dividend distribution here also I am taking earnings per share the perception is changed here also I am taking EPS there also I am taking EPS but the point is that is about distribution this is about earnings so based on the requirement which is asked in the examination you have to apply the formula accordingly but in most of the cases the next theory that I am going to discuss is very important that is dividend by price plus growth approach dividend by price plus growth approach this is an important theory very important theory very important approach you have to understand so here also see before going for this actually I must say one thing under this theory the dividends will grow for how many years sir forever for indefinite period up to infinite period the dividends will grow but the growth rate is always constant that is what the important point you must remember G is always constant here okay remember that now here also I am taking two circumstances in case of fresh issue cost of equity ke is equal to the notations will be slightly changed no change in the denominator net process only for fresh issue but in the numerator instead of taking constant dividend per share I must consider dividend per share at the end of first year DPS 1 additionally I must add growth ok G in case of existing instrument what will happen just 
write the formula cost of equity ke is equal to this is very important actually i must write fully cost of equity ke is equal to dps 1 by instead of net process i must consider market price today today's market price mp not plus growth rate is quite common growth rate is quite common mp not plus g okay so this is a very important formula you must remember forever until you qualify final okay so dps 1 by mp not plus z even from this formula i am going to define one more formula called mp not actually see ke minus g is equal to dps 1 by mp not then from this mp not is equal to dps 1 by ke minus c actually from this formula only ke is defined but just i'm taking for the sake of understanding mp not from this formula so what is mp not today's price dps 1 by ke minus c sir what is this dps 1 by ke minus c i'll explain first let me define the terms one by one first of all first where dps 1 is equal to dividend per share at the end of first year how i can get this add growth rate to your last year dividend which is known as dps not dps not into 1 plus z power 1 that gives me dps 1 generally i don't mention deep power 1 actually i'll write dps not into 1 plus z if i write power 1 i'll get dps 1 if i write power 2 i'll get dps 2 if i write power 5 i'll get dps 5 if i write power n i'll get what dps n so i can calculate dps n at the end of any year at the end of any year simply by multiplying last year dividend dps not with 1 plus c power n okay here i need dividend per share at the end of first year so the formula will be dps not into 1 plus c power 1 is obvious no need to say that okay now you know that ke means cost of equity mp not means current market price per share mp not means current market price per share and g is equal to growth rate g is equal to growth rate this is a multiplication of two factors called b into r where b is retention ratio how much profit you are retaining of equity shareholders say for example if we got earnings after tax which belongs to equity shareholders of 100 crores and out of that i paid equity dividend i paid equity dividend of 40 crores so how much profit i am retaining 60 crores this is what retain profit okay our retained earnings now look at the point here out of 100 crores profit which belongs to equity shareholders how much profit i have retained 60 crores this is nothing but 60 percent the 60 percent is known as what retention ratio so let me write it clearly retention ratio retention ratio so what about this r r means return on equity return on equity so what is how to calculate return on equity simple profit after tax by equity profit after tax by equity this is a formula for return on equity this is nothing but the profit percentage on my equity fund okay rate of return on equity so if you can multiply these two factors i'll get growth rate okay so what is the formula for growth rate b into r where b is retention ratio this is simply profit after tax minus equity dividend profit after tax minus equity dividend divided by profit after tax okay or i can say retained profit divided by profit after tax this is a formula for what this is a formula for growth rate okay so with this we understood all the terms for dividend by price plus growth approach okay yes now I can go for realized yield approach. Sir, what is this realized yield approach? You know, dear students, realized yield approach is nothing but the return that I have, that I have earned in the past. Realized means past tense. That means the realized yield. Yield means return. So whatever the return that you have realized in the past, that should be expected as equity shareholders expectation called KE for the next year. That means the past return as an equity shareholder whatever we have earned 
the same return if you can expect in the future that is what cost of equity so i am calculating cost of equity ke by taking past as a basis such past is nothing but the realized yield and that return should be expected in the future nothing but this uh, cost of equity ke calculation is nothing but calculation of irr so i have to calculate irr by taking past few years cash flows so compounded growth rate compounded yield should be calculated accordingly the same rate will be cost of equity ke so i'll explain that part when we are handling the study material yes now let me go for the next theory called capital asset pricing model i'll explain this realized yield approach when we are going for a uh, i mean uh, the study material capital asset pricing model this is an important theory shortcut term is capm a famous name capm capital asset pricing model sir so what is this model this model is saying how much return every investor should expect for a given level of risk but they are classifying this risk who are classifying actually this method has been developed by sharp william sharp and mr sharp says risk is classified into two parts systematic risk and unsystematic risk so what is systematic and what is unsystematic risk systematic risk means the risk which is unavoidable the risk which is unavoidable actually this is unavoidable which is applicable to every company in india like inflation rate fluctuations foreign currency rate fluctuations gdp fluctuations and then interest rate fluctuations and the government tax rate fluctuations so if there is a change in any macroeconomic factor that will affect every company share returns so that this is what the risk which arises because of external factors called macroeconomic factors whatever the risk which arises because of external factors called macroeconomic factors that's what systematic risk that is unavoidable any investor in the world should face a systematic risk which is not diversifiable that means by putting different by putting my money in different company shares i cannot avoid this risk and that's why this is non diversifiable risk non diversifiable risk non diversifiable means diversification means investing in more than one company shares investing but i mean if you invest your money in different company securities your risk will be eliminated through diversification so a portfolio if you invest in more than one company shares that means you are forming a portfolio group of securities you are buying so if one company is giving loss the other company will give you profit the abnormal gain from one company will be adjusted against abnormal gain from other company so that you are you will get minimum return so you can avoid risk through diversification that means by putting your money in different company securities by investing your money in different company securities that's what diversification even though by going for diversification you cannot avoid uns- you, you cannot you cannot avoid systematic risk which arises because of what inflation rate fluctuation foreign currency rate fluctuation like that there are some factors economic ec- macroeconomic factors those factors affects every company in india that that is unavoidable whereas unsystematic risk is that portion of total risk which can be avoided through diversification every investor can avoid unsystematic risk why because unsystematic risk is company specific firm specific which is based on the inefficiency of the company so this part of risk can be eliminated by putting my money in different type of securities so if i can invest my money in different company securities i can eliminate this portion of risk so but still i cannot eliminate systematic risk and mr sharp says don't expect additional return or premium for this unsystematic risk because that can be avoided through diversification expect premium only for systematic risk which is measured with beta okay which is measured with what beta so this unsystematic risk is also known as diversifiable risk that means through diversification i can eliminate this portion of risk diversifiable risk that is will be eliminated through diversification by investing in different company securities the portion of risk that is non uh, that is that is not diversifiable is systematic risk which is known as non diversifiable risk and this systematic risk for this systematic risk only you, you must expect premium return for the company shares which is measured with what beta so under capm they have defined one formula called they have defined one formula called cost of equity ke is equal to cost of equity ke is equal to rf plus beta into rm minus rf this is what the formula so what is rf the risk free rate of return that you can earn 
from Indian Treasury bills. The risk-free rate of return that you can earn from Indian Treasury bills. Every investment in India is risky except one instrument which is being issued by government of India. Any bonds issued by government of India or treasury bills are the best examples of risk-free asset. The return that you can earn from such government of India bonds or risk-free, I mean government of India bonds or Indian treasury bills are the best examples for risk-free rate of return or risk-free return or risk-free rate of return. And this beta is systematic risk. Just now I have explained. It's a factor which ranges between like less than one, more than one or equal to one. Your beta can be equal to one, more than one or less than one. Whereas RM is, RM is known as return on market portfolio. Return on market portfolio. Return on market portfolio. Market portfolio means it is nothing but Sensex portfolio or Nifty portfolio. So whatever the return that you can earn from the market portfolio, the best portfolio, which is comprising of top 30 securities in Sensex or top 50 securities in Nifty. If you can take the average return of such portfolio, market portfolio, that is known as return on market portfolio. This is also known as average market return. That means I'm taking the average of top 30 companies return in the Sensex, average market return. So RM means average market return or return on market portfolio and RF you know that. So I'll tell you one more point. Beta, yeah, I have explained beta point and all already in the chapter risk and return. So I don't need to explain this part. So finally, what is the formula for cost of equity KE under CAPM? C RF plus beta into RM minus RF. That is what the formula for cost of equity KE. And also I need to tell you one important point. RM minus RF, which means what? RM minus RF means market risk premium. This is known as market risk premium. That means the risk premium that you can earn by moving from risk free asset to market portfolio. This part of market risk premium can be earned by facing a beta called one time actually. So th that's okay. Just remember the formula RM, RM minus RF means market risk premium. Sometimes this can be known as average market risk premium. Average market risk premium. See, you may be confused between these two terms called average market return and average market risk premium. You should be very cautious while handling these two terms. Just by seeing average term, you should not write RM. Okay. Why? Because RM means average market return. If in the examination, if they've given you this particular term called average market risk premium, you should not write RM because that is market risk premium. So read the sentence very carefully and that, that is clearly saying what average market risk premium. That means I have to consider RM minus RF. That's what the point here. Okay. So with this, we understood cost of equity KE computation under CAPM RF plus beta into RM minus RF. Yes. Thank you. Hi dear students. Good evening all of you. Now. Let us continue with the chapter cost of capital. In the previous session, we understood cost of equity under capital asset pricing model. Now let us go for the next model, next calculation of the next source cost of retained earnings. Here is the source cost of retained earnings. You know, for cost of retained earnings, we have several formulas here actually. Cost of retained earnings. See dear students, retained earnings is the money which belongs to equity shareholders. So whatever the cost which is applicable to equity, the same cost must be applied to cost of retained earnings. So this is first method actually. Method one, under method one, cost of retained earnings is nothing but cost of existing equity KE. So here is a formula cost of retained earnings KR is equal to cost of existing equity KE. This is what the formula. So cost of retained earnings KR is equal to cost of existing equity KE. This is method one. Under method two, you can see two components actually. One is if 
the personal tax rate and brokerage rate or brokerage or commission rate actually you can see here commission and brokerage both the terms are considered as c here okay if the personal tax rates tax rate and uh, brokerage or commission are given then the formula for cost of retained earnings is different actually here so here under method 2 kr is equal to ke into 1 minus tp or personal tax rate or marginal tax rate into 1 minus c into 1 minus c so this is the formula for cost of retained earnings in case of the personal tax rate and the brokerage or commission rates are given here so look at the formula here in the study material or in our material kr is equal to ke into 1 minus t into 1 minus c ke is cost of equity t is marginal tax rate or personal tax rate whereas c is commission or brokerage rate okay these are the terms you should apply you should substitute I mean, that means these terms should be available in the problem if you can substitute these terms in the formula then you can get cost of retained earnings so this is uh, first method and the second method is nothing but cost of retained earnings kr is equal to cost of existing equity ke we have written the first method as second method and second method as first method it doesn't matter actually first you should remember this formula as method one it's cost of retained earnings kr should always be equal to cost of existing equity ke in case if these terms are specifically given in the problem you have to apply this formula okay so this is regarding cost of retained earnings now let us apply these formulas to one of the few problems in the study material there are two problems in the study material now look at this formula a firm is ke sorry a firm's ke return available to shareholders is 10 percent cost of equity ke is 10 percent the average tax rate of shareholders is 30 percent this is tp personal tax rate or marginal tax rate and is expected that two percent is brokerage and that the shareholders will have to pay while investing their dividends in alternative securities for example, instead of retaining the funds, if you distribute the profits to the equity shareholders, they can invest their money, their dividend in other securities. So that they have to pay 2% brokerage cost. That's what they have given here. What is the cost of retain earnings? Since the personal tax rate of shareholders and brokerage rate are given here, I must apply method 2 formula. Nothing but cost of retain earnings KR is equal to KE into 1 minus T into 1 minus B. Here B means brokerage rate. Okay so where ke is equal to rate of return available to the shareholders that is 0.10 or 10 percent and tax rate is 30 percent and brokerage rate is 2 percent so here is the calculation kr is equal to 10 into 1 minus 0.5 personal tax rate and 2 percent is brokerage rate so 10 into 0.5 into 0.98 i got 4.9 percent this is what cost of retain earnings so you can calculate this cost of retained earnings by using method 2 okay now look at 24th problem <clears throat> this is a different problem actually we don't have any problem relating to this particular we don't have any formula relating to this pro problem but they have given a separate formula in the problem itself so this is a copy paste problem actually but still you have to understand this problem there is a chance that this type of questions can be asked in the examination also nowadays uh, in most of the cases, I have to apply this formula only. Cost of data and earnings KR is equal to KE into 1 minus T into 1 minus B. But unfortunately, they have not removed this particular problem, which is based on the old formula actually. So still, you have to remember this formula also. See, this is another formula for cost of data and earnings KR. The formula is K into 1 minus TP minus brokerage rate. This formula is applicable if the opportunity cost of shareholders are given here. See the expected return of, so let me write, uh, let me read the question. AKS Limited retains 10 lakh rupees out of its current earnings. So this is what the retained earnings 10 lakhs. The expected rate of return to the shareholders if they had invested the funds elsewhere is 10%. This is the opportunity cost of equity shareholders capital K. The brokerage rate is 2% and shareholders comes in 30% tax bracket. What is the calculate the cost of retained earnings? Cost of retained earnings KR is equal to K into 1 minus TP minus brokerage rate. That is what the formula you have to apply here. 
this is another formula which is we don't have any formula like this in our regular description actually see they have covered only two methods and this particular formula was not covered actually so but still you you have to remember this formula so kr is equal to capital k into 1 minus tp minus brokerage rate now look at k opportunity cost is 10 percent personal tax rate is 30 percent and whereas the brokerage rate is 2 percent so 10 into 1 minus 0 0.3 that comes to 7 percent minus brokerage rate 2 percent i got 5 percent so alternative combination don't see it just follow the first method itself okay with this we understood cost of retained earnings now let us go for the next area called weighted average cost of capital computation so what is weighted average cost of capital just now i mean actually at the in, in the introductory part and i have explained one part one important component called cost of capital the cost of capital is nothing but the weighted average cost of all the sources so that's what the importance of this chapter i need to calculate weighted average cost of capital as part of that i have calculated cost of debentures cost of preferences cost of uh, equity cost of retain earnings and again i have applied several methods capm etc like that right see after calculating all these sources cost what is my next job my job is to calculate weighted average cost of capital for calculating weighted average cost of capital i need two components actually one is the weights of every source the weights of each source the weights of each source and the second component is cost of each source nothing but cost of debentures cost of preferences cost of uh, equity the cost of specific source cost of each source or cost of specific source this is k and this is weight which is also known as proportion or weight okay in simple terms okay now these weights can be taken from books book values or these weights can be taken from market values also that's why these weights are classified into two types book value weights book value weights and market value weights market value weights book value weights and market value weights okay the question is how to calculate these weights sir see book value weights means i have to take the numbers from books okay nothing but capital structure values from the balance sheet market value weights means i have to consider the market value of every source from the stock market so it can be calculated like this market value of each source is equal to number of units into market price per unit so what is unit here the unit can be equity share the unit can be preference share the unit can be debenture say for example if you are calculating market value of equity the formula is number of equity shares into market price per share if you are calculating market value of preference shares number of preference shares into market price per preference share like that you have to calculate market value of every source and then you have to calculate weights of the sources based on market values so book values means generally book values will be given in the problem itself you don't need to calculate it like equity share capital face value preference share capital face value debentures face value retained earnings have to take okay like that by taking those values if you can calculate weights then such weights will be book value weights so that's how to calculate weighted average cost of capital let me give you one format for calculating weighted average cost of capital calculation of weighted average cost of capital in simple terms these are the columns source nothing but equity preference debentures like that amount how much money you are taking how much amount you are taking is it market value weight or book value weight proportion or this is also known as weight proportion or weight and cost of specific source nothing but cost of capital of every source the cost of each source weight into cost of capital this gives me weighted average cost of capital say for example if i am taking equity share capital retained earnings preference share capital and debt 
so write the amounts here okay write the amounts here based on the values given in the problem such values can be book values such values can be market values say for example if this amount is 1 this is 2 this is 3 this is 4 I have to take total this is my total of all the sources 1 plus 2 plus one plus two plus three plus four okay then i should go for proportions the proportion of every source multiply these proportions with the respective sources cost which we have calculated first of all my job is to calculate cost of every source after calculating cost of every source then i will calculate weighted average cost of capital multiply these two numbers nothing but third column into fourth column gives me last column that is my answer actually weight into cost of capital so this total is your ko overall cost of capital also known as weighted average cost of capital ko okay this is the way to calculate weighted average cost of capital here is a format okay now see We are going to handle one problem relating to this concept weighted average cost of capital that covers every source cost computation also. Look at 26th problem. I am taking study material directly. 26th problem I am taking here. Okay. Here is the question. 26th. Okay. Asia on all limited has a following capital structure rupees in lakhs equity share capital 100 lakhs with a with a number of shares of 10 lakh shares so the number of shares are 10 lakh shares the total capital is 100 lakhs so 100 by 10 simply you'll get what 10 rupees face value face value of equity share is 10 rupees 12 percent preference share capital is 10 lakhs and number of shares are 10 10,000 shares so 10 lakhs by 10,000 shares So the face value of preference share is 100 rupees. Retained earnings 120 lakhs. 14% debentures of 70 lakhs with a debentures of 70,000. So I can write 70 lakhs divided by 70,000. I got 100 rupees per debenture. And 14% term loan is 100 lakhs. Totally the money is 400 lakhs. The market price per equity share is 25. MP not. The next expected dividend per share is 2 rupees. That is DPS1. Next expected dividend means next year expected dividend DPS1. And expected and is and it is expected to grow at a rate of 8%. G is 8%. The preference shares are redeemable after 7 years at par. At, that, this is not PER. That, that is at par. Nothing but the redemption value is par value. And are currently coded at 700 rupees per share. That is market price per preference share debentures are redeemable after six years so debentures are also redeemable debentures at par so this is par value and their current market price of the quotation is 90 rupees per debenture so the so the market price per debenture is also 90 rupees so the tax rate applicable to the firm is 50 percent now what i should do i can calculate weighted average cost of capital here by using book value weights as well as by using market value weights. Let me show you how I can do this. Under book value method, the first computation, then under market value method, and that is the second computation. Before showing the solution, I need to tell you one important point. You can use book value weights or market value weights, but it doesn't matter to calculation of cost of every source. So while calculating cost of every source, I don't consider whether I'm taking book value weights or market value weights because for both the weights the cost remains same so there will be no change in fourth column there will be no change in fourth column what is fourth column cost of capital column so that is always same whether you take book value weights or market value weights the cost of capital column remains same okay so then what i should do sir simple identify the weights that's it so the only changing terms are weights but not the cost of each source so how to calculate cost of ESOs regularly? So whatever the formulas we have discussed, the same formulas should be applied here. So the only thing you have to consider is whether the source is fresh issue or existing instrument. If it is a fresh issue, I must consider net process, existing instruments, market price should be considered. Okay. 
so so here is the first part cost of equity what is the formula for cost of equity dps1 by mp0 plus g see dps1 means expected dividend per share actually so dps1 is how much 2 expected dividend per share dps1 2 by market price per share 25 you don't need to multiply 100 here itself okay 2 by 25 plus growth rate 8 percent you know that 2 by 25 means it is 8 percent 8 plus 8 16 percent you can write like that you don't need to multiply into 100 actually you can straight away calculate the percentage 2 by 25 percent symbol that gives you 8 percent 8 plus 8 16 percent so what is the formula for cost of equity ke dps1 by mp0 plus c dps1 2 divided by mp0 25 plus g 8 percent i got cost of equity 16 percent the next source is cost of preference share capital actually we have we understood two formulas for ca calculating cost of debentures and uh, i mean actually for cost of debentures for cost of preference shares we have two formulas one for irredeemable another for redeemable preference shares just now we understood that these preference shares are redeemable preference shares so that i can apply the second uh, formula called preference dividend plus rv minus np by n whole divided by rv plus np by 2 since the market prices are given here i should not write net process here actually i must write market price but in the study material they have written net process instead of market price you better change it so that that gives you better clarification okay so that so what is the formula for cost of retained earnings preference dividend plus rv minus mp divided by n whole divided by rv plus mp divided by 2 so instead of net process here you must write mp mp is market price now you know that my dear students preference dividend is 12 percent yes 100 is a face value of preference share i've calculated if you remember 100 into 12 percent preference dividend 12 rupees divided by sorry plus rv redemption value at par 100 minus market price of preference shares preference shares are 75 rupees so the so the preference shares are traded at 75 rupees the quotation price in the stock market is 75 divided by life of preference shares 7 years whole divided by 100 plus 75 by 2 so after calculating this we got 17.8 percent you know how to calculate this portion of this portion right now let me explain the second part cost of debentures actually we have discussed two formulas irredeemable redeemable but for redeemable debentures also, I've given you two formulas. In the study material itself, they've given two formulas. Applying 1 minus tax rate to whole term, I, I and RV minus NP by N. And applying into, into 1 minus tax rate only for interest. But here in the calculation part, they've taken into, I mean, 1 minus tax rate multiplying factor for both the terms. That means interest as well as RV minus NP by N. So if you can see here, cost of retained earnings KR is equal, sorry. Cost of debentures KD is equal to, what is the formula? It is simply I plus RV minus MP because it's an existing instrument. MP by N whole divided by RV plus MP divided by 2. Whole the term should be multiplied with 1 minus tax rate. So here is your interest component. 100 into face value. Face value 100 into interest rate 14% debentures. So I got, I got 14 rupees interest here plus RV redemption value at par 100 minus market price of debentures. So don't write net process here. You better write market price. So market price of debentures are 90 rupees divided by life of debentures 6 years whole divided by 100 plus 90 divided by 2. That whole term should be multiplied with 1 minus tax rate into 1 minus 0 0.5. Don't apply 1 minus tax rate only for 14. You should also apply that 1 minus tax rate also for 100 minus 90 by 6. So if you can compute this part you'll get 8.24 some odd number that will be 8.25 percent approximately okay and you know dear students for calculating cost of term loans processing charges etc see if these terms are not given like processing charges related to term loan or i mean if there are no adjustments relating to net process i'll always take one shortcut formula called i into 1 minus t interest rate into 1 minus tax rate so the formula is KTL cost of term loan is equal to I into 1 minus C. I can also write KD also. Okay. So interest rate into 1 minus tax rate. This is a shortcut formula. When the net proceeds, when the net proceeds are exactly equal to the face value that I'm raising. Okay. Nothing but the amount that if I'm raising some amount, if I'm receiving the same amount, that means the net process are equal to the face value of amount that I'm issuing, then I can use this shortcut formula I into 1 minus T. So for term loans, we don't have any adjustments regarding net process. So I'm taking, I'm taking the shortcut formula interest into one minus tax rate. 
Sir, can I use other formula? You better use this formula only. This gives you answer very easily. Okay. KD is equal to 14% into 1 minus 0.5. I got 7%. 14 into 1 minus 0.5. I got 7%. This is cost of term loans. So successfully we have calculated cost of every source. Now I can calculate weighted average cost of capital by using book value weights. Weighted average cost of capital by using market value weights. Let us handle the first part of the question. Weighted average cost of capital by using book value weights. Now look at the columns. Sources of finance. You better write source. And then book values. Nothing but amount rupees. And weights proportion. Weights are proportions. Nothing but the third column and finally fourth column cost of capital specific cost and last column proportion into cost of capital or weight into cost of capital so you please understand there are five sources here equity share capital 12 percent preference share capital retained earnings 14 percent debentures 14 percent term loan so why we have not calculated cost of retained earnings you can write we don't have any personal taxes and flotation costs here I mean, uh, brokerage, whether brokerage rate or commissions are, uh, I mean, these two numbers, these two terms are not given in the problem. So I can take cost of retail earnings, KR is exactly equal to cost of existing equity, KE, method one in our discussion. Okay. As per study material, that is method two. Okay. So I can write cost of equity as cost of retail earnings. You can see here 16% and 16%. They have taken 16, 16 for cost of equity and cost of retail earnings. Now they have written what the amounts, book values. So what are the book values? What are the numbers given in the problem? Those are book values. So 100 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 120 lakhs, 70 lakhs, 100 lakhs. You can see these numbers in the problem itself and calculate the proportions. Let us calculate proportions one by one. First one, 100 lakhs divided by 400 lakhs. So I got a total of 400 lakhs. You can check that one also. And see, 100 plus, 10 plus, 120 plus, 70 plus, 100, I got 400 so the first source cost is 100 divided by 400 it will be 25 percent nothing but 0 0.25 and 10 divided by 400 it will be 2.5 percent nothing but uh, I can write like this 10 divided by 400 is equal to 0 0.025 and 120 divided by 400 I got 0 0.3 so like that you have to calculate the proportions the I mean the condition should be the proportions total should be equal to 1 in case if the proportions totals are not equal to 1, you may not get accurate answer. You better round off one of the proportion and ultimately you must get the total of all the proportions should be equal to 1. And write the cost of every source. Just now we have calculated cost of every source 16, 17.8, 16, 8, 8.257%. We have arrived all the numbers. Okay. And in these numbers, I need to tell you one important point. Cost of retained earnings care is exactly equal to cost of existing equity KE that is 16%. So I have written 16% for equity, 16% for cost of retained earnings. Now multiply the cost of every source with the proportions so that I'll get what proportion into cost of capital. The last column will be weighted average cost of capital. In this context, the my cost of capital KO is 12.439. This is under book value weights. So what about market value weights? Under market value weights, your job is to calculate cost um, your job is to calculate market value of every source but while calculating market value of every source there is a problem with retained earnings or whether i should consider retained earnings or not my point is please calculate market value of equity generally your market value of equity is a big number which is loaded with three components generally if you ask me uh, conceptually your market price is loaded with your market value of equity is loaded with three components one is your face value of equity share capital. The second one is retained earnings. The third one is the additional value which is added to the shares because of NPV, net present value. So your market value of equity is loaded with all these values. But I will consider the market value of equity is loaded with only two components. One is the face value of equity. The other one is retained earnings. So what I, I should do? First, I will calculate market value of equity. Then I will split that amount into equity share capital and retained earnings in the ratio of book value of equity share capital and retained earnings that's what my job so here is the book value of the equity share capital and retained earnings have you observed the numbers my equity share capital is 100 lakhs my retained earnings are 120 lakhs in which ratio there the numbers are here 100 is to 120 that's what the ratio so you don't need to solve it just 100 is to 120 that's what the ratio of book value of equity share capital and book value of retained earnings in that ratio only i must split this market value of equity into equity share capital and retained earnings under market value weights so even under market value weights i'll write retained earnings 
but such values are based on market value of equity not the book values okay now let me calculate total market value of equity shares 10,000 10 lakh shares are here every share price is 25 so 25 is the market price 10 lakh shares into 25 I got 2 crore 50 lakhs market value of equity now split this amount into market equity share capital and retained earnings in the ratio of book value of equity share capital and retained earnings now look at the ratio here 100 is to 120 ratio between equity shares and retained earnings 100 is to 120 that's all the ratio instead of that we can write 100 plus 120 220 100 by 220 120 by 220 that's what uh, that is more than enough but they solved it 5 is to 6 that's okay now 5 by 11 is equity share capital 6 by 11 is retained earnings market value of equity 2 crore 50 lakhs into 5 by 11 i got 1 crore 13 lakh 63637 say so out of market value of equity i've taken what the market value of equity out of market value of equity i have taken uh, the face value of equity share capital so nothing but 2 crore 50 lakhs into 5 by 11 i got market value of equity and then i should take another number called market value of retained earnings see these words are not appropriate actually i must write equity value retained earnings value so market value of retained earnings how to get it out of 2 crore 50 lakhs how much is the retained earnings value 6 by 11th part so 2 crore 50 lakhs into 6 by 11th part i got 1 crore 36 lakh 36,363. you can calculate it and check it so these numbers i am going to take for calculating weighted average cost of capital under market value weights here are the columns the first so column source the second column market values i'm not taking book values here i'm taking market values and then the third column is weights or proportions and cost of every source and finally weights into cost of capital so write all the sources equity share capital 12 percent preference share capital retained earnings 14 percent debentures 14 percent term loan have you observed one thing i've written retained earnings also even in market value weights but i don't take retained earnings which is given in the problem i'll take the market values that i've calculated just now okay Okay. Now substitute the numbers. First look at market value of equity share capital. 1 crore 13 lakh 63,637 and 1 crore 36 lakh 36,263. These are the market value of equity share capital and market value of retained earnings. Now let us go for preference share capital, debentures, term loans. Now debentures, uh, yeah, preference shares. How many preference shares are there actually? The preference shares are 10,000 preference shares. Market price per preference share is 75. So it will be 7,50,000. 7 7,50,000. That's what the number we have written here. 7,50,000. In the similar way, number of debentures. The debentures are 70,000 debentures. The market price of each debenture is 90 rupees. So I got 63 lakhs. Here is the market value of debentures. So we have written market value of preferences, market value of debentures, equity is over. So the only term remaining is term loan. Generally, since the term loans are not traded in stock markets, I'll take the face value as or the book value as a market value. So you should not ignore this. So you must write term loans also and the value is 100 lakhs. The book value remains. The book value is nothing but market value. So successfully we have written all the, sorry. Successfully, we have written all the values, all the market values. Now take the proportions. So these numbers are different or different from the previous numbers. The previous numbers are book values, whereas these numbers are market values. So whatever the weights you are going to get, such weights are, such proportions are calculated based on market value. So these proportions are also known as market value proportions or market value weights. The proportions are weights that are calculated by taking market values are simply known as market value weights now multiply these proportions with the specific cost of every source so sir what cost i should consider the same cost which you have considered in the previous problem so the same cost i have to write here so the cost of every source into weights that gives me what weighted average cost of capital 12.75 percent based on market value weights that's it so with this we understood how to calculate weighted average cost of capital and also we have covered all the sources cost computation that's it okay Yes, I need to explain one last formula in this chapter, growth rate, G formula.
actually g is equal to b into r this is one formula we have another formula actually this g is equal to b into r i'm going to cover this part and the chapter dividend policy actually so that's why i have not explained this part because there is a model called gordon growth model that will be covered under dividend policy or, div or dividend uh, yeah dividend policy chapter actually yes now then we'll check the study material we have one formula which we need to cover here is the one average method growth rate can be calculated by using this formula g is equal to nth root of d not by dn minus 1 okay actually this means it's a compounded growth rate actually current year dividend today's dividend d0 is equal to few years back dividend nothing but n years back dividend this is not future dividend dn means n years back dividend n years back dividend into 1 plus z whole to the power of n so over the period of these n years what is the growth rate you have to apply that so i need average growth rate that i got or that i have achieved in the past few years so if you multiply the last i mean n years back dividend with growth rate of all the past few years or n number of years then i'll get what today's dividend that's what the understanding here so from this only they have defined this formula d0 divided by dn is equal to 1 plus z whole to the power of n then 1 plus z whole to the power of n is equal to d0 divided by dn then 1 plus z is equal to nth root of d0 by dn then g is equal to nth root of d0 by dn minus 1 this is what the formula for growth rate okay so how to calculate nth root you know that square root 15 times minus 1 divided by n plus 1 into is equal to 15 times that gives you nth root of any number okay this is a way to calculate growth rate so you just remember the formula that's more than enough okay this is for calculating average growth rate okay with this the chapter cost of capital is completed now i can enter into the next area called capital structure see under this chapter my objective is to identify the best capital structure actually structure means the structure of capital here structure means the proportion or weight of every source so the objective of this chapter is to define the best capital structure in such a way that the shareholders wealth market price per share should be maximized this is what the objective of this uh, uh, this is what the objective of the chapter capital structure my objective is to maximize the shareholders wealth so in such a way that I should fix the capital structure. So if there are several alternative capital structures available, which alternative capital structure I must choose? The alternative capital structure that maximizes my market price per share must be chosen. Okay. So say for example, the fund that I need for accepting the projects can be procured, can be raised from several sources. The combinations or based on my financing decision which is nothing but capital structure decision i can raise my capital in three alternative ways these three are three alternative capital structures sir so what are these alternative capital structures say for example in alternative capital structure i want to raise 50 percent equity and 50 percent debt and in alternative two capital structure, I want to raise 70% equity and 30% debt. Whereas in alternative three, I don't want to raise debt. I want to raise 100% equity. These are the three alternative capital structures 
through which I can raise my required fund. Only one out of these three alternatives should be chosen. So which alternative I must consider? That's what this chapter is all about actually. The alternative capital structure that maximizes your market price per share should be taken. Okay. Any capital structure you're choosing that doesn't matter to your sales variable cost contribution and EBIT. Up to EBIT, the number remains same for every capital structure. So I can start with EBIT actually. Why? Because say for example, if you need 100 crores fund, so out of 100 crores fund, if you go with alternative one, you'll raise 50 crores equity, 50 crores debt. If you go with alternative two, you'll raise 70 crores equity, 30 crores debt. If you go with alternative three, you'll raise 100 crores equity. Any alternative you're choosing here, it doesn't matter. You'll raise 100 crores, you'll invest 100 crores, you'll get same sales, same expenses, variable and fixed cost. You'll get same operating profit EBIT. The EBIT remains same for any alternative capital structure. It won't change, but the interest taxes, preference dividend, number of shares will change based on the alternative capital structures. So my dear students, I must start with EBIT for every alternative capital structure here. From this numbers, I have to deduct interest. Then I'll get EBT earnings before tax. Then I'll deduct income tax so that you'll get earnings after tax. So we'll get a earnings after tax. If we have preference share capital here, you better deduct preference dividend also PD. Then finally, we'll get earnings available to equity shareholders, earnings available to equity shareholders, or this is also known as profit after tax and after deducting preference dividend. PAT and PD means profit after deducting tax and after deducting preference dividend. This is the profit which belongs to equity shareholders which is to be divided with number of equity shares to get EPS number of equity shares number of equity shares so that I'll get EPS A by B once we get EPS then for every alternative capital structure we are going to have one ratio called PE ratio it changes from one alternative capital structure to another alternative capital structure PE ratio is the ratio of market price per share to earnings per share so that will be given in the problem then multiply this EPS with P ratio to get market price per share that is C into D. I'll explain this P ratio later just understand that EPS into P ratio gives me market price per share. So I'll choose the alternative with I'll choose the alternative where my market price per share is maximum say for example if the market price per share is maximum under alternate two under alternative one then I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead with alternative one. That means I'll raise 50% through equity, 50% through debt because my market price per share is maximum. Okay. So this is the way to calculate market price per share. EBIT minus interest, EBT less income tax, EAT minus preference dividend, earnings available to equity shareholders are profit after tax and profit, profit after tax and after directing preference dividend. That is to be divided with number of equity shares. I'll get EPS that is to be multiplied with PE ratio to get market price per share. So the simple formula for market price per share is EPS into PE ratio. So I'll give you the ratio PE ratio. My dear students, PE ratio is nothing but price to earnings ratio, price earning ratio, nothing but market price per share to earnings per share ratio. Okay. From this formula, I can calculate market price per share that is EPS into PE ratio. Okay. Right. For calculating EBIT, sometimes I must use one formula called written on capital employed. Written on capital employed. See on your capital employed, on your total capital, how much return you're earning. That's what the concept it is. Written on capital employed. Also known as written on investment. Written on investment. Shortcut ROI. Shortcut ROI actually. See my dear students, return on capital employed or return on investment ROCE or ROI is equal to write your capital employed in the denominator capital employed the total capital that you are employing in the business equity preference debt everything long all the long term sources must be considered here. Okay. And in the numerator I must write EBIT EBIT is the profit which is which belongs to all the long-term investors, nothing else. Okay, after recovering variable and fixed cost, I'll get EBAT. So whatever EBAT you're getting, that belongs to all the long-term investors, equity, preference, and debt holders. So return on capital employed or return on investment is equal to EBAT by capital employed. This is a formula actually. Say for example, if I'm 
if I invested 100 crores capital employed, capital which is in the business, and I got 20 crores EBAT from this capital employed annually, so my return on capital employed is 20%. Okay, so sometimes the return on capital employed can be given in the problem. From that, you may need to calculate EBAT. See, from this formula, you can calculate EBAT very comfortably. So, EBAT is equal to the simple formula is capital employed into capital employed into return on capital employed return on capital employed sometimes it can be written as roi return on investment this is a formula you must remember for calculating ebat if the capital employed and return on investment are given in the problem okay so what is the formula for ebat ebat is equal to ebit is equal to capital employed into return on investment or return on capital employed okay this is what the formula for ebat yes So we understood the terms. Now I need to write the formula for capital employed. So what is the formula for capital employed? Capital employed is equal to equity share capital plus reserves and surplus plus also known as retained earnings plus preference share capital plus long term debt. So what are the long term debt sources? Nothing but long term debt means it includes debentures bonds and loans okay and loans this is what the formula for capital employed okay so we understood the formula for capital employed so successfully we can calculate ebat if you know the capital employed sometimes in the problem they'll ask you to calculate capital employed then you have to calculate ebat from it and then finally after calculating EBIT, you are supposed to calculate market price per share under several alternative capital structures. And after that, you have to choose the alternative capital structure where your market price per share is maximum. Because ultimate objective of choosing best capital structure is to maximize the shareholder's wealth. Wealth is represented with market price per share. Okay. Market price per share. So successfully, we understood the first part. And then I'm moving to the next area called EBIT indifference point. or EPS equivalency point. So what is this EBIT indifference point or EPS equivalency point? Generally, if you take two alternative capital structures, let us say 50% uh, equity, 50% equity and 50% debt, in alternative to, I'm taking 70% equity and 30% debt. Okay. These are the two alternative capital structures. If you calculate EPS for these two alternative capital structures, generally for alternative one, you may get higher EPS and for alternative two, you may get lower EPS. That's the point here. So if you take some amount of EBAT, if you calculate EPS for these two alternative capital structures, you don't get same EPS. But the point is, if you change the EBAT, EPS, EPS will change. If you again change your EBAT, EPS again will change for these two alternative capital structures. But at one level of EBAT, the EPS of alternative 1 will be equal to EPS of alternative 2. And that amount of EBAT level is nothing but EBAT indifference point or EPS equivalency point. So, which means generally for two alternative capital structures, you can choose any amount of EBIT, you will get different EPS. But at a certain amount of EBIT, at a certain level of EBIT, the EPS of both the alternative capital structures will be equal. Such point is known as EBIT indifference point or EPS equivalency point. So it is the level of EBIT, it is the level of EBIT, level means amount, the amount of EBIT, it is the amount of EBIT at which, at which, at which the EPS of alternative 1 the eps of alternative 1 will be exactly equal to the eps of alternative 2 so how to get eps of alternative 1 simple ebat from ebat please deduct interest then you'll get ebt into 1 minus tax rate i'll get eat minus preference dividend i'll get earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares this gives me eps of alternative 1 this this is it should be equal to the same term it should be equal to the same term nothing but ebit minus interest into 1 minus tax rate 
minus preference dividend divided by number of equity shares. This is what the equation you must use for calculating indifference point. See, after writing this equation for alternative one, from alternative one capital structure, please write the interest amount, please write the tax rate, please write the preference dividend amount, please write the number of equity shares from alternative one capital structure. Then after that, from alternative two capital structure, please write interest amount, tax rate, preference dividend amount, and number of equity shares. The only unknown variable is EBIT. This is what you need to solve. So from this equation, you'll get every number except EBIT. So after uh, solving this equation, you're going to get one number called EBIT. At this level of EBIT, the EPS of these two alternative capital structures will be equal. And that particular level of EBIT is known as what? EBIT indifference point or EPS equivalency point. Hope you got it right. EPS equivalency point. So this equation, will assist you to calculate the level of EBIT at which EPS of two alternatives will, uh, capital structures will be equal or one and the same. Okay. So with this we understood EBIT indifference point or EPS equivalency point. Now I am moving to the next area called financial breakeven point. So what is this financial breakeven point? Financial breakeven point means the amount of EBIT at which the equity shareholders profit is equal to zero. This is a simple way of understanding. See, break even point means what? No profit, no loss. From whose point of view you are taking this financial break even point? We have general break even point that defines the relationship between sales and profit. That means the level of sales at which profit is equal to zero. There the profit is EBIT. But I am not defining regular break even point, operating break even point here. I am defining financial break even point from equity shareholders point of view. So from this, uh, from when you are evaluating or when you are calculating financial break-even point from equity shareholders point of view, you have to calculate the amount of EBIT at which the equity shareholders profit is equal to zero. Nothing but earnings available to equity shareholders. Let me write it. It is the level of EBIT at which earnings available to equity shareholders will be equal to zero. It will be calculated for every alternative capital structure separately. It is not between two alternative capital structures. It will be calculated for each alternative capital structure separately. What will be calculated? Financial break-even point. Financial break-even point should be calculated for each alternative capital structure separately. So at this financial break-even point, nothing but it is the level of EBIT at which the earnings of equity shareholders must be equal to zero. So how to get earnings of equity shareholders? Earnings available to equity shareholders means, means EBIT minus interest into 1 minus tax rate. EBIT minus interest means EBT into 1 minus tax rate means EAT minus preference dividend earnings available to equity shareholders should be equal to zero. So from this, please define EBIT minus interest into 1 minus tax rate is equal to preference dividend. EBIT minus interest is equal to preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. Preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. So, EBIT is equal to interest plus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. This is a formula for this is a formula for financial break-even point. Say for example, in the examination, if they are asking you to calculate financial break-even point, if they are asking you to calculate financial break-even point, what you need to calculate? You need to calculate EBIT amount. So calculate financial break-even point means you have to calculate EBIT amount. EBIT formula, financial break-even point EBIT is equal to I said what financial break-even point EBIT is equal to a simple formula you must remember interest plus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. This is the derived formula from this. Nothing but this is the level of EBIT at which the earnings available to equity shareholders is equal to zero. Simply take one alternative capital structure, write the interest amount, write the preference dividend tax, write the preference dividend amount and write the tax rate and you'll get financial break-even point. This is a very comfortable computation. You can understand it very easily. Okay. Whereas for calculating EBIT indifference point, always you need two alternative capital structures. Whenever you want to solve EBIT indifference point, you need two alternative capital structures. 
and I should write this equation for alternate 1 and for alternate 2 and I should substitute the numbers then only I must get I'll get EBIT level where the EPS of alternate 1 and alternate 2 are one and the same or equal okay so please you don't be uh, please don't get confused between these two concepts called EBIT in difference point and financial break-even point financial break-even point will be calculated for every capital structure separately Whereas EBIT indifference point for calculating EBIT indifference point or EPS equivalency point, I need two alternative capital structures like alternative one and two or alternative two and three or alternative one and three like that. Otherwise, A and B capital structures, B and C capital structures or A and C capital structures. Sometimes the EBIT indifference point may not exist. That means if you after solving these equations, you may not get the answer. That means the LHS and RHS terms gets cancelled. In such a case, you have to write like this EBIT in difference point doesn't exist between alternative two and three capital structures or alternative one and three capital structures so that means every time you name you may not get the answer ebit number for calculating ebit in difference point in that case you have to write like this ebit in difference point doesn't exist between these alternative capital structures that can also happen in the problems okay with this we understood the first part of the capital structure that is calculation of market price per share by using PE ratio and we understood return on capital employed and then we understood what EBIT from return on capital employed and also we understood how to calculate capital employed and after that in the second part we understood EBIT in difference point and in the third formula we understood financial break even point okay the next formulas and the next concepts I'll discuss in the next session bye hi dear students good evening all of you now I am continuing with the chapter capital structure. The first part of the chapter is over. Uh, in that part we understood how to calculate market price per share under uh, different alternative capital structures and after that we understood how to calculate EBIT indifference point or EPS equivalency point and thereafter we understood financial break even point. So now I am moving to the next area called capital structure theories capital structure theories yes we have several capital structure theories <coughs> we need to understand the first theory is net income approach <clears throat> next one net operating income approach and traditional theory or traditional approach The next one is Modigliani and Miller approach without taxes. <clears throat> then the next theory is same theory with taxes. Modigliani and Miller approach with taxes. Yes. See, in all these theories, we need to understand one important point called whether the changes in the capital structure the changes in the capital structure can affect the value of the firm or not. This is the question. Whether this changes in capital structure can affect the value of the firm or not. See my dear students, some of the theory said capital structure changes will affect the value of the firm and some theory said capital structure changes cannot affect the value of the firm. So we have to understand all these theories. I mean those theories which are relevant 
and those theories which are relevant not for the examination from captor structure perspective so whether captor structure is relevant or irrelevant from the uh, for for calculating the value of the form or not that's what our discussion is all about see the changes in the captor structure happens because of changes in the financing decision so the ultimate thing is whether this financing decision can affect the value of the form or not so before going for that i need to give you few important points called changes in the capital structure means change in debt equity mix because every capital structure is loaded with debt fund and own fund debt equity mix is a first area so whenever i'm changing capital structure that means i'm changing debt and equity mix can it affect the value of the form or not the value of the form so this value of the form can be calculated by using a simple formula called ebit divided by ko earnings before interest and tax that is the profit which belongs to all the long term investors divided by ko this ko means overall cost of capital the expected return of all the long term investors so the numerator term is <coughs> long term investors profit and denominator term is their expected rate of return so if you can capitalize their expected profit at their expected rate of return then i'll get value of the form ebit by ko yes now the question is whether this changes in debt equity mix can affect the value of the form or not actually this ebit is always constant that's what our assumption ebit is always constant at any level of capital structure so even though i'm changing capital structure it won't affect my ebit actually but the question is whether this ko will change or not with the change in the debt and equity proportions on the capital structure so if i am changing the debt and equity mix can it affect ko or not see my dear students if ko changes the value of the form will change because ebit is always constant if ko is not changing then automatically the value of the form remains constant say for example if i take 10 crores ebit and i am taking 10% cost of capital then the value of the form will be 10 divided by 10% i'll get 100% so i'll get 100 crores so this is my value of the form when my cost of capital is 10% i'm just changing the cost of capital ko i'm reducing cost of capital 10 crores by 8% when i'm decreasing the cost obviously it is it should increase the value of the form because when cost of the fund is decreasing the value of the form should should increase so let us take it 10 crore divided by 8% i got 125 crores and if i increase the cost of capital from 10% to 12% it will decrease my value of the form yes 10 divided by 12% i got 83.33 crores so you must understand one thing here there is an inverse relationship between cost of capital and value of the form so whenever the cost of capital is increasing the value of the form is decreasing and cost of capital is decreasing value of the form is increasing so that's what the uh, relationship between cost of capital and value of the form inverse relationship now the question is if this ko is constant then automatically the value of the form will be constant the question is whether this changes in debt equity mix can change the cost of capital or not that's what our discussion is all about in all this series i'm going to discuss whether this ko is a constant number or variable number that's what our discussion is all about now as part of that we have to understand all these theories so some of the theory says ko is constant some of the theory says ko is is a or variable number it changes with the change in the debt equity mix so we have to understand every theory to know whether these uh, cap uh, financing decisions can affect the value of the form or not yes the first theory is net income approach net income approach yes under this approach see every theory must be understood with the help of two dimensional axis with the help of two dimensional axis and i am taking degree of financial leverage on x axis dfl that is nothing but percentage of debt in my capital structure and cost of capital on y axis cost of capital on y axis so net income approach says say for example this origin point is 0% debt and this is 20% debt and 80% equity 40% debt and 60% equity 60% debt and 40% equity 80% debt and 20% equity so on x axis i am taking percentage of debt nothing but percentage of debt in my capital structure 
So if I'm moving forward or if I'm moving rightwards on x-axis, that means I'm increasing the proportion of debt in the capital structure. If I'm moving upward, so that means I'm my cost of capital is increasing. Okay, any cost that you're taking. So NI approach says, by changing the debt and equity mix, that means by increasing the proportion of debt in the capital structure, KD is constant. Cost of debt is constant. Interest rate is constant. K is also constant. Generally, whenever the debt proportion is increasing in the capital structure, equity shareholders expectation will increase because of increase in risk. But this theory is taking cost of equity KE is always constant even though you are increasing the proportion of debt in the capital structure. So KD and KE are both are constant. So, so what it indicates? See, I am adding debt component to my capital structure by rem removing the equity component because at, at origin point, I mean, I'm, I'm using 100% equity and I'm not using even a single rupee of debt. But when I'm moving rightwards on x-axis, that means I'm removing equity, the most costiest source, and I'm adding debt, the cheapest source, that in, that generally that generally decreases the cost of capital. Why, sir? See, by removing the costiest source from the cost uh, your capital structure and by adding the cheapest source in, uh, into your capital structure, generally what will happen? The cost should decrease. Why, sir? Because the cheapest source proportion is increasing here and the costiest source proportion is decreasing here. So automatically, automatically our cost of capital gradually decreases, KO. So what this theory says, KD, KE are constant, whereas KO decreases because, because by adding the cheapest source to our capital structure that automatically reduces cost of capital because I am removing the costiest source and adding the cheapest source. So automatically that implies cost of capital KO is decreasing. So this theory says, KD and KE are constant at any level of capital structure and at any level of debt economics whereas KO will gradually decrease by adding more and more debt to our, our capital structure. So that's what this theory says and this theory gave you some valuation process. So how I can calculate the value of the firm under this theory. So there are some steps I must follow for calculating the value of the firm. Step number one, first of all. I must prepare one statement called EBIT minus interest. I'll get EBT. Taxes are not applicable under this theory. So I can take EAT or earnings available to equity shareholders. So under this theory, in uh, any taxes are not applicable, either corporate taxes or personal taxes. So this is my step number one, EBIT minus interest EBT. I got EBT or EAT or EASH. Now step number two. Under step number two, I'm going to calculate value of equity and value of the firm. Calculation of value of equity and value of the firm. So value of equity is equal to write the profit which is available to equity shareholders, nothing but earnings available to equity shareholders and write their expected return on under denominator KE. EA ESH divided by KE gives us value of equity. And to this value of equity, add value of debt. Add value of debt. So debt value, if I add debt value, I'll get value of the firm. Sometimes this debt value can be calculated by using interest divided by KD. Mostly the debt value will be given on the problem itself or you don't need to calculate it. But if there is a requirement, write interest amount under numerator and divide that number with interest, expected interest rate KD, then you'll get value of debt. And this gives me value of the firm. So value of equity plus value of debt gives us value of the firm. So EA ESH divided by KE plus value of debt, I got value of the firm. And in step number three, I have to calculate cost of equity, I mean cost of capital KO. Calculation of overall cost of capital KO. Overall cost of capital KO is equal to simple. Once you get value of the firm, use that value of the firm for calculating overall cost of capital KO. EBIT divided by value of the firm. This is the formula for overall cost of capital KO. So what is the formula? EBIT divided by value of the firm. This is a formula for overall cost of capital KO. So that's it. It's all about net income approach. <coughs> now let me go for the next theory, net operating income approach. Try to understand the essence of every theory. 
net operating income approach so this is NOI approach so here also I'm going to take same two dimensional axis x axis y axis see under this theory you have to take like this KD is always constant see on x axis it is DFL it is cost of capital the cost of capital on y axis Twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, 40 60 80 like that okay, same same assumptions by changing the debt economics your KD is always constant the expected interest rate but this time KE will increase the KE will increase why sir because you're taking some advantage associated with the use of debt why because by uses of debt what I'm getting I'm adding the cheapest source to my capital structure. So automatically that reduces cost of capital. Whatever the benefit you're enjoying from debt capital that will be taken over by equity shareholders that nothing but since the debt proportion is increasing the capital structure that increases the financial risk of equity shareholders. So their expectation will increase KE will increase nothing but the advantage associated with the use of debt nothing but the cheapest source cost of the cheapest cost of the cheapest source cost of uh, I mean the cost of the cheapest source debt the benefit which you are deriving from debt cap de uses of debt capital that can be taken over by equity shareholders so that increases cost of equity KE so what will happen sir see this will result in KO constant number why sir why the KO is constant because I'm getting benefit from debt capital by adding it so whatever the benefit I'm taking that will be taken over by equity shareholders that means proportionately KE is increasing so the sentence exact sentence is the advantage associated with the uses of debt will be exactly offset or adjusted by increase in the cost of equity KE so that there will be no change in the cost of capital KO. So the KO cost of capital KO remains constant. So this is what net operating income approach says. So KD is constant. KE is increasing because the financial risk is increasing but KO remains constant. Why sir? Because the benefit which is derived from debt will be taken over by equity shareholders will be adjusted or offset by cost of equity KE thereby cost of capital KO remains constant. So under this theory at any level of capital structure my KO is constant that means your value of the firm will be constant that's what this theory is saying okay. So here also I should understand the valuation the valuation step number one. EBIT <clears throat> minus interest same calculation earnings available to equity shareholders taxes are not applicable here and in step number two this time I'm going to calculate value of the firm first then I'll deduct debt value from it I'll get value of equity calculation of value of the firm I'll capitalize the value of the firm as a whole value of the firm and value of equity so what will happen simple value of the firm is equal to EBIT divided by KO this is the formula for value of the firm EBIT divided by KO the formula for value of the firm is EBIT divided by KO from this please deduct value of debt value of debt then I'll get value of equity value of equity so value of the firm minus value of debt I'll get value of equity this is step number two under net operating income approach and step number three you need to calculate cost of equity calculation of cost of equity so how to calculate cost of equity simple formula KE cost of equity KE is equal to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by value of equity so once we get value of equity from that please calculate cost of equity KE that's it KE so this is recording NOI approach net operating income approach now I'm moving to the next area called traditional approach see I'll show you the traditional approach because actually here is the theory <coughs> 
look at the theory traditional approach look at this chart we don't have any specific valuation process whatever the valuation process which is applicable to net income approach the same valuation process is applicable to traditional theory also you don't need to understand valuation process separately for this theory so just look at this graph so what this theory is saying this theory is divided into three stages stage one stage two stage three look at this graph under stage one this theory is saying both kd and ke are constant under stage one both kd and ke are constant that's what this theory says up to one stage kd and ke are constant since kd and ke are constant ko this term i mean this line is representing ko this ko will gradually decrease but you cannot enjoy that benefit forever you will enter into stage two up to stage one kd ke are constant thereby ko decreases but up to after a certain level of leverage nothing but by adding more and more debt the this benefit you cannot enjoy continuously so after certain point of leverage financial leverage after adding some amount of uh, i mean from additional amount of debt you cannot enjoy this benefit you'll cross this point what will happen you'll enter into second stage under this second stage both under this second stage the ke will increase whereas kd will be constant so again kd will be constant but ke will increase it starts increasing since ke is increasing whereas kd is constant automatically the term ko remains constant it is not nothing like nothing, uh, it is nothing but uh, net operating income approach so under second stage you are entering into net operating income approach and in the first stage you are you are in net income approach so under st uh, first stage so what what is happening here both kd and ke are constant ko is decreasing but in second stage ke is increasing kd or kd is constant automatically ko remains constant but after this point what will happen both kd and ke these two numbers will increase just like this the extended line kd so the interest rate and equity expectation these two numbers will gradually increase thereby your ko will also increase that's what this a uh, stage three this is stage one this is stage two and this is stage three so these are the three stages actually okay so it is just a description actually so i'll just consolidate the points up to stage one both kd and ke are constant ko decreases after in second stage ke will increase kd will be constant thereby ko remains constant in third stage both kd and ke are increasing thereby ko will increase that's what traditional theory is talking about nothing but you just remember the points only we don't have any specific uh, valuation process for this whatever the formulas we are following under net income approach the same formula set is applicable for this theory also but the only factor only factors are kd and ke fact kd and ke factors are the most important factors in this theory because these two numbers will change actually okay right with this we understood traditional theory also now i am entering into the next theory called modigliani and miller approach a very important theory modigliani and miller approach without taxes without taxes see these members modigliani and miller the famous economists and they are saying two firms identical in all respects two firms identical in all respects one is a levered firm which is using leverage financial leverage another one is unlevered firm which is not using financial leverage that's why that is known as unlevered firm unlevered means no leverage identical in all respects that means the same business line same business risk same total fund same total as the same profitability everything is same except for capital structure one is using debt other one is not using debt levered firm is using debt unlevered firm is not using debt that is the only difference just because of that you should not expect two different values for these two firms that's what modigliani and miller says that that means the value of levered firm and unlevered firm must be equal that's what this modig i mean these people modigliani and miller are saying and they proved it with the help of a theory called arbitrage that's our last discussion so i'll <coughs> just say you what the particular theory is saying so first of all let me understand let me explain 
the propositions that we need to cover under this Modigliani and Miller approach without taxes. They have given you two propositions, proposition one and proposition two, both in tax, uh, both uh, without taxes theory and with taxes theory. Under both of the areas, we need to understand two propositions. Let me explain the proposition one under Modigliani and Miller approach with taxes, uh, without taxes here. See, under proposition one, they are talking about the value of levered and unlevered firm. Just now I told you, both the firm values are equal. And that's what we need to write. Value of levered firm will be equal to value of unlevered firm. So what is the formula? The formula is very simple. That will be equal to EBIT divided by EBIT divided by KO. Value of levered form will be equal to value of unlevered form. Both the form values are equal. The formula is very simple. EBIT divided by KO, where KO is equal to KE of unlevered form. KE of unlevered form at equilibrium level. Equilibrium level means both the form values should be equal at that level. So at equilibrium level, whatever the KE which is applicable to unlevered form, the unlevered form KE becomes the KO of unlevered form. Why? Because when there is no debt, the KE becomes KO. So whatever the KO which is applicable to unlevered form, that KO should be used for calculating value of levered and unlevered form. So here KO means KE of unlevered form. That's it. Yes, this is proposition one. And in proposition two, you need to understand how to calculate cost of equity KE. Of which firm, sir? Not unlevered firm, because for unlevered firm, KE should be given in the problem itself. So I just need to calculate KE of levered firm. So what is the formula for KE of levered firm? KE of levered firm is equal to regular formula, earnings available to equity shareholders divided by value of equity. That's it. Earnings available to equity shareholders divided by value of equity. So just now we understood how to calculate value of equity, EA, ESH by KE. From that only you can define KE is equal to EA, ESH divided by value of equity. So if you can understand one formula from that formula, you can write the other formulas also. We have another formula for calculating cost of equity KE of levered firm. KE of levered firm is equal to, this is a shortcut formula. KO of unlevered firm plus KO of unlevered form minus KD into debt by equity. Just remember this formula. That's it. That's more than enough. See, this formula is applicable only when the percentages are given. So what is the formula for KE of levered form? KO of unlevered form plus KO of unlevered form minus KD interest rate into debt by equity. Sometimes this ratio can be given directly in the problem. So that ratio must be used for calculating KE of levered firm. So this is the second formula for calculating cost of equity KE of levered firm. These are the two propositions you need to understand. Proposition 1, value of levered firm and value of unlevered firm both are equal, which is equal to EBIT by KO. But KO is nothing but cost of equity KE of unlevered firm at equilibrium level. And in proposition 2, we understood KE of levered firm. We don't need to calculate KE of unlevered firm. That should be given in the problem itself. So KE of levered firm, regular formula, earnings available to equity shareholders divided by value of equity. And I have another formula in terms of percentage. KE of levered firm is equal to KO of unlevered firm plus KO of unlevered firm minus KD into debt by equity. This is regarding Modigliani and Miller approach without taxes. Under this theory, sometimes they may ask you to calculate value of equity of levered firm. Once we get value of levered firm, if you remove debt value from it, you'll get value of equity. So I, I can write that formula also here. That is not a proposition. You, ca you can calculate that very easily. Value of equity of levered firm is equal to value of levered firm. This is total value of levered firm. From that, please deduct value of debt. So why should I deduct value of debt? Because levered firm is loaded with debt value. If you remove that debt value, the balance must represent value of equity of which firm levered firm. That's it. Yes. Right. Now I'm moving to the next area called same theory, Modigliani and Miller approach with the taxes, with taxes. So if corporate and personal taxes are applicable to 
companies what will happen mnm is saying a different perception actually they are giving a different perception see according to them here also i am going to define two propositions which were given by modigliani and miller modigliani and miller says if taxes are applicable to companies the value of levered firm slightly more than value of unlevered firm because of the tax saving benefit which is being enjoyed by levered firm only by paying interest to the debt holders so how it would happen let me show you value of unlevered firm first you should define value of unlevered firm remember one thing whenever the corporate taxes are applicable levered firm and unlevered firm values both are not equal first you must define value of unlevered firm from that value i can derive value of levered firm the formula is ebit into 1 minus tax rate divided by ebit into 1 minus tax rate divided by ko nothing new here for unlevered firm ebit is nothing but ebt so interest because interest is zero ebt into 1 minus tax rate means eat or ea esh divided by for unlevered firm ko is nothing but ke that means this is nothing but ea esh divided by ke so that gives you value of equity for unlevered firm since it is using only equity value of equity becomes value of unlevered firm so this uh, that means even by writing the formula called ea esh by ke for unlevered firm i can calculate value of unlevered firm so the second way of understanding of this formula is earnings available to equity shareholders divided by ke i can use the second formula also or first formula in both the cases i'll get value of unlevered firm now the point is what about the value of levered firm sir this value of levered firm is slightly more than value of unlevered firm because of the tax saving which is being enjoyed by levered firm only by paying interest on debt why because interest on debt is a tax deductible expenditure i can enjoy some tax shield or tax saving on interest payment that will happen for that will be generated for that will be generated for future years for how many years sir for perpetual years and if you can capitalize that value into present value terms then you can add some extra value to levered firm and that cannot be enjoyed by unlevered firm so you just this is all a conceptual understanding you better understand the formula that's more than enough so what is the formula for value of levered firm value of unlevered firm plus value of unlevered firm plus an additional value should be added so what is such additional value the present value of perpetual tax savings which you can enjoy in the term uh, future years for how many years perpetual years so so what is the formula debt into tax rate see there is a background reason behind this and we don't need to uh, recollect that point and remembering this formula is more than enough so what is the formula for value of levered firm value of unlevered firm that you have calculated previously plus debt into tax rate this is regarding proposition 1 and you know how to calculate value of equity of levered firm the same previous formula you can apply here also value of equity of levered firm is equal to value of levered firm minus debt value value of debt then that gives you what value of equity i'm not writing that formula i'm moving to the second proposition second proposition under modigliani and miller approach with taxes under proposition 2 you need to right one formula called cost of equity ke and cost of capital ko so because you are following mnm with the tax theory see under with tax theory since the values of both the firms are not equal ko should not be equal for both the firms if ko is same for both the firms value should be equal so here the values are different so because the values are different ko should be different so because of this reason i must define ke and ko of levered firm So for only word form, you don't need to calculate KE and KO because KE will be given, KE should be given related to what uh, only word form. That KE becomes KO. Then only I can handle only word form value. Once that is over, I can move to levered form value. So the point is, the discussion is purely about levered form especially. So for calculating value of levered form, uh, I have calculated value of only word form. In the similar way, for levered form, I need to calculate KO KE. Let me write the formulas first of all. Cost of equity KE. of levered firm is equal to previous formula only wait sorry earnings available to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by value of equity that's it so how i can calculate eaesh nothing but uh, ebit minus interest ebit minus tax eat which is eaesh 
and if you can write that number here divided by value of equity that gives you cost of equity ke of levered firm we have another formula for this ke of levered firm is equal to ko of unlevered firm plus ko of unlevered firm plus ko of unlevered firm minus kd into debt by equity up to this this the regular formula it is a regular formula but in addition to this you must multiply one factor tax rate into 1 minus tax rate this is the formula okay the same previous formula additionally i am multiplying one factor 1 minus tax rate okay with this we understood ke of levered firm and also you must define ko of levered firm so what is the formula for ko of levered firm i'll show you ko of levered firm ko of levered firm is equal to ebit into 1 minus tax rate divided by value of levered firm this is a formula for ko of levered firm so ko of levered firm is equal to ebit into 1 minus tax rate divided by value of levered firm so these are the two propositions you must remember with this we understood m and m with taxes theory okay then we have one more theory arbitrage process only So how this arbitrage process works? Just now I told you two firms identical in all respects except for capital structure cannot command two different values that means unlevered firm and levered firm. These two firm values should always be equal. In case if these two firm values are not equal we can bring the values of these two firms into equal position or equilibrium position by using a process called arbitrage process. How this happens? Levered firm, say for example, this levered firm is overvalued firm. That means the share prices are at higher value. The share prices are at higher value. Overvalued firm, this is an overvalued firm. This is an undervalued firm. That means unlevered firm is undervalued. So what will happen, sir? See, what is happening here? One firm security prices are at lower level that is un, 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 uh, unlevered firm whereas the other firm levered firm security prices are, are at higher price see investors will switch their investment holding from overvalued firm to undervalued firm under arbitrage process that means since these two firms are not in equilibrium position not in equal position the investors will take the advantage of this inequilibrium situation that means they'll sell their equity in overvalued firm and they'll buy the equity an undervalued firm what will happen slowly the demand for levered firm reduces and share prices will reduce and slowly the demand for unlevered firm rises because there are more buyers and less number of sellers then automatically because of high demand the prices will increase so the overvalued firm prices will decrease gradually the firm value will decrease the undervalued firm gradually increases because of increase in share prices so one is decreasing other one is increasing at one point of time these two form values will be equal these two form values will be equal and this equal position is known as equilibrium point this is equilibrium point at this equilibrium point both levered form value and unlevered form values will be equal that means value of levered form is equal to value of unlevered form at this equilibrium point this is what going to happen sometimes a reverse position may happen that means the firm which is not using leverage unlevered firm 
may be a uh, more valid firm and lever firm may be undervalued firm and in that case what will happen the same thing will happen the buyers will shift their holding from unlevered firm to levered firm that means the buyers will sell their equity in unlevered firm sorry the investors will sell their equity in unlevered firm and by using such process they are going to buy the equity in levered firm what will happen gradually the demand for unlevered firm reduces the demand for levered firm will increase so the unlevered firm value gradually decreases and the levered firm val value gradually increases so at one point of time again equilibrium position will happen so my dear students in both the ways it will happen so either the levered firm can be overvalued and unlevered firm can be undervalued or the levered firm value can be undervalued and unlevered firm value can be overvalued the ultimate thing is in arbitrage process investors will shift their holding from overvalued firm to undervalued firm such overvalued firm can be levered firm or unlevered firm such undervalued firm can be levered firm or unlevered firm it depends ultimately you must shift your holding from overvalued firm to undervalued firm that's what this arbitrage theory is all about okay so we understood the arbitrage process actually this arbitrage process is introduced by modigliani and miller so with that uh, with the help of that theory only they proved that the value of levered firm and value of unlevered firm should always be equal even though such firm values are not equal you can bring the values of these two firm values into equilibrium position by using a process called arbitrage that's what we understood in arbitrage process yes so dear students these formulas you must remember and if you can apply these formulas in the examination you can easily handle the problems also so i'll try to handle few problems relating to these theories along with uh, i mean the first part of this chapter then we can move to the next chapter okay so before going for the other chapter i mean before going for the problems i need to tell you one important point in all these theories there are some assumptions that you should follow the first assumption is taxes are not applicable the second assumption is whatever the money you are raising through debt such process must be used to buy back the equity in case if you are raising the money through equity such process must be used to repay the debt capital so what is happening here sir if you raise debt you will buy back equity if you raise equity you will repay debt that means you are not increasing the fund you are just changing the capital structure raising equity means i am increasing the owners fund and decreasing the debt fund rising uh, debt means i am increasing the debt fund risky fund and i am reducing what ownership fund so this is what happening here the capital structure will change but not the total fund the total fund remains constant the total assets remains constant the profitability ebit is, is always constant business risk is also same there is no change in it okay these are the important assumptions in this theory uh, in all these theories taxes are not applicable so capital structure change but not the total assets change there, there will be no change in the total assets or total fund so all the remaining all the things are same business risk is same total assets are same ebit is same all the things are same the only difference is what capital structure changes okay this is what the assumptions you must remember under all these theories except for one theory m and m approach with taxes Uh, here only here only i am going to apply taxes for remaining all the theories and all the theories i am not going to apply corporate taxes or personal taxes yes so with this we understood the introductory part of the capital structure then we can move to the problems of this chapter then i'll start with the next chapter okay thank you good evening everyone now in today's session let us handle the problems related to capital structure i am going to handle two problems here now please look at illustration number 3 in your study material i'm just reading the question the existing capital structure of xyz limited is as follows equity share capital 40 lakhs with a face value of 100 rupees each retained earnings 10 lakhs 7% debentures 25 lakhs so you please check it whether uh, how much is your capital employed 40 lakhs plus 10 lakhs plus 25 plus 25 it is 100 lakhs the total capital employed is 100 lakhs the existing rate of return on the company's capital is 12% right now your return on investment is 12% and the income tax rate is 50% the company requires a sum of 25 lakh rupees to finance an expansion program for which it is considering the following alternatives so we need 25 lakhs additional sum to finance an expansion program nothing but we are planning to invest uh, we are expanding our project for that i need 25 lakh rupees additional fund so to raise such additional fund of 25 lakh rupees we have three alternatives here we are evaluating three alternatives alternative 
issue of 20000 equity shares at a premium of 25 rupees per share so 20000 into premium of 25 rupees per share means face value is 100 25 rupees premium it will be 125 i got 25 lakhs that's enough issue of 10% preference shares for the entire 25 lakh rupees money or issue of 8% debentures for the entire 25 lakh rupees money so i can raise this 25 lakh rupees either through equity or through preference or through debentures so it is estimated that p ratio in case equity in cases of equity preference shares debentures financing would be 20 17 and 16 respectively so the p ratios under the three alternative financing modes are given here 20 17 and 16 which of the above alternative would you consider to be the best see i'll choose the alternative where my market price per share is maximum how to get market price per share for all these three alternatives after expansion i have to calculate eps and such eps must be multiplied with the respective p e ratios so already the p e ratios were given here so i just need to calculate eps then once we get eps if you multiply eps with p e ratio then we'll get market price per share so here is the calculation we have three alternative plans here plan one equity plan two preference plan three debentures see in any alternative my total capital remains same so my ebit should be same how much is your existing ebit you know you got 12 percent return on investment on your existing capital employed your existing capital employed yes your capital is 100 lakhs and your return on investment is 12 percent you can see here your capital is 100 lakhs existing return on investment is 12 percent 100 lakhs into 12 percent so I'll get EBIT. My existing EBIT is hundred lakhs into twelve percent. It will be twelve lakhs. This is my existing EBIT, and they are saying we can earn the same rate of return on additional funds also. So what are the additional fund you are raising? On such additional fund, you can earn same rate of return. See. The additional sum that I am investing is 25 lakh. So since we are expanding the same process, we can earn same rate of return. That is not given here. So I am assuming that the same return which you are earning on the existing project, the same return you can earn even for expansion fund also. So 25 lakh rupees into 25 lakh rupees into 12 percent. So for additional fund, I'll get extra EBIT. So this is my existing EBIT actually. This is my existing EBIT. Add additional EBIT. Add additional EBIT. This will be 25 lakh rupees into 12 percent. The additional fund I'm investing is 25 lakhs. On that I'm getting 12 percent return. 25 into 12 percent. So this gives me 3 lakhs. So my EBIT after expansion is 15 lakhs. This is my EBIT after expansion. That's it. So now that's what we have written here. EBIT after expansion is 20, oh, 15 lakhs. So here is a calculation. So that EBIT is 15 lakhs after expansion. Existing EBIT plus additional EBIT. Now for all these three alternatives, whether you go with the equity or preference or debentures, ultimately I'm going to raise additional 25 lakhs on such and 25 lakhs. I'm going to get 3 lakh rupees extra EBIT. So already we are earning 12 lakh rupees EBIT. Additionally, you are going to get 3 lakh rupees EBIT because you are expanding. So your EBIT after expansion is 15 lakhs. Your existing EBIT will be continued plus additional EBIT is 3 lakhs. Totally you are going to get 15 lakhs. So that's what we have taken here. We have taken here. EBIT after expansion is 25 lakhs. Sorry, 15 lakhs. Less interest. First of all, whenever you are deducting any commitment, you should consider existing commitments along with additional commitments because I am raising additional fund. Interest, existing interest. See, we are using 7% debentures of 25 lakhs. 25 lakhs into 7% interest, it will be 1 lakh 75,000. That's your existing interest applicable to all the three plans. Additional interest is applicable only for third plan because I'm raising additional fund through debt only under alternative three. So for such additional fund of 25 lakh rupees, I'm raising 8% debentures. I'm raising 8% debentures here. So take this rate 8%. So simply 25 lakh rupees into 8%, it will be 2 lakhs. Such 2 lakh rupees is applicable only for alter plan 3. 
So if you deduct interest from EBIT, you are going to get EBT. Total interest should be deducted from EBIT, I will get EBT, 1 minus 2. Less tax 50%, I will get profit after tax. Then I have to deduct preference dividend, existing preference dividend. Your existing preference share capital is 25 lakhs, on that you are paying 9% preference dividend. It is 2 lakh 25,000, applicable for all the three plans. Every existing commitment should be applicable to all the three plans. Only additional commitment should be applicable based on the alternative that you are raising the fund, through which you are raising the fund. So preference dividend is existing preference dividend. It is 2 lakh 25,000, applicable for all the three plans. But additional preference dividend is applicable only for plan 2 because I am raising additional fund through preference shares for plan, under plan 2 only. So plan 2 is saying 10% preference shares. So I am raising 25 lakhs. 25 lakhs into 10%, it will be 2 lakh 50,000. That's what my preference dividend. Yes, we have deducted preference dividend here. 2 lakh 50,000. Then after deducting preference dividend, we are going to get equity earnings. Nothing but earnings available to equity shareholders. We are uh, popularly this term is known as earnings available to equity shareholders EAESH which is also known as equity earnings. Equity earnings means earnings of equity shareholders. So this is to be divided with number of equity shares. You know shares when you are writing shares you should be very careful. See existing shares are 40,000 equity shares. 40 lakhs by 100, 40,000 equity shares. Additional shares are applicable only for plan 1. Under that plan I am raising 20,000 additional shares. So 40,000 plus 20,000, so you are going to get total number of shares of, of 60,000 after expansion. This particular 60,000 additional shares, I mean uh, this particular 60,000 total shares are applicable only for plan number 1. Then for all the remaining pl 3 plans, for all the remaining 2 plans, I am going, uh, my number of shares outstanding are 40,000 only. So here are the number of shares, number of shares 60,000 for plan 1. Whereas for plan 2 and plan 3, my shares are 40,000 only because I am not raising additional fund through equity under plan 2 and plan 3. Divide this equity earnings with number of equity shares outstanding, then you will get EPS. Equity earnings divided by number of shares, 7 by 8, I will get EPS. Now we got EPS. Multiply this EPS with PE ratio given in the problem itself. See already we have PV ratios here, PE ratios here, price earning ratios here, 20, 17 and 16, substitute, substitute the same ratios here. Multiply EPS with PE ratio because market price per share MPS is equal to EPS into PE ratio. So 9 into 10 EPS into PE ratio gives me market price per share. I got highest market price per share under alternative 1 under alternative 1. So I can take I can take alternative 1 only actually. So I am going to choose alternative 1 that means I am going to raise my additional fund of 25 lakh through equity only because my market price per share is maximum under alternative 1. With this problem number 3 is completed. Now I can go for 7th problem that covers the theories, capital structure theories. 7th problem. Here is a problem. See look at the problem here. Yes. Company X and Company Y are in the same risk class and are identical in every fashion except that the Company X is uses, using debt, uses debt while Company Y does not. So that saying Company X is a levered firm, Company Y is an unlevered firm. The levered firm that means the Company X has 9 lakh rupees debentures carrying 10% rate of interest. Yes. Both the firms earn 20% before interest and taxes on their total assets of 15 lakhs. So if from both the firms, we are earning same profit, 15 lakhs into 20%, I will get 3 lakh rupees EBIT. So for both the firms, EBIT is equal to 3 lakhs. Assume perfect capital markets, rational investors and so on, and a tax rate of 50% and capitalization rate of 15% for an all-equity company. Say so they have given two information, uh, two types of information here. One is the tax rate applicable. The tax rate applicable to the company is 50%. And also the capitalization rate for all equity company, the capitalization rate of all equity company is KE. That itself is KO. The KE of levered firm, is, uh, the KE of unlevered firm is given here. All equity firm is unlevered firm. So for unlevered firm, they have given KE. Have you observed that? This is KE. For unlevered firm, they have given KE. And this KE becomes the KO of unlevered firm. Why? Because for an unlevered firm, KE is nothing but KO. Yes. Now, 
look at first question compute the value of form x and form y using net income approach but taxes are applicable here remember that we have taxes here under net income approach what is going to happen ni approach assumes no taxes generally since the tax rate is given in the problem we have to work out of ni approach so under ni approach we have to consider taxes accordingly we have to calculate the values of the forms actually i have to calculate value of form x and form y how to calculate value of the form under ni approach under ni approach my first job is to calculate value of equity the formula is ea esh divided by ke once we get value of equity add value of debt then we'll get value of the form that's a simple computation computation of value of form x and y using ni approach form x and y you see value of the form is equal to market value of equity plus market value of debt that's what the terms given here market value of equity plus market value of debt first write the ebit of both the firms deduct interest from it already you know that for firm x we have debt of 9 lakh rupees with an interest rate of 10% so 90000 is the interest component deduct interest we got pbt for both the firms for firm y since there is no debt interest is zero so i have taken ebit ebit as ebt 3 lakh rupees less income tax 50% generally the tax rate Uh, need not be given in the problem for calculating value of the form under ni approach once it is given please deduct it without any hesitation now tax rate is 50% deduct 50% from it i got earnings of equity shareholders also known as what ea esh this is 1 lakh 5000 and 1 lakh 50000 divide this number with cost of equity ke actually ke is given for an unlevered firm 15% so how about what about firm x see for firm y they have given ke of 15% what about firm x actually they have taken 15% why like that sir because ni approach assumes that cost of equity is ke cost of equity ke is always constant at any level of debt equity mix that means whether the firm x and y are using debt or not it doesn't matter for both the firms cost of equity ke is same that's what ni approach says ni approach assumes that cost of equity remains constant whether you use debt or you whether you are using debt or you are not using debt it doesn't matter so accordingly since for unlevered firm we are taking 15% ke the same ke is applicable for firm x also why you are taking same ke because x is using debt it doesn't matter two firms are identical in all aspects the capital structure can never change ke under ni approach that's why the ke of unlevered firm y is can be taken as ke of levered firm x okay as per ni approach i'm not talking about modigliani and miller approach okay now divide this earnings of equity shareholders with ke then you will get value of equity capitalized value of equity so 1 lakh 5000 divided by 15% i got 7 lakh rupees capitalized value of equity for firm x and for firm y it is 10 lakh rupees now once we get capitalized value of equity what is my next job add value of debt see we have debt value for x only 9 lakhs add it and i got 16 lakhs for value of the firm for firm x whereas firm y it is 10 lakhs that's it with this point 1 is completed now go for second point compute the value of each firm using the net operating income approach so how i can do this simple the same calculation i can do but the point is once the taxes are applicable to net operating income approach i need to tell you one important point generally either for ni or envoy or even for traditional approach also taxes are not applicable but once the taxes are applicable the envoy approach becomes modigliani and miller approach with taxes i can say one thing mnm approach with taxes is an extension of envoy approach if you apply taxes to envoy approach so the rule is if you apply income tax rate to the envoy approach that theory changes its name it will become mnm approach with taxes so if you have any problem in the examination and they, if they are asking you to calculate value of the firms under envoy approach by giving income tax rate you must assume that such that approach is not envoy approach that approach is modigliani and miller approach with taxes so here if you observe you need to calculate value of each firm using envoy approach in case of the tax rate is not given here then i must have i must use the regular process called value of the firm ebit by ko then deduct value of debt then we'll get value of equity that is a way to calculate valuation valuation of of the firms under envoy approach but here i am not going to use such formulas which were given in envoy approach i am going to use modigliani and miller approach with taxes because taxes are applicable here 50% taxes are applicable here so since the tax rate is applicable here then i must use mnm with taxes theory so what is the formula for value of firm under mnm with taxes value of unlevered firm is equal to ebit into 1 minus tax rate by ko i told you already ko or ke both are same see ebit into 1 minus tax rate yes ebit of 
If we are for both the forms as relax into one minus tax rate, one minus zero point zero five. This is not zero point zero five, my dear students. This is zero point five actually. See, this is a wrong number. This is zero point five. Okay, divided by what about KE of unlevered form? See, KE of unlevered form is nothing but KO. I can write KO or KE. Both are same here because KO of unlevered form is nothing but KE. KE of unlevered form. KE and KO both are same for unlevered form. So I have taken divided by fifteen per fifteen percent. This is three lakhs into. 1 minus 0.5 divided by 15 percent, then you'll get what 1 lakh 50 thousand divided by 15 percent. You'll get 10 lakh rupees. This is value of unlevered form. Once we get value of unlevered form, I can easily calculate value of levered form x. What is the formula? Value of unlevered form plus debt into tax rate. See, this is debt into tax rate. You must use like this debt into tax rate. So, how much is your debt? Debt is 9 lakhs into tax at 50 percent. 4 lakh 50 thousand rupees. Additional value will be added for levered form. 10 lakhs plus 4 lakh 50 thousand. I got 14 lakh 50 thousand. This is my value of levered form. Yes. But the second point is over. Now go for third point. Using NOI approach, calculate overall cost of capital KO for form X and Y. I have to calculate KO of form X and Y. You know, if you remember, KO of levered form and KO of unlevered form. Actually, under M&M with, with taxes theory, you don't need to calculate KO of unlevered form because that itself is KE. KO of unlevered form is equal to KE of unlevered form. But you need to calculate KO of levered form. So what is the formula of KO of levered form? I told you already, EB18 to 1 minus tax rate by value of the levered form. I can use that formula, but here they have calculated the value by using weighted average cost of capital. We are not uh, going to use that formula. Let me show you how I can do KO of levered form. First of all, let me calculate KO of unlevered form. KO of unlevered form is Y limited. It's nothing but KE of unlevered form. That is equal to 15% as there is no debt. Yes. So you don't need to calculate KO of unlevered form. Now coming to KO of levered form. How I can do that? I told you already KO of levered form is equal to. We have a simple formula for this. That is EBIT into 1 minus tax rate by value of levered form. Value of levered form. Yes. How much is your EBIT? My EBIT is 3 lakh rupees. I told you already. It is 3 lakhs. Yes. Is it 3 lakhs? Let me check it once. Yes. EBIT is 3 lakhs. Into 1 minus 0 0.5 divided by value of levered form. Just now we got it. 14 lakh 50 thousand. 14 lakh 50 thousand. So apply this. 1 lakh 50 thousand divided by 14 lakh 50 thousand. I got 10.34 percent. This is your answer. So they have calculated like this. They got 10.31% approximately. This is the right answer. You can calculate cost of capital KO of levered form like this also. This is much accurate answer actually. Okay. So instead of following this formula, instead of following this process, you can write this formula and get full marks. Okay. The, with this point three is over. Now go for fourth point. Which of these two forms has no has an optimal capital structure according to NOI approach? Actually. Look at the point here. Out of two firms, firm Y seems to have optimum capital structure and as it has lower cost of capital, higher value of the firm. Firm Y, unlevered firm. Look at unlevered firm Y. The value of unlevered firm is 10 lakhs. How about cost of capital KO? KO of unlevered firm is 15%. Whereas KO of levered firm is 10.34%. Out of two firms, firm Y seems to have optimal capital structure as it has lower cost of capital and higher value of the firm. Firm Y, actually, under which approach they asked you this question, which of the two firms has an optimal capital structure according to NY approach? See, this interpretation is wrong actually. Why? Because for firm X, we got least cost of capital KO, 10.34%, whereas for firm Y, it is 15%. So when compared to firm Y, firm X has least cost of capital KO and also the value of the firm is higher. The value of the firm is 14,50,000. So which firm you should prefer? It is firm X actually. Out of two firms, it is not firm Y, it is firm X. Seems to have optimal capital structure as it has lower cost of capital and higher value of the firm. This is a wrong term. Actually, it is not firm Y, it is firm X. You please change it. But this seventh problem is over. Yes successfully we have another concept called financial break even point and ebit indifference point i am going to cover that particular concept and related problems under the chapter leverages i am moving to the next area called leverages let me start it new chapter leverages 
So, what is the exact meaning of the term livres? Livres, it is simply a measure of risk. It is a measure of risk. For measuring such risk, leverage is going to establish the relationship between two variables. It is going to establish the relationship between two variables. That means the change in one variable can affect the change of other variable. So how the one how one variable can affect the value how how one variable can affect the va value of other variable. That's what we are going to establish with the help of leverage. See the leverage is a measure of risk and this particular risk is of two types operating risk also known as business risk the next one is financial risk so in simple terms leverage is a measure of risk which is going to establish the relationship between two variables if there is a change in one variable how it is going to affect the change in other variable that's what we are trying to establish the relationship between two variable changes two variables changes with the help of what the concept called leverage see since it is a measure of risk such risk is classified into two types one is the business specific risk business risk or operating risk the other one is financial risk which is related to capital structure so the combination of these two factors decides my total risk now this business risk or operating risk is nothing but variability of variability of ebit operating profit variability financial risk is nothing but variability of shareholders profit eps variability of eps okay so my dear students the point is this business risk or operating risk is measured with a leverage called operating leverage operating leverage is a measure of operating risk or business risk financial leverage is a measure of measure of financial risk financial leverage is a measure of financial risk and combined leverage is a measure of total risk combined leverage is a measure of total risk combined leverage is a measure of total risk now dear students we need to understand all these three leverages so that i can complete this particular part once we can if we can solve few problems related to this chapter then this chapter will be over we have few formulas here first of all the first one is degree of operating leverage degree of operating leverage dol yes this is going to establish the relationship between sales and ebit sales minus variable cost contribution minus fixed cost then i'll get ebit so the relationship between sales and ebit can be established with the help of a leverage called dol dol will establish the relationship between sales and ebit how it is going to establish the relation between sales and ebit say for example let me write the formula for dol first of all degree of operating leverage is equal to percentage change in ebit divided by percentage change in sales also known as the other formula is or contribution divided by ebit so dol is equal to percentage change in ebit divided by percentage change in sales or contribution divided by ebit say for example if the percentage change in ebit is 50% divided by percentage change in sales is 25% so what is happening here for 25% change in sales my ebit is changing with 50% then that results in 50 by 25 it will be 2 so my degree of operating leverage is 2 this 2 indicates this particular 2 number indicates for every 1% change in sales 
EBIT changes by 2 percent. That's what the interpretation of the term degree of operating leverage. So this degree of operating leverage is trying to establish the relationship between sales and EBIT. So for every 1 percent change in sales, how much percentage of EBIT is going to be changed? That can be calculated by using what degree of operating leverage. Here my degree of operating leverage is 2, which means for every 1% change in sales, my EBIT changes by 2%. That means if sales increases by 1%, EBIT increases by 2%. If sales decreases by 1%, then EBIT decreases by 2%. That's what the interpretation of the term degree of operating leverage. So why there is a magnifying impact on EBIT when sales changes by 25% EBIT should be changed by 25% only why there is a more percentage change in EBIT this is because of change this is because of the uh, existence of the company's uh, existence of the fixed cost and the company's cost structure actually our cost structure is loaded with two components variable cost and fixed cost variable cost will exactly varies along with what sales so there will be no change in percentage change in contribution percentage change in sales both of these numbers will be equal the percentage change in contribution will always be equal to percentage change in sales because my variable cost changes proportionately along with what sales change Whereas my fixer cost remains constant. Even though my sales is changing, my fixer cost remains constant. Since it is constant, it, it will have a magnifying impact on percentage change in EBIT. Due to this reason, generally, if sales increases by small amount of percentage, whereas your EBIT is going to be increased by more percentage. So there is a huge magnifying impact on percentage change in EBIT whenever there is a change in sales. This is because of what the existence of the company's fixed cost in the capital structure. So I can say one thing, this degree of operating leverage, the magnifying impact on percentage change in EBIT arises due to the existence of fixed cost in the company's cost structure. So I can say one thing, more fixed cost, more degree of operating leverage because more magnifying impact. Low fixed cost, low magnifying impact. So D fixed cost is the reason behind what? DOL. High fixed cost, high DOL. Low fixed cost, low DOL. Moderate fixed cost, moderate DOL. If there is no fixed cost, no DOL. That means the percentage change in sales and percentage change in EBIT both are same. That's what regarding degree of operating leverage. I am moving to the next area called degree of financial leverage. DFL. See, this is going to establish the relationship between EBIT and EPS. Less income tax, <coughs> I'll get earnings after tax minus preference dividend, then we'll get equity earnings, equity earnings, which is also known as earnings available to equity shareholders, divided by number of equity shares, divided by number of equity shares then we'll get EPS. This degree of financial leverage is going to establish the relationship between EBIT and EPS. EBIT and EPS, DFL. So DFL establishes the relationship between EBIT and EPS. So what is the formula of a DFL? DFL, degree of financial leverage is equal to percentage change in EPS divided by percentage change in EPS divided by Percentage change in EBIT. Percentage change in EPS divided by percentage change in EBIT. Or the other formula is EBIT divided by EBT minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. This is the second formula. EBIT divided by EBT minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. In case if your capital structure is not loaded with preference share capital, this becomes zero. So your formula will be very much simplified. EBIT by EBT. I can use EBIT by EBT if your capital structure is not loaded with what the preference share capital. I can use simple formula EBIT by EBT. But you must use this formula EBIT by EBT minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. In case if your capital structure is loaded with preference share capital. My suggestion is you better remember this formula only. Why? Because in the examination they may give you a preference share capital in the capital structure. You may forgot this particular formula. You may apply EBA to EBD. That becomes wrong. That means you will get a wrong answer. 
so you must remember this formula only in case if your capital structure is not loaded with preference share capital you better substitute preference dividend is equal to zero then you will get answer very easily so whenever i ask you the formula of a degree of financial leverage you must remember this formula only ebit by ebt minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate remember this formula only my dear students not the regular formula ebit by ebt okay that is very safe for you okay now the point is say for example the percentage change in eps is the percentage change in eps is 75% whereas the percentage percentage change in ebit is 50% so what will happen 75 by 50 it will be 1.5 sir what is this 1.5 this means for every 1% change in ebit for every 1% change in ebit EPS changes by 1.5%. So here I'm here I'm trying to establish the relationship between EBIT and EPS. For every 1% change in EBIT, my EPS changes by 1.5%. Which means, for example, if your EBIT increases by 1%, EPS increases by 1.5%. If your EBIT decreases by 1%, EPS decreases by 1.5%. That's it, my dear students. Nothing new here. So what is the difference between operating and financial leverage? Financial leverage establishes the relationship between EBIT and EPS, whereas operating leverage establishes the relationship between sales and EBIT. Now, why this DFL arises? DFL arises because of the fixed financial commitments like interest on debt and preference dividend on preference share capital. If you don't have fixed financial commitment funds like debt and preference share capital then your dfl will be equal to one that means the percentage change in ebit and percentage change in eps both are equal so in that case dfl will be equal to one so my dear students dfl arises because of the existence of the debt and preference share capital in the company's capital structure if you can remove debt and preference share capital from your capital structure and then your dfl will be equal to one that means your financial risk is equal to zero there will be no financial risk at all okay there will be no financial risk in case if you can remove debt and preference share capital from the capital structure so my dear students i can say one thing here dfl is a measure of financial risk DFL will be more if your debt is more. DFL will be less if your debt is less. So degree of financial leverage is highly dependent on how much extent of debt you are using in the company's capital structure. If debt is more, high DFL. If debt is less, low DFL. If there is no debt, no DFL. No DFL doesn't mean DFL is equal to zero. DFL is equal to one. That means the percentage change in EBIT and percentage change in EPS both are equal to same. Both are equal and then you'll get DFL is equal to one. So with this we understood degree of financial leverage. Now I'm moving to the next area called degree of combined leverage. DCL. So what it indicates? DCL means it is simply establishes the relation between sales and EPS directly sales to eps relationship is dcl so the formula of a dcl is percentage change in eps divided by percentage change in sales directly okay percentage change in sales the second formula is contribution divided by ebt contribution divided by ebt i can also rewritten this formula as dcl is equal to dol into dfl operating and financial leverage dol means what contribution by ebit dfl means what actually this is ebt minus pd by 1 minus tax rate this is ebit divided by ebt minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate extended formula so if you can cancel these two terms, what will happen? I'll get contribution divided by EBT minus preference dividend divided by 1 minus tax rate. This is a formula of a degree of combined leverage. So you can calculate degree of combined leverage simply by multiplying two numbers DOL and DFL. That's enough. Okay. Now we understood degree of combined leverage successfully. So what it is trying to say, if there is a change in sales, how it would affect EPS change? That's what 
uh, the relationship between sales and EPS that can be established, that can be measured with a lever is called degree of combined leverage. Say for example, if I uh, see if I can apply the previous numbers here, DCL is equal to DOL is 2, D DFL is 1.5, it will be 2 into 1.5, 2 into 1.5 means it is 3 actually, right? So what is this 3? For every 1% change in I got DCL is equal to right DFL is 1.5. This means for every 1% change in sales, EPS changes by EPS changes by 3%. So that means for, for example, if your sales increases by 1%, EPS increases by 3%. If sales decreases by 1%, EPS decreases by 3%. That's what DCL is all about. Okay. With this, we understood degree of combined leverage. Now, we can go for the problems directly with the help of this background. Go for 11th problem. Here is the question. I am reading the question. The ABC Limited has the following balance sheet and income statement of information. Assets, net fixed assets, current assets, total assets 19 lakhs. Liabilities, equity, share capital 8 lakh rupees with a face value of 10 rupees each. That means 80,000 equity shares. 10% debt 6 lakh rupees. That means the interest component is 60,000. Retained earnings 3 lakh 50,000, current liabilities 1 lakh 50,000, total liabilities 19 lakhs. Income statement sales minus operating expenses including 60,000 depreciation. My dear students, 60,000 depreciation is a fixed cost. That means out of 1 lakh 20,000, 60,000 is fixed cost. Balanced 60,000 must be your variable cost. So EBIT less interest, EBT less taxes, earnings after tax. Generally whenever we are preparing income statement, I must split this operating expenses into variable and fixed. Then only I can get contribution and EBIT separately so that I can calculate all the leverages. So now look at the question. Determine degree of operating financial and combined leverages at the current sales level. If all operating expenses other than depreciation are variable costs. So dep other than depreciation, all other operating expenses are variable costs. That's what they're saying. So my dear students, so this 60,000 depreciation is a fixed cost. Balance 60,000 operating expenditure is a variable cost. Now I'm going to re redefine this income statement. I have to prepare income statement again actually. But still, they have not prepared income statement. You can you better prepare income statement. Sales minus variable cost. 60,000, I'll get contribution minus variable, uh, minus fixed cost, 60,000 depreciation, then you'll get EBIT. From this point onwards, your income statement remains same. Okay, now, what is your degree of operating leverage? The formula of a degree of operating leverage is contribution by EBIT. How to get contribution? 3,40,000 sales minus variable cost of 60,000, I got contribution of 2,80,000 divided by EBIT. My EBIT is 2,20,000. So, I got It is 1.27. Yes, degree, degree of operating leverage is 1.27. DFL. Since we don't have preference share capital here, I can say that the formula of a DFL is EBIT by EBT. EBIT, 2,20,000. EBT, just now we got it. EBT is 1,60,000. It is 1.375. Yes, DCL is equal to DOL into DFL. DF, DOL is 1.27 into DFL is 1.37. So 1.27 into 1.37, that is 1.75 DCL. Now look at point B. If total assets remains at the same level, but sales increases by 20% and sales decreases by 20%, what will be the earnings per share in the new situation? So if your total assets remains at the same level, if sales increases by 20% and sales decreases by 20%, so, but your total assets remains same level. It remains at same level. When your total assets are at same level, your total fund remains same. Your debt and equity remains same. But earnings per share under new situation should be calculated here. See here, sales volume increases by twenty percent. First alternative. Under alternative one, if your sales increases by twenty percent, existing sales is three lakh forty thousand into one twenty percent. It will be four lakh eight thousand. If sales decreases by twenty percent, what will happen? you have to apply 80% on sales, 3,40,000 into 80%, 2,72,000. Variable cost will be proportionally changed. My previous variable cost is 60,000. 
when your sales increases by 20%, your variable cost will be increased by 20% into 120 percent It will be 72,000. When your sales decreases by 20 percent, your variable cost will be decreased by 20 percent. That means 60,000 into 80 percent. It is 48,000. Deduct it. Then you'll get contribution minus fixed cost. <coughs> minus fixed cost. How much is your fixed cost? There will be no change in fixed cost even though your there is a change in sales. So 60,000 remains fixed cost. Remains the same fixed cost. Deduct it. EBIT less interest. Interest cost is also constant. My interest component is 6 lakhs into 10 percent 60,000. Deduct it. Even though there is a change in sales, it won't affect your uh, interest component also. I got EBT, less income tax rate, the same tax rate, applicable tax rate is how much percent is. You please calculate it, 56,000 divided by 1,60,000. My tax rate is 35%. Apply 35% tax on this number, 2,16,000 into 35%. It is 75,600. The same tax rate is applicable for second amount also. Deducted earnings after tax, which is nothing but earnings of equity shareholders because we don't have any preference share capital here. Divide that number with number of equity shares. My dear students, there is no change in interest, no change in number of equity shares because my total assets remain same. My total fund remains same. My equity and debt remain same. Number of shares are same. Total interest remains same. Remember that. So number of equity shares are 90,000 and 80,000. Actually, the capital is 8 lakhs divided by face value 10. I got 80,000 equity shares. Even though there is a change in sales, it doesn't affect your number of shares outstanding. And it doesn't affect interest component my, because my total assets remains same. So that is indirect. That indirectly saying what? There is no change in the capital. There is no change in the total assets. Okay. So that your interest and number of shares are same. So I got EPS. Earnings of equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares. We got EPS. But this what? Problem number... 11 is completed. Nothing new here. Now, you please go for 12th problem. This is an important sum. Very important sum. Now, I'm just reading it. A firm's sales variable cost and fixed cost amounts to 75, 42 lakhs and 6 lakh rupees respectively. Sales variable cost and fixed cost are directly given in the problem. It has borrowed 45 lakh rupees at 9% rate of interest and its equity share capital total 55 lakhs. Yes, 45 lakh rupees debt fund. 55 lakh rupees equity fund, total capital employed is 100 lakhs, 45 plus 55, there is no other fund I am using here, okay, yes, and also your interest rate on debt capital is 9%, what is the firm's return on investment, the formula for return on investment is EBIT by capital employed, I know that my capital employed is 100 lakhs, I just need to calculate EBIT, how to get it, sales minus variable cost contribution minus fixed cost EBIT, so that's what they have tried to calculate sales minus variable cost minus fixed cost and they got EBIT of 27 lakhs here. Okay. Now I just need to calculate written on investment. What is the formula for written on investment? EBIT by capital employed. You know, my capital employed is 100 lakhs. Yes, equity plus debt. Okay. So EBIT by capital employed. 27 lakhs EBIT divided by capital employed 100 lakhs. I got 27% written on investment. Now what about second point, does it have favorable financial leverage? So what is this favorable financial leverage? First of all, let me tell you one important point. Financial leverage means debt. Financial leverage means debt. So debt will be favorable only when this debt is able to provide some extra return to the equity shareholders. So every firm is using debt only to provide additional return to the equity shareholders. That's a fact you must understand. How a debt can provide extra return? This is a liability state fund. You know that. Debt is a liability. Yes, and I have raised this debt at a rate of 10%. Example I'm taking here. Say for example, I have raised a debt of 1 lakh rupees. And I'm going to invest this debt of 1 lakh rupees to earn a return on investment of 20%. Now, this debt 1 lakh rupees is going to earn 20% return. Let me take another number. This debt is going to earn 30% return on investment. Whereas I am going to pay 10% interest only. So this debt is getting, generating 30% return. From that you have to pay 10% interest. So balance margin of 20% from debt will be passed on to the owners of the company. They are equity shareholders. So equity shareholders are getting some extra return due to uses of debt. Why? Because I am raising debt at lower cost. Nothing but the interest rate is cheaper. Whereas the return which I am going to generate from this debt is very high. The return on investment from the debt fund is very high. Whereas the cost that I am going to pay to the debt holders is very low. So the return over cost of debt, nothing but interest rate, uh, is nothing but the extra return which is generated from debt. So return on investment is 30%. Interest rate that I am paying is 10%. Whatever the excess margin 20% that I don't need to pay, pay to the debt holders. 
that extra return will be enjoyed by equity shareholders only so here you can understand one thing here this debt is a favorable source when it is able to provide some extra return to the equity shareholders that means if your return on investment the business return is more than the interest rate on debt if roi is greater than interest rate on debt then debt is a favorable source if roi is less than interest rate on debt then debt is an adverse source to the company if R roi is exactly equal to interest rate there is no uses of debt debt in the company's capital structure so my dear students now the question is when this debt becomes a favorable financial leverage actually financial leverage means debt i said what favorable financial leverage so that means that means when will you consider this financial leverage as a favorable number financial leverage means debt i said what debt is a favorable source debt becomes favorable source only when the return on investment the business return is more than the interest rate on debt so if roi is greater than interest rate on debt then debt debt becomes a favorable financial leverage this becomes a favorable financial leverage in case if this return on investment is less than interest rate on debt debt cannot provide extra return to the equity shareholder then this particular debt becomes an unfavorable financial leverage to the shareholders so that's what you need to remember so what is favorable financial leverage if roi is greater than interest rate on debt then the debt becomes a favorable financial leverage okay now look at this point yes the firm has favorable financial leverage as its return on investment is higher than interest rate on debt yes we got 27% at roi whereas interest rate on debt is 9% which is more than interest rate so my dear students this debt is a favorable financial leverage here okay the firm has favorable financial leverage that means favorable debt that debt is a favorable source here okay now look at point c if the firm belongs to an industry whose assets turnover is 3 does it have a high or low asset leverage actually assets turnover formula is sales by total assets you know that sales is the sales value is 75 lakh rupees here whereas your total assets are not given here i can take the total capital as total assets that means the total capital 45 plus 55 100 lakhs is my total assets so what is the formula for total assets turnover ratio sales by total assets that's what you need to calculate sales is 75 lakhs total assets 100 lakhs 75 lakhs divided by 100 lakhs i got 0.75 see 0.75 you should not mention any number here rupees or something else 0.75 is a ratio it's a multiplier or i can say it's a number with any without any unit okay so 0.75 what it exactly means 0.75 means 0.75 0.75 divided by 1 that means for every 1 rupee of asset i'm using in the business for every 1 rupee of asset that i'm using in the business i'm generating 0.75 rupees of sales that's what the literal interpretation of the term assets turnover so my assets turnover ratio in the company is 0.75 that means for every 1 rupee that i'm using in the business for every 1 rupee that i'm investing in the assets i am able to generate 1 0.75 rupees of sales whereas the industry's assets turnover ratio is 3 times that means the industry is generating 3 rupees of sales for every 1 rupee of users of assets in the business whereas i am just generating 0.75 rupees so now my firm has high or low asset leverage my firm has low asset leverage that means my i am generating lower amount of sales for every 1 rupee of asset that i am investing in the business so the conclusion is it has lower it is lower than industry's average so i can say that the firm has low asset leverage you can write that sentence also here the firm has low asset leverage but this point c is over now go for point d what are the operating financial combined leverage that's a simple task operating leverage contribution by ebit financial leverage good evening everyone in the previous session we are in the middle of the problem problem number 12 due to some technical issue i stopped in between so now let me go ahead with point number d what are the operating financial and combined leverages of the firm you know operating financial and combined leverages are nothing but dol dfl and dcl dol is equal to contribution by ebit dfl is equal to ebit by ebt and combined leverage is equal to dcl is equal to contribution by ebt so these are the three formulas regular formulas they have applied here and we got the answers sales minus variable cost contribution by ebit ebit by ebit minus interest means ebt so the formula is ebit by ebt combined leverages contribution by ebt so we got operating financial and combined leverages alternatively 
I can calculate combined leverage by multiplying operating leverage with financial leverage. Yes, we got it. Now, <clears throat> look at point E. If the sales drops to 50 lakhs, what will be the new EBIT? My previous sales is 75 lakhs. If it drops to 50 lakhs, what will be the new EBIT? Just need to prepare income statement. Sales revenue 50 lakhs. Previously, my variable cost ratio is how much? Actually, I have to calculate variable cost ratio. My variable cost is 42 lakhs. So, which is 56% is on sales. So, the variable cost ratio is 56%. The formula for variable cost ratio is variable cost by sales. So, if, if your variable cost ratio is 50%, even though your sales is decreasing, your variable cost ratio remains same. So, I can apply same 56% variable cost ratio on the new sales of 50 lakhs to get my variable cost. So, 50 lakhs into 56%, that is 28 lakhs. If you deduct this variable cost, I'll get contribution. 50 minus 28, 22 is your contribution. Minus fixed cost, there will be no change in fixed cost even though there is a change in sales. So, I can use the same fixed cost of 6 lakhs. So, I got EBIT of 16 lakhs. This is my requirement. So, my new EBIT will be 16 lakhs if the sales drops to 50 lakhs. And point F, what, at what level will the EBIT, EBIT of the firm will be equal to 0? So, at what level of sales the EBD of the firm will be equal to 0? That's what the requirement actually. At what level of sales the EBD of the firm will be equal to 0? I can go ahead with the backward computation. See, look at the numbers here. Your target number is 0, EBT. Now, interest. You know, the interest is always constant. I can use same interest cost. So, the interest component is... The interest component is 45 lakhs into... 9% it is 4,5,000 through backward computation if you can add interest to EBT you will get EBIT okay so 4,5,000 plus 0 I will get 4,5,000 EBIT then if you if you can add fixer cost to EBIT you will get contribution so 4,5,000 plus 6 lakhs I will get 10,5,000 10,5,000 that is my contribution if I can add variable cost to this then I'll get revenue sales revenue see <coughs> I'll do this numbers sales okay sales is your requirement minus variable cost it is your contribution minus fixed cost the number will be EBIT so just now we got EBIT of 4,5,000 4,5,000 actually if I deduct interest also I will get EBT the target EBT is the target EBT is 0 since your target EBT is 0 there will be no change in interest cost 4,5,000. So, EBIT will be 4,5,000. Your fixed cost is 6 lakhs. So, through backward computation, I am doing this computations. I am arriving contribution here. 4,5,000 plus 6 lakhs. I got 10,5,000. This is my contribution. 10,5,000. The thing is, I have to calculate sales. But I know that the variable cost ratio is 56% on sales. If variable cost ratio is 56% percentage on sales, then automatically 100 minus 56, the contribution ratio will be 44%. The contribution ratio will be 44%. You know that the contribution is 10,5,000. From that, you can calculate sales. Contribution by sales is equal to contribution by sales is equal to 10,5,000. Wait, wait. Contribution by sales is equal to 44%. Then sales is equal to 10,5,000 divided by 44%. And from this, I can calculate my required sales. It will be 22,84,090. So it should be your answer. Look at the number 22,84,090.90 that means 22,84,091.
this is your required sales in order to get ebt of zero number so through backward computation you can arrive this figure sales value simply it's a backward computation so if you can add interest to ebt zero target zero, target ebt zero you will get ebit then add a fixed cost then you'll get contribution then from contribution you can easily calculate sales value because you know the variable cost ratio the balance ratio will be contribution ratio so from that equation i can easily calculate sales value yes we got it now the next problem is related to capital structure actually this is related to financial break even point and ebit indifference point look at this 13th problem excel limited is considering three financing plans the key information are as follows the total fund to be raised is 2 lakhs financing plans a b c see under plan a i can raise 100% equity and under plan b i can raise 50% equity and 50% and under plan c i can raise i can raise 50% equity and 50% preference so we have three plans here plan a plan b plan c cost of debt is 8% that is interest rate on debt the cost of preference share is 8% that is in preference dividend rate on preference share capital the tax rate is 35% equity shares of the face value of 10 rupees each will be issued at a premium of 10 rupees per share that is the issue price of equity share is 20 rupees expected ebit is 80000 determine for each plan earnings per share financial break even point it is very easy for you to calculate eps for all these three plans see under plan a i am going to raise 2 lakh equity under plan b 1 lakh equity 1 lakh debt under plan c 1 lakh equity and 1 lakh preference share capital my issue price is 20 rupees per equity share now look at this statement determination of eps of plan e a b and c see i have written ebit here see they have taken ebit here 80000 is a expected ebit direct interest under plan 2 i mean plan b because we have debt component 1 lakh into 8% that is 8000 interest I have deducted it. EBT less tax rate thirty five percent. I got EAT minus preference dividend. So you know preference dividend is applicable only for plan C. C one lakh into eight percent. That is also the same rate, right? So eight percent preference dividend you have to deduct. Then I'll get earnings of equity shareholders. So that is to be divided with number of equity shares outstanding. Then uh, so how to get number of equity shares outstanding? Simple thing. C for plan A. I'm raising two lakh equity. Two lakh by twenty rupees issue price. The number of shares outstanding. For plan A will be ten thousand. Whereas for plan B, I'm going to raise, I'm going to raise one lakh equity only, one lakh by twenty, five thousand shares required to be issued. And under plan C, you're supposed to raise five thousand number of equity shares because amount that is to be raised to equity is one lakh rupees only. Okay, so the amount that is to be raised to equity should be divided with issue price of twenty to get number of shares outstanding. So earnings of equity shareholders under plan A is fifty two thousand divided by ten thousand shares, five point two is my earnings per share. Forty-six thousand eight hundred is the earnings of equity shareholders under Plan B. This is A, this is B, this is C. Divided by number of shares are five thousand. I got nine point three six EPS. Like that for Plan C also. So we got higher EPS under Plan B actually. Okay. Now with this we have completed point number one, earnings per share. Now what about second part of the question? Point number one, financial break-even point. I told you already the financial break-even point formula is. EBIT is equal to interest plus preference dividend divided by one minus tax rate. Interest plus that is the first term plus preference dividend divided by one minus tax rate second term. See, look at the formulas here. Financial break-even points for Plan A, B, and C. Plan A actually financial break-even point for Plan A is zero. Why, sir? Because interest zero, preference dividend is zero. So because we don't have any preference share capital and debt capital for Plan A. So for Plan A financial break-even point EBIT is equal to zero. And for Plan B. It is financial break-even point EBIT is equal to interest plus preference dividend divided by one minus tax rate. For Plan B, preference dividend is zero, so EBIT should be equal to interest. My interest component is eight thousand. This is not eighty comma zero zero. It is eight thousand rupees. This is my financial break-even point for Plan B. What about Plan C? Interest is zero, whereas preference dividend is eight thousand. That is to be divided with what one minus tax rate. One minus zero point three five. I'll get one minus. Uh, I'll get eight thousand divided by zero point six five. So that will be twelve thousand three hundred eight. So the financial break-even point for Plan A is zero. Plan B is eight thousand. Plan C is twelve thousand three hundred eight. You please simply apply the formula. You'll get the answer. And now let us go for the indifference point between Plan A and Plan B. You have to calculate. I mean. Indicate if any of the plans dominate if, and compute the EBIT range among the plans for indifference. You have to calculate EBIT range 
among the plans for indifference nothing but EBIT indifference point. I have to calculate indifference point between plan A and B, plan B and C and plan A and C. That's what my requirement is. Now look at the requirements A and B, B and C and A and C. I'll do this calculation for A and B. The same computation is applicable for plan B and C and plan A and C also. Let me do it. So plan A and B. How I have to write the formula EBIT minus interest into 1 minus tax rate minus preference dividend of plan A divided by number of equity shares should be equal to the same term EBIT minus interest into 1 minus tax rate minus preference dividend divided by number of equity shares. That's what your requirement is. Now substitute all the numbers except EBIT because EBIT is a variable number you have to calculate it. So EBIT and I have to calculate that EBIT minus interest so for plan 1 for plan A the interest is nil into 1 minus tax rate 1 minus 0 0.35 minus preference dividend is nil divided by number of shares for plan A is 20,000 shares. So rate is 10,000 shares. It is 10,000 shares should be equal to the same term but with different numbers EBIT minus interest for plan A plan B is 8000 into 1 minus 0 0.35 minus preference dividend is nil divided by number of shares are 5000 if you can solve this equation you can easily arrive the number 5000 2 times will be and it will be 2 times of 10,000 so I'll get 0 0.65 EBIT should be equal to 0 0.65 EBIT minus 8000 to 0 0.65 it will be 5200 0 0.65 EBIT divided by 2 ok now from this you have to calculate your EBIT ok so 0 0.65 EBIT should be equal to 0 0.65 into 2 it will be 1.3 EBIT 1.3 EBIT minus 52,000 into 2 1 lakh 4,000 so 1.3 minus 0 0.65 so it will be 1 lakh 4,000 divided by 0 0.65 I will get 1 lakh 60,000 so my indifference This 60,000. Let me check it once. Actually, this is not 52,000. This is 5, 0 0.65 into 8,000. It is 5,200. It is 5,200. Sorry. Then the numbers will be changed. This is not 1,4,000. This is 1 lakh. This is 10,400. 10,400. From this 10,400 divided by 0 0.65, I'll get 16,000 financial uh, EBIT indifference point. So for plan between plan A and B, my indifference point is 16,000. So what it means? If you can take 16,000 EBIT, calculate EPS for plan under plan A and plan B, you'll get same EPS. You please try to calculate EPS for plan A and B by taking 16,000 EBIT will get the same EPS under both the alternatives that's what the importance of this indifference point between plan A and plan B. So we understood indifference point between plan A and B in the similar way between B and C and A and C how to calculate sometimes sometimes both LHS and RHS terms may be cancelled in that case indifference point doesn't exist see thus indifference point between plan B and C is indeterminate that means I cannot de determine this so my dear students sometimes for between plan B sometimes between two plans you may not calculate indifference point that means LHS term and RHS term gets cancelled in that case what will happen you have to write like this indifference point doesn't exist between these two plans or you can write this is indeterminate okay indeterminate means I cannot determine the indifference point between these plans B and C. So this will also happen here plan for plan B and C we don't have indifference point whereas for plan A and C I got an indifference point of 24,615. You must use this equation this is the important equation I must apply for calculating EBIT indifference point okay. With this we understood 13th problem 
now we can enter into the new chapter called dividend policy let me enter into the chapter okay here is the chapter dividend policy and dividend decisions and dividend theories actually dividend decisions simply the objective of this chapter is simple whether this dividend decision can affect whether it can affect the wealth of the firm or not wealth means value actually you cannot simply say it can affect the value value of the firm or wealth of the firm because there are two types of opinions here some people said dividend decisions can affect the value of the firm or wealth of the firm and some people said it cannot affect the value of the firm the first set of theories are simply known as theories of relevance that means the dividend decisions are relevant for value of the firm and the second set of decisions are simply known as theories of irrelevance that means the dividend decisions are completely irrelevant for what the value of the firm so the first set of theories are walter model and gordon model the second set of theory is modigliani and miller approach the same persons which we have discussed under the chapter capital structure modigliani and miller approach so we have to understand these two set of theories along with this series we also have other theories called lindner model so we should also understand those th uh, such theory also the calculation of expected dividend per share now let me handle the first set of theory there is that is the theories of relevance under that i am covering the first area called walters model walter is simply giving one conclusion when the company is earning profit of equity shareholders it can distribute the profits or it can retain the profits so what to do whether i should distribute the profits or retain the profits walter says if r is greater than ke if r is greater than ke you better retain the profits if r is less than ke you better distribute the profits that's what the conclusion of walter r is greater than ke so what is r and what is ke r means the rate of return that can be earned by the company by investing its funds in the business or projects ke means the expected return of equity shareholders cost of equity ke so what walter is saying walter is saying a simple sentence if the return from the projects are more than the cost of equity ke you better retain the profits of equity shareholders and reinvest in the business to earn more and more profits why because the business projects are generating higher return when compared to the expected return of equity shareholders so if r is greater than ke it is better for the company to retain the profits in order to increase the value of the share and if r is less than ke since the firm is not able to provide the return which is being expected by equity shareholders it is better to distribute the profits and don't retain even a single rupee of profit which belongs to equity shareholders that's what walter says so a firm can maximize its value per share if it can distribute its entire profits to the shareholders in case if the r is greater than r is less than ke so these are the two conclusions which were given by walter now my dear students this walter has given one formula for calculating the value of the share under walter's model under walter's model the formula for mp notice d by ke plus r into e minus d by ke whole divided by ke so what is d 
where d is equal to dividend per share. R is equal to the rate of return. K is equal to cost of equity. Okay. And coming to E, E is equal to earnings per share. Earnings per share. But this, all the terms are covered. This is the formula which is being given by Walter. MP0 is equal to dividend by KE, dividend per share divided by KE, plus R into E minus D by KE, whole divided by KE. Okay, there is a huge background uh, uh, about this formula actually. There is a huge background behind this formula. I am not explaining such part because that is purely conceptual. You better go ahead with the formula itself because application of formula is very important to get more and more marks. Okay, so you better remember the formula. MP0 is equal to d by ke plus r into e minus d by ke whole divided by ke. So what Walter is saying, Walter has given some optimum dividend payout ratios. Optimum payout ratios means the best payout ratio which can maximize the value per share because ultimate target of every decision is to share, maximize value per share. So I am taking here the optimum payout ratios that were given by Walter. If r is greater than ke, the firm can maximize, wait, wait, I'll do this. The optimum payout ratio will be, the optimum payout ratio will be 0 percent. That means if R is greater than KE, you better don't distribute any amount of profits to the shareholders. The payout ratio should be 0 percent. If your payout ratio is 0 percent, then you can maximize the value per share. Zero percent payout ratio can maximize the value per share. So what is the optimum dividend payout ratio if R is greater than KE? Zero percent. That means don't distribute any amount of profit. If R is less than KE, since the firm is not able to generate better profits which can satisfy the equity shareholders, then immediately you better distribute 100% of profits to the shareholders. 100% payout ratio can maximize the value per share. Can maximize value per share. If R is equal to KE, the dividend policy is completely relevant. The dividend policy or the dividend payout ratio cannot affect the dividend payout ratio cannot affect the value per share. It cannot affect the value per share. Okay. That's it. So these are the payout ratios which were given by Walter. Let me handle one problem related to this concept so that we can close this at the earliest. Here is the first theory Walter's model. Yes. Look at this question, it is, this is covering so many points. From the following data, calculate the value of an equity share of the following three companies according to Walter's model when dividend payout ratio is nil, 25%, 50%, 75% and 100%. So when the dividend payout ratio is nil, 25%, 50%, 75% and 100%, what could be the value per share, value of an equity share? Name of the companies X Limited, Y Limited, Z Limited. Observe the rate of return and cost of equity. Internal rate of return are cost of capital K, nothing but cost of equity KE and earnings per share for all the firms were given. What conclusions do you draw? First of all, look at X limited. R is greater than KE for X limited. R is less than KE for Y limited. R is equal to KE for Z limited. For all these payout ratios, how to calculate market price per share for X limited, Y limited and Z limited. Statement showing for valuation of each equity share according to Walter's model. You know the formula for price per share under Walter's model. D by KE plus R into E minus D by KE 
whole divided by ke see uh, you can apply the formula which i have given to you so now dividend payout ratio for x limited since r is greater than ke what should be the optimum dividend payout ratio so first of all dividend payout ratio for x limited y limited and z limited yes actually these are the situations actually uh, the terms were given earnings per share 10 for x limited earnings per share is 10 and r is equal to 15% ke is equal to 10% r by ke is given here i am not going to take this now for y limited earnings per share is 10 r is equal to 5% actually and ke is equal to 10% for z limited earnings per share 10 r and ke both are same that is a 10% you, do, you please don't consider r by ke because we'll apply the formula as per our understanding when dividend payout ratio is nil if the payout ratio is nil what will happen to all the three firms when payout ratio is nil earnings per share becomes dividend per share sorry dividend payout per share will be zero when dividend payout ratio is nil dividend per share will be nil for all the firms dps is nil when dividend is nil what will happen d by ke the first term becomes zero plus d r into e minus d by ke so if i can take here first firm x limited d by ke that means 0 by ke means 10% plus r into e minus d by ke the rate of return is 15% here okay 15% into e earnings 10 minus d 0 divided by ke 10% whole divided by 10% this is for the first firm the first firm x limited let me calculate it 15% into 10 1.5 divided by 10% divided by 10% i got 150 rupees share price yes we got 150 share price here in the similar way for y limited and z limited also in the similar way okay now when the dividend payout ratio is 25% i'll do it i'll do it for x limited actually they have calculated dividend per share earnings per share is 10 into 25% dividend payout ratio i got 2.5 dps 2.5 by ke plus r into e minus d by ke whole divided by ke let me do it for x limited mp not is equal to d by ke see 2.5 divided by 10% plus r into e minus d by ke 15% into earnings per share 10 minus dividend per share 2.5 divided by ke whole divided by ke so you please solve this so that you can get you can calculate market price per share for for x limited when the dividend payout ratio is 25% yes 2.5 by 10% and 2.5 by 15% plus 2.5 by 15% and 15 is divided by 10% so i got 137.5 rupees share price you please do it in your own way you don't need to follow the study material computation every time one that is 1.5 i got it in the similar way for y limited and z limited now my dear students if you can take dividend payout ratio 50% the same computation is applicable 75% 100% everywhere the computation is same the point is you please look at firm z limited since r is equal to ke since uh, when r is equal to ke the dividend policy cannot affect the value of the share that means for any payout ratio for jet limited your share price must be equal you please check it once when the dividend payout ratio is zero my share price is 100 under walters model when the dividend payout ratio is 25% i got the same 100 rupees 50% dividend payout ratio 100 100% payout ratio 100 and 100% payout ratio 100 so for jet limited why we got the same share price same market price per share under walters model under the different payout ratios why sir why because the dividend payout ratio is completely relevant to the firm is completely relevant to the value of the share <clears throat> in case if r is equal to ke so when return on investment is equal to cost of equity ke the dividend policy is completely irrelevant according to walters model yes we understood walters model comments on all you please read it you can easily say that uh, the conclusions which were given by walters will be covered under com comments okay comment section now let me go for the next theory gordon gordon model
under gordon model the same conclusions were given by gordon also when the firm is earning profits it has two options one to retain the profits the other one is to distribute the profits the same logic was given by gordon also if r is greater than k you better retain the profits if r is equal to k you better distribute the profits okay that's what the conclusions given by gordon actually and according to gordon the share price can be determined by using this formula mp not is equal to eps into 1 minus b by ke minus br this is a formula where eps is equal to expected earnings per share expected earnings per share b is equal to retention ratio k is equal to cost of equity that's a known term to everyone whereas r is equal to rate of return and i need to tell you one important point b into r b into r is nothing but growth rate that means the growth rate is a multipli multiplication of it is a multiplication of retention ratio and rate of return b into r so the formula for mp not is eps into 1 minus b by ke minus br where eps is expected earnings per share b is retention ratio ke is cost of equity r is rate of return br is growth rate okay see my dear students 1 minus b is also known as 1 minus b means 1 minus retention ratio so what is 1 minus retention ratio 1 minus retention ratio means dividend payout ratio dividend payout ratio so if you can simply understand this term 1 minus b which is clearly saying i am dividend payout ratio so 1 minus b is nothing but dividend payout ratio if you can multiply dividend payout ratio with eps i'll get dps dps by ke br means g so dps by ke minus g that's what the understand nothing but this is nothing but dividend growth model uh, under dividend growth model also the formula for mp not is dps 1 by ke minus g that's the same formula i'm applying here that's why the gordon model is also known as growth model okay now actually even gordon is saying same thing if r is greater than ke by retaining more profits you can maximize the value per share if r is less than ke by distributing more profits we can maximize the value per share okay that's what the gordon is saying so you must remember this formula for application let us handle one problem related to this concept also gordon yes <clears throat> here is the gordon model from the following data calculate the value of an equity share of each of the following three companies according to gordon model when dividend payout ratio is 25% 50% and 100% so this the same formula set actually for the and i'm taking the same uh, i'm taking different returns x limited y limited z limited r ke earnings per share are given here what conclusions can you draw first of all you know the formula e into 1 minus b by ke minus br for calculating share price of the company let me take x limited earnings per share is 12 r is 12% cost of equity ke is 10% okay then and for y limited earnings per share 12 ke 10% r is 8% and for z limited earnings per share is 12 ke 10% r is 10% now let me apply the formula when the dividend payout ratio is 25% when the dividend payout ratio is 25% i can calculate 1 minus b 1 minus b means 1 minus b means actually uh, you know one thing dear students the dividend payout ratio just now i told you 1 minus b is nothing but dividend payout ratio so what are the dividend payout ratio what are the dividend payout ratios that were given in the problem i can take these dividend payout ratios as 1 minus b that means already we have 1 minus b here okay 1 minus b is 25 percent or you can take retention ratio from dividend payout ratio because if the dividend payout ratio is 25 percent that means the retention ratio is the balance percentage 75 percent so instead of that you better take this 1 minus b directly and you can solve the problem very comfortably but they have taken b directly here see 12 is my earnings per share 1 minus b since the dividend payout ratio is 25 percent retention ratio b will be 75 percent 75 percent means 0.75 1 minus 0.75 divided by ke is 10 percent and 
R is 9% actually. K minus BR. B into R. B means what? 0.75. Means R means what? R is 12%, 0.12. So 0.75 into 0.12. I got 0 0.09. That's what they have written here. Okay. So 12 into 0 0.25 divided by 10 minus 9%. Nothing but 1%. I got 300 rupees. This is what my share price. Okay. For Y limited also, you can do like this. And for Z limited also, you can do like this. Okay. Now, go for the next payout ratio. If my payout ratio is 50%, yeah, I'll take... 50% uh, payout ratio. If my dividend payout ratio is 50%, then my retention ratio will be 50%. That means uh, B is equal to 0 0.5. Do the same, I mean, go with the computation, just like in the previous computation, B is 50%. So B into R is 0.5 into 0 0.12, 0 0.06. Substitute the numbers here. EPS 12 into 1 minus B. B is retention ratio 0 0.5 divided by KE minus BR. KE is cost of equity 10% minus BR. B into R. Just now we got it, 0 0.06. So if you can substitute the numbers, you can get the answer. 12 into 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.04. I got 150 rupees share price. Okay. Now, even for zero payout ratio also, I mean zero retention ratio also, you can calculate like this. The same formula. That's it. See, B is a retention ratio. B means retention ratio. 1 minus B means 1 minus retention ratio. That is dividend payout ratio. Or I can write like this. B is equal to 1 minus dividend payout ratio. Retention ratio B is equal to 1 minus dividend payout ratio. You better write that formula also without any confusion. So B is equal to 1 minus dividend payout ratio. 1 minus dividend payout ratio. You can write this formula also for better retention. Okay. For better understanding. Okay. Now you need to observe one thing here. You need to observe one thing here. For Jet Limited, since R is equal to KE, what, is, what has happened here? The share price is 120 when my payout ratio is 25%. My share price is 120 again when my payout ratio is 50%. My share price is 120 again when my share price is 100%. So what is the conclusion? The dividend policy is irrelevant for valuation of the share. That means the value per share remains constant if R is equal to KE, even under Gordon model also. Even under Gordon model, if R is equal to KE, the dividend policy is irrelevant. The, if R is greater than KE, the share price can be maximized the share price can be maximized by retaining more and profits, more and more profits and by distributing lesser amount of profits. If R is less than KE, the company can maximize the value per share by distributing more profits and by retaining lesser amount of profits. Even you can check the numbers here. See, if R is greater than KE, here the context is R is greater than KE. When I am following 25% payout ratio, I got 300 rupees share price. When I am following 50% payout ratio, I got 150 rupees share price. When I'm following 100% payout ratio, I got 120 rupees share price. What is happening here? When I'm distributing lesser amount of profits, that means when I'm retaining much profit, that means 75% retention, I got highest price. When I'm retaining lesser amount of profits, 50% only, I got lower share price. When I'm retaining nothing, my share price is reduced to least price of 120. That means I can maximize the value per share from 120 to 150 and 150 to 300 rupees by reducing the payout ratio and by retaining the profits. Nothing but the retention ratio. And by increasing the retention ratio, I can maximize the value per share. That's what your observation actually. The same, the same logic is applicable to Y limited also. Reverse computation actually. That means since your R is less than KE, so I can maximize value per share by distributing more profits. So since uh, for that reason only, for 25% payout ratio, I got 75 rupees share price. For 50% payout ratio, I got more share price, 100 rupees. And with 100% payout ratio, I got highest share price of 120. So I can maximize value per share, even under Gordon model, when R is less than KE, by distributing more and more profits, I can maximize value per share. If R is equal to KE, the dividend policy is irrelevant, the share price remains constant. With this, we understood Gordon model also. Yes. Now the next model is Modigliani and Miller approach. Modigliani and Miller, these people are always against the world. If you are saying something, they'll say no. Okay. So that's why they are under second set of theories theories of irrelevance these the, these two persons are saying the dividend policy is completely irrelevant for the value of valuation of the firm that means the value of the firm remains constant even though the firm is paying dividend 
or if, 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 I mean the firm may pay dividend or may not pay dividend, it doesn't matter to the value of the firm. That's what Modiglian and Miller says. So, and they proved it with the help of empirical derivation actually. I'm going to give you a few formulas under m and approach actually. P0 is equal to current share price and they are taking holding period of one year. So we have to consider one year cash flows. If you can discount such one year cash flows at investors expected return of cost of equity KE. So you can calculate value per share. So D1 is the first cash flow I can receive at the end of first year. Since I'm taking one year holding period, I can sell my share at the end of first year at a price of P1. Market price per share at the end of first year. P0 is current share price. I'm calculating current share price by discounting one year cash flow because my holding period is one year. So dividend one, I mean DPS one, the expected dividend at the end of first year, this is my first cash inflow and sale value of share price at the end of uh, first year, that's my second cash flow. I have to discount these two cash flows at my investors expected rate of return, cost of equity KE. So divide by one plus KE, one by one plus R, hold to, <coughs> hold to the power of one, one by one plus KE, hold to the power of one, that I don't need to write. So if I can discount one year cash flow at cost of equity KE, then I can calculate value per share. That's what the formula for share price under Modiglian and Miller approach. P0. Here the holding period is one year. So what is the formula for P0? Current share price D1 plus P1 divided by 1 plus KE. This is regarding first formula. <clears throat> and also the, these two persons Modigliani and Miller proved that the current value of the firm and the future value of the firm remains unaffected by remains unaffected by dividend payout that means the company may pay dividend or it may not pay dividend it doesn't matter the current value of the firm remains constant the future value of the firm remains constant they proved it with the help of uh, arbitrage process and also empirical derivation actually now we have one formula set for calculating current value of the firm and then I can I can calculate future value of the firm with the help of some computation actually. So let us understand the first part of the area current value of the firm. How to calculate current value of the firm? We have a formula set for calculating current value of the firm. Let me show you. Here is the formula set. Look at the formula. Here is a formula. NP0 is equal to M plus N into P1 minus I plus C divided by 1 plus KE. I'll write the same formula. NP0 is equal to M plus N into P1 minus I plus E divided by 1 plus KE. So first of all, what are these terms actually? You know, N is equal to current number of shares outstanding. N is equal to current number of shares outstanding. M is equal to number of new shares to be issued. Number of new shares to be issued at the end of first year actually. P0 is equal to current market price per share, today's share price. P0 is equal to current share price, current market price per share. P0. P1 means market price per share at the end of first year. At the end of year 1. Okay, and you know that, uh, yes, I is equal to investment amount, nothing but capital expenditure. Investment amount at the end of first year, also known as capex, capital expenditure. And E is total earnings at the end of first year. 
total earnings total earnings this is what the formula for NP naught sir what is this NP naught you please understand one thing here N means current number of shares outstanding P naught means current share price current market price per share so if you can multiply current number of shares outstanding with current market price per share what will get I'll get current market value of the firm current market value of the firm so what is this NP naught current market value of the firm have you observed one thing in this equation in this equation actually we don't have a term called dividend so the current market value of the firm remains unaffected by dividend payout why because this formula is missing one term called dividend so your payment of dividend doesn't matter to this current market value of the firm NP naught if you can substitute these numbers you'll get current market value of the firm whether you pay dividend or not your current market value of the firm should be equal you will get same current market value of the firm. I need to prove it with the help of one problem actually. Okay. Let me show you. Let me show you. See, we have a problem here. We have a problem here. I'll explain it. Yes, Bangabasi Limited belongs to a risk class for which an appropriate capitalization rate is 10%. See, this is KE. It currently has outstanding 2000 equity shares of 100 rupees each. See, dear students, this is N. And the share price is 100 rupees. This is P0. The firm is contemplating the declaration of dividend of 8 rupees per share. Declaration of dividend of 8 rupees per share at the end of the current financial year. This is D1. It expects to have a net earnings of 20,000. This is E. And as a proposal for making a new investment of 24,000. This is I. Show that under Modiglian and Miller assumptions, the payment of dividend does not affect the value of the firm. Let us calculate value of the firm first of all. And that's what they've done here. P0, current share price 100. P1, market price of the share at the end of the year. That is, you have to calculate it actually. Okay. That's what your first job. D1 is expected dividend per share at the end of the first year, 8 rupees. Cost of equity KE is 10%, also known as cost of capital. Number of shares outstanding at the beginning of the year, 2000. N, small n, small n means current number of shares outstanding. They have taken delta N. Instead of this, we have taken M, small m. Number of additional shares to be issued. Number of new shares to be issued. E means earnings of the company, 20,000. I means, this is I, total amount, of uh, total amount required for investment, 24,000. Now, my first job is to calculate P1. So, how to calculate P1? The formula for P1 is dependent on whether you are paying dividend or not. Under both the cases, I have to calculate uh, price per share at the end of first year. P0 is equal to P1 plus D1 divided by 1 plus KE actually. Okay. Valuation of the firm when dividends are paid. So, P0 is 100. P1, I have to calculate that. D1 is 8 rupees divided by 1 plus KE 0 0.10. If you can solve this equation, you get get price per share at the end of first year 1 or 2 that's a simple equation when the company is not declaring dividend what will happen if dividends are not paid if dividends are not paid p naught is equal to the same formula i have to apply actually here the same formula my p naught is 100 that is equal to dividend p1 is I have to calculate that D1 is 0 because I am not paying any dividend divided by 1 plus 0 0.10. So I will get P1 is equal to P1 is equal to 110 rupees. This is my price per share at the end of first year if I am not paying any dividend. If I am paying dividend, the share price will be 102. Okay. Now, the requirement is I have to calculate current market value of the firm when dividends are paid, when dividends are not paid. Okay. Uh, you better do one thing. We'll do our own computations actually here. So the formula is NP0 is equal to current market value of the firm. NP0 is equal to first, the first term, M plus N. How many number of addition shares to be issued? That's what the first question. Actually, you have to calculate that. 
that's a big question number of new shares to be issued how many additional shares we are issuing here 2000 sorry this is dependent on one important factor actually first you have to calculate that it's part and parcel of presentation they have done in their own way we need to do our own computations before applying this formula i have to calculate small m number of new shares to be issued that's what your first requirement calculation of future market value of the firm and number of new shares to be issued to be issued under two situations how to do this particulars if dividend is paid if dividend is not paid so what I had to, how to write first you have to write investment amount my investment amount is let me write it my investment amount is 24,000 24,000 under both the cases Twenty four thousand under both the cases. From this, you please deduct retained earnings. How to get retained earnings? Because my investment should be financed out of retained earnings first of all. How to get retained earnings? First, identify your earnings. Your earnings are twenty thousand rupees. My earnings at the end of first year is twenty thousand. 20,000 in both the cases when dividends are paid when dividends are not paid from that you please deduct your dividend payment less dividend for how many shares I am paying dividend here for current number of shares only how to pay dividend for current number of shares see for at the end of first year I will pay dividend only for uh, old number of shares but not for additional shares 2000 into my dividend is 8 rupees 2000 into 8 2000 into 8 it will be 16,000 so if I pay 16,000 dividend, my retained earnings will be 4,000 when dividends are paid. When dividends are not paid, the dividend payment will be zero. So retention will be 20,000. So I should prefer, I should prefer retained earnings first of all for financing my new investment at the end of first year. Then the balance must be raised through equity. Amount to be raised through fresh equity how much amount must be raised to fresh equity 24,000 minus 4,000 it is 20,000 24,000 minus 20,000 it is 4,000 so after retained earnings deduction whatever the money I need for financing my new project should be raised to fresh equity it is to be divided with the price at the end of first year P1 see I got 102 if dividends are paid and I got 110 if dividends are not paid that's what we have done so amount to be raised through fresh equity should be divided with share price at the end of first year because at this price only I am I am going to issue fresh equity shares. So number of new shares to be issued nothing but small m. So 20,000 by 102. I got 196.078. You have to consider fractions only as per the assumptions of M and M. 4000 divided by 110 it will be 36.36 36 shares 3636 36 shares so plus this is small m actually current number of shares outstanding current number of shares are uh, let me check it i think it is 2000 current number of shares are 2000 shares 
add these numbers 2000 2000 2196.078 shares 2036.36 number of shares total number of shares outstanding at the end of first year which is to be divided with share price at the end of first year market value of the firm or market value of the equity at the end of the year how to get it sir simple multiply these number of shares total number of shares outstanding with share price at the end of first year 102 2196.078 into 102 I got 2,24,000 this is my future market value form 2036.36 number of shares outstanding into 110 so 110 into 2036.36 here also I got 2,24,000. Have you observed one thing? My future market value of the firm at the end of first year is same. It is equal whether I am paying dividend or not. So I paid, I may pay dividend or I may not pay dividend. The future market value remains same. And also I should prove whether the current market value of the firm is same or not. See, I need small m here. Okay, you must remember these numbers. 2,196.078 and 2,036.36 total number of, I mean, sorry. Uh, 196.078 and 36.36 small m numbers actually here okay these numbers must be considered here look at the numbers under this formula p1 102 value of the form p1 102 2000 plus 2000 by 102 that's what we got it actually minus i 24000 plus e 20000 divided by 1 plus 0 0.10 you please do do this number you'll get some current market value of the form that is equal to 2 lakhs just do it 102 into 2000 I, have to, I got some total number of shares actually 2000 196.078 2196.078 plus uh, minus 24000 plus 20000 divided by 1 plus 0 0.10 you plus do this number 2196.078 into 102 minus 24,000 plus 20,000 divided by 1.1 I got 2 lakh rupees current market value of the firm so I got some current market value of the firm when dividends are paid you will get the same current market value of the firm when dividends are not paid you please try the same formula but this time small m means small m means you have to consider 36.36 that means n plus m should be 2036.36 by taking these numbers, you can calculate current market value of the firm. But you remember one thing, P1 is 110, not 102. You'll get same 2 lakh rupees current market value of the firm. That means, even the current market value of the firm remains constant whether you pay dividend or not. It doesn't matter. Okay. So with this, we understood Modigliani and Miller approach. You better follow my, my way of calculation. That is so easy. Okay. So this is regarding 21st problem. So we understood Modigliani and Miller approach successfully. Yes, and also we have dividend discount model. You see, my dear students, dividend discount model is nothing but discounting of future dividends. I can calculate share price when constant dividends under constant dividends P0 is equal to constant dividend per share divided by cost of equity. This formula will give me the share price today, today's share price. In case if dividends are growing, the formula will be changed. The formula will be DPS1 by KE minus Z. The first formula is applicable for constant dividends. The second formula is applicable for dividends which are following constant growth rate that means the growing dividends okay dps1 means expected dividend per share at the end of first year the formula is dps not into 1 plus z here dps you don't need to give any notation dps means expected dividend per share without any growth because the dividend per share is always constant okay and here is a formula constant dividend growth rate so the formula is d1 by ke minus c for calculating current share price See, you instead of remembering this formula, you better follow the process for non-constant growth rate situation. See, for under non-constant growth rate situation, the share price can be calculated in a phased manner. So that is covered under the chapter cost of capital actually. Yes, we have one more theory and that will be covered in the next session. Thank you. Good evening all of you dear students. 
in the last session we understood several theories in dividend policy now we have one more theory under dividend policy that is lindner's model you better follow my formula instead of the formula which is given in the study material because that is little bit confusing actually the terms are not clear so i am giving you the clear formula under lindner's model c lindner develop a formula for calculating expected dividend per share for the next year by observing the dividend trend of several corporates so this formula is very famous because it is taking the realistic things actually it is taking some realistic assumptions so as per lindner's model what is the formula for expected dividend per share for the next year the formula is dps1 is equal to dps0 plus eps1 into target payout ratio target payout ratio minus dps0 into adjustment factor af so every term is very clear where dps not is equal to last year dividend dividend per share and eps 1 is equal to expected earnings per share at the end of year 1 and this term af is nothing but adjustment factor based on the sustainability of the earnings in the future this is adjustment factor okay so this is a formula for dps1 as per lindner's model so what is the formula dps not eps1 into target payout ratio dps not plus eps1 into target payout ratio minus dps not into adjustment factor actually uh, in the uh, i mean if you if if you have if you found any problem in the examination paper they'll give you dps not and they'll give you eps1 and target payout ratio then finally they'll give you adjustment factor so you are supposed to calculate dps1 that's not an issue but sometimes they may give you dps1 and dps not and everything except adjustment factor so you are supposed to calculate adjustment factor sometimes they may ask you to calculate target payout ratio by giving all the remaining terms so you better remember this formula that is more than enough okay and please try to define every term clearly dps not last year dividend per share eps1 next year expected dividend per share at the end of first year af is adjustment factor target payout ratio means the dividend payout ratio which they are following okay this is regarding dps1 as per lindner's model so with this we understood all the theories in dividend policy now i am entering into the next chapter ratio analysis this is what the new chapter ratio analysis see in our context ratio means financial ratio so i have to define several financial ratios by taking financials from financial statements financial statements means trading and profit and loss account and balance sheet so i have to take several financials from balance sheet and trading and profit and loss account then i must define financial ratios the question is why should i define financial ratios because i should analyze such financial ratios so what is objective of analyzing financial ratios see by defining several financial ratios after analyzing such financial ratios will be able to analyze will be able to assess the financial strengths and weaknesses of the company so the ultimate objective of analysis of all the financial ratios by taking the financials from the financial statements is simply to assess the strengths and weaknesses of the firm 
So how to assess the financial strengths and weaknesses of the firm? By defining several financial ratios. Sir, can we assess the financial strengths of the, and the weaknesses of the firm merely by seeing the financial statements? The financial statements may not give you the true picture of the company in terms of performance in several aspects. That's why we are supposed to define financial ratios. See, in every ratio, there will be a numerator and denominator, x by y. Say, for example, I have defined one ratio called x by y. There should be a numerator and denominator. But the point is, whenever you are defining the financial ratio, there should be a meaningful relationship between numerator and denominator. So, accordingly, all the ratios are classified into several types. The ratios are liquidity ratios. Solvency ratios, also known as capital structure ratios. Solvency ratios or capital structure ratios. And we have activity ratios. Nothing but sales related ratios. And finally, profitability ratios. Apart from these ratios, set of ratios, we should also discuss about coverage ratios and also we need to discuss about valuation ratios. Now, valuation ratios are part and parcel of profitability ratios only, nothing else. Okay. Now, let me start with the first area called liquidity ratios. The first area is liquidity ratios. Sir, what is the objective of defining liquidity ratios? To know the liquidity position of the company. The question is, what is liquidity position? Liquidity position means the ability of the firm the ability of the firm to meet its current liabilities, to meet its current liabilities like creditors and outstanding expenses. The ability of the firm to meet its current liabilities out of the available current assets. So we should test the ability of the firm to meet its current liabilities as and when they become due out of the available current assets, not out of current fixed assets because I cannot sell my fixed assets to meet my current liabilities. So in order to meet our current liabilities, how much worth of current assets I am maintaining? So if you are maintaining sufficient worth of current assets, then your liquidity position is strong. If you are not maintaining sufficient worth of current assets, then your liquidity position is weak. So in order to test the financial, I mean, in order to test the liquidity position of the company, we have to define several liquidity ratios. And as part of that, the most important ratio is current ratio. You should remember this ratio very carefully. The formula for current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. That's it. CA by CL, current assets by current liabilities. Say for example, if my current assets are 200 crores and if my current liabilities are 100 crores, then the ratio is 2 is to 1. That means for meeting 1 rupee current liability, I am maintaining 2 rupees worth of current assets. This is a sufficient worth of liquidity that the company is maintaining. Because for meeting 1 rupee liability, current liability, we are maintaining 2 times of current assets. Even if you can realize 50% of current, current assets, you can meet your current, current liabilities. So, the ideal ratio of current ratio is 2 is to 1. Remember that. So, what is the formula for current ratio? Current assets by current liabilities. That's it. Now, I am moving to the next area called quick ratio. Quick ratio also known as liquid ratio. Liquid ratio. So what is the formula for quick ratio or liquid ratio? Again I am testing the ability of the firm to meet its current liabilities. But this time not out of current assets. It's out of quick assets. The quick assets are also known as liquid assets. The quick assets are also known as liquid assets. So the formula is very simple. Quick assets or liquid assets divided by current liabilities. This is what the formula for quick ratio or liquid ratio. I am not changing the current liabilities denominated term. I am just changing the numerated term. Under current ratio, I am taking current assets. Whereas under quick ratio, I am taking quick assets or liquid assets. The question is, sir, what is quick asset? See, quick assets are the assets which can be quickly realized, realizable. What assets are quickly realizable? Other than stock, every current asset is quickly realizable. That means, if you remove stock from current assets, then the balance current assets are quick assets. And also, you are supposed to detect one more non-regular item called prepaid expenses. This is prepaid expenses. So, what is the formula for quick assets? Current assets minus stock minus prepaid expenses. And that gives you quick assets. And also, I can write this quick assets as... Debtors plus 
cash and bank balances this is one more formula for quick access okay so we understood quick ratio also or liquid ratio so the next ratio is defensive interval ratio defensive interval ratio the formula is liquid assets divided by projected daily cash expenses projected daily cash expenses so this is what the formula for defensive interval ratio so liquid assets divided by projected daily cash expenses you know the term liquid assets or which are nothing but quick assets projected daily cash expenses how to get how to get projected daily cash expenses just calculate the annual expenditure annual operating expenses nothing but i can say cogs plus operating expenses for the year divided by number of days in a year nothing but 365 days so then i'll get projected daily cash expenses so from this you can define the ratio say for example my liquid assets are 30 crores and my projected daily cash expenses 365 crores is my total expenditure divided by 365 days so my daily cash expenses are 1 crore per day so this gives me say for example it is 30 crores and 365 crores rupees rupee rupee cancel crore crore cancel 365 365 cancel i'll get 30 days so it's a time period actually okay it's a time period prospected daily cash expenses oh actually the defensive interval ratio we have calculated and i got 30 days so what it exactly means see in one year period i'm going to incur 365 crores expenditure cost of goods sold and other operating expenses whereas i'm maintaining 30 crores worth of liquid assets so with this available liquid assets with this available liquid assets for how many days i can run my business very smoothly even though i'm not having any kind of sales so without resorting to further sales for how many days i can run my business smoothly i can run my operation smoothly see for 30 days i can run my operation smoothly because i am maintaining 30 crores worth of liquid assets in case if i am maintaining 40 crores liquid assets i can run my business for 40 days very smoothly so this is regarding defensive interval ratio defensive interval is a time period which means for how many days you can run your business very smoothly without resorting to further sales that's what defensive interval ratio yes we understood all the liquidity ratios now i'm moving to solvency ratios or capital structure ratios so before going for solvency ratios or capital structure ratios i'll give you a few terms which are very important so from the balance sheet, I have to define such ratios, fixed assets, current assets, and we have equity, I mean equity share capital plus, reserves and surplus, and we, will, we are going to have preference share capital, long term debt, current liabilities, okay, these are the liability side items, and assets are fixed assets and current assets. From these numbers, you are supposed to define several terms. The first one is capital employed. Capital employed or long term fund. If your capital employed is loaded with long term fund only, then the formula will be equity share capital all the long term sources must be considered here equity share capital plus reserves and surplus plus preference share capital plus long term debt this is the formula for capital employed or long term fund okay yes from assets side i can define the formula fixed assets plus current assets add all the assets minus current liabilities then you will get capital employed or long term fund nothing but i'm adding what all the to total current assets from that if i remove these current liabilities 
whatever the value I'll get, that is the sum of all these three sources, equity, preference and debt, long term debt. So my dear students, this is a formula for capital employed or long term fund, equity share capital plus reserves and surplus plus preference share capital plus long term debt or fixed assets plus current assets minus current liabilities. And I can define one more ratio, equity or proprietors fund or shareholders fund. If I say equity or proprietors fund or shareholders fund, equity means the, which includes equity shareholders fund as well as preference shareholders fund. If I say proprietors, proprietors includes equity shareholders and preference shareholders. If I say shareholders, equity shareholders and preference shareholders must be considered here. So the formula is equity share capital plus reserves and surplus plus preference share capital. That's it. This is what equity or proprietors fund or shareholders fund. That's it. From asset side, I can write this formula as fixed assets plus current assets minus current liabilities minus long term debt. If you remove all the current liabilities and long term debt, then I'll get equity or proprietors fund or shareholders fund. And I need to define one more formula, equity shareholders fund, exclusive equity shareholders fund. So you should not include preference share capital here. The formula is equity share capital plus reserves and surplus. That's it. Equity share capital plus reserves and surplus only. And you can write the formula from asset side also fixed assets plus current assets minus current liabilities minus long term debt minus preference share capital that gives me equity shareholders fund. So these are the formulas you must remember while defining all the capital structure ratios. Now let me define one by one. The first ratio is debt equity ratio. So what is the formula for debt equity ratio? We have two formulas here. The first formula is long term debt by equity LTD by equity. So long term debt by equity this is the first formula that means I am taking only long term debt. Say for example if my long term debt is 200 crores and my equity is 100 crores the ratio is 2 is to 1 which is an ideal one actually. For every 1 rupee of bonus fund I am maintaining 2 rupees of loan fund okay this is what the debt equity ratio. So out of total fund 2 third is long term debt 1 third is equity. So this is what the ratio. So whenever we see the ratio between long term debt and equity nothing but debt equity ratio. I can split my capital employed into long term debt and equity in this ratio 2 is to 1. 2 third is long term debt 1 third is equity. Like that based on the ratio I can define the amount of long term debt and equity. Okay. So the ideal ratio which is widely accepted by every company is 2 is to 1. Generally the debt equity ratio should not be more. That means I should not maintain excess debt and I should not maintain 10 is to 1 or 15 is to 1 ratios. So your debt equity ratio should be in an optimum manner. It should, it should not exceed 2 is to 1. That is a maximum acceptable debt equity ratio. Okay. I can also define this debt equity ratio like this. Total debt divided by equity. So what is this total debt? See my dear students total debt in this context means total debt is equal to long term debt plus current liabilities. So I am taking current liabilities also into consideration. Okay. I am taking current liabilities into consideration along with long term debt. So this is another formula for debt equity ratio. You should also remember this formula. So what are the two formulas? Debt equity ratio. The most famous formula is long term debt by equity and uh, the second formula is total debt by equity. Total debt means which includes current liabilities. Okay. Now, the next ratio. You better go for the formulas which are, which are given in your study material. Follow the order. Yes. The next ratio is capital gearing ratio. So what is the formula for capital gearing ratio? The formula is common stockholders equity divided by fixed cost bearing funds. So what is this common stockholders fund? Capital gearing ratio is equal to equity shareholders fund nothing but common stockholders fund divided by long term debt plus preference share capital. You better remember this formula. This is more than enough. So equity shareholders fund divided by long term debt plus preference share capital is a formula for capital gearing ratio. Say for example, if your equity shareholders fund is 200 crores and long term debt is 100 crores, preference share capital is 
100 crores. The ratio is 1 is to 1, which means for every 1 rupee of fixed bearing, fixed cost bearing funds, nothing but long term debt and preference share capital, the company is maintaining 1 rupees of bonus fund, nothing but equity shareholders fund. Okay. This is regarding capital gearing ratio. What is the formula for capital gearing ratio? Equity shareholders fund divided by long term debt plus preference share capital. So what is <coughs> equity shareholders fund? Equity share capital plus reserves and surplus. Okay. And also I must define one more ratio. Out of my total assets, say for example, if I am maintaining 1000 crores worth of total assets, I have equity for financing and also I am maintaining long term debt and current liabilities. Say for example, if equity is 400 crores and long term debt is 400 crores, current liabilities is 200 crores. 1000 crores is my total fund. Say out of 1000 crores, 400 crores is taken from equity proprietors fund equity is nothing but proprietors fund so from this i can define one ratio called proprietary ratio proprietary ratio so what is this proprietary ratio simple proprietors fund divided by total assets my proprietors fund is 400 crores. So what is this proprietor's fund? Proprietor's fund is nothing but equity. This is also known as equity. So I am maintaining 400 crores worth of proprietor's fund divided by 1000 crores. So 40% it is. Which means 40% of total assets are financed out of proprietor's fund or equity fund. Okay. 40% of total assets are financed out of proprietor's fund. What about balance 60% which is financed out of liabilities? Just financed out of liabilities. So what is this liabilities? Outside liabilities. Which we call it as simply as liabilities. Okay. I can say this is total liabilities. I am not including equity here. Okay. So my Rex ratio is total liabilities to total assets. So what is this total liabilities? Total liabilities to total assets means I will get one. No. Here total liabilities means which is excluding equity. Okay. Total liabilities, total liabilities to total assets. The formula is total liabilities divided by within brackets excluding equity divided by I can say total outside liabilities divided by total assets this is one more ratio i can define from so from the above numbers i can say total liabilities are 600 crores so what is this total liabilities total liabilities means total debt nothing but long term debt plus current liabilities here total liabilities means long term debt plus current liabilities all long term loans along with debentures and all and also i must consider current liabilities and that gives me total liabilities 600 crores divided by total assets 1000 crores it is 60 percent which means 60% of total assets are financed out of total liabilities or total debt, okay, which includes long term debt and current liabilities. That's it. So, here is the formula set. We understood total liabilities to total assets ratio, and also we understood capital gearing ratio, property ratio. So, all the solvency ratios were covered here, okay. Now, we can go for Activity ratios. That's our next set of ratios. Activity ratios or turnover ratios. Okay. The next set of ratios are activity ratios or turnover ratios.
see all these ratios are sales based ratios let me define the first ratio is capital turnover ratio formula is net sales net sales means sales minus sales returns divided by capital employed you know that capital employed means debt and equity capital employed means debt plus equity long term debt plus equity okay this is my capital turnover ratio for example i'm my sales of 5000 crores and my capital employed is 1000 crores this is five times it should be expressed in terms of times there is no unit for this which means for every 1 rupee of capital that i'm using in the business i'm generating 5 rupees of sales that's what capital turnover ratio okay now let me define another ratio fixed assets turnover ratio fixed assets turnover ratio the formula for fixed assets turnover ratio is sales divided by nothing but net sales divided by net fixed assets fixed net fixed assets means fixed assets minus depreciation so for example my net fixed assets are 3000 crores and i mean sorry my sales is 5000 crores and my net fixed assets are Two thousand crores, which means two point five times. If I'm not wrong, it means for every one rupee of money that I have invested in Netflix assets, I'm generating two point five rupees of what sales. This particular ratio indicates how efficiently and effectively I'm utilizing the organizational resources called fixed assets. If I can utilize fixed assets properly, I can generate more sales. So. the higher ratio indicates high, better profitability of the company okay because more sales generates more profit and also we have another ratio called total assets turnover ratio the same interpretation is applicable here also total assets turnover ratio means sales divided by total assets sales divided by total assets that's it so here also the same interpretation is applicable for every 1 rupee of money that i have invested in total assets how much sales i'm generating here okay that's what total assets turnover ratio is indicating so capital turnover ratio net sales by capital employed fixed assets turnover ratio net sales by net fixed assets total assets turnover ratio net sales by net total assets that's it okay yes now i can also define one more ratio called working capital turnover ratio what is the formula for working capital turnover ratio the same logic sales divided by working capital okay sales divided by working capital uh, this it this this particular ratio should be maintained at optimum level actually you should not maintain higher working capital turnover ratio or lower working capital turnover ratio the working capital turnover ratio must be at an optimum level just like how we are maintaining working capital level you should not maintain excess working capital or lower working capital you should maintain optimum working capital this particular ratio and working capital management are interrelated okay now i'm going for the next area called current assets and current liabilities based turnover ratios the first one is stock turnover ratio this is also known as inventory turnover ratio stock turnover ratio or inventory turnover ratio the formula is cost of goods sold divided by average stock cost of goods sold divided by average stock average stock of finished goods remember that so if for example if my cost of goods sold is 5000 crores and i am maintaining average stock of 500 crores so 5000 by 500 it will be 10 times so i'm rotating my average stock for 10 times i'm selling it and i'm producing it again i'm selling it i'm producing it like that my stock is rotated for 10 times on an average based on the availability of average stock of 500 crores this is what stock turnover ratio or inventory turnover ratio i can define stock velocity or inventory velocity by using stock turnover ratio stock velocity or inventory velocity is equal to 365 days or 12 months or 52 weeks depends because i can calculate the velocity in terms of days or in terms of months or in terms of weeks based on the situation you must apply the formula divided by stock turnover ratio 
stock turnover ratio this is what the formula for stock velocity and inventory velocity now we understood stock turnover ratio and inventory inventory velocity or stock velocity now i am moving to the next area called data's turnover ratio data's turnover ratio the formula is credit sales credit sales divided by average data's average data's and i can also read it in this formula as credit sales divided by average accounts receivables average account receivables this is the formula for data turnover ratio credit sales by average data nothing but how many times i am rotating my data selling collection selling collection it is happening for certain number of times and that is what data turnover ratio from that i can define one more term called data's velocity the formula for data's velocity is 365 days or 12 months or 52 weeks divided by data's turnover ratio dtr data's turnover ratio see the previous stock velocity and data's velocity are representing how speed you are moving the stock out of the good on while selling within how many days you are selling your stock that's what stock velocity it will be expressed in number of days say for example if i get 30 days stock velocity that means within 30 days i am removing the stock from my godown in the form of sales okay whereas data's velocity means how speed you are collecting your receivables say for example if my data's velocity is 60 days that means i am collecting my entire receivables within 60 days again i'll sell it and again my data's will be generated and again such data's will take for another 60 days this like this these data's will be rotated okay such rotations are nothing but what turnover now i am moving to the next area called creditors turnover ratio the formula for creditors turnover ratio is credit purchases divided by average creditors average creditors means opening creditors plus closing creditors divided by 2 average creditors means opening creditors plus closing creditors divided by 2 average stock means opening stock plus closing stock divided by 2 remember that and also i can rewritten this formula as credit purchases divided by average accounts payables okay this is regarding credit as turnover ratio how many times the credit as are rotated throughout their nothing but paying to, uh, i mean if you can pay off your credit as again you can buy the raw material on credit basis like that it will be rotated okay then the next thing is credit as velocity how speed you are paying your payables the formula is 365 days or 12 months or 52 weeks divided by ctr credit as turnover ratio how speed you are paying your payables that's what credit as velocity okay with this all the turnover ratios were completed you can see all the ratios were covered data's velocity is also known as data's collection period credit's velocity is also known as credit's payment period i need to say you data's velocity is nothing but data's collection period this velocity is also known as what data's collection period and this credit's velocity is also known as credit's payment period credit's payment period okay that's it yes now show your ratios in the study material every ratio is covered turnover ratios nothing else to cover i can go for the next set of ratios called profitability ratios yes 
the next set of ratios are profitability ratios now see this and also we have to understand expenses ratios also okay now let me start with one by one first one sales related profitability ratios profitability means the ability of the firm to earn profits that's what profitability ratios how i can assess the ability of the firm to earn profits by defining several ratios the first one is sales related profitability ratios gross profit to sales ratio the formula gpr gross profit divided by this is nothing but gross profit divided by net sales sales less returns okay gross profit by net sales see this particular ratio's importance is how much gross profit we are how I mean at what rate of at what rate we are generating the gross profit after recovering our cost of goods sold so say for example if your gross profit ratio is 30% that means 70% is representing what cost of goods sold okay a higher gross profit ratio indicates a lower cost of goods sold or huge sales or it is representing better selling price also okay net profit ratio net profit by sales you know that net profit means profit after tax okay generally net profit means profit after tax sometimes it can be taken as pbd also and sometimes i can use another formula called ebat into 1 minus tax rate but in most of the cases i'm using i'm going to use profit after tax or profit before tax so what is the formula for net profit ratio net profit by sales so if my net profit ratio is 10% say for example then the form that indicates what i'm generating 10% of sales as profit net profit finally after recovering cost of goods sold and other operating expenses then the next ratio is operating profit ratio so what is the difference between net profit ratio and operating profit ratio in operating profit ratio i'm not going to take net profit instead of that i'm going to take ebat ebat is representing operating profit operating profit means i'm going to consider operating revenue sales and i'll deduct operating expenses like cogs and admin and selling and distribution expenses or else i can say variable and fixed costs i'm not going to deduct any losses on sale of fixed assets and investments or i'm not going to include any profits on sale of uh, fixed assets and investments other income should not be included that means purely you have to consider sales operating revenue purely you have to deduct operating expenses like cost of goods sold administration expenses selling and distribution expenses no losses related to asset sale and investment sale no profits related to asset sale and investment sale and also no other operate non operating incomes should not be included here should not be included here so my ebat is my pure operating profit this is regarding operating profit ratio generally when the firm is wanted to know about the true performance operating performance of the company it should calculate operating profit ratio but not net profit ratio net profit ratio is an overall performance by considering all the transactions okay now coming to expenses ratios see we have several expenses cost of goods sold to sales ratio cogs by sales now whenever i am writing sales net sales must be considered operating expenses ratio the formula is operating expenses by sales my dear students operating expenses means all the expenses in profit and loss account are not operating expenses only admin and selling and distribution expenses are operating expenses okay so that's why they have, we have taken what administration expenses plus selling expenses divided by net sales this is my operating expenses ratio so what is the formula for operating expenses ratio look at point e operating expenses by net sales and if you can elaborate the term operating expenses i must consider administration expenses and selling expenses they have given two formulas one formula is enough b and c are interrelated nothing but operating expenses are or administration selling expenses in pnl account you should not consider any other expense administration expenses ratio administration expenses by net sales selling expenses ratio selling expenses by net sales that's it now return on investment now i am moving to the profitability ratios return on investment we have several formulas related to return on assets and return on net assets return on capital employed return on invested capital return on equity these are the ratios we have to understand now one by one let me start return on assets so what is the formula for return on assets return on assets means ebat into 1 minus tax rate divided by total assets this is ebat into 1 minus tax rate that means the profit after deducting tax operating profit after deducting tax divided by total assets this is post tax return on assets if you want to calculate pre tax return on assets don't deduct tax remove it that means you have to consider ebat only ebat by total assets so return on assets means after tax return on assets and before tax return on assets post tax return on assets pre tax return on assets post tax return on assets means ebat into 1 minus tax rate divided by total assets 
pre tax written on assessments ebit divided by total assess don't deduct tax okay so this particular ratio indicates the rate i mean the profit percentage on your total assets before tax as well as after tax now return on net assets return on net net assets is nothing but instead of taking total assets i can also take net assets so the same terms pre tax post tax ebit into 1 minus tax it ebit only so what is the uh, difference we have a difference here here net assets means total assets minus current liabilities previously total assets means fixed assets plus current assets all the total assets you should not deduct current liabilities if you deduct current liabilities then such assets are known as net assets then the formula will be changed return on net assets means ebit into 1 minus tax rate by total net assets ebit by total net assets instead of taking total assets you better write total net assets so that you can differentiate the previous formula and this formula okay yes this is regarding return on assets now i can move to the next stage you call return on capital employed so what is this return on capital employed on your capital employed how much return you can earn how much profit you can earn my dear students return means profit remember that okay return means profit which profit you are taking is a matter here capital employed i said capital employed means a debt plus equity here debt includes long term debt plus current liabilities that's what they said actually so look at the point here capital employed is the sum of to debt which includes long term debt and short term debt nothing but current liabilities and equity so if you take long term debt and short term debt nothing but current liabilities along with equity this particular term is capital employed see this is capital employed whereas i have given you one formula in that formula i have not included what current liabilities but they are taking here this debt plus equity capital employed including what current liabilities nothing but short term debt so post tax written on capital employed for calculating post tax written on capital employed i must consider eb18 to 1 minus tax rate divided by capital employed means which includes current liabilities also nothing but what total debt plus equity if you can calculate post tax written on capital employed the formula is very simple sorry pre tax written on capital employed the formula is very simple eb80 by debt plus equity that that's it okay so my dear students after tax or post tax written on capital employed means eb8 into 1 minus tax rate by debt plus equity debt includes long term debt and current liabilities if you want to calculate after tax written on capital employed sorry before tax written on capital employed don't deduct tax from eb8 so the term will be eb8 divided by capital employed means debt plus equity debt includes long term debt and current liabilities that's it now written on in invested capital this is a new formula but no where we are going to use this formula but still there is a chance to there is a chance for the new question in the examination return on invested capital they are taking invested capital in a different way invested capital means capital employed whatever the number we have calculated earlier equity plus debt debt means long term debt plus current liabilities capital employed is a number which is calculated by using what debt plus equity from that you have to deduct cash and cash equivalents and goodwill so please deduct cash and cash equivalents and goodwill from it then we will get what invested capital so what is this invested capital invested capital means the money which is truly invested in assets like land and buildings plant and machinery furniture and fixtures stock data stock data whatever the money which you are maintaining in the form of cash and in the form of goodwill and those two numbers are not invested capital invested capital means what the tangible fixed assets and then the tangible current assets apart from cash cash and bank balances okay so this is regarding investor capital so you must deduct long term debt plus equity from that you have to deduct what goodwill and cash and cash equivalents so on such investor capital if you calculate return on capital employed so return on investor capital the formula is very simple post tax return eb8 into 1 minus tax rate by debt plus equity pre tax return before tax return eb8 by debt plus equity but while taking this debt plus equity i must deduct what cash and cash equivalents and goodwill okay this is a separate formula actually now the next one is return on equity own as equity so return on equity means what their profit their profit profit after tax whose profit shareholders profit divided by their investment equity so their investment the profit divided by their investment that gives you what return on equity say for example if equity is 100 crores and their return is i mean nothing but profit after tax is 25 crores the percentage will be 25% okay I want to tell you one important point. This return on equity can be calculated in two ways. One from total shareholders' perspective, other from equity shareholders' point of view only. Say, for example, return on equity from equity shareholders' point of view only. 
If you take this number, then I must write this formula. Profit after tax minus preference dividend divided by equity shareholders fund. This formula is calculated exclusively from equity shareholders point of view. This is ROE. I can also calculate return on equity from total shareholders point of view. That means shareholders means both equity and preference shareholders. In that case, I don't deduct preference dividend from profit of tax. Then I'll take profit after tax divided by equity. Here equity includes what? Equity share capital plus reserves and surplus plus preference share capital. Okay. Already I've given you this formula. This is the formula actually. Okay. That's it. This is regarding return on equity from shareholders point of view. Yes. All the turnover ratios, return based, I mean the profitability ratios were completed, but we have valuation and payout ratios. That's what we need to understand. I'll show you. Yes. The first one is price earning ratio. It is a ratio of market price per equity shares to earnings per share. Say for example, if my market price per share is 100 and earnings per share is 10, there, this is 10 times. There is no unit for PE ratio. It is a multiplier. That means for your earnings per share, the price is 10 times. The market price per equity share is 10 times of earnings per share. That's what PE ratio. So market uh, so the term itself is saying the formula Pri price earning ratio price to earning ratio price means market price per share earnings means earnings per share so price earning ratio is market price per share divided by earnings per share then the next ratio is market value to book value book value per share ratio nothing but market value per share divided by book value per share the question is what is market value per share what are the value per share which is traded in indian stock markets that is what market value per share what about book value per share book value per share means equity share capital plus reserves and surplus divided by number of equity shares that gives you what number of equity shares that gives you book value per share so what is the formula for book value per share equity share capital plus reserves and surplus divided by number of equity shares that gives you book value per share so say for example the share price the market value per share is 100 rupees whereas the book value per share is 25 rupees it is 25 rupees so as per books the share price is representing 25 Equity share capital plus resistance surplus divided by number of equity shares. Whereas the share price which is traded in Indian stock markets is 100 rupees. So it is 4 times. 4 times means for 25 rupees book value per share, the trading price is 100 rupees. That means your market is responding 4 times of your book value of equity. Okay, that's what market value to book value ratio. So market value to book value share ratio means market value per share, market price per share divided by book value per share, which share equity share. The next one is Tobin's ratio, Q ratio. Tobin's Q ratio means market value of all assets divided by replacement cost of the assets. That's what the formula. Take the market value of all of your assets, nothing but your business value, value of the business, divided by estimated replacement cost of the assets. If you can replace all of such assets immediately, what, uh, how much cost you need to incur? That's what replacement cost of the assets. Say for example, my market value of the assets is 5000 crores divided by estimated replacement cost of the assets is also 5000 crores. The ratio is 1. 1 is an ideal ratio. If it is more than 1, the value of the assets are overvalued. If it is less than 1, the market value of the assets are undervalued. Generally, your Q ratio should be equal to 1. If Q ratio is more than 1, which means what? The market value of the assets are more than replacement cost of the assets. That represents overvaluation of the assets. If market value of the assets are less than replacement cost of the assets, then the ratio will be less than 1. That indicates what? Your market value of the assets are less than replacement cost of the assets. That indicates undervaluation of the assets. Okay. This is regarding Tobin q ratio and the next one is dividend payout ratio so out of your earnings how much percentage of profit you are distributing in the form of dividend say for example my earnings per share is 10 rupees whereas the dividend that i am distributing is 4 rupees that means 40 percent of dividend i am distributing here that's what the payout ratio or dividend payout ratio the formula is dividend per share divided by earnings per share in simple terms the formula is dps by eps this particular ratio indicates the percentage of earnings that are dis that you are distributing in the form of dividend. So here 40% of dividend is distributed in the form of dividend. If you are distributing 40% of earnings in the form of dividend, then balance 60% is representing retention ratio. Retention ratio. So what is the formula for retention ratio? 
वन मैनस डीपी रेशो नथिंग बट डिड पे अवट रेशो वन मैनस डिड पे अवट रेशो जीरो पॉइंट फोर जीरो और दिस कैन बी रिटर्न एस जीरो पॉइंट सिक्स जीरो और सिक्सटी पर्सेंट दट सेट ओके Yes, we understood. Now the next one is dividend yield ratio. Dividend yield means the percentage of dividend that I am earning on my investment of shares in the company. So I cannot buy the share at book value per share. Generally, every investor can buy the share at a market value per share. So write the market value per share or market price per share in the denominator and write the dividend per share in the numerator. DPS by MPS is a dividend yield ratio. It's a percentage. Say for example, I purchase one of the company share at hundred rupees and I got a dividend of. 10 rupees at the end of the first year so i got 10% yield on my investment that's what dividend yield so what is the formula of a dividend yield ratio dividend yield ratio is equal to dividend per share divided by market price per share that's it so with this we understood valuation and payout ratios also we have two other ratios which we need to cover one is debt service coverage ratio another one is fixed charges coverage ratio let me tell you fixed charges coverage ratio is nothing but ebit by interest here is a formula Uh, income before interest and tax means EBIT. EBIT divided by interest is a formula for fixed charges coverage ratio. EBIT divided by interest. Okay. EBIT divided by interest. Say for example, our profit is. Thousand crores, whereas interest that I am paying is two hundred crores. So five times as fixed charges coverage. So for paying interest, the company is earning five times of interest as a profit. Okay. Now the next one is debt service coverage ratio. This is very important actually. Debt service coverage ratio. So what is the formula for debt service coverage ratio? I'll write it here. DSCR debt service coverage ratio is equal to earnings available for debt service earnings available for debt service divided by interest plus installment this is a formula installment of the loan okay so what is the formula for earnings available for debt service you must remember this formula earnings available for debt service is equal to i'll give you simple logic actually i'll get profit after tax net profit as my profit but while calculating this net profit after tax i have deducted non cash expenses and also i have deducted some non operating losses and also i have deducted interest also income tax also deducted add those items which are not involving any cash outflow in that case i'll add interest so interest involves cash outflow why you have added that number i'm trying to cover interest and installment and further i'm searching for earnings available for servicing my debt earnings available for debt service means what servicing of debt is nothing but payment of interest and payment of installment for paying interest and installment how much earnings are available in the company so for that i'm calculating the available earnings to pay interest and installment while calculating the earnings available for interest and installment payment you should not deduct interest but while calculating profit of tax already since i have already deducted interest component for calculating profit of tax so whatever the deducted interest should be added to profit of tax in order to calculate what earnings available for debt service so since i am covering interest here i should not consider before tax uh, i mean uh, after deducting interest profit i must consider profit or i must consider profit before deducting interest okay so since we have deducted interest already i should add back that portion of profit that portion of interest okay profit after tax plus interest plus and also i must add back non cash expenses nothing but depreciation and amortization of amortizations non cash expenses so why you are adding non cash expenses because depreciation why you are adding non cash expenses because depreciation and amortizations never involves any cash outflow such portion of fund will be available for paying what interest and installment okay and also i must add back one more item called non operating losses so non operating losses means loss on sale of fixed assets and loss on sale of investments 
So loss on sale of insurances and loss on sale of investments and those transactions never involves any cash outflow out of the company. So such portion of fund will be available in the company itself. So this is a formula for earnings available for debt service. What is the formula? Profit after tax plus interest plus non-cash expenses plus non-operating losses. Okay. Yes. Say for example, my earnings available for debt service is 5,000 crores. Divide by I need to pay an interest amount of 100 crores and installment amount of 2000 crores then the ratio will be 5000 by 2100 it will be 2.38 generally debt service if debt service coverage ratio is two times which is a better ratio more than two times means you are maintaining better earnings to cover your interest and installment to serve the interest and inst installment payments okay nothing but i can service rate comfortably by paying interest and installment because my earnings available for debt service are sufficient enough. Okay. So this is a formula for debt service coverage ratio. Earnings available for debt service divided by interest plus installment. Earnings available for debt services, profit after tax plus interest plus non-cash expenses like depreciation and amortizations. Amortizations means write-off of goodwill and patents and write-off of fictitious assets like preliminary expenses. And uh, discount on issue of debentures written off like that okay and non-operating losses means loss on sale of fixed assets and loss on sale of investments that's it okay with this we understood debt service coverage ratio yes every ratio is covered here all the ratios are covered you can see here but in some of the textbooks Relating to this capital gaining ratio, you can see the reverse ratio. That means fixed cost bearing funds divided by common shareholders equity. But in the CMA study material, they have given capital gaining ratio in a different way. Okay. There are no standards for defining these ratios actually. You can define your own ratio based on your interpretations. That's why this is a limitation of ratio analysis. Some companies may define their own ratios in their own way. I may define my own ratios in my own way. I cannot compare my ratio with other companies' ratios. Generally, our company's ratios will be compared with industry's average to know the company's performance. But while comparing these ratios, the other ratios may not be compatible with our ratios. Because I have defined in my own way, the other companies may define their ratios in a different way. So in that case, comparison is a different, difficult task here. Okay. So generally, this ratio analysis is useful for trend analysis also. That means for comparing my ratios with the previous year's performance of my company. And also I can compare my ratios with other companies for trend analysis and for comparison purpose with the industry. This ratio analysis is very much useful, but there is a limitation for non-standardized form. That means there are no specific standards for defining these ratios. Okay. That's regarding all the ratios. You better revise all the ratios before going for the problems because remembering these formulas are very important for solving the problems. But in the problems, you may face one situation. That means you may find a few for formulas which were not given in the study material. But still you are supposed to solve that sum. That means they, they'll give you few ratios in the problem based on their requirement. That, that means for solving the sum, conveniently they'll change the formulas. Accordingly, you must write the ratios. You should not question the ratios which are given in the problem. You have to follow those formulas accordingly without comparing such formulas with your known formulas which, are, which were given in your study material. So... The problem is because there is no standard for defining the ratios. So that means you may find a new ratios in the examination problems also. That means you don't need to define the ratio. They'll give you the ratio. You should not question it. Just solve it. Okay. This is regarding ratio analysis, financial ratio analysis. Actually, the chapter name itself is financial ratio analysis. Okay. Oh, so, okay, fine, my dear students. In the next session, I'm going to solve few problems related to all these ratios. Okay, you better try to read the content and the study material, the theory content also for better understanding. Why? Because the interpretations worry are very important in this chapter. We have another chapter uh, related to this ratio analysis. In that chapter, we are going to understand the trend of the company for several years. And also, we'll compare our company's performance other company with other companies. So, and also we have other formulas in this chapter and I'll cover those formula set in the end of the chapter, nothing but uh, after solving few problems. Okay. Right. Okay, dear students. Bye. Thank you. Hi, dear students. Good evening, all of you. Yes. In today's session, let us handle 
few problems related to ratio analysis illustration number eight look at the problem the capital of a limited is as follows 10 percent preferences of 10 rupees is 3 lakhs equity shares of 10 rupees is 8 lakhs so number of equity shares are 80,000. additional information profit after tax at profit after tax at 35 percent 2 lakhs 70 thousand depreciation is 60 thousand equity dividend paid is 20 percent on equity share capital so your equity dividend paid is 20 percent on equity share capital equity share capital is 8 lakhs 8 lakhs into 20 percent that is 1 lakh 60 thousand equity dividend market price per equity share is 50 rupees you are required to compute the following showing the necessary workings dividend yield on the equity shares cover for the preference and equity dividend earnings per share and price earning ratio these are the requirements now look at the first requirement the requirement is dividend yield the formula for dividend yield on the equity share is dps by mps already the market price per share is available here i just need to calculate dividend per share so dividend per share is equal to dividend paid actually how much dividend we paid one lakh sixty thousand divided by number of equity shares it is simply eighty thousand shares so one lakh sixty thousand by eighty thousand shares it is 2 rupees dividend per share. So 2 divided by DPS by MPS is 50. 2 by 50. That comes to 4% dividend deal. And next one is cover for the preference and equity dividend. Cover for the preference and equity dividend means preference dividend coverage ratio and equity dividend coverage ratio. Preference dividend coverage ratio formula is profit opted acts by preference dividend. And equity dividend coverage ratio formula is earnings available to equity shareholders divided by equity dividend. So coming to preference dividend coverage ratio, profit after tax divided by preference dividend. You know, the preference share capital is 3 lakhs. On that, preference dividend rate is 10%. 30,000 is preference dividend. Profit after tax is simply, it is 2 lakhs 70,000. So 2 lakhs 70,000 divided by 30,000 preference dividend. It is simply 9 times preference dividend coverage ratio. Coming to equity dividend coverage ratio. The formula is very simple profit after tax minus preference dividend nothing but earnings available to equity shareholders divided by dividend for equity shareholders at current rate of 2 rupees per share actually look at the dividend per share yes already we have calculated dividend per share as 2 rupees and 2 rupees into how many number of shares 80,000 number of shares 80,000 into 2 it is 1,60,000 and we have calculated equity, equity dividend also you can take 1,60,000 directly by applying dividend rate of 20% on equity share capital. So this is my equity dividend. So to out of 2,70,000, already we paid 30,000 preference dividend. So the balance is 2,40,000. That, that is the earnings which belongs to equity shareholders divided by divided by equity dividend as simply 1,60,000. And that comes to 1.5 times. Okay. So 240,000 divided by 160,000 is 1.5 times. Exactly 1.5 times it is actually 2,60,000. 40,000 divided by 1,60,000 and that comes to 1.5 times. Yes, with this dividend coverage ratios are completed. And coming to the next ratio, earnings per share. It is very simple. Earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares. Yes, 2,40,000 is my earnings of equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares 80,000. So, 240,000 divided by 80,000 that comes to 3 rupees per share. This is the EPS. And P ratio, price earning ratio, market price per share divided by earnings per share that is a formula mps by eps my mps is 50 eps is 3 rupees so 50 by 3 that is 16.67 times calculate it 16.67 times but this problem number 8 is completed nothing new here now go for the illustration number 9 I'm solving this problem just for the sake of understanding only we are handling these two problems so you have to solve as many problems as possible okay the following are the ratios relating to the activities of X Limited. Data's velocity is 3 months, stock velocity is 8 months, Kratos velocity is 2 months, gross profit ratio is 25%. Gross profit for the year ended 31st December 2021 amounts to 4 lakhs. Closing stock of the year is 10,000 above the opening stock. Bills receivables amounts to 25,000. Bills payable is 10,000. Find out sales, closing stock and sundry Kratos. These are the requirements. First of all, let me tell you one important point. Data's velocity, first of all, what is this data's velocity? Three months actually. The formula for data's velocity is yes. Data's velocity. 
actually we know the gross profit amount of 4 lakhs and we know the gross profit ratio from that you can calculate sales first of all you know gp by sales is equal to gp by sales is equal to 25% and out of that i know the number gp then sales is equal to what gp by 25% you know the gp gross profit is 4 lakhs divided by 25% and i'll get 4 lakhs divided by 25% that is 16 lakhs so i got sales value first of all comfortably we got six or we got a uh, sales value here and determination of sundry credit sundry data set the next thing is i have to calculate closing stock and sundry creditors actually before going for that, let me calculate sundry datas. So for calculating sundry datas, first I need to calculate, I need to use this datas velocity 3 months. You know, datas velocity 3 months means, it is nothing but, the formula for datas velocity is 12 months divided by DTR, datas turnover ratio. So DTR is equal to data turnover ratio is equal to 12 months divided by 3 months and I got 4 times. So my data turnover ratio is 4 times. Now look at this data turnover ratio is 4 times. You know the formula for data turnover ratio credit sales by average data or average accounts receivables. Since we don't have any opening and closing balances here I can use closing data and closing bills receivables. So we have already we, we have uh, already we got the credit sales actually that is 16 lakhs the entire sales i'm assuming as credit sales so credit sales divided by i have to write account receivables account receivables means data plus bills receivables already we know the number bills receivables 25000 so the balance must be closing data so that's why they've written the formula like this data turnover ratio is equal to credit sales divided by closing data plus bills receivables both of these terms are simply known as accounts receivables so the common term is accounts receivables which includes data and bills receivables and out of that i know the number bills receivables so credit sales divided by you know that data turnover ratio is four times 16 lakhs divided by four times that comes to four lakhs out from the four lakhs i have to deduct bills receivables so if you deduct bills receivable of twenty five thousand, the balance is three lakhs twenty five thousand, and that is my closing data yes that's it the similar way you can calculate creditors also sundry creditors so for calculating sundry creditors i must use creditors velocity so what is the formula of a creditors velocity creditors velocity is equal to creditors velocity is equal to creditors velocity is equal to 12 months divided by ctr creditors turnover ratio and we got actually we have creditors velocity of Two months here so from that you can calculate creditors turnover ratio is equal to 12 months by two months and that comes to six times that's it you know the formula for creditors turnover ratio so what is the formula for creditors turnover ratio simple credit purchases divided by average creditors or average accounts receivables average accounts payables so the original formula is credit purchases divided by accounts payables or average accounts payables accounts payables is a broad term which covers credit and bills payable yes i need to calculate credit purchases first of all how i can calculate credit purchases look at the numbers here we have sales and gross profit here if you adjust gross profit from sales then the balance will be cost of goods sold from the cost of goods sold if you can adjust closing stock and opening stock you can get you can get purchases why because the formula for cogs is Opening stock plus purchases minus closing stock. So from this purchases is equal to COGS plus closing stock. COGS plus closing stock minus opening stock. So we know the number cost of goods sold actually here. Sales minus GP. Sales is 16 lakhs. Out of that, 25% is cost of goods. Oh, sorry, GP. So 75% is cost of goods. So 12 lakhs. 12 lakhs plus closing stock minus opening stock. Closing stock minus opening stock difference is 
closing stock of the year is 10,000 above the opening stock. That means closing stock minus opening stock is 10,000. So 12 lakhs plus 10,000. I got 12 lakh 10,000. That's what my credit purchases. Okay. So your credit purchases is simply 12 lakh 10,000 actually. EOGS plus closing stock minus opening stock. See here they have taken 12 lakhs. The 12 lakhs is COGS actually. Any information regarding rate as turnover ratio? See, this is the wrong number actually. You are supposed to take 12 lakh 10,000, but they have taken 12 lakhs. See, the, see here they have calculated purchases credit purchases of 12 lakh 10,000 but they have substituted 12 lakhs in the formula so this is a wrong computation so the formula is 12 lakh 10,000 divided by credit as plus bills payable that is 10,000 yeah already we have bills payable here the problem the bills payable is 10,000 so that is equal to 6 times Yes, credit as turnover ratio 6 times already we have calculated that. So from this credit as plus 10,000 is equal to 12 lakh 10,000 divided by 6. That is 2 lakh 1,667. So deduct 10,000 from it. I will get 191,667. 1, 1, yeah. Their answer is right. The substituted substituted number is wrong actually. 191 This is 12 lakh 10,000. I think that's a printing mistake. 12 lakh 10,000. Okay. That's it. So in a similar way, what we have calculated datas and now we have calculated credas. And what about the next thing? I need to calculate closing stock. How to calculate closing stock? Simple. You know the stock turnover ratio here. We have given they have given stock velocity. So the, what is the formula for stock velocity? It is eight months actually. Stock velocity is equal to 12 months divided by stock turnover ratio. And that is eight months. Okay. Stock 12 months divided by stock turnover ratio is stock, uh, stock velocity. So from this stock turnover ratio is equal to 12 months divided by eight months. And that comes to 12 by 8. That is 1.5. So your stock turnover ratio is 1.5 times. Since your stock turnover ratio is 1.5 times, from that you can calculate cost uh, average stock. Stock turnover ratio is equal to cost of goods sold by average stock. You know the formula. Sales minus GP is cost of goods sold. I got 12 lakhs divided by average stock. I don't know the amount of average stock, but I know the stock turnover ratio 1.5 times. So st stock turnover ratio 12 lakhs divided by 1.5 times, and I, I got 8 lakh rupees average stock. So what is this average stock? Opening stock plus closing stock divided by 2. So opening stock plus closing stock divided by 2 is equal to 8 lakhs. Opening stock plus closing stock is equal to 16 lakhs. This is one of the equation. Already we know that closing stock minus opening stock is 10,000. That is one of the equation. So by solving these two equations, I can get closing and opening stock. So 1 plus 3, otherwise subtracting 1 from 3. Subtract by subtracting 1 from 3, closing stock gets cancelled. I'll get what? 2 opening stock. That is equal to 16 lakh minus 10,000. I got 15 lakh 90,000. Opening stock is 7 lakh 95,000. If you can substitute that number in the above equation, you'll get closing stock also, 8 lakh 5,000. That's it. So successfully, we got closing stock also. Like this, you have to solve as many problems as possible in ratio analysis. See, you should try to identify the breaking ratio. Generally, it starts with a number. So if you, uh, whenever you want to solve any problem related to ratio analysis, you should start with the ratios along with one number. Without having a number, by solving two equations or by, by solving two ratios, you cannot get any answer. So, always try to identify the numbers in the problem, then relate such number with one of the ratio, then try to uh, define an equation or try to solve that, uh, solve that ratio so that you can get other numbers also, like current assets, current liabilities. If you know the current ratio, link that number with what networking capital, current assets minus current liabilities. If you know the gross profit ratio, link that number with what gross profit amount. Okay, otherwise cost of goods are amount. Like that. 
the amount that those are given in the problem should be compared with one of the related ratios so that you can break or as many ratios as possible and you can you can prepare financial statements also okay yes now i am moving to the next area called funds flow statement actually we have uh, two other areas in this particular chapter i'll i'll explain that portion at the end of the uh, chapter uh, at the end of the chapter funds flow statement or cash flow statement so with this we understood one, uh, one of the part in tools for financial analysis that is ratio analysis only we need to analyze two other areas i'll explain those parts later okay now the next chapter funds flow statement yes what is this funds flow statement first of all fund means working capital flow means changes so this is simply a statement which shows the changes in working capital change means either increase or decrease either increase or decrease so this is a statement which shows the changes in nothing but what increase or decrease in working capital in one accounting year in one accounting year so we have to identify this change in one accounting year or one financial year so fund store statement means the statement which shows the changes in the flow of fund or changes in the flow of what working capital so change means either increase or decrease in the working capital from one accounting date to another accounting date from one balance sheet date to another balance sheet date so we should identify those transactions which are the reason for changes in working capital and present such transactions in this particular statement called fund store statement so there ends the matter so in this particular fund store statement we have to understand several formats we have to understand several formats like funds from operations funds flow statement funds flow statement and finally statement showing changes in working capital statement showing changes in working capital these are the three important areas which we need to understand this particular funds from operations can also be prepared with the help of an account called profit and loss adjustment account so with this account also we can prepare funds from operations first let us understand the statements then i'll go for the account also okay yes let me write the statement before going for this first you please try to identify the items in your balance sheet under liability side we have equity share capital reserves and surplus preference share capital debentures and ltl long term loans okay and in assets side we have fixed assets and current assets in between we have another asset called investments and in liability side we have current liabilities also that's it now look at the numbers i'm going to prepare one statement called funds flow statement first of all that's my first statement funds flow statement then i'll explain funds from operation funds flow statement in a funds flow statement you can see two items called sources and applications sources means those transactions which will increase working capital applications means those transactions which will decrease working capital so first i'll write sources then i can write applications so let me identify the sources first of all then after that i'll write applications also so what are the sources any transactions that increases working capital is a source i said what any transaction that increases working capital is a source so here look at the items on the balance sheet don't touch this current assets and current liabilities part just focus on these items and try to identify the transactions which will increase working capital nothing but the source now equity share capital so equity share capital becomes a source if you can issue equity share capital fresh equity share capital because that increases cash 
preference share capital issue can increase your cash balance that increases your current asset that is also one of the source so issue of equity share capital issue of preference share capital issue of debentures long term loans further loans can increase your cash balance that increases your working capital and also sale of fixed assets and sale of investments sale of fixed assets and sale of investments that will also increase your cash balance current asset that increases your working capital first of all source means any transaction that increases my current asset is a source or any transaction that increases my working capital is a source so you should identify those transactions which will increase your working capital that becomes your source i said working capital but not cash so cash is also a, one of the component of working capital but apart from cash sometimes there is a chance of increasing your debtors or increasing your stock balance or like that or uh, there is a possibility for reduction current liabilities these transactions will increase your working capital in any way so cash need not always be one of the your source so apart from cash the other components like debtors and stock and reduction current liabilities reduce increases your working capital so such transactions becomes your one of your source so i said sources source means any transaction that increases working capital okay that increases working capital don't take only cash here okay because i'm not preparing cash flow statement i'm preparing what funds flow statement in funds flow statement i'm very much concerned about what the fund fund means working capital the source means increasing working capital okay now let me write all those transactions here issue of equity share capital this is my amount column issue of preference share capital issue of debentures long term loans long term loans long term loans sale of fixed assets sale of investments these are all your sources apart from this we can write other sources called two other sources one is funds from operations and i have to calculate this funds from operations with the help of a format and i should write one more transaction called non operating receipts that means any receipt which is generated out of your operations not from operations apart from operations you may get other receipts also those receipts are known as non operating receipts examples are interest and dividend received on investments example these are just examples or other miscellaneous receipts also apart from operating business activities okay interest and dividend received from investments this is one of the example for non operating receipts so these are the sources my dear students issue of equity share capital issue of preference share capital issue of debentures long term loans sale of fixed assets sale of investments funds from operations non operating receipts then after that you please write applications by giving some space for the sources because you need to write the balancing figure based on the situation based on the situation you can write the balancing figure sometimes you may get balance sometimes you may not get balance i'll tell you why why it is like that then i'm writing applications here b applications sir what is application application means any transactions any transactions which reduces my working capital which, de which decreases my working capital so i have to write all the transaction all the transactions under application side if such transactions results in decreasing of decreasing of working capital or reducing of working capital okay so what are the applications now again look at the balance sheet items from liabilities to asset side now go for the equity share capital if you buy back equity it reduces cash reduces working capital if you redeem preference share capital it reduces cash reduces working capital redemption of debentures reduces working capital repayment of long term loans reduces working capital purchase of fixed assets reduces cash and reduces working capital purchase of investments reduces cash and reduces working capital so i am writing applications now one by one from liability side so the first transaction is buy back of equity buy back of equity buy back of equity share capital 
redemption of preference share capital redemption of debentures repayment of term loans repayment of term loans purchase of fixed assets purchase of fixed assets purchase of investments purchase of investments that's it purchase of investments and you should write to other transactions like two important transactions one is payment of tax payment of tax income tax payment okay this is income tax payment and payment of dividend payment of dividend okay and also you can write one more transaction called non operating payments any non operating payment you can write it here that's it so these two are out of the box transactions payment of tax and payment of dividend and then one more item is non operating payments okay so now look at the applications buyback of equity share capital redemption of preference share capital redemption of debentures repayment of term loans purchase of fixed assets purchase of investments purchase payment of income tax payment of dividend dividend payment of dividend means it can be final dividend or interim dividend non operating payments okay yes now these sources will increase the working capital and these applications will reduce the working capital generally these transactions should be written for one accounting period that means from one balance sheet date to another balance sheet date so write all the transactions under sources side i mean if such transactions occurred in one accounting period and get the total say for example i got a total of 150000 rupees under sources side whereas under application side i got a total of 130000 what is happening here during one accounting year we have received 150000 amount of sources and we applied 130000 rupees towards all these uh, transactions towards, towards all these items so what uh, what uh, what what is the result end, end result or net result since the sources are more than applications we got more source so that increases of working capital so when sources are more than applications it results in increase in working capital Balancing figure comes under application side. Increasing increase in working capital. The balance is 20,000 here. Okay. I can write into marks. Okay. This is my balancing figure. Vice versa. Sometimes the applications can be more and sources may be less. Say for example, my sources are. Yeah, the same number I'm taking here. 150,000. Same number I'm taking here. 150,000. But my applications are much more than sources. My applications are 170,000. Now look at the numbers. The applications are more than source. 170,000 is more than up my sources. So that results in decrease in working capital. So from opening working capital, my working capital gets reduced. So what will happen? When your applications are more than sources, it results in decrease in working capital. Balancing figure comes under source side. decrease in working capital it's a balancing figure it's a balancing figure that's it okay so this is regarding funds source statement my dear students now i can go for funds from operations where to start it is actually you should know the transactions in profit and loss account so that you can prepare funds from operations very comfortably 
I'm not touching trading account. I've started with profit and loss account. It starts with gross profit. It starts with gross profit. Write the transactions to admin expenses. To selling and distribution expenses. These two are operating expenses actually. Then write the non-cash expenses. Write the non-cash expenses. Sir, what are the examples of non-cash expenses? Depreciation and amortizations. Amortizations means amortizations means amortization of intangible assets and fictitious assets like PL account debit balance and good uh, preliminary expenses debit balance like that. Okay. So the examples of non-cash expenses are depreciation is the first example. Then amortizations, all your amortizations like write-off of goodwill and write-off of patents and write-off of copyrights, intangible assets and write-off of fictitious assets. Nothing but write-off of what? Preliminary expenditure, debit balance, discount on issue of debentures, debit balance, all these are what debit, debit expenses, debit balances which comes under miscellaneous expenses not written off head. And such balances are known as fictitious assets, comes under asset side of the balance sheet. Along with that, I can write non-operating expenses and losses in your PL account. So, what are the examples of non-operating expenses and losses? Non-operating expenses, best example is premium on redemption of debentures and premium on redemption of reference share capital. The best example of non-operating expenses is premium on redemption of debentures and preference share, preference share capital. Okay. What are the best examples of non-operating losses? The best examples of non-operating losses are loss on sale of fixed assets and loss on sale of investments. That is the another example. There is another example for non-operating losses. So loss on sale of fixed assets is first example. Loss on sale of investments is second example. So non-operating losses. So if you are selling asset or investment, since that is not your operating activity, the main operating activity is purchasing the raw material and manufacturing the products and then I'll sell it. So say selling the finished product and generating the profit or loss as an operating profit or operating loss. Whereas by selling fixed assets investments, that's not my operating activity. That is my non-operating activity because I'm not here to sell my fixed assets and investments. So any profit or loss which is generated during the course of what selling fixed assets and investments, such profit or loss must be considered as non-operating profits or non-operating losses. So losses, non-operating losses, best example, loss on sale of fixed assets, loss on sale of investments. Yes. Then I can write <clears throat> interest, finally income tax, finally we'll get net profit, profit after tax. This is my profit after tax. Under credit side of the profit and loss account, I have to write one important transaction called non-operating incomes and gains. Non-operating incomes and gains. Sir, what are the best examples of non-operating incomes? Non-operating incomes means incomes generated from our investments which are not meant for business activities. Actually, if you have any surplus fund, you may you might have invested that fund in one of the company shares or debentures or one of the uh, money market instrument. You may buy some of the investments if you have surplus fund. So from such surplus fund, if you are generating any income and earning income is not your objective on the investments because since you have surplus fund, you have you might have invested that fund in one of the investments. So whatever the income which you are earning from such investments is your non-operating income. Why? Because the objective of the company is not to earn such income. The objective of the company is to earn profit by selling products. So whatever the income that you are generating from investments is simply known as what non-operating incomes. Examples of non-operating incomes are interest received, dividend received on our investments. As the best examples of what non-operating incomes. And coming to non-operating gains, just now I have explained any gain or profit which is generated by selling fixed assets and investments is your non-operating profit. Already I have explained the logic. Okay. Now with this, we have completed p and account. Now I am moving to profit and loss appropriation. account. See after p and account, every company will prepare profit and loss appropriation account. Why? Because I have to appropriate profits and I should transfer some of the profits to others. And I should distribute some of the profits to preference and equity shareholders in the form of dividend. Then finally, I should maintain some balance. 
and that's what profit and loss appropriation account right yes profit and loss appropriation account i'm writing here by net profit brought down by net profit brought down here two i have to write the transactions one by one what are the transactions by net profit brought down two first i should appropriate preference dividend that's my first transaction second appropriation is proposed dividend this is my second appropriation proposed dividend means what are the dividend that you are appropriating for equity shareholders that's your proposed dividend that's the dividend of equity shareholders this is the second appropriation after appropriating proposed dividend then i'll transfer some of the profits to any reserves few reserves are specific reserves few reserves are meant for what statutory purpose so general reserves generally those are free reserves and then i'll write the balance under profit and loss appropriation account that is profit and loss account credit balance okay this is the end of the story so now from this statement i have to prepare funds from operations see actually all the transactions under pnl account credit side are representing your sources all the debit side transactions are representing applications subject to some adjustments so from this profit and loss account and profit and loss appropriation account only we can prepare funds from operations you better remember the format that's so easy that's better for you but my objective is to explain the logic behind that particular format so i'm preparing funds from operations now from this profit and loss account See this balance carried down is known as profit after tax and after appropriations. Yes, already we got profit after tax in PNL account. And after that, we did what all the appropriations like proposed dividend appropriation, pro I mean preference dividend appropriation, proposed dividend appropriation, and, and we have transferred some amount of profits to reserves. Some of the reserves are free reserves, some of the reserves are specific reserves, and finally we got this balance. This balance is simply known as what? profit after tax and after appropriations yes and from that from that particular term only we have to start our funds from operation statement pat and appropriations profit after tax and after appropriations yes this is my net source actually the final source but now what i'm going to do is See, while arriving this profit after tax and after appropriations, I have debited nothing but I have deducted some non-cash items and some non-operating items. Now, I am going to add back those transactions which were debited in the form of non-cash item or in the form of non-operating expenses. So, why you are not, why you are adding, why you are adding now? Why? Because those transactions never results in cash outflow or those transactions are non-operating. My objective is to calculate funds from operations. When I am trying to calculate funds from operations, I should not deduct non-operating applications and I should not deduct non-cash applications. Why? Because non-cash transactions means that such transactions never involves any cash outflow. Example, depreciation. Depreciation never reduces to working capital, but still such transaction was debited in your PNL account. So, I am going to add back those transactions. Either those are non-cash or those are non-operating. So those transactions I'm going to add back if such transactions were debited. Now let me start with one by one. Add. So what is the first transaction? Reserves. Transferred reserves never involves any cash outflow. That's just merely an appropriation. No, that's not an application. So transfer to reserves is the first transaction. Just add it. Then after transfer to reserves, what I should do? The next transaction is proposed dividend. So why you are adding proposed dividend and preference dividend? Yes, you should add back proposed dividend and preference dividend also. Why? Because those two are non-operating transactions. Add proposed dividend and preference dividend. In most of the problems, you can never see preference dividend in the format. Why? Because the information may be not available. I'll explain one problem. Then you can understand why we are ignoring preference dividend. You better add back preference dividend if that is available okay so add proposed dividend and add preference dividend now 
with this p and l appropriation account is closed now go ahead go ahead with profit and loss account we have income tax here income tax is the non operating expenditure so add it back which is known as provision for tax in fact the money which is debited in p and l account is provision for tax but not enough but not payment of tax actually there is a difference between provision for tax and payment of tax why because the provision which is created in the current year will be paid in the next year the provision which is created in the previous year should be paid in the current year okay that part i'll explain later provision for tax is next edition since that's a non operating expenditure and then i'll go for interest actually in most of the cases i don't consider interest because payment of interest identifying payment of interest is a difficult task so we'll ignore interest in case if interest calculation is certain that that should be added back that should be added back so but in most of the problems you can never see interest interest application so just ignore it now i'm just moving to the other items admin and selling and distribution expenses should not be added because those two are those two are cash items cash transactions and operating expenses also okay now i can add non cash expenses because those are non cash and i can add non operating expenses and losses because those are non operating so non cash and non operating should be added back added back okay so i'm trying to add it here now non operating i mean non cash expenses you know the examples of non cash expenses depreciation and amortization of goodwill patents preliminary expenses etc etc okay and then the next item is non operating expenses and losses non operating expenses and losses you know the examples of non operating expenses non operating expenses are premium on redemption of debentures and premium on redemption of preference share capital non operating losses examples are loss on sale of fixed assets and loss on sale of investments with this all additions were completed now we have to deduct some of the credit side items we have only one item to deduct because that is non operating incomes and gains so while calculating funds from operations if there is any addition in the form of credit in the profit and loss account that should be excluded from funds from operations why because while calculating funds from operations non operating incomes and gains should not be included in ffo so since already we got this number net i mean profit of tax and offer of operations this number is loaded with what the credit side items and pre and l account so whatever the number which is created which is added should be excluded okay so what was that minus non operating incomes and gains minus non operating incomes and gains you know that non operating income best example is interest received and dividend received on investment non operating gains means gain on sale of fixed assets and gain on sale of investments so non operating incomes and gains should be excluded or should be deducted so finally i am going to get funds from operations this is my funds from operations yes but this we have completed funds from operations format now look at the format funds from operations profit after tax and after appropriations add transfer to reserves proposed dividend preference dividend provision for tax non cash expenses non operating expenses and losses add it then deduct non operating incomes and gains then we'll get funds from operations okay so what is the next task see preparation of statement showing changes in working capital i'll prepare the statement i'll explain that particular statement and the problem directly why because there is no complication for preparing statement showing changes in working capital that's a simple statement to prepare okay but before going for that i need to explain two transactions very particularly one is provision for tax another one is proposed dividend before explaining these two transactions i want to tell you one important point see in funds flow statement i'll write those transactions which are the combination of non current and current or current and non current account that means generally our account combinations are of three types current account and current account transactions current 
the second one is non current account and non current account transactions the third one is non current and current vice versa current and non current both are same so your transactions are generally the, the combination of these three only okay first combination current and current account so what are the current accounts and what are the non current accounts all long term items are non current accounts and all short term items nothing but current assets and current liabilities are the current accounts okay so current assets stock data cash and bank balances current liabilities credit as provision for tax proposed dividend outstanding expenses all these are what current accounts so what are the non current accounts rest of the items fixed assets investments long term investments equity share capital reserves and surplus preference share capital debentures long term loans all these are what non current items so my dear students if your transaction is a combination of current and current account don't write such transaction in the pansho statement if your transaction is a combination of non current and non current account don't write such transaction in the pansho statement if your transaction is a combination of non current and current please write such transactions in the pansho statement either in sources or in applications the question is so please tell me the examples of current and current account combination uh, simple collection from datas the entry is what bank account data to datas account bank account is a current account datas account is a current account don't write such transaction in the pansho statement payment to creditors creditors account data to bank account creditors account is a current account bank account is a current account don't write such transaction in the pansho statement now let look at the second combination non current and non current combination see non current non current combination means say for example i purchased uh, fixed assets by issuing debentures what is entry purchase of fixed assets by issuing debentures means fixed assets account data to debentures account fixed asset is a non current account debenture is a non current account that will never have any impact on your working capital change again conversion of debentures to equity share capital entry debentures to equity share capital account simple debenture account is a current non current account equity share capital is a non current account don't write such transaction in the pansho statement like that if any transaction is a combination of non current and non current so you should not write such transactions in the pansho statement so current and current account combination should be ignored while preparing pansho statement and non current and non current combination should be ignored while preparing pansho statement only those transactions which are the combination of non current and current account which are going to have an impact on your working capital changes so what are the best example i have issued equity share capital what is accounting entry bank account data to equity share capital account bank account is a current account equity share capital is a non current account what will happen issue of equity share capital increases current asset increases working capital increases current asset increases working capital cash will be increased issue of debentures increases cash increases current asset increases working capital long term loans borrowed i mean that increases cash balance increases current asset increases working capital fixed assets sold increases cash balance increases working capital bank account data to fixed asset account like that bank account is a current account and fixed asset account is a non current account so the combination of non current and current will increase my working capital or it may, it may decrease my working capital also redemption of debentures debentures account data to bank account debentures is a non current account bank is a current account so debentures is a non current account bank is a current account that reduces my cash redemption of debentures reduces my cash reduces my current asset reduces my working capital so like that you can see so many transactions which are the combination of non current and current such transactions either decreases of working capital or increases of working capital should be written in the statement called pansho statement if such transaction increases your working capital that will be your source if such transactions decreases your working capital that will be your application so only you have to write the transactions which are the combination of non current and current in the pansho statement yes now the question is sir that's okay what is the accounting entry for payment of tax and payment of dividend payment of tax and payment of dividend have written in the pansho statement have you observed it payment of tax and payment of dividend are considered in pansho statement what is the accounting entry for payment of tax sorry payment of tax accounting entry simple entry is provision for tax account data to bank account provision for tax is a current liability current account bank account is a current account so this transaction is a combination of current and current but still have written the transaction in the funds of state payment of dividend entry proposed dividend account data to bank account proposed dividend account is a current account bank account is a current account again this is a combination of current and current current and current combination transactions should not be written in the statement of funds of statement should not be written in the statement of funds flow funds of statement so why you have written 
why you have written these two transactions these two transactions are specific transactions you should be consider these transactions separately in the functional statement why because i want to show these payments and for better disclosure relating to payment of tax and payment of dividend though these items are a combination of current and current still you have to consider these two transactions as non current and current combination how that is possible sir i am going to take one assumption even though provision for taxation and proposed dividend or current liabilities still for the sake of better disclosure to show the payment of tax and payment of dividend in the form of funds store statement to the users of financial statements i am going to take one strict assumption provision for taxation and proposed dividend as a non current liabilities so why like that actually these two are these two are current liabilities but still for better disclosure purpose i am taking provision for taxation and proposed dividend as non current liabilities that means what is under payment of tax now and, and based on your assumption previously this is a current liability now uh, based on our assumption this is non current liability this provision for taxation proposed dividend these two are non current liabilities so let me write the entry payment of tax provision for taxation account at a bank account now change it now this time provision for tax is a non current liability non current account bank is a current account so this is a combination of what and what non current and current combination now again payment of dividend what is the combination the proposed dividend account at a bank account generally proposed dividend proposed dividend is current liability but based on our assumption proposed dividend is a non current liability so non current account at a bank account non current account at a current account so this is a combination of non current and current so based on our assumption these two transactions are the combination of non current and current so take this assumption strictly provision for taxation and proposed dividend are considered as non current liabilities so that i can write these two transactions in the funds store statement that's it so this is one more important point you should remember okay now successfully we understood provision for taxation and proposed dividend treatment so what is the treatment remember that prepare provision for taxation and proposed dividend accounts and add back the current year provision for taxation and the current year provision for tax and proposed dividend in funds from operations so the current year provision which is created for tax and the current year appropriation which is created from which is created in the form of proposed dividend should be previous transaction provision for taxation and proposed dividend the current period appropriation of proposed dividend and the current period pro uh, created provision for tax should be added back to profit after tax and after appropriations for calculating what funds from operations for calculating funds from operations what is the next thing whatever the numbers which you have added those are the provisions created and profits appropriated in the form of proposed dividend during the current financial year so during the current financial year you are going to pay tax and dividend income tax payment and income tax uh, income tax payment and dividend payment those two are the applications in the funds store statement so payment of tax and payment of dividend should be considered as applications in the funds store statement so what is the final conclusion if you are taking provision for taxation proposed dividend as non current liabilities then add back current year provision for taxation and current year appropriation of proposed dividend in funds from operations and consider payment of tax and payment of dividend as an application in funds store statement that's it so what is the second assumption we have another assumption also instead of taking provision for taxation and proposed dividend as non current liabilities you can also take another assumption called provision for taxation and proposed dividend can be considered as current liabilities also so what i should do then if you consider provision for taxation and proposed dividend as current liabilities don't add back current year provision for taxation and current year appropriated proposed dividend in funds from operations these two transactions must be ignored here should not be add back should not add back these two transactions and also you should not write payment of taxation payment of dividend here because that's a combination of current and current so then what i should do don't consider those two transactions here in ffo or ffs funds from operations or funds store statement right away consider those two current liabilities provision for taxation and proposed dividend in a statement called statement showing changes in working capital that's a separate statement this is purely based on assumption i'll explain while handling the two problems okay yes this is regarding funds from operations and funds for statement so in the tomorrow session i'm going to explain the problematic part relating to funds for statement thank you yes 
good evening all of you dear students in the previous session we understood the format of funds flow statement along with funds from operations now let us solve the problems related to funds flow statement from the study material look at illustration number 12 i'll tell you the approach to handle this problem because that there is an approach to handle this kind of problems that are like funds flow statement or cash flow statement so i'll tell you i i'm going to handle this problem in three phases phase 1 i'm going to prepare working notes by taking assets and liabilities along with adjustments and in phase 2 i'm going to prepare funds from operations and funds flow statement then finally the last statement is statement showing changes in working capital okay now let me read the question the following is a balance sheet of gamma limited for the year ended 31st march 2021 and 31st march 2022 we have share capital capital and liabilities 2021 22 two years balance sheet are given here share capital general reserve capital reserve look at the item profit on sale of investment this capital reserve is created by selling the investment so on sale of investment we got some profit and such profit was credited to capital reserve okay this is regarding capital reserve account and profit and loss account credit balance 15% debentures accrued expenses creditors provision for dividend provision for taxation let me take the numbers here share capital general reserve capital reserve profit and loss account credit balance 15% debentures accrued expenses creditors provision for dividend provision for taxation this is the situation and coming to assets fixed assets less accumulated depreciation net fixed assets we have long term investments at cost stock at cost debt as net of provision for doubtful debts of 45000 and 56000 to 50 respectively for 21 and 22 respectively bills receivable prepaid expenses miscellaneous expenditure okay out of these transactions out of these assets you can see stock to prepaid expenses these are your current assets miscellaneous expenditure is a fictitious asset yes and we have some adjustments a to f i'll read every adjustment based on the requirement prepare a funds flow statement statement of changes in financial position on working capital for the year ended 31st march 2022 okay this is your requirement yes see there is a mistake in the problem i'll correct it just look at the numbers up to general reserve everything is okay share capital and general reserves balances are clearly given without any problem but from capital reserve onwards the numbers were jumbled actually see this dash as this is that is not minus actually that is dash that means capital reserve profit on sale of investments Oh, I mean, on the balance sheet date of two thousand twenty-one, it is nothing nil dash, and then for twenty-two, we got a capital reserve credit balance of eleven thousand fifty. So, this profit and loss account credit balance is one lakh twelve thousand five hundred. That's what this number one lakh twelve thousand five hundred is not capital reserve credit balance. Capital reserve credit balance for twenty-one is nil dash, for twenty-two it is eleven thousand two fifty. Okay, so one lakh twelve thousand five hundred is capital reserve actually. Sorry, one lakh twelve thousand five hundred is profit and loss account credit balance actually. Okay, this one lakh twelve thousand five hundred is not capital reserve. That is profit and loss account credit balance. Then what about capital reserve balance? Nothing nil dash. So fifteen percent debentures is three lakh thirty thousand thousand five hundred. Accrued expenses eleven thousand two fifty. Credit loss one lakh eighty thousand. Provision for dividend thirty three thousand fifty. Provision for tax seventy eight thousand seven fifty. and remaining numbers are clearly given okay remaining numbers are in order no issue with that so just like this 12500 is belonging to this number and this one this one this one this one and this one okay so accordingly see the numbers no confusion just the numbers are jumbled i'm taking the numbers here now let us handle one by one now look at the first asset first balance called fixed assets account see here the fixed assets are given at cost 
and accumulated depreciation is given separately and we have net fixed reserves also and there are some adjustments relating relating to this point a that's it point a only okay apart from that no other adjustments were given now let me solve this let me solve this i'm taking the material here yes Problem number 12. See, when assets are given at cost, you should maintain fixed asset account at cost along with provision for depreciation account. So please open the fixed assets account. Fixed assets account at cost. Here is the balance. And write the balances. Opening balance to balance brought down. In closing balance by balance carried down. Yes. Now, what are the opening balances? The opening balance is 1 lakh, 11 lakh 25,000. The closing balance is 13 lakh 50,000. Okay. And also you should maintain, you should open another account called provision for depreciation account, which is nothing but accumulated depreciation account. Provision for depreciation account by balance brought down. Opening balance two lakh twenty five thousand. Two lakh twenty five thousand. And closing balance two eighty one two fifty. Hmm. Now let us read the sentences. The adjustments. Okay. The adjustment is saying what during the year 2021-22, fixed assets with a net book value of 11,250, accumulated depreciation of 33,750 was already provided on it, was sold for 9,000. This is the sale transaction. Okay. This is the sale transaction. So first adjust this sale transaction, the provision for depreciation account and fixed asset account. Whenever the asset is sold, then immediately related, related provision for depreciation which is provided on it should be transferred. So actually we are selling one asset with a net book value of 11,250 on that already we have provided a depreciation of 33,750. So the depreciation which is included in 2,25,000 the amount of 33,750 related to sold asset must be transferred to fixed asset account first of all. The amount is 33,750 reduce this balance. Why? Because we are selling this asset. So you don't need to maintain this balance for further years. So transfer the provision for depreciation related to sold asset to the fixed asset account. So buy provision for depreciation account. Provision for depreciation account. And that balance is 33,750. So relating to sold asset, we have transferred the depreciation, the corresponding depreciation. So what to do next? So after transferring provision for depreciation, now write the sale entry. So out of 11,25,000, already we have provided 33,750 related to sold asset. So the book value of the asset is 11,250. So I, I think the cost of the asset will be 11,250 plus 33,750. The cost of the asset is 45,000. On that already we have provided 33,750 provision for depreciation. So this 11,25,000 is loaded with the sold asset which costs 45,000. On that already we have provided 33,750. We are reducing it. That means uh, the adjustment with this 33,750 is adjusted against the cost of the asset. So from this 45,000 we are adjusting this 33,750. The balance is your book value which is 11,250. And we are selling such book value of the fixed asset for how much value? 9,000. So, for sale entry, it is by bank. Bank account at auto fixed asset account. In fact, the bank account at auto fixed asset account at auto. I mean, bank account at auto fixed asset account is a regular entry. When we are selling the asset on loss basis, nothing but while selling, if you are facing loss, then the entry will be bank account at auto loss on sale of fixed asset account at auto fixed asset account. In case if you are getting profit, what is entry? Bank account at auto fixed asset account to profit and uh, I mean profit on sale of fixed asset account. So here, I am selling the asset for 9,000 rupees, whereas the book value of the asset is 11,250. So 11,250 minus 9,000. So this is 9,000 sale value. The balance is 
loss on sale of fixed asset and that is 2250 but the sale transaction is closed instead of writing by loss on sale of fixed asset you can also write by pnl account okay so generally when the assets are maintained at cost you should close two accounts, fixed asset account and provision for depreciation account. While closing these two accounts, you should focus on important balances like this. In provision for depreciation account, look at the opening and closing balances and identify any transfer of provision for depreciation related to sold asset under debit side. Once it is transferred, close this account. It should be closed. In case if you get any balance, that should be the current year provision. So add this number 281,250 plus 33,750. 3,15,000 whereas I got a credit side balance 3,15,000 3, minus 225,000 90,000 so this is it should be your current year provision for depreciation by p and L account balancing figure this is my current year provision for depreciation I can write by p and L account or I can write by depreciation account also it depends okay so this is your current year depreciation but this depreciation provision for depreciation account is closed now look at the fixed asset account see we have opening balance, closing balance and sold transaction is completed. Generally in fixed asset account at cost, we are going to have these transactions. Along with opening and closing balances, there will be a sale entry under credit side. There will be a purchase entry under debit side. That's it. Sale and purchase. If you have any discarded asset, then that will be another transaction that comes under credit side. Okay. So my dear students, look at this. Look at these transactions. Already the sale transaction is closed. So I should close this account. If it is not close, if you get any balance on the debit side, that should be your purchase. So look at the number, 11,25,000. I'm just closing it. Get the total under credit side. 13,50,000 13, plus 2,250 plus 9,000 plus 33,750. It's 13,95,000. And here also it is 13,95,000 and we got some debit balance, debit side balance, got some debit side balance, the balancing figure 13,95,000. So the balancing figure is 13,95,000 minus 11,25,000. It's 2,70,000. This is your current year purchases to bank balancing figure. So with this fixed asset account is closed. So Successfully, we have closed fixed asset account and provision for depreciation account. Now go for the next account. Long term investments account. Investments account is your next account. Yes. Write the opening balance to balance brought down. That is 2,2500. And write the closing balance by balance carried down. And that is also 2,2500. 2, now read the adjustment. See, look at point B. During the 2021-22, investments costing 90,000 were sold and also investments costing 90,000 were purchased. For purchase, you can write the direct entry. So we purchase 90,000 worth of investment. So investments account dot to bank account, 90,000. And you should write the sale transaction. But while writing the sale transaction, you should recognize the profit or loss. See, investments costing 90,000 was sold. So we have sold 90,000 cost of the investment. That doesn't mean that the sale value of the investment is 90,000. Actually, if you look at the capital reserve account under the liability side of the balance sheet, there is a capital reserve with zero opening balance but have a, we have a closing balance of 11,250 that's a credit balance and within brackets they have mentioned clearly this credit balance is created out of profit on sale of investments that means the 90,000 cost of the investments was sold with a profit of 11,250 so the sale value must be 90,000 plus 11,250 I'm just adding profit to the cost so the sale value is 1,1250 so you should write by bank by bank account not the cost you should write prof no cost plus profit 90,000 plus 11,250 and I got 11,250 this is 1,1250 
and you should write the profit on the debit side to profit and loss account. I'm just transferring profit to profit and loss sale of investments to profit and loss account. That is one thousand two fifty. Sorry, eleven thousand two fifty. Eleven thousand two. Now, same logic is applicable here also for investments account. We have sale transaction, we have purchase transaction. Once sale and purchase are over, you can close this account called investments account. So, generally in investment account, you can never see depreciation adjustment. Why? Because investments are generally shown at cost. So, just close this account. It should be closed. 2,2500. This is an excess zero. Two lakh two thousand five hundred plus ninety thousand plus eleven thousand two fifty. I got three lakh three thousand seven fifty. Here also you must get must get the same number two lakh two thousand five hundred plus one not one two fifty. Same number. So with this investments account is closed. So fixed asset account, accumulated depreciation account, long term investments accounts are closed. Stock data, bills receivables, bills prepaid expenses. All these are current assets. For current accounts, you don't need to prepare. Accounts. You don't need to prepare working notes also. And miscellaneous miscellaneous expenditure will be adjusted under FFO funds from operations. We have opening balance of sixteen thousand eight seventy five, and we have closing balance of eleven thousand two fifty. That's a fictitious asset. The debit balance was reduced. The debit balance is reduced actually here. So that reduction is clearly representing. We have written some portion of miscellaneous expenditure in the profit and loss account. So this transaction is required while preparing FFO. Okay. This transaction, this this item is required while preparing FFO. Remember that, and remaining stock data, bills receivable, prepaid expenses comes under statement showing changes in working capital. Okay, now with this asset side transactions were closed. Now go for the liability side. We have a share capital of six lakh seventy five thousand and a closing balance of six seven lakh eighty seven thousand five hundred. What was happened? It's clear. It is clear the share capital has been issued. So that's the source. So any adjustment, just go for the adjustments relating to share capital because sometimes you can see you can see the bonus issue or rights issue, and accordingly I should write those transactions in the account, and ac accordingly such transactions should be considered in funds flow statement because only those transactions which are resulting in increase in working capital, decrease in working capital should be considered in funds flow statement. Sometimes you can see increase in the share capital account due to bonus issue. Bonus issue never rises additional cash balance. That never increases the cash balance. That just that is just the capitalization of what results in surplus to share capital. So you you'll just convert free results to share capital. That's what bonus issue. So bonus issue can never increase the source. So that's not a transaction should be considered in funds flow statement. So whenever you're preparing share capital account, you must see the adjustment. See we don't have any adjustment here. We don't have any adjustment here relating to share capital. That means the difference in share capital, the increase in share capital balance is purely representing issue of equity share capital for cash or bank. Okay, that's a clear source. General reserve, capital reserve is closed. You don't need to prepare any account for that. General reserve comes under FFO. I must consider this general reserve and profit and loss account credit balance while preparing funds from operations. Generally, general reserve and profit and loss account credit balance. These two credit balances must be considered while preparing funds from operations. So we have another account called fifteen percent debentures with an opening balance of three lakh thirty seven thousand five hundred and a closing balance of two lakh twenty five thousand. So the balance got reduced. That indicates that debentures were redeemed. And look at the transactions. That means adjustments. You should be very careful while adjusting these transactions. Debentures were retired, redeemed. Retired means redeemed at a premium of ten percent. So we have redeemed debentures. At a premium of ten percent, now just prepare debentures account. Yes, debentures account. This is fifteen percent debentures account. Say so I'll prepare working notes only. Then I'll show you the transactions and the funds from operations and funds from statement directly, because these working notes are very crucial. Since it's a liability, it's a credit. It shows some credit balance by balance brought down. I have a debentures balance of three thirty seven five hundred. Okay, three lakh thirty seven thousand five hundred, and a closing balance of 
two lakh twenty five thousand. Just check the transactions once. See the benches opening balance three thousand five hundred, closing balance two twenty five thousand. Yes. These debentures were retired at a premium of 10%. See the difference in debentures balance. The opening balance is 3,500. The closing balance is 225,000. Difference is 112,500. That's the face value of debentures which were redeemed. So, and this is made at a premium of 10%. The redemption is made at a premium of 10%. Then you should write to bank account along with premium. 112,500 into 1,12,500 into 110% along with premium into 110% this will be 123,750 so that 11,250 excess money that you are paying as a premium that should be adjusted under credit side by premium on redemption of debentures and that is 11,250 this premium is an expenditure which is generally debited to profit and loss account unless otherwise specifically stated. Sometimes the premium can be shown at the other side of the balance sheet as an ex as an expenditure balance. That means instead of debiting this premium to p and account, that can be shown at the other side of the balance sheet. Okay. So, unless otherwise specifically stated, I always assume that this premium should be debited to profit and loss account. Already debited to profit and loss account. Okay. Now, let us close this account. It must be closed without any adjustment because we have taken the balancing figure. So 123,750 plus 225,000. This is 348,750. Here also we have to take 348,750. And take the numbers 3,500 plus 11,200. That is 348,750. With this account, debenture account is closed. Yes, accrued expenses create us. Both are current liabilities. Now go for the provision for dividend account. Provision for dividend account. So I'll always assume that provision for dividend, I mean proposed dividend and provision for taxation are the current, I mean non-current accounts. Accordingly, we must prepare accounts. We should prepare working notes for that. By balance brought down to balance carried down. Yes. Provision for dividend. <clears throat> yes. See the balances here. Look at the provision for dividend. The opening balance of provision for dividend is 33,750. Closing balance is 38,250. 33,000. 750 Yes. Now, so look at the adjustments related to proposed dividend or provision for dividend. Just go over the adjustments. Yes. Proposed dividend. The proposed dividend for 2021 was paid in 21-22. Nothing but I need to tell you one important point. Generally, the appropriated proposed dividend for the last year will be paid in the current year. The appropriated proposed dividend of the current year will be paid in the next year. That's why this opening balance is appropriated. This is the appropriated proposed dividend of the last year, which will be paid in the current year to bank account. 33,750. So whatever the closing balance that you are seeing on the, in the account, this closing balance must be appropriated in the current year p and account. So by p and appropriation account or simply p and account that is 38,250 so that your account will be close 38,250 plus 33,750 so 72,000 is your total balance so what is the entry here see whatever the opening balance that you are seeing in the proposed dividend account that opening balance is the appropriated profit in the last year so that was appropriate in the last year and that will be paid in the current year. And you, uh, if you can see the closing balance in the proposed dividend, the such closing balance is a current year appropriation, which is yet to be paid, that will be paid in the next year. That's why we are seeing this balance here. Because if it is paid, you can never see the balance here. Okay. So what is the conclusion? 
if there are no adjustments related to proposed dividend, I always assume that the opening should be paid in the current year to bank account. The ba opening balance should be written as to bank account. And closing should be considered as current year appropriation by PNL appropriation. So these two are related. These two are related. So the opening should be to bank. The closing should be by PNL. Okay. If you have any adjustments related to payment or appropriation separately, first you should write the transaction. The balancing figure can be current year payment. The balancing figure under credit set can be current year appropriation. So if current year appropriation is given, then you should write by PNL account. Then accordingly, bank to bank will be your balancing figure. If the payment is given in the problem, then you should write to bank account. Then the balancing figure under credit side will be by PNL appropriation account. Okay. So if there are if there is no other information, then I always assume that the opening should be paid, the closing should be appropriated. Same logic is applicable to provision for tax also. Yes, provision for tax account. By balance brought down. Provision for tax account by balance brought down 78,750. Two balance carried down 85,500. Okay. See, do you have any adjustments in this regard? Yes, we have point D here. In point D, they said what tax of 61,875 was paid for 2021. So the last year tax was paid in the current year to bank account how much tax was paid actually this opening provision is representing last year uh, this provision is related to last year profit that should be paid in the current year so there is a you know that the previous year uh, tax liability should be paid in the assessment year the assessment year i mean the, every assessment year is the previous year for the next assessment year so this assessment year tax liability should be paid in the next year actually nothing but what the current year tax should be paid in the next year the last year tax should be paid in the current year but provision should be created in the previous year okay so let me tell you one thing this 78,750 is the opening balance of provision for tax account this was created in the previous year this is created in the previous year the provision is created in the previous year so we have a final tax liability of 78,750 which is supposed to be paid in the current year but due to some adjustments even though we have created 78,750 we have to pay only 61,875 here as per the information given in the problem then you should write to bank account 61,875 you are supposed to pay 78,750 but they said what you have to pay 61,875 only because based on the adjustment in case if this particular adjustment is not given if this particular adjustment is not given then what I should do don't write this number just to bank account the opening should be paid the closing should be provided in the current year actually so you have to write the opening balance as to bank Nothing but that's your current year payment. The closing balance is assumed to be provided in the current year PNL account. So you have to write by PNL account 85,500. If this number is not given, okay, this number is not given. If the number is given, then you should not write opening as paid, closing as provided. You have to take the balancing figure 61,875 plus 61,875 plus 85,500. I got 147,375. 147,375. Here also 147,375. 147,375 minus 78,750. The balancing figure is 68,625. This is my current year provision by PNL account. This is created in the current year. Okay. By PNL account 68,625. So, in case if this payment is not given, in case if this payment is not given, what I should do? Simple. Write to bank. Nothing but the opening balance is paid. Two banks, 78,750. Write by PNLs. Nothing but closing balance, 85,500. The same logic which we have applied to proposed dividend, applicable, uh, applicable here also. The same is applicable here also. What I should write? The opening is provided in the last year. The opening provision for tax is provided in the last year. That should be paid in the current year to bank. The closing is provided in the current year. So you should write by PNL account. So, opening paid, closing provided. Opening to bank, closing by PNL. That's it. If no information is given. But here, we have a payment information. So, you should write the payment. The closing balance will be by PNL account. Hope you got it. With this provision for taxation, proposed dividend accounts for closed. And we have one adjustment in uh, that is point E. During the year 21-22, bad debts of 15,750 were written off against the provision for doubtful debts account. 
actually you don't need to prepare account for this adjustment because this is related to current account i'll take the current account balances directly in the statement called statement showing changes in working capital successfully we have considered every adjustment and also we have taken every asset and every liability into consideration non non current account and non current account without touching what the current accounts okay now let us go for ffo funds from operations i'll try to way show you the statement of ffo funds from operations generally it starts with what profit after tax and after appropriations so how to get profit after tax and after appropriations if you can see the balance in your balance sheet the profit and loss account opening balance is 112500 the closing balance is 225000 the closing balance is 225000 opening balance is 112500 so the difference should be 225000 minus 112500 see the balance which is shown under the asset side or liability side of the balance sheet the profit and loss account credit balance which is shown under the liability side of the balance sheet is clearly representing profit after tax and after appropriation account that's a profit after tax and after appropriation balance actually okay because only after appropriations you can take that balance into balance sheet so my dear students this difference of 112500 increase in profit and loss account credit balance is clearly representing current year profit after tax and after appropriations that's what they've taken here profit after tax and after appropriation by taking the difference between profit and loss account credit balance opening and closing i got 112500 now let us write one by one all the transaction and you should follow our format what is our first transaction in the format transfer to reserves that's our first transaction we have transferred some reserves we have transferred some amount of profits to general reserve look at general reserve account opening balance 225000 closing balance 281250 281250 281250 minus 225000 and the difference is 56250 that's what the transfer to general reserve from profit and loss appropriation account should be added and so can i take capital reserve only such reserves which were created out of profit and loss account or profit and loss appropriation account should be added back here you should not take all the reserves only those reserves which were created from profit and loss appropriation account should be considered here general reserve is generally created out of profit and loss appropriation but as they have clearly mentioned what the capital reserve is created out of profit on sale of investments that was not created out of profit and loss appropriation account if it is debited in pnl appropriation account should be added if it is not debited in pnl appropriation account should be ignored so i am not i am not taking this capital reserve account here then apart from that we don't have any other reserve so the transfer to general reserve is over now go for proposed dividend yes we have a proposed dividend which is appropriated in the current year look at proposed dividend account yes how much is the proposed dividend which is appropriated in the current period 38250 the amount which is debited in pnl appropriation account or pnl account that's it okay 38250 is the current year appropriation then that should be added back look at the transaction proposed dividend you have our provision for dividend 38250 yes that was added and then next one after proposed dividend you must consider preference dividend do you have preference share capital here do you have preference share capital here yes we don't have any preference share capital here so no addition so after that i must go for what the next transaction is provision for tax i must add back provision for tax the current year provision should be added back so how much is the provision for tax which is created in the current year so look at the provision for tax account the current year provision for taxes 68625 which is debited in pnl account which is debited in pnl account should be added back should be added back 68625 yes then after provision for tax what is our next entry after provision for tax our next entry is non cash expenses non cash expenses that is depreciation and amortizations look at the depreciation account nothing but provision for depreciation account the current year depreciation which is provided the current year depreciation which is provided in the provision for depreciation account is 90000 that's a non cash expenditure please add it add it depreciation is 90000 don't stop with that and you should also check what the intangible assets which were written in written off in the pnl account or, or else if you can see any fictitious asset which is written off in the profit and loss see right off of intangible assets and right off of fictitious assets must be added back here look at the balance sheet do you have any intangible assets like goodwill patents corporates no on the top of the balance sheet we don't have 
any intangible assets, but you can see the fictitious assets that is miscellaneous expenditure not written off. I told you already this particular item should be considered in funds from operations. So the opening balance is 16,875, whereas the closing balance is 11,250. Since it is a debit balance and not an asset, the debit balance has reduced. That means that was that is purely written off in PL account. So 16,875 minus 11,250. The gap is 5,625. That means the miscellaneous expenditure debit balance is successfully written off to the extent of 5,625 and the profit and loss account. So what are the money which is written off in the PNL account? That particular miscellaneous expenditure written off is nothing but write off of fictitious asset that comes under non-cash expenditure should be written, should be added back here. So the under non-cash expenses. Look at the transaction here. Look at the transaction. Miscellaneous expenditure written off 5,625. Yes, added. So non-cash expenses were closed. Now go for non-operating expenses and losses. So what are the non-operating expenses? Premium on redemption of debentures, premium on redemption of preferences are the best examples of non-operating expenses. Do you have any premium on redemption of debenture which is debited in PNL account? Yes, we have a premium of 11,250. If you remember, if you want to show me, if you want to see this, look at the debentures account. There you have, writ you have written premium on redemption of debentures of 11,250. And that is supposed to be debited, that was already debited in PNL account, should be added back here under the head non operating expenses. So we have successfully added premium on redemption of debentures also. We don't have any preference share capital, no need to consider. So non operating losses is our next item. So while writing non operating losses, you have to consider loss on sale of fixed assets, loss on sale of investments. Yes, we have sold some fixed assets and investments, but by selling fixed assets, we suffered a loss. Yes, we suffered a loss. And that was debited in PNL account actually. Fixed asset by loss on sale of fixed assets that that's that is 2250. That should be added back here. 2250. 2250 loss on sale of fixed assets. Investments were sold, but for the profit. So you don't need to add back such item. So up along with this, I mean after uh, after this, we don't have any adjustments to adjust here. Non-operating expenses and losses were closed. Add it. Then after that, don't stop it we sh because you should also deduct one item called non-operating incomes and gains. Do you have any items like interest received and dividend received on investments which were traded in PNL account? We don't have any such, such adjustments here. Interest received and dividend received on investments. Then go for non-operating gains. That means profit on sale of fixed assets and profit on sale of investments. That is the sale of fixed assets, but that result that resulted in loss. That is a sale of investments. Yes, that results in profit, but that was not created in PNL account. Instead of that, that was created in what capital reserve account. You should add back. I mean, you should deduct gain on sale of fixed or gain on sale of investments. Only such transactions created in PNL account. And the problem they have specifically mentioned that the gain on sale of investments was created to capital reserve account instead of creating creating to PNL account. So that means you don't need to deduct such portion nothing but you don't need to deduct that particular item gain on sale of investments from this ffo from this profit of tax and after appropriation account okay in case if such adjustment is not given i might have assumed that such profit is traded in pnl account should be deducted here okay that should be deducted here but they have clearly mentioned what such profit is created to capital reserve account not created to pnl account since it is not created to pnl account no need to deduct it okay so no non-operating incomes and no non-operating gains. So there are no directions here. We have only additions here. So successfully, we got funds from operations of 384, 750. That's it. FFO is over. Now I can go for funds flow statement. Funds flow statement is our final statement. Funds flow statement. Yes, here is the statement. Go for the transactions. So whenever you're writing the transactions in the funds flow statement based on our format, you should always check whether all the working notes were successfully prepared or not. Because from the working notes only, I, take, I can take the numbers. Sometimes I can take the numbers directly from the balance sheet if there are no adjustment, if there are no complications. Now let me write the first transaction, the sources. The first source is issue of share capital based on our format. I'm just following our format, the issue of share capital. Issue of share capital, look at the transaction. Under the sources, can you see the... Transaction called issue of share capital. Yes, increase in share capital is nothing but increase issue of share capital. That is the difference between opening and closing balance of share capital. Opening and closing balance of share capital is 787500 minus 6,75,000 and that resulted in 1,12,500. Yes, no adjustments are applicable here. 
Yes. Now the next transaction is issue of debentures. Yes. There is a redemption of debenture. We don't have any issue here. Next. Issue of preference share capital, no preference share capital, no issue. Long term borrowings, look at the loans, we don't have any loans here, okay. Sale of fixed assets, yes, we have sale of fixed assets. Fixed assets was sold for, <laughs> yes. Let me go for the asset account. The fixed assets was sold for 9,000 and investments were sold for 1 lakh 1,020. These two transactions must be considered here. Sale of fixed assets, sale of fixed assets. Sale of fixed assets, 9,000 sale of investments. And then non op sale of fixed assets and sale of investments. After that, I have MS consider funds from operations 384, 750. Non operating receipts, interest received, dividend received. Such type of transactions are not given here. So, with this, we have written all the sources. Now go for the applications. What is the first application? Purchase of fixed assets. Do you have any purchase of fixed assets here? Go for the fixed asset account. Yes, we have purchased 2,70,000. And also, we have purchased. Some investments also, purchase of investments, purchase of investments 90,000. So now see the transaction, purchase of fixed assets. Purchase of fixed assets, that's the first transaction. Purchase of investments, yes, we have written that. Actually, we should start with redemption of preference share capital. We don't, uh, act, the first transaction is buyback of equity, no buyback of equity. Redemption of preference share capital is not applicable here. Redemption of debentures, actually. The next thing is redemption of debentures. Debentures were redeemed along with premium. 1,12,500. You can see the debentures account along with premium. 1,23,750. I hope you have written that number. 1,23,750. Premium was written separately. Instead of that, you can write both the numbers collectively by writing redemption of debentures along with premium. 112500 plus what 11,250 and the value is 123,750. So, redemption of preference share capital, no redemption of preference share capital, redemption of debentures we have taken here. Purchase of fixed assets and purchase of investments we have taken. Yes. First one, redemption, buyback of equity, no buyback of equity. Second one, redemption of preference share capital, no preference share capital, no redemption. Redemption of debentures along with premium, yes, we have taken. Purchase of fixed assets we have taken. Purchase of investments we have taken. Now payment of tax, income tax payment and dividend payment, payment of tax and payment of dividend are considered here by seeing this accounts payment provision for tax account, provision for tax account, payment of tax, provision for dividend account, 61875, provision for dividend account, 33,750. Yes. Now see this payment of tax, 61875, payment of dividend, 33,750. What about the transactions? See, payment of taxes over, payment of dividend over, non-operating payments. Rarely you can write the transaction. Most of the cases you can never see such transaction, non-operating payments. So we have completed all the adjustments, we have prepared all working notes, we have prepared FFO, and now we are finalizing this funds flow statement. We have written sources and we have written application. See, this statement is clearly saying what the sources are more than applica applications. That's why we got a balancing figure under application side. And that's what 28,125 that is increase in working capital. You can take the total. This is more total. Try by writing this total here. I'll get a balancing figure of increase in working capital of 28,125. FFS is over. Okay. Now, the easiest statement to prepare is statement showing changes in working capital. What are the standard columns? Particulars year 21, 22, two balance sheet dates. Write the current assets. Stock, debtors, bills, receivables, prepaid expenses. Already I told you, these are your current assets. Debtors means net debtors. That means debtors after deducting provision for bad and doubtful debts. Don't consider those adjustments which were given in the problem. Just ignore it. Just consider net debtors. Yes, we have written opening and closing balances here. 21, 22 balances. And also the current liabilities. We have only two current liabilities, accrued expenses and creditors. Sir, we have provision for tax and taxation proposed dividend also. Why you are not taking those two balances here? Because we assumed that we assumed that those two items are what? Those two items are non-current accounts. That's what our assumption. That's why we have adjusted those two items in FFO and FFS. Okay. So we have only two current liabilities, accrued expenses and creditors, opening and closing balances. Now write the current liabilities total. Write the current assets total. Calculate working capital, networking capital for 21, 22. Networking capital means current assets minus current liabilities. A minus B. A minus B. This is 343, 125 opening working capital. 343, 125 closing networking capital. 
that's the wrong balance actually let me check it 666000 minus 343 i mean sorry 294750 and that is 371 250 so your working capital is increased minus 343 125 the gap is 28125 this is my increase in working capital so successfully we got an increase in working capital of 28125 the rule is whatever the balance you're getting in funds for statement either increase or decrease in working capital should be matched with the balance that you're getting and the statement showing changes in working capital i got a balance of 28125 increase in working capital in statement showing changes in working capital this number must be matched with what the number which we got which we got it in what the statement called fund store statement in fund store statement i got 28125 yes the same number we got it in statement showing changes in working capital then only your problem your solution is absolutely right okay but this we have completed this particular 12th problem you can go for other problems also yes with this the chapter ffs is over yes <laughs> Yes, the next chapter is comparative common size financial statements and trend analysis. The three terms you must remember comparative, common size, and trend analysis. Comparative financial statements, common size financial statements, trend analysis. Three components here. Okay. We have three formulas for these three uh, items called comparative financial statements, common size financial statements, and trend analysis. In all these three areas, I'm going to take financial statements two years, the previous year and this year. Okay. Yes. Now, dear students, in this chapter, we can see lot of interpretations, lot of interpretations. You better go ahead with the formulas first of all, so that you can calculate the basic part of the solution. Then try to identify the comments and the problems so that you can easily understand. So I'll try to give you the formulas, formulas part. And I'll explain why we how we are calculating. Okay. So now, now the first area of this chapter is comparative financial statements. See, while comparing financial statements, while comparing financial statements, what I'll do, I'll take this formula. Just go, go for this part only. Go for the third point. Go for the third point. This is very important. Okay. Showing increase or decrease in value in terms of percentage. What is the formula? Increase or decrease amount divided by amount in the past period. So from last year to this year, how your component is increasing or decreasing, whether it is increasing or decreasing. Write that increase or decreasing amount in the numerator divided by the amount in the past period, nothing but the base amount. Okay. Then write, calculate the percentage under which analysis, comparative financial analysis. Okay. So under comparative financial analysis, the first formula I must remember is increase or decrease amount of the components of the financial statements divided by amount in the past period in the financial statements. Okay. Then under common size financial statements, I need to check the common size of every item in the financial statement. So common size of financial under common size financial statements, I'll take the same numbers in the current year actually. Investments divided by total assets. Current assets divided by total assets, fixed assets divided by total assets. That means I'll take every component of asset side, like fixed assets, and out of such, uh, I mean, by taking such fixed assets, I'll try to calculate the percentage of such fixed assets on the total assets. Then I'll try to calculate the total current assets on the total assets, the percentage of current assets on the total assets, the percentage of fixed assets on the total assets, the percentage of share capital on the total assets, the percentage of equity, proprietary fund, sorry, the percentage of proprietary fund on the total liabilities. The percentage of share capital on the total liabilities. The percentage of debt capital on the total liabilities. The percentage of current liabilities on the total liabilities. Like that, I'll take the total in the denominator and the respective component in the numerator. Then I can calculate the common size of every component. The proportion of every component in the balance sheet or in the income statement out of the total. Okay. This is uh, the formula that you should remember. This is the second formula you must remember under common size statements. So what is the formula? Investments by total assets, current assets by total assets, fixed assets by total assets. If it is liability side, liability side is classified as what? Proprietary fund, long-term loan, current liability showing individually and in total in the denominator. 
so then percentage of each liability to total liability the percentage of each liability to total liability the formula is what each liability divided by total liability is called is calculated according like as a set so just like as a set under liability set also you have to calculate every component percentage then that is what common size statement analysis i'm not talking about analysis this is just mere computation okay even an income statement also we classified the items like sales cods operating expenses net profit interest tax earnings after tax every component should be expressed as a percentage of sales who is the hero in the income statement sales so sales should be in the denominator and every component in the numerator because the expenses and losses everything should be recovered from what sales only so in the numerator i'll write what cost of goods sold interest i mean cost of goods sold admin expenses selling and distribution expenses interest cost income tax like that every component should be written in the numerator the individual components in the numerator and in the denominator i'm going to take what the sales value okay this is your second area second formula you must remember again i'm repeating see dear students under comparative financial analysis the formula is increase or decrease in the amount divided by amount in the past period so what in the second formula you know just now we have discussed okay the individual components of asset side liabilities divided by total assets or total liabilities that's it if, if it is an income statement I, I should take the expenses or losses divided by what the sales now the third formula is trend analysis this is third formula trend percentage trend percentage or trend ratio the formula is value of each item in the financial statements of any period divided by value of same item in the financial statements of the base period say for example the, in the last year my fixed assets balance is 1 lakh and in the current year the, my fixed assets balance is 1 lakh 25,000 so my fixed assets are increasing so this year this is current year this is previous year so compared to previous year my fixed assets percentage is 1,25,000 divided by 1 lakh. So 125%. So this year my fixed assets balance is 125% of the previous year balance. That's what the trend formula. So the trend ratio is what the value of each item in the financial statements of any period, the current period, divided by value of the same item of the in the financial statements of the base period. So you must take what the financial, I mean the value of each item of the current year financial statements should be compared with the value of financial value of the same item in the previous year. Okay. So simply current year balance divided by previous year balance that's what the formula you must remember what is the formula trend ratio trend ratio is equal to current year balance sheet item divided by previous year balance sheet item the same item you have to consider okay that's what trend ratios that in that in that way i can calculate trend ratios now let us apply the formulas see illustration number one from the following income statement, prepare common size statement and also interpret the results. I'm not going for the interpretation because that's a big part. Okay. Yes. I'll try to give you how to go for the calculation part. Okay. See, under common size statement, what is the formula? This is a formula. The individual item divided by total. Individual item divided by total. That's what the formula you have to apply here. Net sales, COGS, gross profit less other operating expenses, operating profit less interest on long term debt, profit before tax. Yes. Now, what is, the, what is the main component here? Sales. So, I am going to calculate every item. COGS by sales, gross profit by sales, other operating expenses by sales, operating profit by sales, interest on long-term debt by sales for last year and this year also. You see, common size statements for the year ended 31st March 2021 and 22, two years. Net sales is 100%. Out of such 100%, cost of goods only is how much percent is? Yeah, but just calculate it. COGS is 5,70,000. 5,70,000 divided by 10,50,000. And I got a percentage of 54.228%, approximately 54.3%. In the similar way for 2022 also, 47.8%. So, like that, you have to calculate gross profit ratio for 21 and 22, other operating expenses by sales for 21 and 22, operating profit ratio for the 21 and 22, interest on long term rate for 21 and 22, like that. Every formula. We are applying the same formula here. Individual item divided by total item for the respective year only. Okay. See, by seeing these numbers, we can interpret, we can go for a few, few interpretations actually. See, look at the, uh, look at the transactions here. Last year, my COGS percentage is 54.3%, whereas this year, 47.8%. So, I was able to reduce my cost of goods to up to some extent. Might be my purchase price of the raw metal is reduced or my wages cost is reduced or my some of my variable overheads were reduced. Because of this reason, I got some reduction in the cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales thereby i got some extra gross profit ratio last year my gross profit ratio is 45.7 percent whereas this year is 52.2 percent so 
my gross profit is improved because of reduction in what cost of goods sold like that you have to write your own interpretation by seeing the comments okay so you can see some com comments here you can write your own comments also it is based on your understanding okay yes this is regarding common size statements yes common size statement is over now i can go for comparative statements so here also this is common size statements i'm not taking it common size common size we should go for comparative statements here is the comparative income statement look at the problem the following are the income statement of pay limited for the year ended 31st march 2021 and 22 net sales minus cost of goods sold gross profit less admin expenses selling expenses we got operating expenses total and then if we deduct this operating expenditure from gross profit we got operating profit then then add back of other other incomes and other ex, and deduct other expenses then we'll get profit before tax less income tax profit after tax yes now what is my job i should go for comparative analysis that's what they're, they're saying prepare a comparative income statement and comment on the performance of a limited first of all you should go for the formula in the comparative statement what is the formula increase or decrease amount comparative financial under comparative financial analysis increase or decreasing amount divided by amount in the past period for every item just try to calculate the increase or decrease in the amount so i'm taking numbers here last year net sales one lakh seventy thousand this year one lakh ninety thousand four hundred amount of increase or decrease plus is increase minus is decrease my sales is increased by twenty thousand four hundred twenty thousand four hundred divided by last year number base number one lakh seventy thousand so it has been increased by twelve percent sales is increased by twelve percent go for cost of goods sold it has been increased by fifteen thousand how much percent is it is increased fifteen thousand divided by base number one lakh five thousand last year is base number okay that is fourteen point three percent is increased so like that you have to calculate every percentage gross profit is increased by 8.3 percent administrative expenses increased by 13.33 percent advertisement expenditure is increased by 33.33 percent other selling expense increase and then total selling expenses increased operating expenses increased operating profit increased and other incomes increase other ex other expenses decrease the only expenditure which is reduced here is other expenses on what the other expenditure last year 6800 this year 4800 it is reduced by 2000 the reduced by 29.4 percent like that some of the expenses most of the expenses were increased and uh, mostly your sales and sales is also increased here so finally your profit after tax is successfully increased by 106.3 percent the last year it is 3800 now this year it is 7840 so there is a huge increase in your net profit by 106.3 percent <laughs> okay and accordingly they have given some comments and you should if you can read such comments you can easily understand simple increase or decrease in each item divided by the base period item nothing but last year item that gives you the percentage increase or decrease in the respective items this is what comparative income statement analysis okay the last one is trend analysis here is the formula for trend ratios the trend ratio means what this year item divided by last year item that's it this year item divided by last year item into 100 that gives you trend ratio compute the trend ratios from the following data and comment 19 20 21 22 four years numbers were given here cost of material consumed labor cost other expenses cost of sales profit and sales were given here computation of trend ratios 18 19 19 20 20 21 21 22 cost of material consumed see the first year numbers are all 100 percent so calculate the ratios now for 1920 material consumed 250000 it has increased 250000 divided by base year last year number this year I have number divided by last year number divided by 2 lakhs that is 125 percent now go for the 2021 2 lakhs is a material consumption last year is 250000 2 lakhs by 250000 that is 80 percent no no actually not like that take the first year as a base year and write the numbers for the future year, I mean, but remaining years by taking the first year as the base year. 2 lakhs by 2 lakhs, 100%. And then what? For 22, 1 lakh 80,000 divided by the base number, 2 lakhs. This is 90%. So the first year is a base number. Remaining all the years are the rest, ne next year numbers, how the numbers, how the cost is increased. Okay. 
how the cost is increased, how the revenue is increased, just like that you have to calculate. So I'm taking base num base year as 1819, remaining all the years are the future numbers. So this is your numer denominator. Okay, this is your denominator. Remaining all these are what numerators? Yes. Labor cost last year 150,000. 1920 19 in the year 1920 or 1819. My uh, my labor cost is 150,000. For 1920, it is 1,50,000, 100%. For 2021, it is 2 lakhs. 2 lakhs by the base here is 1,50,000. Yes. And what about the year 1922? 1,25,000 divided by 1,50,000. It is 83.33%. Like that, you have to calculate trend ratios by taking one of the year as a base year. That is generally the first year. Okay. So like that you can calculate the percentage for other expenses, cost of sales, profit and sales also. Sales is 112.5% for the 1920, 93.8% for 2021, 100% for 21, 22. Okay. This is regarding trend ratios. Okay. Yes, with this, the comparative common size financial analysis of financial statements and trend ratios or trend analysis is over. Okay.